Derita, derita, derita. Stop, stop, stop. Okay, okay. Hop, 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 hop. No le muevas. Las paragus. Going to contraceptives. This is something that they really, really like to test, right? So let's go into contraceptives. Let's go into like. Each one that we have in the different types. So we have natural, right? We have barrier, we have hormonal, we have our IUDs, we have implant, we have sterilization. And like the natural methods are gonna be like abstinence, withdrawal, um, postcortal douche, lactational amenorrhea. Bare methods, we think about our condoms for both me uh, females and males, uh, diaphragms or cervical caps. For hormonal options, we think about our pills, right? Vaginal ring or patch. Um, we do what we think about our shots, like um, Depo-Provera, Nexplanon, IUDs. We think about our Paragard, Copper IUD, and Marina, Kylina, and Skylene. Uh, copper interferes with sperm, right? LNG actually thickens, thickens the mucus. So it causes this mixed endometrium and it decreases tube motility. We think about Nexplanon, right? This is like a rod that's implanted under the skin in the upper extremity that's effective for up to three years. And then we can also do sterilization. This is permanent though. So we can do a vasectomy or your bilateral tubal ligation. So let's go into each one. So in regards to oral contraceptives, how do they work, right? So these suppress the follicular development and ovulation by suppressing the FSH and LH levels. They thicken the cervical mucus and they create this type of mixed endometrium that is not suitable for implantation. And they alter tubal transport. But some of the complications with oral contraceptives, which we need to educate our patients, is that they can have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, especially if the patient is a smoker. Also, they're at risk for thromboembolism, like our DVTs, right? Pulmonary embolisms, uh, CVA, uh, myocardial infarction, benign hepatic tumors, which is a big one that's usually commonly associated with patients on oral contraceptives, increased risk of gallbladder disease, and they tend to interact with other medications. So there's medications that will decrease the efficacy of oral contraceptives like penicillin, cetracycline, sulfonamides, rifampin, motrin, fintoin, and barbiturates. And then there's medications that are going to um, basically be decreased by oral contraceptives. So medications that decrease oral contraceptives, we're thinking about our folates, anticoagulants, insulin, megalodopa, hypoglycemics, phenothiazins, and tricyclic antidepressants. So that's why, you know, sometimes patients that are on these medications, they might choose another alternative. And so there are like non-contraceptive health benefits, right? So <clears throat> things like uh, possibly like ectopic pregnancy, pelvic inflammatory disease, but it can also alleviate certain things like iron deficiency anemia, painful menstruation, right? Your dysmenorrhea. Um, it can also alleviate um, functional ovarian cysts, benign breast disease, osteoporosis. So just some key points real quick. Hormonal contraceptives have an extremely low failure rate, right? Um, combined hormonal contraception methods are prevent pregnancy by suppressing right, the ovulation, like we said, they alter the cervical mucus and they cause uh, atrophic changes in the endometrium. They're available either orally, injectably, topically, vaginally, intrauterine and implantable forms, but there's a lot of complications that can come from contraceptives like we discussed, right? DVTs, pulmonary embolism, myocardial infarctions, especially if the patient has a sm their smokers, they have an increased risk. But there's also benefits, like we said, it protects them against ovarian and endometrial cancer, um, pelvic inflammatory disease, and osteoporosis date, uh, <clears throat> rates. So let's go into each one then, right? So we said combination of oral contraceptives, estrogen and progesterone, right? <clears throat> uh, now, what are some of the cons that we would use oral contraceptives? Like, who do we not use them in? So oral contraceptives in general should not be used in smokers, right? Especially if they're older than 35. So once again, oral contraceptives, if a patient is older than 35 and they're a smoker, then we do not want to use combined oral contraceptives. Another con is that it, the patient's at risk for gallstones, uh, thromboembolism, like we said. So just make sure that you keep that in mind. Another one that we have is progestin only, right? So usually these are known as a mini peels. Are they really mini peels? They're actually not mini peels. So that's something that also to keep in mind with these patients that they are not mini peels. So for progesterone only pills, 
just like it says, they only have progesterone. So what they do is that they thicken the cervical mucus, they cause changes in the endometrium, and this one's safe during lactation. So make sure that you know that this is actually one of the ones that are usually unique, that a woman that's lactating can use a progestin mini pill. So make sure that you know that, okay? So if it's a woman that's a, uh, they are lactating, then you can use a progestin mini pill. It's also very safe in a woman over the age of 35. But some of the cons is that it can cause menstrual regular irregularities. It's less effective than combo oral contraceptives. And these patients have a higher risk of ectopic pregnancy than combined oral contraceptives. Next one is that you have long-acting long acting progestins, so things like Implanon, right? This is a single rod that's implanted. This is um, your, progest your progestin, your ito etonogestrel. It lasts three years with this one. And the side effects that it has, it's going to be the same ones like progestin pills, right? The menstrual like, irregularities. It's not as effective as um, combo oral contraceptives, and it has a slightly higher risk of ectopics and then also osteoporosis. Another long-acting progestin is gonna be your Deepa Provera injectable or your Medroxyprogesterone. This one's gonna last three months and it has the same of side effects as progestin pills like we discussed. So we said that Implanon is a rod that's implanted, right? And it lasts for three years and Medroxyprogesterone or your Deepa Provera injectable lasts is three months. And these are long acting progestins, right? They only contain progesterone. And then we have our Orthic Evra. This is a, a topical patch the patient has. This one has nor norogestrin and ethanol estradiol. It's applied every week for three weeks and then you take it off for one week. So every week's for three weeks, every week for three weeks, and then you take it off one week. Um, so this is only effective in patients that are compliant, right? And the thing about this one though, is that some of the cons that it has, it has that one week of withdrawal bleeding and it's less effective if the patient is underweight. You have the Nuva ring. This is a flexible plastic vaginal ring. It contains etonogestrel and estradiol. It's applied three weeks and then you take it one week off. The cons about this one is that it has to be removed during intercourse, but it can be replaced within three hours. These patients can also have withdrawal bleeding. So. If it's a woman that does want something right, that does not have withdrawal bleeding, then we might not want to prescribe them NuvaRing because this one has withdrawal bleeding. And then we have natural family planning, like we discussed, like uh, make sure that the patient usually abstains from sex during fertile period. It's usually determined by their body temperature, cervical mucus, colander, and urine progestin test. This one is not very effective. We also have our spermicides, right? These destroy sperm. And it's usually often used with things like condoms, but with these patients, they have no risk. They're at risk for STDs, especially like HIV, right? Um, for spermicide, especially if they only use spermicide. And then uh, we have our male condoms, right? Our female condoms, our diaphragms, our feminine caps, contraceptives, sponges. These are polyurethrin sponges that have nanoxinol 9. Um, the only thing about this one is that it's controversial whether it protects you against STIs. Um, and it's important that the, the patient inserts this, right, a few hours before they have sexual intercourse. And it has to be placed, left in place for at least six hours, but no longer than 24 hours. So these women are at risk for increased toxic shock syndrome if they leave it in there for a very long time. And then you have your emergency contraception, right, plan B. As levonogestrel, the good thing about this one is that they only take it for one dose. And it's beneficial only if it's taken within 72 hours. So make sure that you know that. It's only taken, it's only effective if it's taken before, um, within 72 hours of unprotected sexual intercourse. And it's effective the quicker the patient takes it. So if they take it like within an hour that they had some unprotected sexual intercourse, they have a higher effectivity rate. So it's effective, once again, the faster the patient takes it and only within 72 hours after 72 hours it's not as effective uh, some of the cons for this one is that sometimes it won't work of course if the patient is already pregnant and it can also mess up a patient's um period iud's so we have marina right we have paragard and we have um <clears throat> our copper so 
well, Paragard, which is a copper. So Marina is going to be levonorgestrel. This one has a five year of duration. It's the most effective form of contraception besides sterility and abstinence. And some of the cons for this one is going to be placement and removal of, of it, right? It has similar progestion side effects that we discussed. The patients at increased risk of PID. And then we have Paragard, a copper. This one has 10 years duration of action, although I've heard some podcasts that say that it can actually protect you, protect you up to 12 years. Side effect for this one's gonna be, or a con, that the patient has increased risk of pelvic inflammatory disease. So if a patient's looking for something like, you know, long-standing, they don't wanna make sure that they're taking pills every day, then you can do something like uh, Marina, right? This one's five years, or Paragard, which is 10 years. Another thing is that Paragard can actually be used as an emergency contraceptive, which is really interesting. The mechanism of action of how it works, they don't know of how it works as an emergency contraceptive, but in general, right? Copper, what it does, it, it creates this environment in the vaginal area that does not make it suitable for sperm. So that's why we would use this. And of course, copper, right? We don't use it in patients that have like hemochromatosis, right? So it's contraindicated in these patients. Or just in general for IUDs, any patient that has like a uterine abnormality, if they have fibroids, right? Then it's contraindicated in these patients because they are at risk for perforation. And just one of the risk factors for an IUD is that you can perforate the uterus, but it's not very common. It has very, very low risk of perforating. So just make sure that you know that, right? Paragard, like we said, 10 years, up to 12 years. Um, we said that Marina can protect you up to five years. And with these patients, we want to avoid them in any patient that has um, pelvic inflammatory disease, right? A QPID. Also, if a patient has fibroids or any type of abnormality of the uterus that can increase the risk of perforation. All right, sterilization is another thing that can prevent pregnancy, but this is going to be usually going to be, um, it's usually going to be permanent. So it's really important that the patient makes sure that, that they know that this is going to be permanent. So you can do something like white, um, Bilateral tubal ligation, this is going to be permanent, like we just said, we said. Some of the cons, though, is that it's difficult to reverse. I mean, you can go in there and reverse it, but it's very difficult, and the patient has to go into surgery, so it's more invasive, and the patient is at risk of ectopic pregnancy. You can also do Escher, like chemicals or coils, scar portion of the fallopian tubes. And the thing about this one of an Escher is that it can be done in an office procedure, but it's very difficult to reverse, right? So that's why we said these are permanent and the patient has an increased risk of ectopic pregnancy. And then, of course, the male can also get um, also a permanency procedure, right? Vasectomy. And this is usually an, an office procedure. It's not as invasive either. So that's another thing also to take into consideration when you are talking to a patient with the partners, right? So once again, right, just going all over these, right, um, oral contraceptives, you want to make sure that we avoid them in patients that are older than 35 or combined oral contraceptives, especially if they're smokers or if they have any history of migraine with aura is another one that they really like to test. You want to make sure that we do not use these, especially if it's a patient older than 35, they have a migraine with aura or they're a smoker, we want to not use these. And the thing about oral contraceptives is that they're as effective as the patient it like, takes them, right? So if a patient is not taking them, they're not as effective. So it depends on the individual. Are they being compliant with the medications? Another thing they really like to ask is if a patient missed one dose of their prescription, say that like they forgot to take their Monday, Tuesday, can they take it? Yeah, that's fine. They can take their they can take their Monday and Tuesday oral contraceptives. What if they missed two days worth? Say they forgot Monday and Tuesday and it's Wednesday, like can they still take it? I mean they can but you have to educate them that they make sure that they use protection for the next seven days because they can actually become pregnant. So that's another way that they really like to ask these questions, right? And we said copper IUD can be used as an emergency um, contraception, especially if a woman, for example, had sex and it's been more than 72 hours of protected sex and they cannot do the plan B, then you can possibly consider something like a copper IUD. So copper IUD can be used as an emergency um, contraception. So make sure that you know that. We said that progestin-only pills, right? Those are used in your lactating patients, and that's usually what they are indicated for. So any woman that is lactating. And um, yeah, 
those are it. And we said oral contraceptives just increase your risk for DVTs, thromboembolisms, embolisms, right? But they are protective, so they can decrease your risk of <clears throat> certain cancers, like endometrial cancer, and they can also help with like painful menstruations. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So let's go into our pregnancy. So just in general, this is something that's on the blueprint. Um, so this is good because if you if you have your OB-GYN exam and you know this, then you'll do really well. So let's go into uncomplicated pregnancies just in regards to prenatal care, right? So goals of prenatal care is to ensure the mommy is healthy, right? Ensure that we deliver a healthy baby and to anticipate any problems and to diagnose any early problems. So just the terminology, gravity, gravidity, what is that? That's pregnant refers to the total number of pregnancies. Parity is the number of births, both before and after the 20 weeks of gestation. So it's comprised of full-term births, preterm births, that means that uh, there was birth to an infant, either alive or dead, that occurred at or beyond 20 weeks. It also includes abortion, so it's going to be pregnancies that ended before 20 weeks, and then living children. Full term, it's going to be a baby that's born between 37 and 40 weeks gestation. Preterm, it's going to be a baby that's born between 20 to 37 weeks gestation, and then abortion, it's going to be expulsion or extraction of part, whether it's complete or all complete of the placenta or membranes without an identified fetus or with a fetus, whether it's alive or deceased, before the age of 20 weeks, less than 20 weeks. All right, guys. So another thing that you need to know, it's going to be your last menstrual period, last um, normal menstrual period, right? Uh, this is going to help us estimate the date of confinement, right? which we'll discuss in a few mi minutes right now. So signs and symptoms for these patients. How is a patient going to present when they're pregnant? Amenorrhea, right? They're going to have no periods. They're usually caused by hormones that are produced by the corpus luteum. They're going to have nausea and vomit vomiting. The thing about nausea and vomiting is that hyperemesis gravidarum is a very extreme form of nausea and vomiting, and it can actually... Um, cause the woman to kind of become very severely dehydrated, lose weight, and have ketonuria. And hyperemesis gravidarum, we think about hyperemesis gravidarum in two states of pregnancy, right? We think about patients that have some type of molar pregnancy or in a patient that has multiple, um, for example, if they have twins, right? So hyperemesis gravidarum is very common in these two types of pregnancies, molar pregnancies, and then patients that just have multiple pregnancies, like they're, they have twins or triplets or quadruplets. Also, the patient's going to be presenting with uh, breast tenderness, right? Breast engorgement. Um, they can also have colostrum secretion, which is going to be protein and antibody production that can occur during pregnancy as early as 16 weeks gestation. They can also have quickening symptoms, right? This is usually like a perception of movement. It tends to occur between 18 to 20 weeks gestation in like new mommies and then early as 14 weeks in patients that have like or have had like multiple parodies, right? Multiple pregnancy. It's usually described like a butterfly like movement. Also, in regards to urinary tract infections, urinary tract, they can have increased basal body temperature because what happens is that progesterone will increase that temperature. Uh, for skin, they're going to have the cloasma, which is going to be that mask of pregnancy, right? Usually on the face, that increased pigmentation on the face. And usually this will go away once the patient has a baby. They can have that linea negra, which is going to be the what happens. Melanocytes stimulate hormone that increases uh, the darkening of the nipples and the lower midline from the... And it's usually found from the lower midline to the... From the umbilicus to the pubis. It's going to be from the umbilicus to the pubis. You're going to see that dark uh, line. Stry also, spider to langectasias. You can also see pelvic organ changes like your Chadwick sign, which is going to be a congestion of pelvic vasculature. You'll see this bluish discoloration of the vagina and cervix. You'll see a Hagar sign, which is a widening and softening of the body or isthmus of the uterus. It occurs at six to eight weeks menstrual age or gestational age. For the pelvic ligaments, you'll see relaxation of the sacroiliac and pubic symphysis during pregnancy. And then you'll see the Goodell sign, which is going to be a softening of the cervix. 
uh, they'll have a positive HCG, Braxton's Hicks, which is usually uh, painless uterine contractions that are felt as tightening. They are not associated with cervical dilation or that the woman's going into labor. This is very commonly found during, um, and it starts at 28 weeks gestation. So just make sure that you know that. Uh, this is something that they really like to test the difference between your quickening and your your Braxton Hicks, right? So quickening is usually that fetal movement between 18 to 20 weeks versus like your Braxton Hicks, that's usually gonna be your uterine contractions at 20, starting at 28 weeks gestation. And these go away with walking or exercise, whereas like the true labor contractions will not go away with walking or exercise. Another thing, abdominal enlargement, right? From 18 to 34 weeks, um, usually you can measure between the uterine fundal measurement in centimeters and it'll tell you how many weeks along the mommy is in. And then you can also hear uh, fetal heart tones. You'll see, you'll have palpable fetal movement. And in regards to calculating the gestation, right? Gestational age and estimating the date of confinement delivery, we're gonna do Nagel's rule. rule Nagel's rule. So what happens with Nagel's rule is that you ask the mommy, when did they have their last normal menstrual period? And then you subtract three months from that. And then you add seven days to the first day of the last normal period menstrual period. So once again, last normal menstrual period, you subtract three months, you add seven days to that, and you add one year also. So on your initial office visit, we want to make sure that we identify all risk factors that involve the mommy and the fetus. And we want to make sure that we confirm the pregnancy. So on physical exam, um, usually for these patients, we're going to do a physical exam, right? What we're going to see is that we can see in these patients uh, elevation of the diaphragm. Usually this is gonna be found late in pregnancy. We're gonna see a soft systolic murmur that's gonna be, and this is usually due to increased cardiac output, right? And then you're gonna see it here in S2, which is gonna be loud. For the breast and the abdomen, you can hear fetal heart tones at 14 weeks using a Doppler, and the uterus is gonna grow out, out of the pelvis at 12 weeks. For the cervix, you're gonna see the signs that we discussed, right? The Goodell, cell, Good, Goodell sign, the Chadwick sign. Vital signs, the patient's gonna be hypotensive, but they're gonna be tachycardic. For the skin, we're gonna see the striae, right? The, melas the plasma. Uterus, we're gonna see an enlarged uterus or our bimanual exam. For the vulva and the perineum, we're gonna see hyperpigmentation, varicose veins, hemorrhoids. Um, Vagina, you're going to see increased secretions, um, and usually red flags would be something like trichomoniasis or BV, those are abnormal, right? We want to make sure that we're checking the patient's weight, blood pressure, urine, labs, and ultrasound. And then there's different tests that we need to do depending on what trimester the patient's in. So just to go real quick through that, right? First trimester is usually going to be week 1 through 12. For these patients, we're going to do the maternal blood screening test. Um, the Down syndrome screening can be performed by doing the pre-beta HCG, which is abnormally high or low, then they can tell us that there's some type of abnormality going on. We can also do the nuchal translucency. This is usually an ultrasound that's done at 10 to 3 weeks. Usually if there's increased thickness that we see on this nuchal translucency, we're thinking that this is something like abnormal. If the uterine size and gestation is abnormal, then we can do something like chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis, and this is usually offered at 10 to 13 weeks. It's really important that we do this at 10 to 13 weeks, the CVS, the chorionic villus sampling, because if it's done at, in a patient that's less than 10 weeks, it has a lot of risk factors, and like um, loss of limbs in a baby is actually one of the risk factors for that. Ultrasound, we do that. Fetal heart tones are usually heard around 10 to 12 weeks by Doppler. And the heartbeat is usually heard at five to six weeks um, using an ultrasound of the fetus. So like we said, chorionic valus sampling, sampling, right? It's usually offered with to patients that have a child with chromosomal abnormalities. So for example, if it's a woman and she has a child that has Down syndrome, you can offer them this. Um, also in women that are older than 35 years old, so if they have advanced maternal age, if they have an abnormal abnormal first or second trimester maternal screening test, abnormal ultrasound, or if they had a prior pregnancy loss, we can offer them something like a chorionic villus sampling. And like we said, the disadvantage of this one is that they have an increased risk of a 
spontaneous abortion, it's very invasive. But the advantage is that it's like the, it helps the patient um, choose whether they want to terminate the baby or not, if there's any abnormalities that are found with these patients. So in initial tri first trimester test, what we want to do is we want to do a CBC, right? Check the hemoglobin, hematocrit platelets. We want to check for the ABO and RH, see if the mom is like maybe like RH negative, right? We want to screen for antibodies against blood group antigens. We want to do the VDRL or RPR for syphilis. We want to do a hepatitis B test also. And antibodies to rubella and HIV is another thing that we want to do also. For genetic screening and testing, we can screen for trisomy 21, 18, and 12 using a serum alpha fetal protein, free and total beta HCG, hemoglobin electrophoresis to look for any type of hemoglobin or globinopathy, like sickle cell risk, right? The more invasive ones are going to be chorionic villus sampling. We said at 10 to 13 weeks, we try to avoid it at less than 10 weeks. And then you can also do amniocentesis at 15 to 20 weeks. Another thing we can do is urine analysis and culture perform. We wanna make sure that we're looking for the UTIs, right? Um, we can also do a pap smear. Usually cervical cancer screening is done unless there's been a normal exam within the last year. We also test for TB, so PPD, also in your higher risk patients. We check for STDs. And if the patient does have STDs for syphilis, right, we treat them with penicillin, chlamydia, azithromycin, gonorrhea. It's really important that we check for gonorrhea, herpes simplex virus, HIV, trichomonas, candidiasis, and then BV, right? And then second trimester test. So this is going to be between weeks 13 to 27. This is going to be your quad screen. This is going to be for patients who desire annual ploidy assessment who did not receive first trimester screening. Then you can offer the second trimester screening usually with these patients uh, between the weeks of 15 to 20 weeks. But it's usually done at 16 to 18 to check for any neural tip defects and aneuploidy. It looks at the serum beta HCG, unconjugated estrogen, alpha fetal protein, and inhibin. You can also do triple screening. This is usually measured at 15 to 20 weeks, and it checks for alpha fetal protein, beta HCG, and estradiol. Another test that we do for these patients is going to be gestational diabetes, right? This is actually one of the big ones that they like to test. I don't remember if it was this one or your ob -Gen. I definitely had this on the pants is when do you do gestational diabetes testing? It's going to be at 24 to 28 weeks, right? 24 to 28 weeks. All right, so then we have our third trimester tests, right? It's going to be from week 28 until birth. Um, we do the gestational diabetes, right? We said 24 to 28 weeks for these patients. We do a CBC test, um, look at their hemoglobin and hematocrit. We do a group B strep also. Why? Because this is the number one cause of sepsis in baby. And so this is very, very preventable. It's very easy to treat. And we usually do this at 32 to 37 weeks um, via a vaginal and rectal culture for these patients. We also repeat antibody titers, especially in your unsensitized arch negative moms, followed by rogum at 28 weeks and within 72 hours after childbirth. We also do the biophysical profile what is a biophysical profile? It looks at five variables, including fetal breathing, fetal heart tones, amniotic fluid levels, NST, and gross fetal movements. And each one gets two points. We can also do a non-stress test. Usually the best baseline fetal heart rate is between 100 to, I'm sorry, 120 to 160 beats per minute with these patients. So what are some of the subsequent visits or the frequency of visits on these patients? So usually on patients that are uncomplicated, right? Because the office visit is gonna depend on the patient, right? The gestational age, maternal condition. Is a mom older? Like, are they advanced maternal age? Are they older than 35, 40s? It depends on the patient. But in general, for uncomplicated patients, it's gonna be every four weeks from zero to 32 weeks, and then every two weeks from 32 to 36 weeks, and then every week after 36 weeks. It's important on these visits that we check the patient's weight because for a, a weight gain that is expected in a patient that has a singleton pregnancy is going to be between 25 to 35 pounds, okay? And usually it's going to be 0 0.5 pounds per week increase for the first 28 weeks and then one pound per week until delivery after the 28 weeks. We want to make sure that we're checking their blood pressure, right? Also, their urine to look for any protein, glucose, and ketones. If we see any protein, like 2-plus protein, then 
you know, we might think about maybe preeclampsia. If we see any glucose, we think about gestational diabetes. We want to do also a fundal height, right? Fetal heart tones, usually we auscultate them by 10 to 12 weeks gestation using a handheld Doppler. We see the fetal heart tone that is normal is between 120 to 160. And <clears throat> with these patients, um, make sure that we are educating them on, on the importance of nutrition in the pregnancy, right? Make sure that they're getting their vitamins, their minerals, they're decreasing their salt, protein, their iron, and just educating them on preparing for labor. Educating them on exercise, right? They can do moderate to intensity exercise about 30 minutes a day. Make sure that the patient's avoiding their drugs, alcohol, and nicotine. Also, tell them to avoid douching and make sure that they're taking care of their teeth. Um, um, and usually swimming is not in quant contraindicating for these patients, but we just want to make sure that for them to make sure that they're healthy. They're careful, especially if they're in their third trimester because they're at increased risk of falling. And then also looking for any of the complications, right? Preeclampsia, right? Preeclampsia can develop into eclampsia, and then it can cause HELP syndrome, which is like the really, really bad one. All right, so now that we discuss a normal pregnancy, let's go into an abnormal pregnancy. So let's go into our abortion. So an abortion is defined as a termination of pregnancy before the 20 weeks gestational age, and it's most commonly found during the first seven weeks. And it can either be spontaneous or induced by medical or surgical means. Usually the frequency of abortions tend to increase with maternal age. The majority of them increase occur during the first trimester, right? And usually if they occur in the first trimester, which is the most common one, right? The most common cause of a first trimester uh, abortion is gonna be chromosomal. So make sure that you know that I've had questions on that. So most common cause of a pregnancy loss or an abortion in first trimester is gonna be chromosomal. So we're thinking about our trisomies, right? Our polyploidy or monosomies. For second trimester, it can be an abnormal karyotype. There's also factors in the mom like that can cause an abortion, like if they have incompat incompatibilities like ABO or RH negative, right, or antibodies, if they drink, smoke, the history of radiation, um, also if they have any type of maternal infection, malnutrition, uh, immunologic, like for example, antiphospholipid syndrome, that's actually one of the most common causes of abortion in women that have these hypercoagulative disorders. Physical trauma also, Urine abnormalities like cervical incompetence where the baby just falls out because that cervix is not like hard enough to hold that baby. But like for uterine abnormalities, like the, the most common cause is usually a uh, uterine abnormality like a septate uterus. So now that we've gone through all these, why don't we go into just the types of abortions that exist, right? So when we think about our abortions, we think about threatened, inevitable, incomplete, complete, and septic. So with threatened, it's gonna, the patient's gonna be presenting with abdominal pain or bleeding in the first 20 weeks of gestation. The cervical os is going to be closed and there's no, going, no passage of fetal tissue in these patients. For inevitable, right, the patient's gonna have abdominal pain or bleeding in the first 20 weeks of gestation. The cervical os is going to be open and the patient is gonna have no passage of fetal tissue. For incomplete spontaneous abortion, the patient is going to have abdominal pain or bleeding in the first 20 weeks of gestation, and the cervical os is going to be open, but you are going to see passage of fetal tissue. You'll see some products of con conception that still remain in the uterus. Complete, it's going to be abdominal pain or bleeding in the first 20 weeks of gestation. The cervical os is going to be closed. And in complete, you're gonna see it's complete passage of fetal parts and placenta and the uterus is going to be contracted. For septic abortions, you're gonna see infection of the uterus during miscarriage. The patient's gonna be presenting with fever and chills, uh, usually due to staph aureus. The patient's cer cervical os is going to be open with purulent cervical discharge, uterine tenderness. And sometimes for passage of fetal, there, there, be, there may be none, or sometimes there is incomplete passage of fetal tissue. How I memorize it is that you need to pay attention to the cervical os, right, whether it's open or closed, and whether there's passage of fetal tissue. For how I memorize it is that eyes open, 
right? Your eyes open. Anything that starts with I, like your incomplete, inevitable, the cervical os is going to be open. Completed and incomplete are going to have usually your passage of fetal tissue present. So, <clears throat> with these patients, how are we going to treat each one, right? So, with threatened, usually it's a supportive, right? Threatened abortion, just tell the patient to rest at home. They can go to the ER if symptoms start getting worse. Um, usually, we do a serial beta HCG to just make sure that it's like not abnormal, and then ROGAM if indicated with these patients. But usually the principal management, right, like we said, is going to be pelvic rest with close follow-up for observation. So threatened, it's going to be observation. For inevitable, these patients usually need a dilation and evacuation if they're in the second semester, trimester, <laughs> semester, trimester, and then suction curative in the first trimester, ROGAM if indicated also. Usually we can also do a DC and DE. Um, usually a DE, so dilation and evacuation, is preferred over a D and C. So just make sure that you know that. For incomplete, usually with these patients, you can do a D and E, so dilation and evacuation, after the first trimester. And then we said D and C, right, in the first trimester with these patients. It's usually medical management. And then for a complete, for a complete abortion, Usually for these patients, we monitor bleeding. If bleeding is, is minimal or absent, we really don't need to do any further treatment for these patients. And if it's septic, remember that we said with septic, these patients have, are gonna have that foul brownish discharge, fever, chills, uterine tenderness. Um, whenever I've, heard, I've read question stems about septic, it's gonna be a patient that went somewhere with a medical, with a, uh, an individual that does abortions, but they are not medically cer certified, right? And so they try to induce this abortion, they do not ex succeed, and now the patient is septic. And treatment for this and diagnosis, we wanna make sure that we obtain a CBC, UA, endocervical culture, blood cultures, and abdominal x-ray, just to make sure that there is no type of uterine perforation. We do an ultrasound to look for any type of retained products of conception. And we can do a dilation and evacuation or a DNC plus broad spectrum antibiotics and IV fluids. And then usually these patients also get hospitalized because these patients can become um, septic, right? They can have bacteremia. Um, they can develop peritonitis. So it's really important with all these patients that we do that. Okay, the other one I wanted to discuss was just a missed abortion. So with a missed abortion, what happens is that the patient has, that there's fetal demise, but they're still retained in the uterus. So with a patient with a missed abortion, they're not going to have any bleeding. It's going to be a non-viable pregnancy, no cervical dilation, and treatment, and the cervical os is going to be closed, like we said. No product of conception is going to be seen. And usually with these patients, it is just, um, we do a scheduled dilation and curatage, right? Um, and we can follow up with them outpatient. So you can offer them outpatient follow-up for your missed, or you, and you can also schedule a, a DNC. All right, so the next one I want to go over is recurrent abortion. So this is going to be a patient that has had three successive abortions. So they've had three continuous abortions. And with these patients, we want to think about, you know, maybe something is causing the pregnancy. Do they have something like um, hyper um, antiphospholipid syndrome, right? Anything that causes hy hypercoagulation that is causing them to become, have these multiple pregnancy losses. Also, we think about lupus, right, in these women. So we want to make sure that we test them. We do a TSH. We do a hysteroscopy so look in there, right? Look at the ovaries just to make sure that everything's normal and there's nothing abnormal. We can do a parental karyotype endometrial biopsy just to make sure that endometrium is working fine, right? There's not any type of abnormality. Antiphospholipid antibodies, like we said, lupus anticoagulant or and or cardiolipin um, antibodies. And treatment for this is just supplemental progesterone for luteal phase effect because how I think about the hormones is that progesterone is progestation, right? So it helps with the pregnancy. Surgery also to correct any type of uterine abnormalities. Does the patient possibly have endometriosis? Does the patient have maybe fibroids? We can also treat the couple empirically with doxycycline. If the patient has antiphospholipid syndrome, we can put them on aspirin or heparin, right? 
So these are some of the things that we can do for these patients. All right, guys. So now that we've gone into that, let's go into pelvic or organ prolapse. So this is going to be your um, cystocele and rectocele. So <clears throat> the pelvic support defects can be classified according to where they're located. Are they anterior? Are they posterior? Etc. So anterior wall defects, vaginal wall defects, we think about anterior vaginal wall prolapse described as an anterior vaginal wall defect in which the bladder is associated with the prolapse. It's also known as a cystocele. A cystocele is going to be that posterior bladder that's herniated into the anterior vagina. So when we think about anatomy, right, that makes sense why this would be an anterior vaginal wall prolapse. Now, when we think about an apical prolapse, this is usually going to be a uterine prolapse. This is where the uterus herniates into the vagina. Some of the risk factors for this one is going to be weakness of the pelvic support structures, especially and most commonly found in women that have had multiple childbirths, especially if those childbirths were traumatic. Um, increased pelvic floor pressure, uh, obesity, repeated uh, heavy lifting are some of the examples of this. And... <clears throat> Usually for these patients, right, also very commonly found in your post-hysterectomy. We also have intro seals. This is usually an apical vaginal wall defect that is found where the bowel is contained within the prolapse segment. It usually occurs status post-hysterectomy. And usually in seal, what it happens is that you have the pouch of Douglas, which is a small bowel. It herniates into the upper vagina. And then you have a posterior vaginal prolapse. So this is known as a rectal seal, right? This is going to be the distal sigmoid colon rectum. It herniates into the posterior distal vagina. So like we said, we think of anatomy, right? We have our bladder, which is going to be anteriorly to the uterus. We have our uterus, and then we have our rectum. So if you think about it, right, anterior prolapse, it's going to be the bladder prolapsing. And then we have the uterus, which is going to be in the middle. And then we have our rectum, which is going to be in the back. So <clears throat> now that we've gone through this one, let's go into each stage. So you can actually stage the pelvic organ prolapse. So it's either grade one, two, three, or four. So grade one is where it descends into the upper two thirds of the vagina. Grade two is where the cervix um, approaches the introitus. introtitis. Uh, grade three is gonna be outside of the introitus, and grade four is gonna be where the entire uterus is outside of the vagina. So basically there's a complete prolapse. And how is this patient going to present with a pelvic organ prolapse? So this patient is going to present with the following symptoms. They're going to have sensation of vaginal fullness, pressure, heaviness. They're going to feel like something's falling out, but they are not going to have any pain. They're going to have a sensation of sitting on a ball, discomfort in the vaginal area. They can have vaginal bleeding, purulent discharge. They're going to have a presence of a soft reducible mass that's bulging into the vagina and descending through the vaginal enteritis. And whenever they strain or cough, there's going to be increase in that bulging and descent of the vaginal wall. They're going to be presenting a back pain and pelvic pain also. Usually when I think about back pain and pelvic pain, I think about rectal seals. Because when you think about the anatomy, right, rectal seal is going to be in the back. So back and pelvic pain, I think about usually your rectal seals. Now, these are just symptoms in general. Now, how is the patient going to present what symptoms, depending on what prolapse they have? So if they have an anterior prolapse, vaginal prolapse, we're thinking about bladder, right, or cystoceles, these patients are usually going to present with urinary symptoms, which makes sense, right, because you have the urinary bladder, like, anteriorly. So they're going to have a feeling of incomplete bladder emptying, emptying stress incontinence, urinary frequency, hesitancy, needing to push the bladder up in order to avoid. And usually with these patients, um, they tend to have an increased risk of UTI. So they have very increased frequency of UTIs. Now, a posterior vaginal prolapse, these patients are going to have defecatory symptoms, right? Because we're thinking about the rectum. So they're going to have a sense of incomplete emptying, need to strain, or manually, manually splint the vagina or on the perineal body in order to defecate. So to go number two, they're going to have low back pain, dyspareunia, which is going to be that painful pain during sexual intercourse, or even fecal gas, fecal and gas incontinence can be reported. So, with these patients, what are you going to see on your exam, right? 
So usually you're going to see a mass which appears when the patient is straining and disappears whenever the patient is lying down, right? And usually for a vaginal prolapse, you're going to see a smooth bulging mass. Uh, the vaginal rugae is usually absent. And what's going to be our diagnostics for these patients? So we can do an ultrasound, MRI or CT, and IV pyelogram. These are usually all available options. We can also do an MRI. It's usually a clinical diagnosis. I've also heard about the Q-tip test, right, which is really interesting. So treatment for these patients, it's always going to be with your Kegel exercises. They really like to test that. So Kegel exercises, which makes sense, right, because you're having basically that wall is not strong like it used to be so it's weak so kegel exercise is going to be the best one and also weight control prevention is always the key for these patients so for anterior prolapse right with these patients um like i said utis can develop so just make sure that we are treating the utis and also we can do a pissari, right? A pissari is a soft, flexible device that's placed in the vagina. It's gonna help support the vagina, bladder, uterus, and or rectum. And they're, they're made in different shapes and sizes. It's non-surgical, so it's not invasive. So that's why a pissari is the best one. So first line is gonna be your Kegel exercises, right? Weight loss. Second line is gonna be your pissaris. And then you can also do estrogens for these patients. Um, it actually works best in conjunction with Kegel exercises. It helps with that atrophy. And then your last, last line is going to be a surgical measure. So like something like a hysterectomy, right, with these patients. Um, because a hysterectomy is just going to be like your definitive treatment with a hysterectomy, right? So say the patient has tried your Kegel exercises, you're doing a Pissari, or it's just so bad where they just cannot go on with life, or it's affecting their daily life, then you can do something like a hysterectomy. All right, guys, so now that we've gone into that, um, now, real quick, sorry, before I keep going, surgical therapy is going to ba be based, right, of course, on the location of the prolapse. So, for example, if it's anterior, we're thinking about our um, cystoceles, then you would do an anterior copography, right, which makes sense. It's going to reinforce and repair that vesicle vaginal tissue. If it's posterior, we're thinking about rectal seals, then you're going to do a posterior copography which is gonna be repairing that rectovaginal septum. I just wanted to go into that because sometimes it won't say surgery, it'll say anterior posterior. So depending on the question stem, are they having urinary symptoms? Can you see like the cervix coming out, right? Then you're thinking about cervix coming out, you're thinking about uh, uterine prolapse. If they're having urinary symptoms, you're thinking about a cystocele. If they're having that back pain, that lower back pain, um, or that pelvic pain, or they have trouble going to the restroom, then you're thinking about rectal seal, right? And so with these patients, definitive treatment, it's going to be whether what location it's in, posterior copography, it's going to be your rectal seals, we think about the anatomy, anterior copography, it's going to be your cystoceles, right? But usually first line is going to be your Kegel exercises, you can also give them estrogen, and then after that, second line is going to be your pessaries, and then surgery, which we just, just discussed, is going to be the last line. So let's go into our next one, which is going to be vaginitis, right? So there's a lot of things that fall under the umbrella of vaginitis. So we'll go into each one, but in general, vaginitis. So like we said, vulva vaginitis is a spectrum of condition that involves vaginal or vulva symptoms like itching, burning, irritation, and abdominal discharge. It can be infective or non-infective, right? And with these patients, um, depending on what the cause is, is depending on how we're going to treat it. One thing that we need to know is that vaginal secretions are normal, right? It's necessary. I was listening to a podcast the other day. It's really interesting how an ob doctor called it. She said that the vagina is just like a self-clean. It cleans itself. You don't need to do anything to help it clean. So that's why it's really important that with these patients, we tell them to avoid douching, right? Avoiding any type of those fragrance soaps um, to that they rub in that area because it can actually further worsen or make them more predisposed to like infections like BV, right? Or vaginitis, things like this. Um, another thing is that they can just clean themselves with water, right? Water, that's all really you need. And <clears throat> another thing that we need to know is that um, the pH of the normal vagina is between 3.5 to 4.5, right? So it's usually acidic. 
and it's usually maintained by the production of lactic acid. And whenever you have a patient that comes in with vaginitis, there's several things that we want to order, right? Or pH, just to make sure that that vaginal pH is normal. Because if it's abnormal, if it's increased, we're thinking about, you know, if it's greater than 4.5, um, we're thinking about maybe like a BV, trick, trichomoniasis. Another thing that we want to do is an amine odor with addition of KOH, right? That can tell us whether it's BV, microscopy, and culture just to look for like STDs. So let's start into each one. So atrophic vaginitis. This is going to be a chronic progressive condition, and it's very commonly found in your postmenopausal woman. It develops slowly over five to 10 years, and it's usually due to estrogen deficiency. On exam, you're going to see the vaginal epithelium that's going to be pale, thin, shiny, and shrunken. Okay. But the thing about atrophic vaginitis is that can also occur with allergic reactions, but in general, it's very commonly found in your postmenopausal woman. Some of the signs are going to be labial atrophy, epithelial thinning, loss of rugae, pale, dry appearance of the vagina, semicosal petechial hemorrhages, fornices, obliteration, right? On lab findings, you're going to see a negative whiff test because it's not bacterial. You're going to have a pH that's going to be greater than 4.5. And if you do microscopy, you're going to see decreased lactobacilli, scant fluoride also. Management for this is usually going to be vaginal estrogens. Remember, we try to avoid oral, anything that's oral, especially since most of these women are postmenopausal. So you can do vaginal estrogen creams, vaginal rings. Um, and usually what happens with these vaginal estrogens, what do they do? They just reverse those trophic changes with these patients. You can also do ospemethine, os which is a serum, right? It's an estrogen agonist in the vagina and bone, and it's an estrogen antagonist at the breast and uterus. So it's great, right? Because it antagonizes estrogen where it shouldn't, which is in the uterus, but it agonizes and helps with estrogen in like areas that we want it to do. So things like the vagina and the bone. Uh, we can also do vaginal moisturizers, right? But the thing about vaginal moisturizer is that it happens, it, it causes symptomatic treatment, but it does not treat the cause of it, right? So it has no effect on the atrophy. So the next one we're going to go into is that infectious vaginitis, right? So when we think about infectious vaginitis, we think about BV, trigmonis, candidiasis, right? So let's go into each one. So let's go into vulval vaginal candidiasis. This is due to a fungal infection called candida albicans. That's actually the most common one. And these are not sexually transmitted. That's something that we need to know is that they are not sexually transmitted. So what happens is that there's candida albicans overgrowth, right? Usually it's part of the normal flora, but sometimes if there's changes in the vaginal pH, right, the vaginal environment, especially like when a patient takes antibiotics and they're prone to getting this overgrowth of the candida albicans. Some of the risk factors for this is going to be patients that are pregnant, obese, if they're diabetic, if they're immunosuppressed, if they're on oral contraceptives, corticosteroids, um, antibiotic use also. Also, if they use a lot of panty liners or underwear without cotton, they're more prone to getting these fungal infections. So how is the patient going to present? They're going to have dyspareunia. It's going to be that painful sexual intercourse, vaginal itching. It's going to be very, very itching and itchy. That's how you can kind of differentiate between the other ones is that this one is predominantly very itchy. Vaginal discharge burning is another one that's very commonly associated with this one in comparison to the other ones. Um, they'll have also external dysuria, which is just burning whenever the urine touches the skin. So on exam, you're going to see just the vulva and vaginal tissues that are bred. They're going to be angry, right? They're, you're going to see excoriations. They're going to be this thick, odorless cottage cheese discharge. They're going to see erythema to the vulva. And also, you might see these satellite lesions. The thing about this one is that the whip test is going to be negative. Diagnosis for this, usually it's a clinical diagnosis just by visualization, right? You can do a yeast culture, which is going to be positive. And then on KOH prep, you're going to see hi-fi, yeast, and spores. The pH is usually going to be normal for these patients. So it's going to be less than 4.5 or 4.0 to 4.5. And that's how you can differentiate between the other ones also is that for like BV and TRIC, the pH is usually higher. For candidiasis, the pH is going to be less, right? It's going to be less than 4.5. 
Uh, treatment for these patients is usually going to be with either fluconazole, which is usually just give one dose, or you can do intravaginal antifungals like myconazole, right? Myconazole cream for three days or nice statin. So prevention for this one is to make sure that you educate the woman to keep the vagina dry, right? Uh, make sure that they're wearing cotton underwear and avoid any type of tight-fitting clothes, avoid any type of feminine deodorants, and bubble baths. Now, if a patient has like repeated episodes, like more than four episodes a year, then we think about maybe, you know, they have an underlying disorder like diabetes. So just make sure that we further trust test these patients. So next one's going to be bacterial vaginosis. This one is due to an alteration of the normal bacterial flora that causes an inflammation. It's the most common form of vaginitis, and the most common anaerobe or bacteria you're going to see is going to be your gardener, garden, gardenella vaginitis. It's associated with increased risk of PID also, and also with chorioamnionitis. So it's really important that in pregnant patients we treat this because it can go in there and infect right um, the amniotic fluid where the baby's living in. So what is going to be the pathogenesis? Usually the patient has decreased lactobacilli acidophilus, which usually normalizes the vaginal pH, right? So what happens is that since you have decreased lactobacilli, you have this overgrowth of normal flora. And how is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with thin and off-white discharge. It's usually going to be fishy and the vaginal order is gonna be worse after sex. And how are we gonna diagnose this? We usually do the AMSOLS criteria, right? Where the patient has to have three of the four criteria in order to be diagnosed. So these are the criteria. The first one's gonna be vaginal secretions that are gray and thin. They coat the vaginal walls. The pH of the secretions have to be greater than 4.5. So usually between 4.5 and 5.7. The next one's going to be a microscopy of the vaginal secretions are going to be, reveal an increased number of clue cells. That's usually like pathognomonic for this. It's going to be your clue cells. Another way I've seen it asked and how I, I saw it on like pants practice questions, which I thought was interesting, and this was through the NCCPA, is that they had um, bacteria that was coated with epithelial cells. So it won't say clue cells. Sometimes it'll say epithelial cells that are covered with bacteria or coated bacteria. Then you're thinking about your clue cells, right? You're thinking about BV. You'll see few white blood cells, few lactobacilli. The other and last AMSO criteria is going to be the addition of KOH to the vaginal secretions causes a whiff test, right? It's a positive whiff test. It releases this fishy amine like odor. So the patient has to have three out of these four criteria, according to the AMSO criteria, to be positive for bacterial vaginosis. So management for this is usually going to be with metronidazole for seven days. Okay, so just make sure that you know that. And prevention, educate the patient on avoid douching, right? Um, and usually this is not sexually transmitted. So once again, not an SCD. The woman, the partner does not need to be treated. The next one's going to be trichomonas vaginitis. So this one is a sexually transmitted disease. This patient's going to be presenting with that copious frothy discharge with a musty odor and itching, and it's worse with menses. The patient's getting presenting with vulvar pruritus and erythema, abdominal pain, painful urination, and painful sexual um, intercourse also. On physical exam, you're going to see that purulent green frothy discharge, and you'll see this punctate erythema vagina or this strawberry cervix or cervical petechiae. Usually, the WEF test is going to be positive. So... Diagnostic findings, the pH is usually going to be high on this one, right? It's going to be usually greater than 5.0 for these patients. On these patients, you want to make sure that you do a microscopy of the protozoas that you're going to see on there because this is usually a parasitic infection, which is really gross, right? So you're going to see this modile pear-shaped flagellated protozoas, trichomonas. What are the trichomonas you're going to see? And there's going to be increased number of leukocytes. So microscopic testing is the best test, and it's the most conclusive and sensitive. I took a parasitology class and we saw these under the microscope and they're beautiful guys. They look like kites to me. They look like kites. It's like this and they have even like a little flagella that helps them to. So I thought they were really, really cute. Um, treatment for this is usually going to be metroditisol, right? It's usually preferred to do the one dose. So you can do two grams um, orally for one dose or 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Okay.
and make sure that we are treating the sexual partner because this is a sexually transmitted disease. All right, there's also cytolytic vaginitis. This is where there's overgrowth of lactobacilli. The patient's gonna be presenting with vaginal or vulval pruritus and burning. They're gonna have painful urination, also vaginal discharge that's non-odorous and white to opaque in color. But the thing about this one is that the vaginal pH is going to be normal. In comparison to all the other ones, right, it's usually abnormal or high. We're gonna diagnose this. We're gonna see copious lactobacilli that's gonna be large in number, and you're gonna see a large number of epithelial cells. Management is just make sure that we tell them we can do sodium bicarb, right? Discontinue tampon use because this tampons tend to decrease vaginal acidity and sodium bicarb. So sit spats, right? With sodium bicarb. So now that we're done with these, let's go into our dysmenorrhea, which is gonna be painful menstruation. So there's three types. We have primary, secondary, and then we have membranous. So primary is where there's no cause of the dysmenorrhea. This one's gonna be very commonly found in your younger patients, right? Your teenagers. So there's no etiological cause or organic cause of the painful menstruation versus your secondary causes. Usually there is an underlying cause. This is usually older women, um, women that have a history of, for example, fibroids, um, endometriosis. So with Primary, the patient's going to be presenting with recurrent abdominal pain, um, crampy pain that occurs during menses. It's associated with anovulation, which is a failure to ovulate, right? And then we have secondary, which is usually due to endometriosis, adenomyosis, uh, fibroids like leomyomas, right? Adhesions, pelvic inflammatory disease. And it tends to occur in your older patients, like um, not your teenagers, but usually patients uh, after the age of 20. And usually the incidence is increase, especially if the woman's greater than 25. And then you have membranous. This is due to a cast of endometrial cavity shed as a single entity. This one's very, very rare with these patients. So what's a pathogenesis? For primary dysmenorrhea, there's an abnormal and increased prostanoid and possible elcosacinoid secretion, which in turn induces abnormal uterine contractions. These contractions decrease uterine blood flow, which causes uterine hypoxia. And usually this pain starts one to two years after the teenager has had their first menstrual period. Some of the risk factors in general for dysmenorrhea is going to be smoking, stress, um, and also what, re what reduces or what are their risk reductions for dysmenorrhea if the patients are on oral contraceptives like we discussed, right? If they have higher parities or multiple pregnancy, and um, if they were younger age at first childbirth. How's this patient going to present? They're gonna have abdominal pain, like we said, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and headache can occur also. Sometimes like teenagers will say that they have intractable pain that will interfere with their daily activity. So workup for these patients for primary dysmenorrhea, right? Since there's no organic cause, we're gonna do all these labs and everything's gonna be normal. Versus our secondary dysmenorrhea, we want to make sure that we look for underlying causes. So cervical infections, uterine infections, PID, we look for abnormalities of the reproductive tract, right? Endometriosis, like we said, leomyomas. And treatment for this is usually going to be NSAIDs. These are usually first line because they inhibit that prostaglandin, right? Because we are saying that usually for primary dysmenorrhea, it's going to be that prostaglandin that's causing that uterine activity that's causing this pain. So NSAIDs are usually first line for these patients. You can also do oral contraceptives. This is going to help with the ovulation suppression. Um, another thing that we can do is um, paric GnRH agonists like lupulide, right, or progestin therapy. This is usually going to be in a patient that has like persistent severe symptoms where like NSAIDs are not working. And then the last line is going to be like laparoscopy. If like all these medications have not worked, the patient does not want to have any um, babies anymore, right? And especially like if the patient has a history like PID or endometriosis, then we can do something like this. Also, adjuvant therapy, vitamin E and exercise you can tell the patient to do. But usually first line, right, it's going to be your NSAIDs, then second line is going to be oral contraceptives, and then third line is going to be your laparoscopy. That's when you're going to go in there and look for secondary causes like endometriosis, um, maybe some fibroids. So let's go into abnormal uterine bleeding. So abnormal uterine bleeding. 
With abnormal uterine bleeding, what happens is that there's an abnormal frequency or intensity of menses due to non-organic cause. So the patient that's coming in, their menses is just like all over the place, they're bleeding in between periods, they're having menstrual bleeding, and there is no organic cause. Like we cannot identify maybe fibroids are causing the heavy bleeding. There's no organic cause for this. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. And usually this patient will have a normal cycle, abnormal cycle, right? With these patients, they're going to be bleeding a lot. And this includes abnormal menstrual bleeding, right? Like we said, bleeding due to other causes. And we want to make sure that with these patients, we exclude everything, right? Make sure that they're not having maybe like some type of ectopic pregnancy. They're not pregnant. And another thing that they really like to test is on the patterns of abnormal uterine bleeding. So let's go into each one. Menorrhagia. This is hypermenorrhea. This is heavy or prolonged menstrual blood flows, right? With these patients, some of the causes of this can be complications of pregnancy, adenomyosis, IUDs, endometrial hyperplasia. And then we have hypomenorrhea. This is where the patient has very light menstrual flow, sometimes only spotting. And these, we're thinking about maybe patients on oral contraceptives can have this. Asherman syndrome, right? Which this is where there's scar tissue in the uterus. And obstruction like hymenal, hymenal or cervical stenosis can also cause this. Metrorhagia is the next one. This is going to be intramenstrual bleeding. The patient is bleeding that occurs at any time between menstrual periods. Polymenorrhea describes when periods occur too frequently. So they're, they're having multiple periods. The periods are occurring less than 21 days, right? And then the next one's going to be your menometrorrhagia. This is excessive bleeding that occurs at irregular intervals between expected menstrual cycles. We have oligomenorrhea. This describes menstrual periods that occur more than 35 days apart, but less than six months apart. So they're not menstruating frequently. It's taking them longer to menstruate. And then we have postcoital or contact bleeding. This is usually a red flag. This is usually a sign of cervical cancer. So we want to make sure that we work these patients up. But there's other causes, right, like cervical polyps, um, also sometimes cervical or vaginal infections like trichomonas or atrophic vaginitis in your older patients. But usually, this is a red sign. We want to work these up also for these patients. So some are, what are some of the causes of abnormal uterine bleeding? Chronic anovulation, right? Also, ovulatory changes with these patients. And how are we going to work these patients up? We want to make sure that we get a good history. We get a good exam, a cytological exam, and a pelvic ultrasound. We're going to do labs, CBC, beta HCG, and TSH because we want to rule out, right? The patient, first thing we want to rule out is that the patient is not pregnant. And that's what you should always do in all these patients that have like abnormal periods. Get a beta HCG, rule out that the patient is not pregnant. Also, you want to look for things like trophoblastic disease. You can also do a cytological exam right? Especially if you want to rule out any type of um, red flag that we had. A pelvic ultrasound also, endometrial biopsy, a hysteroscopy. This is actually the gold standard for these patients just to make sure that there's not any abnormality or pathology of the uterine cavity. And then um, we can do a DNC also. But this is usually a diagnosis of exclusion, right? We're excluding everything else. And workup is usually just like, once again, beta HCG, look at our hormone levels, do an ultrasound just to make sure that everything is normal in the uterus, the ovaries, everything's normal. And then a biopsy, if especially if it's a woman that has like an endometrial strep that's greater than four millimeters on a transvaginal ultrasound, or if the woman's older than 35 years old, just to make sure that we're ruling out any type of endometrial cancer. So what is the management for these patients? So it's either, the management is going to depend on whether the patient's having obvious hairy or and ovulatory cycles, right? So <clears throat> the treatment's gonna depend on that. And another thing is also how much is the patient bleeding? So if the patient has acute severe bleeding, then we're gonna do high dose IV estrogen or high dose oral contraceptives because this is going to decrease the bleeding, right? If the patient has on and ovulatory, right? The, the dysfunction of uterine bleeding is due to an ovulatory, then we can do something like prostate, um, progesterone alone or oral contraceptives. Usually oral contraceptives are going to be the first line for an ovulatory causes of um, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. We can also do GnRH agonists for an ovulatory causes like lupulide. For ovulatory causes, we can do oral contraceptives once again, GnRH agonists once again, and progesterone. 
And then surgery is going to be the last line if the patient is not responding to medical treatment. And hysterectomy is going to be the definitive treatment for these patients. All right, guys, so let's go into our next one, which is going to be our menorrhagia. So we said menorrhagia is defined as a heavy menstrual bleeding that occurs for more than seven days or results in a loss of greater than 80 milliliters of blood per menstrual cycle. So the management for these, these patients is that we want to make sure that we're controlling the symptoms, right? We're preventing the blood loss. We want to get a CBC in these patients just to make sure that they are not iron deficiency. We want to do an ultrasound to rule out, you know, fibroids, right? And usually you want to make sure that we control the symptoms, right? Hormonal contraception is usually the first line for menorrhagia. And in severe cases where the patient is just bleeding so much, like say that their uh, hemoglobin level is like, less than like nine, eight, or seven, like seven is like very severe, um, usually these patients need to be hospitalized, right? And we need to give them IV conjugated equine, IV conjugated estrogen, sorry, in doses of 25 milligrams every four to six hours until the bleeding stops for 24 hours. All right, so let's go into cervical carcinoma. So cervical cancer, Cervical cancer, um, they really like to test on this, on who, like when you start screening. So we'll probably go into this in a few minutes, okay? So cervical cancer is an abnormal growth of cells on the surface, cervix of, surface of the cervix. So abnormal growth of cells on the surface of the cervix. HPV is associated with these strains. You need to know this, this is very highly tested. So cervical cancer is due to HPV, human papillomaviruses, and there's different strains, right? We think about 6 and, six and 11, like HPV strain 6 and 11, causing like those warts that we see like on our hands um, and also genital warts, right? But the bad ones that are associated with cancer are going to be 16, 18, 31, 33. The commonly ones you're going to see tested is going to be 16 and 18, okay? The other one's just extra information. So this cervical cancer, it most commonly metastasizes locally. So it'll go to the vagina, the pelvic lymph nodes, and it occurs at the transformation zone, okay? It occurs at the transformation zone. It's something that, another thing that they like to test. What are some of the risk factors? So if the patient has HPV or a history of HPV, if they started having sexual activity early, if they have an increased number of partners, right? Smoking, um, if they have any type of cervical dysplasia or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, if they have DES exposure, that's a big one, if they're immunosuppressed, if they have a history of STIs, and also lower socioeconomic status. Why? Because usually these patients don't know about cervical cancer and don't really follow up with their primary care providers. Because in general, the most preventable cancers are going to be your colon cancer, like we discussed in the GI topic, and cervical cancer because these can be prevented by just being screened and following up with your doctor. So <clears throat> another thing is that usually women that have persistent HPV are the ones that are going to be at a higher risk for cervical cancer. And there's different types, right? The most common type is going to be your squamous um, cervical cancer. There's also adenocarcinoma. Usually adenocarcinoma, we think about patients that have a history of DES exposure. So DES exposure, we're thinking about adenocarcinoma, but the most common type in general is going to be your squamous cell carcinoma. How is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with postcoital bleeding and spotting. That's going to be the most common symptom. Metrorrhagia, pelvic pain, and watery vaginal discharge. In diagnosis, we're going to do a pap smear with cytology, right? That's what we're going to use to screen it. If the patient has abnormal cells, then we're going to do a colposcopy with a biopsy. We're going to look at and sample the transformation zone. With the colposcopy, what you do is that you apply acetic acid to the transformation zone, and usually if there's any abnormal cells, they tend to turn white, right? So a colposcopy with biopsy is gonna be the best test that's gonna confirm whether the patient has cancer or not, because it's gonna help you with the histologic evalu evaluation. Usually colonization is used only when results of the colposcopy are unsatisfactory, Right or endocervical curatage scrapings, scrapings indicate severe disease. And there's different stages. There's stage 0, 1A, um, <clears throat> 2B. So there's different stages. It just depends where it's located. So stage 0 is going to be usually carcinoma in situ. 
with these patients, it's just going to be local treatment like excision like with leap or cold knife conization. You can also do ablation. And then you have stage 1A. This is usually going to be microinvasion. So with these patients, usually the treatment is going to be surgery with colonization. You can also do a total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy. And then also uh, we do radiation therapy with these patients. Stage 2, it's usually going to be locally advanced. It extends locally beyond the cervix. While stage 3 involves lower one half of the vagina. And then stage 4A, it's already metastasized to the bladder and rectum. So stage 2B through stage um, your stage 4A, these patients need radiation therapy plus chemotherapy, usually with cisplatin and 5-FU. Um, stage 4B or recurrent usually is metastasized, right? So this is already metastasized. Usually these patients need palliative radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and surgery, but usually surgery is not going to be curative because it's metastasized everywhere. So another thing that we need to know is the dysplasia, right? Is it mild or moderate? If it's mild, usually these tend to go away by themselves and we can repeat a pap every six months. If it's moderate, it's gonna be severe. We wanna make sure that we destroy that abnormal tissue. So treatment, right? Um, it depends on what stage they have. And it's really important that with these patients or just patients in general, right? If they're younger, we educate them on the importance of HPV vaccine. So HPV vaccine is amazing because it protects you against a lot of the HPV strains, especially the ones that cause cancer, right? Which are which ones? 16 and 18, right? So usually with your HPV vaccine, we recommend this to give be given at age 11 and up to age 26. There's two types. You have Gardasil and then you have Gardasil 9. So the Gardasil is going to be a quadrivalent HPV. And this one only covers four strains, right? It covers your 6, 11, 16, and 18 versus your Gardasil 9. That one covers nine strains. So it covers... 6, 11, 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. And that's usually what's being administered now to patients. It's going to be the Gardasil 9 because it covers more HPV strains. So, <clears throat> usually the HPV vaccine is contraindicated if a patient's going to be immunosuppressed, pregnant, or lactating. And, you know, cancer could be prevented with these patients. So just make sure that we know that also. Another thing that they like to test is when do we start screening for cervical cancer? So we usually start screening at the age of 21 and we discontinue at the age of uh, 65. And this is according to the USPSTF and also the um, ASCS, so an A, an ACOG. So once again, we start screening at the age of 21 and we stop screening at the age of 65. Patients are between the age of 21 to 29 according to the ACSS, right? They get a pap test every three years. Patients that are older than 30, they get code testing, so they get a pap test plus HPV every five years, or they can get a pap smear every three years, which is the same for uh, USPSCF. So just make sure that you know that, right? We start screening for cervical cancer at the age of 21. We stop at the age of 65. Patients that are less than the age of 30, they get pap, they get, um, pap tests, so your Papanicolaou tests every three years. And age 30, once they're older than 30, then these patients get both pap test and HPV testing every five years, right? Or they can do a pap smear every three years, but we recommend to test for that HPV. So let's go into pelvic inflammatory disease. So PID is going to be our next topic. This is going to be an inflammation of the upper female genital tract, and this can lead to a lot of things like endometritis, alpingitis, tubal ovarian abscess, and pelvic peritonitis. That's why it's really important that we treat this. The organisms that are involved are going to be your gonorrhea and chlamydia, but also there's anaerobes, right, like enteric gram negative rods and streptococcus um, agalacti that can be involved in pelvic inflammatory disease. So how is this patient going to present? Usually we think about that chandelier sign. Have we ever seen it in real life? No, we haven't. I've heard podcasts of doctors saying that they've never seen that. What does it mean? Basically that they have so severe pain when you, never you do that cervical motion tenderness that they reach for the chandelier, right? So it's going to be that chandelier sign, cervical, uh, severe cervical motion tenderness seen in pelvic inflammatory disease. They're going to be presenting with lower abdominal pain, lower abdominal tenderness, cervical motion tenderness, and adnexal tenderness. This is usually going to be the major criteria. They're also going to be presenting with a fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius. They're going to have abnormal discharge. 
and they're going to have a positive culture for next year, gonorrhea or chlamydia. Um, on CBC, you're going to see a white blood cell that's going to be greater than 10,000. They're going to have an elevated CRP and also an elevated CSR, which tells us, right, that the patient has inflammation. So we do that. What's going to be the treatment? It's going to be ceftrioxone, 250 milligrams IM, plus doxycycline, 100 milligrams PO, twice a day for 14 days for these patients. And when do we admit these patients, right? Usually if a patient presents, if they're pregnant, right, if they just look very, very ill or they have a tubal ovarian abscess, usually we're gonna admit these patients. How are you gonna know whether there's a tubal ovarian abscess versus PID? Usually on exam, it'll say that you're doing an exam and you feel this mass, or also it'll say that you do a pelvic ultrasound and you see like these stations, right, or you see an abscess. And it's really important that we treat these because there's a lot of complications like we discussed. It can develop Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome, um, hepatic fibrosis and scarring. It can also lead to infertility, right? Because it's scarring um, that area. All right, guys, so finally we finished ob -Gen. Finally, finally, finally. So let's go into now musculoskeletal. Musculoskeletal is kind of going to be a lot, and not only for this one, but also just for your pants in general. So let's go into each one and start with our lower extremity disorders. So lower extremity disorders start with our hip disorders, right? Our hip fractures. So hip fractures. We have intracapsular and extracapsular, right? How is this patient going to present? They're going to have pain in the groin area they're going to have pain that's going to be radiating to the lateral hip buttock or knee and usually on exam you're going to see c so the mnemonic is going to be s e a c s is going to be for shortening of the leg it's going to be e for externally rotated and a is going to be abduction so the mnemonic c legs and c biscuit right b and abduct so c legs c biscuit so with these patients on physical exam Usually these patients are going to have pain with deep palpation and area of the femoral triangle. Also with these patients, they're going to have a positive Trendelenburg test also. And how are we going to diagnose them? We're going to do a hip x-ray, right? AP views of the pelvis and bilateral hips. We can also do a CT or MRI. But usually hip x-ray is going to be your best one. And usually treatment for these patients, it's going to be important that we refer them to ortho, right? We want to make sure that we refer them to Ortho, they have to have surgery usually within the 21st, the first 24 hours. Um, we want to make sure that we admit them, right, for pain control. And if we delay surgery, like if it's been more than two days before the patient goes to surgery, they have increased risk of complications. So it's really important that these patients go and have surgery. What are some of the risk factors just for hip, hip fractures? So... Risk factors are going to be osteoporosis, right, female sex, if the patient's older than 50, any type of high-velocity trauma, motor vehicle accident, especially in your younger patients, are at risk for hip fractures. And another thing about hip fractures, right, is that which type of fractures is going to be associated with a vascular necrosis? This one they really like to test. It's going to be your intracapsular fracture. This one occurs along the neck of the femur. And when it's displaced, the blood supply to the femoral head is disrupted, so it increases the possibility of avascular necrosis, which can cause destruction of hip joint and severe arthritis. That's why it's really important that these patients go and have surgery ASAP. Okay? So what if a patient has a femoral neck fracture, right? Usually these patients are going to need a hemoarthroplasty or total hip replacement. We want to make sure that we do immediate weight-bearing post-op on these patients. And um, that is it for this one. So what's a Trendelenburg test? This is where we examine for weakness or instability of the hip abductors, right? And usually what happens is that you tell a patient to stand, you tell them to grasp, you, um, you grasp weight, their waist, and you tell the patient to put their thumbs bilaterally, put them down bilaterally, and instruct the patient to flex their leg Flex one leg at a time. If the, and it's positive if the patient cannot stand on one leg due to pain or if the opposite pelvis fails to rise or if it just falls in general. So the next topic we're going to go over is going to be avascular necrosis. What is avascular necrosis? This is due to um, 
bone tissue deaths, and it's usually death of bone tissue of the femoral head. So it's also known as osteonecrosis, aseptic necrosis, usually because you have some type of trauma to the vascular supply. So medial femoral circumflex artery is going to be the one that's most commonly associated. Usually the incidence is going to be between, it's going to be found in your 30 to 50 year patients. They're going to have risk factors of rheumatoid arthritis, right, steroid use, hip trauma, fracture, dislocations, alcoholism, sickle cell disease is a big one. Uh, slipped capital femoral epiphysis, especially like in your younger patients, right? This is why we want to make sure that in a patient that presents with Skiffy, they get treated right, right away. So with these patients, you're going to be presenting with acute or insidious onset of dual throbbing pain in the groin area, buttock or lateral hip with a limp. They're going to have pain with internal and external rotation of the hip and decreased range of motion. We're going to diagnose this by doing an x-ray AP lateral and frog lateral view. It's going to be flattened femoral head with joint space narrowing. We're going to do an MRI and bone scan that can detect early changes. Treatment for this is going to be protective weight bearing, right? We're going to refer them to ortho for surgery and hip arthroplasty also, especially if they have positive um, femoral head collapse. So the next one's going to be leg calf prick disease. This one is due is basically an idiopathic ischemia of the capital femoral epiphysis in children. That's usually going to be the hallmark. Very commonly found in children between the age of 4 to 10. And that's how you can differentiate between this one, like cap press disease, and your skiffy, because skiffy is usually going to be presenting in your older patients with your leg cap press disease. It's usually going to be a child that's going to be between the ages of 4 to 10, so it's going to be younger patients. So what are some of the risk factors for leg cap press disease? So, of course, if the patient has a positive family history, it's actually four times more commonly found in boys and girls. Patients that had low birth weight and abnormal birth presentation are more commonly to present with leg calf burst disease. In addition, how is this patient going to present? So they're going to have an insidious, painless limp for weeks that worsens with activity and it worsens at the end of the day. Usually the hip pain can radiate to the thigh or knee. They're going to have an antalgic gait and restrictive range of motion. On physical exam, you're going to see decreased hip motion, especially with abduction and internal rotation. Sometimes flexion and adduction contracture can occur. Diagnosis for this is going to be with an x-ray pelvis, right? It's going to be the AP frog lateral view. We can also do an MRI or a bone scan if the x-ray is normal. And treatment for this is usually self-limiting um, disease with revascularization within two years. And usually with these patients, we can do operative innervation, especially for our older patients that have like advanced disease. But our primary goal for treatment for these patients is going to be pain reduction, sometimes with either bracing and casting and protective weight bearing. So let's go into our next topic, which is going to be hip dislocations. So it's very commonly found during active years of life and in any type of energy trauma that is high, so like high energy trauma, like more vehicle accidents, right? This is what happens when the femoral head is displaced from the acetabulum. And there's different types, right? We have anterior and we have posterior hip dislocations. What we need to know is that the most common hip dislocation is going to be your posterior hip dis dislocation, anterior it's not very common, it's actually rare. So just make sure that you know that, right? Hip dislocations, posterior dislocations gonna be the most common versus like your shoulder dislocation, dislocations, we think about anterior shoulder dislocations being more common. So once again, hip dislocations, posterior is gonna be the most common versus shoulder dislocations, anterior is gonna be the most common. So it's really important that with these hip dislocations, we put them back into place adequately and in a timely manner. Why? If we don't do that, it's because the patient can develop avascular necrosis, right? And this one's actually going to be most commonly found in your posterior dislocations. So how is the patient going to present with a posterior hip dislocation? And this is how you need to differentiate between how a patient presents with an anterior and a posterior. So we just said posterior dis hip dislocation once more is going to be the most common. So the patient's leg is going to be shorter and it's going to be fixed in flexion. It's going to be adducted, so adducted. And the patient's going to have, and it's going to be internally rotated with these patients. They tend to have um, sciatic nerve injuries very commonly found in patients with posterior hip dislocation. So we're going to diagnose this with an x-ray. On the x-ray, we're going to see the affected femoral head that appears smaller than the opposite side, which makes sense, right, because it's going to be posterior. 
And treatment for these patients is that once we rule out, right, that there has not been any fraction, fracture of the hip, then we're going to reduce it as soon as we can, right? And after reduction, we can do crutch-assisted ambulation with limited weight-bearing until the patient is pain-free. So anterior hip dislocation, the hip is going to be in mild flexion. It's going to be abducted, right? So abduction, and it's going to be externally rotated. Usually the arteries and nerves that are injured in, in anterior hip dislocation is going to be your femoral artery and obturator nerve injury also. Once again, we're going to do an x-ray for these patients. We're going to see the femoral head that's going to be larger than the opposite side. Treatment is going to be reduction right similar to posterior hip dislocation. So once again, posterior hip dislocation is going to be the most common type of dislocation. This patient's leg is going to be shorter. It's going to be fixed in flexion. It's going to be adducted and internally rotated. And on x-ray, the femoral head is going to be smaller than the opposite side. So let's go into our next topic, which is going to be our skippy, right? our slipped capital femoral epiphysis. This is very commonly found in your adolescent obese boys. So it's going to be your older boys, 10 to 16 years old. In comparison to remember how we were discussing in regards to our leg calf press disease, that this is usually found in your younger boys. So um, skippy is going to be usually in your older boys. What happens is that there's a displacement of the proximal femoral epiphysis due to disruption of growth plate or weight issue. Usually the head of the femur is displaced medially and posteriorly relative to the femoral neck. Now with these patients, we want to make sure that we see and examine whether this is a stable or unstable, right? So if it's stable, skiffy, the patient's going to be able to bear weight. If, the pa if it's unstable, then the patient cannot um, bear weight. And it's really important that we differentiate between stable and unstable because in patients that have unstable skiffy, it's correlated with an increased rate of avascular necrosis. And this is actually why we want to make sure that we treat these patients for skiffy because they can develop avascular necrosis. And if the child does develop avascular necrosis, they have a very, very poor prognosis. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have vague symptoms that occur over time. In a healthy child, they're going to be presenting with a pain and a limp. Usually the pain can be referred into the thigh or medial side of the knee. This is something that you need to know because I've had questions where I confuse this one. So once again, pain can be referred into the thigh or the medial side of the knee. So it doesn't always have to be on the thigh. Physical exam, you're going to see an obese child, right? It's complaining of knee pain. Usually on your question stem, it's going to be an obese child and they're going to have limited internal rotation of the hip. You're going to do an x-ray, a lateral x-ray of view of the hip in the frog lateral position. And usually like what's pathognomonic for slipped capital for more epiphysis is going to be the ice cream falling off a cone. So it literally looks like you have a cone and the ice cream is falling off the cone. With the treatment for these patients, initial treatment, right, it's going to be your crutches. You're going to put them non-weight barren, but you have to make sure that you refer these patients immediately to an ortho surgeon, right? Because these patients are at high risk of developing skiffy, especially if the fracture is, um, I'm sorry, skiffy is unstable. So most of these patients need percutaneous screw fixation. So let's go into our knee, our knee, right? Um, <clears throat> knee, we need to know the difference between a sprain and a strain. So in regards to a sprain, a sprain is stretching or tearing of ligaments. It's the most common location for a sprain is going to be in the ankle. And then a strain is going to be stretching or tearing of muscle or tendon. Usually for treatment for strains and sprains is going to be conservative, conservative. So it's going to be rice, right? Rest, ice, compression, and elevation over the counter medications like Tylenol and NSAIDs. And then the patient can do some home exercises after two to three days of rest for these patients. Now, another thing that we need to know, of course, is going to be the different types of ligament injuries, right? Our ACLs, PCLs, MCLs, meniscal tears. So it's going to each one. So why don't we start with anterior cruciate ligament injury, also known as ACL. So with ACL, it's very commonly going to be found in your patients that have non-contact activities like jumping, pivoting, twisting, deceleration, hyperextension, internal rotation. 
Um, it can be found also in contact activities if they have valgus below to the knee, but usually it's going to be more commonly found in your non-contact activities. This patient's usually going to say that they felt a pop when their knee buckles, and it's usually pathognomonic. What you see on your question stems is that there's a pop. And then there's going to be immediate swelling, usually within two hours, because there's going to be hemarthrosis, right? The patient's going to be presented with severe pain, unable to bear weight. They're going to be unable to extend their knee. And there's going to be instability with lateral movement and going downstairs. They're going to feel like their knee just gave away at the time of the injury. So what are we going to do for the physical exam? So it's really important that you know the physical exams because they really like to test this. Lachman test and your anterior drawer test and the pivot test. So these are usually going to be positive and the ones that are best for ACL is going to be Lachman and anterior. Out of both of these, the most sensitive one is going to be your Lachman. So make sure you know that, right? Lachman is going to be the most sensitive one for anterior cruciate ligament injury. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? We're going to do an x-ray. Um, we're going to see a Segun fracture, which is a small avulsion, avulsion fracture. This is usually what's pathognomonic. But the best diagnostic test is going to be an MRI. Treatment for these patients is usually going to be RICE. Once again, right, rest, eyes, compression, and elevation. If they have a complete ACL tear, especially like if they're young and they're, they play sports or they want to keep playing sports, then in these patients are going to be taken to surgery. If the patient's like older, right, um, then in these patients we can do something like physical therapy. So next one's going to be PCL, posterior cruciate ligament injury. What we need to know about this one, that it's the strongest ligament of the knee. This patient's going to be presenting with anterior trauma to the tibia. The most common one I've seen on question stems is going to be your accidents, right? Your MVA is like a dashboard injury. Also, excessive knee movement falling onto a flexed knee. It's highly associated with multi-ligament injuries and knee dislocations and neurovascular injuries. The patient's going to be presenting with anterior bruising. They're going to have swelling and instability, large effusion within 24 hours. They can also have pain, swelling, and pallor numbness. If we see these things, right, if we see pain, swelling, and some type of pallor numbness, then we're thinking about possibly a knee dislocation with injury to the popliteal artery. So on physical exam, we're going to have decreased range of motion. The physical exams that we're going to do, are we going to do a SAG sign, which is going to be positive, a posterior drawer test, which makes sense, right? Posterior cruciate ligament injury, posterior drawer test. It's going to be positive, and then a positive pivot test. X-ray is usually going to be the, um, what we're going to start with, but MRI is going to be the best test. Treatment for this is usually conservative. Um, we can do physical therapy. We immobilize the knee with a brace and extension. We can do crutches for ambulation. And then once again, surgery only if there's a severe torn ligament. Next one's going to be your medial collateral ligament injury. This is usually due to a valgus stress to partially flex knee. The patient's going to have a direct blow to the lateral leg that stresses opposite medial side of the knee, and it's going to be the most common injured ligament in the knee that you need to know in general. Usually on exam, there might be some mild pain on the inside or medial side of the knee, but there's not going to be any effusion with these patients, and they're going to have a positive valgus stress test, right? Diagnosis, once again, we start with an x-ray, but it's not really diagnostic, and then we're going to do an MRI for these patients. Conservative treatment is usually going to be with physical therapy, protective weight bearing. Surgery is usually not really needed with these patients. Next one's going to be your lateral collateral ligament injury. This is not very common. Usually it's due to a medial blow to the knee. The patient's going to be presenting with pain on lateral knee, limited range of motion due to pain, and no effusion. The physical exam that's going to be positive is going to be your varus stress test. And once again, we're going to do an x ray. And we can also do an MRI for these patients, which is going to be the best test. Usually these patients, the treatment is usually ur urgent surgical repair within one week because these usually do not recover well since they're associated with other injuries like ACL and PCL. So make sure that you keep that in mind for lateral collateral ligament injury. All these patients usually go to surgery. The next one's going to be medial meniscal tear. So usually with these patients, you're going to have a history of twisting with a foot that's planted and deep squatting, usually in your younger patients. They can also have micro trauma due to squatting, twisting, especially found in your older patients. And then it can also be seen in arthritic knees. The patient's going to be presenting with a pain altalgic gait. K 
catching or locking, swelling during the first 24 hours, pain with deep squatting. They're going to have that duck walk, right? Medial joint line tenderness, and they're going to have an effusion present. So for medial meniscus tear, what we're going to see, the tests that are going to be positive is going to be your McMurray test. Usually it's going to be a medial click with this one. They're going to have a positive Desily test also. So how I memorize it is that um, McMurray likes to eat apples because you also have the Apley test also that's going to be positive for these patients. So x-ray is usually going to be normal and MRI is going to be the best diagnostic test, right? Uh, treatment for this is usually conservative for older pati patients, especially if they have degenerative tears, right? So we're going to treat it with NSAIDs, physical therapy also. You can do surgery, especially for your young and active patients. And the next one's going to be your lateral meniscal tear. Um, usually the etiology is going to be same as medial, right? So it's going to be twisting with the foot that's planted in deep squatting, um, microtrauma. Signs and symptoms, it's going to be similar to your medial meniscus tear. So it's going to be that pain and talgic gait, that catching or locking, that swelling, the pain with deep squatting and duck walk. But the difference is, of course, you're going to have lateral joint line tenderness, right? Because it's a lateral meniscal tear. The tests that are going to be positive for these patients are going to be a positive McMurray test. It's going to be a lateral click and then a positive Thessaly test for these patients. Diagnosis is going to be an MRI. is going to be the best one, right? And treatment is usually conservative treatment once again with NSAIDs, physical therapy, and then surgery for your young or active patients um, if they have very severe signs. The next one is going to be your patellofemoral syndrome, usually known as your runner's knee, also known as chondromalacia. It tends to affect the patella, the quadriceps, the patellar tendon insertions, and usually the symptoms are going to prevent, present after the patient has trauma or repetitive activities. Pain is going to be localized under the patella. The patient's going to have pain with knee bending, squatting, and climbing. And usually these patients on exam have a positive apprehension sign. This is when the patella is deviated laterally, and they're going to have a positive patellar grind test, um, which is just the grinding sensation, right? And also on exam, you're going to see patellar mobility that's going to be greater than half the diameter of the patella. So they're going to have like excessive mobility of the patella on exam. The best test is you, the test that you're going to do to diagnose, you're going to do an x-ray. You're going to do the sunshine view, right? This is where you'll see the lateral deviation or tilting of the patella in relation to the femoral groove. You're going to do an MRI also that shows thinning of articular cartilage. It's not necessary but it's helpful, especially if these patients have to go to surgery, just to rule out other causes. Treatment for this is going to be conservative, right? NSAIDs, eyes, physical therapy, and surgery is going to be the last resort, but it's not usually needed. The next one's going to be your iliotibial band syndrome. It's the most common cause of knee pain in runners. It's also seen in your cyclist. Usually this patient has inflammation of the IT bursa due to lack of flexibility of the iliotibial tibial band bursa that causes bursitis, right? So this patient is going to be presenting with sharp pain in the lateral knee. So that's usually what's going to be key for this one is that they're going to have that sharp pain in the lateral knee that's worse with climbing the stairs or running downhill. Pain is going to be at the beginning of the run and then it goes away. On diagnosis or physical exam, you're going to see tenderness over lateral femoral epicondyle. They're going to have a positive over test. And pain is going to be reproduced when the hip or knee is actively flexed from a fully extended knee. We usually don't really need to do any type of diagnostic test for these patients. It's a clinical diagnosis. And treatment for this is going to be conservative. Usually you want to make sure the patient's resting, right? Um, eyes, physical therapy, stretching, and NSAIDs. You can do steroid injections, but they're rarely used. The next one's going to be your Oshkod, Oshkod slaughter disease. Uh, this is going to be osteochondritis of the patellar tendon at the tibial tuberosity from overuse, repetitive stress, or small avulsions due to quadriceps contraction on the patellar tendon insertion into the tibia. So once again, this is usually going to be found in your older uh, children, right? It's usually in your 10 to 15 year olds, um, especially on the question stem, it has to say an athlete, like a soccer player, basketball player. And what they really like the test is just like the patho. So just make sure that you know it's because they have some type of, they have a quadricep contraction on the patellar tendon insertion into the tibia. They really like the test up also. 
Also, osteochondritis, the patellar tendon at the tibial tuberosity from overuse, right? So they have that repetitive stress. Um, that's another thing that they like to test. And it's the most common cause of chronic knee pain in young active adolescents. This patient is going to be presenting with pain and swelling localized to tibial tubercles. So once again, right, if you see anything that says tibial tubercle, right, you're thinking about Oshkod slaughter disease. And usually this pain is going to be worse by running, jumping, or kneeling. On physical exam, you're going to see a painful lump below the knee. They're going to have tenderness, once again, to where? The anterior tubial tubercle. It's going to be anterior, right? Anterior, not posterior. Anterior tibial tubercle. They really like to test this. X-ray, you're going to do to diagnosis patients, although it can be a clinical diagnosis. But on X-ray, you're going to see fragmentation or irregular ossification of the tibial tubercle. Treatment for this is that usually just going to be conservative because these tend to get better by themselves once the patient reaches their skeletal maturity. But conservative treatment, you can do like ice, NSAIDs, physical therapy, right? So osteoporosis Schlatter's disease, just make sure you know that's going to be your athletes, right? Older children, 10 to 15 years old. It's going to be due to osteochondritis of patellar tendon at the tibial tuberosity from overuse, and they're going to have tenderness over the anterior tubule tubercle. Next one's going to be patellar fractures. This is due to direct blow to the anterior knee. Um, when, and when a patient falls on a flexed area with um, forceful quad contraction, it can cause a patellar fracture. Another cause can be indirect blow with a knee inflection and, then it's, and sudden contraction of quadriceps. It's very commonly found in your younger patients. On exam, you're going to see pain, swelling, hemarthrosis, and deformity or displacement of the patella. You're also going to do an active extension of the knee, so the straight leg raise, right? That's going to be lost usually in these patients. You're going to do an x-ray for these patients, sunrise, just look at the patella. And usually treatment for this is if it's non-displaced, you can do conservative treatment like a knee mobilizer or long leg cast for six to eight weeks. But if it's displaced, you do surgery for these patients. All right, so next one I wanted to go into is the Gina Varum, Gina Valgum, and <clears throat> the difference between these two. So Gina Varum is going to be normal from infancy to three years old, and then alignment changes to the Gina Valgum. So Varum is going to be your bow leg, right? So I memorize it is that Valgum, gum, right? So it's gum sticks. So that means the knees are going to be sticking versus ver uh, Varum. It's going to be your bowl leg patients, right? So, like I said, this is usually going to be with Gina Varum normal from infancy to three years of age. Then alignment can change to Gina Valgum. If it persists beyond two years of age and it increases rather than decreases, then we want to make sure that we refer this to ortho, especially if it's occurring only in one leg. It's usually secondary to Blount disease. What is Blount disease? It's a growth disorder of the tibia that causes it to angle inward. And then we have Gina Valgum. This is going to be a knock knee, right? That's going to be the, the ones that are look like the knees are just stuck together. This is going to be frequently observed in children two to four years of age. It's okay until eight years of age. But if the patient is knock kneed in association with short stature, you want to make sure that you refer these patients to ortho. This one can be caused by skeletal dysplasia or rickets like vitamin D deficiency. So make sure you keep that in mind, right? Gina Valgum can be due to vitamin D deficiency. So now that we've gone through that, let's go on to our next one, which is going to be the ankle, right? So the ankle is really important that we grade the ankle sprains. So we have grade one, two, and three injuries. If it's grade one, there's no laxity on stress tests. So it's going to be an incomplete tear. If it's grade two, there's going to be laxity of the ATF joint, also known as the Anti ligament, sorry, anterior talofibular ligament on anterior drawer test, but negative tilt test, so it's going to be an incomplete tear. Grade three injury is going to be both the anterior drawer and subtalar tilt test are going to be positive. This means that there's a complete tear. So once again, grade one, right, incomplete tear. Grade two is going to be incomplete tear, and then grade three is going to be a complete tear. So let's go into our different types of Sprains. So we have inversion, inversion ankle sprain. This is the most common mode of injury. Make sure that you know that. Inversion and plantar flexion sprain of the anterior talofibular ligament. 
how I memorize it is that ATF, right, always tears first. That's how I memorize it. So the ATFL ligament is the one that always tears first. It's the most common one. It's due to inversion ankle sprains. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have um, localized pain and swelling over the lateral ankle, difficulty waiting, bear, bearing weight, limping. The ankle can sometimes feel unstable. And usually on the history, they're going to say that they turn their ankle during a fall or after landing on an irregular surface. Physical exam, you're going to see swelling and bruising over the lateral ankle. They're, they're going to have a positive anterior drawer test and a positive subtalar tilt test. So they're going to have swelling that can limit the range of motion of the ankle. And usually for these, right, how are we going to diagnose it? Well, we're going to diagnose them depending on the Ottawa ankle rule. And this is something that's really commonly tested. So I just wanted to discuss this real quick your Ottawa ankle rule because they really like to test this. So if the patient is unable to bear weight in the office or ER for, for four steps, you want to check for the following, right? So you want to check for it depending on where the pain is located. So you get an ankle radiograph and it's, this is going to be performed if there's pain in the malleolar region with any of the following. If they have bone tenderness at the posterior edge of the distal six centimeters or the tip of the lateral malleolus so once again right lateral malleolus and if they have bone tenderness at the posterior edge of the distal six centimeters of the tip of the lateral malleolus bone tenderness at the posterior edge of the distal six centimeters or the tip of the medial malleolus and if once again they are unable to bear weight for at least four steps both immediately after injury and at the time of evaluation so we want to check for these if the patient has these, then we're going to get an x-ray, right? Now, what about a foot x-ray? So we're going to do a foot radiograph radiography series should be performed if there's pain in the midfoot region with any one of the following. Bone tenderness at the navicular bone, bone tenderness at the base of the fifth metatarsal, and inability to bear weight for at least four steps, both immediate after injury and at the time evaluation. So these are the steps. It's really important that you know them because they really like to test this on whether you're going to do an x-ray, a foot x-ray, or an ankle x-ray for these patients. So what's going to be the treatment for inversion ankle sprains? Um, usually it's going to be your ice, your ice, right? It's going to be your ice compression um, elevation. You can also do protective weight bearing with crutches and ankle braces, especially for your grade two and three injuries. Um, make sure that the patient is increasing the range of motion and conditioning. If the patient has like chronic ankle instability or associated injuries and they're present for more than three months after the sprain happened, then you can uh, refer these patients to surgery, right? And who do you refer to surgery? Usually you're going to refer a patient that has an ankle fracture if they have recurrent ankle sprains, if they have chronic ligamentous ankle instability, or if they have once again no response after three months of conservative treatment. So the next one's going to be your eversion, your high ankle sprain. This one's most commonly misdiagnosed as a um, anterior talofibular ligament sprain. So make sure that we know, right, that inversion ankle sprains are associated with your ATFL joint ligaments and your ATFL ligament, your always tear first or anterior talofibular ligament is going to be the most common um, injured ligament in general. So eversion high ankle sprain, it involves a deltoid ligament and anterior tibial fibular ligament, right? So we said inversion is going to be your anterior talofibular ligament. Your eversion is going to be your tibial fibular ligament. So with these patients, they're going to be presenting with severe prolonged pain over the anterior ankle at the anterior tibial fibular ligament. They're going to have decreased range of motion, swelling. They're going to have decreased weight bearing, and they can also present with an ankle fusion. On physical exam, you're going to see that they have point of maximal tenderness at the anterior tibial fibular ligament, which is usually higher than your um, anterior talofibular ligament. So it's going to be higher where their point of maximal tenderness is. You're going to have a positive external rotation stress test, which means that the patient should have intact uh, neurovascular exam before doing this test. Just make sure that we keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to do an x-ray for these patients once again if they do meet the criteria that we discussed for the Ottawa ankle rules, but MRI is going to be the best test for these patients. So 
Treatment and management for these patients. Conservative treatment is usually with a castor or brew for four to six weeks. And make sure that we're instructing the patient to start physical therapy early to regain range of motion and strength. And we usually refer these patients to a surgeon, right, a foot and ankle surgeon, if the tibial teller joint space is widened and asymmetrical. Usually the gold standard surgery for these patients is going to be a, a screw fixation. So the next one we're going to go over is going to be your cavus foot or your high arc. This is going to be unusually high longitudinal arc of the foot. It's usually hereditary or neurologic. This patient is going to be presenting with usually um, a diffuse localized pain in the lower leg. And often there's an association, associated contracture of toe extensor. So they might have like a closed toe deformity also where the metatarsal phalangeal joints are hyperextended and the intraphalangeal joints are flexed. And with these patients, usually um, they have to go to um, orthopedics, right? So they need orthotic realignment of foot in mild cases, and then usually surgery in symptomatic cases. Flat foot is going to be the next one. This one is usually normal in infants. Um, it's also uh, commonly found in your younger children that are male obese and then who have excessive joint laxity. And also if they have like a family member in their family that has flat foot, like it's a familiar incident. So it's not always something that you need to further like investigate. It's usually normal with these patients. Treatment is that usually these tend to go by themselves, um, tend to go away by themselves. There's usually no treatment unless they have calf or leg pain. And if there's children they have a leg, that have leg pain because of their flat foot, then you can give them something like supportive shoe for these patients. Next one's gonna be bunion and hallux bunion, or also known as hallux valgus. This is the most common forefoot deformity. The etiology is unknown. Usually the majority of these patients that have your bunions or your hallux valgus tend to have a family history, or so someone in their family has this. So how is this patient going to present? Um, on exam, you're going to see lateral deviation of the great toe that's associated with prominence overhead of the first metatarsal. It's going to be painful with shoe wear, and it's going to be relieved by wearing wide shoes. Treatment for this usually is that further growth leads to recurrence of deformity, so we want to make sure that we avoid surgery in adolescence. Um, and then surgery is going to be like the treatment, the definitive treatment for these patients. It tends to have about 95% resolution. The next one's going to be your plantar fasciitis. This is heel pain in adolescent and older athletes. It occurs in runners, especially in those patients that tend to run more than 30 miles per week and patients with tight Achilles tendon or wear poorly fitting shoes. It's also commonly found in your patients with cavus foot and patients that are overweight. They're going to be presenting with pain that's worse upon first standing up in the morning and taking a few steps. That's usually like pathognomonic, right? It's going to be a history with for plantar fasciitis of a runner that the first thing that they do they wake up in the morning and they have this pain like right when they get out of the bed and usually on physical exam you can see a bone spur usually treatment for this is going to be local massage with a tennis ball so you just tell them to put a tennis ball under their foot and just kind of like roll it um, also stretching is going to help NSAIDs arch supports and then also like final it's going to be local steroid injections but as always right we always do conservative treatment before we jump into surgery. All right, guys, let's go into our next one. It's going to be your upper extremity disorder. So let's go with subacromial impingement syndrome. This is a decrease in space between the acromion and greater tuberosity due to rotator cuff tears, muscle strength imbalances, poor scapular control, subacromial bursitis, and bone spurs. Usually this, pain, this patient's going to be presenting with pain with overhead activities nocturnal pain with sleeping on the shoulder. That's usually what's pathognomonic for your subacromial impingement syndrome. It's going to be that pain at night whenever they sleep on that shoulder. They're going to have that pain with anything that's overhead, like reach for like the Play-Doh overhead, etc. They're going to have pain on internal rotation. So exact, for example, if they put a jacket on or a bra on. And it's really important with these patients that we ask them what do they do as like, what are they employed in? Like, what do they like to do? You know, if it's a painter that uses their hand, their, they use this movement a lot, like upper, then 
you know, we're thinking about maybe subacromial pinching syndrome because of that overuse. And on a physical exam, they're going to have tenderness at the edge of the greater tuberosity. They're going to have a positive near impingement sign and a positive Hawkins impingement sign for these patients. Diagnosis is usually going to be, we can do an x-ray, we can also do an MRI and an ultrasound for these patients. And usually the treatment for these patients is that most of these patients tend to respond well to conservative treatment with NSAIDs. Uh, just educating them on possibly like act, ba basically like modifying their activity, right? Physical therapy. We refer these patients for surgery only if like conservative treatment has failed, like if they have not gotten, gotten better or if they have worsening symptoms for more than three months. So next one's going to be rotator cuff tear. So this one is usually acute injury from falling on an outstretched hand or your foosh injuries, right? or from pulling on the shoulder. It's also, also associated with chronic repetitive injuries with overhead movement and lifting. So someone that's just doing this over and over again, like chronically lifting and elevating um, their shoulder, then they're more prone to getting these rotator cuff tears. This patient is going to be presenting with weakness, pain with overhead movement, that night pain also. And on physical exam, usually with these patients, they're going to have symptoms that are very similar to impingement syndrome that we discussed but usually with these patients since they have a full thickness tear they're going to have like more obvious and like more decreased weakness with light resistance testing of specific like sits muscles right and what are your sits muscles they really like to test these it's going to be your supraspinatus your infraspinatus uh your teres minors and your subscapularis so how do we test these we're going to test the supraspinatus by doing the open can test or the empty can test, right? They're emptying a can. You're gonna test the infraspinatus and the teres minor with resisted shoulder external rotation and with shoulder at zero degrees abduction and elbow by the side. We're gonna test the subscapularis with a lift off or a belly press test. And these patients are usually gonna have a positive Nears test and a positive Hawkins test on physical exam. With these patients, we can do an x-ray. Usually on x-ray, we're going to see a high riding cumoral head that's usually going to tell us that there's a tear of the supraspinatus tendon. MRI is usually going to be the best test, though, for to visualize these rotator cuff tears. And what's going to be the treatment? Usually for partial rotator cuff tears, these tend to heal with scarring. So usually treatment with this is going to be physical therapy and usually rotator and scapular uh, muscle strengthening. If it's a full thickness rotator cuff tear, then these patients need to go to surgery, especially if they're young, right? And now out of all, out of the sits muscles, right? Which one is the most common one that is going to be injured? So which one is the most common, uh, rot most common toward tendon of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teraspinaris, and subscapularis? So the most common one's gonna be your supraspinatus, so the most common torn tendon is going to be supraspinatus. So just make sure that you know that. And also make sure what are the rotator cuff muscles, right? Once again, for repetition, supraspinatus, the sits, I is going to be your infraspinatus, T is going to be your teres minor, and then the last S is going to be your subscapularis. And then we said that the most common torn tendon is going to be the supraspinatus. All right, so shoulder dislocation and instability. Shoulder dislocation and instability, right? Usually on the, on the history, the patient's going to have a history of falling on an outstretched hand, right? So your foosh injury. Usually going to be saying that they fell on an outstretched hand and then they abducted their arm. Now, remember that we said for shoulder dislocations, the most common one is going to be which one? It's going to be your anterior, right? Versus hip dislocation is going to be your posterior. So your anterior shoulder dislocations are going to be the most common one. If a patient presents with a posterior Dislocation, we're thinking about our three E's, right? Electricity, ethanol, and epilepsy. So usually it's going to be your patients that had were electrocuted, right? They have had an epileptic seizure. Um, if they drink alcohol, also patients that fall from a very um, tall height also. Um, we also have traumatic shoulder dislocation. This is usually due to Banfart lesions uh, when the anterior inferior labrum is torn. Labrum 
is torn and this is usually very commonly found in your young patients and then your active patients. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have pain and feeling of instability when the arm is abducted and externally rotated. They're going to have pain that's going to be improved with manual reduction. And usually on physical exam, you're going to see like an obvious deformity of the humoral head that's going to be dislocated anteriorly, right? So the patient holds their shoulder and, ar shoulder and arm in the externally rotated position. Now, if it's a posterior dislocation, which is not as common, usually these patients are going to be holding their arm in an internally rotated position, and usually the deformity is less obvious. But the patient's going to have a difficulty pushing the door open for a posterior dislocation. These patients are going to have an, a positive apprehension test, a positive load and shift test, and then a positive O'Brien test. So usually for these patients, we're going to do an x-ray for acute dislocations. It's really important that we do them before we do the physical exam, right? Because we want to make sure that we identify uh, bone injuries and then also like hill sex lesion, which is an indented compression fracture at the posterior superior humeral head that's associated with an anterior uh, shoulder dislocation. We can also do an MRI, but usually we do an x-ray. What's going to be the treatment? It's going to be reduction as soon as possible. In general, what you need to know for shoulder dislocations, we said the most common dislocation is going to be your anterior, right? So make sure that you know that. So adhesive capsulitis is going to be the next one, also known as your frozen shoulder. So with these patients, usually the cause is idiopathic. We think it's usually due to acute inflammation of the capsule that's usually followed by scarring and remodeling. It's very commonly found in your patients between the ages of 40 to 65 very commonly found in your perimenopausal women that have like diabetes or thyroid disease. Um, also, these patients that have breast cancer um, tend to have a higher incidence um, if they have a history of breast cancer and they were treated for the breast cancer like mastectomy, right? Signs and symptoms, the patient's going to be presenting with a very painful shoulder with limited range of motion with passive and active movements. They're going to have limitation of movement of external rotation with elbow by side of the trunk. And usually the strength is going to be normal, but it tends to appear diminished because the patient is just in so much pain on your physical exam. So usually this is going to be a clinical diagnosis. Um, you can do an x-ray for these patients just to rule out things like lenocumoral arthritis and calcific tendinitis, but usually it's a clinical diagnosis. Treatment for this is usually self-limiting, but it's very debilitating, right? So we can give them things like NSAIDs, um, physical therapy also. Um, do like a short-term course of intra-articular corticosteroid injections or oral prednisone. And then we usually refer these patients if they do not respond to treatment or just conservative treatment after six months, um, then we usually refer these patients. Surgery is usually like very rare in these patients. The next one's going to be your acromial clavicular separation or your shoulder separation. Uh, this is usually due to some type of direct downward blow to the hip of an adductor's shoulder. This patient is going to be presenting with pain and swelling at the top of the shoulder over the AC joint, right? They're going to have pain with forward elevation of the arm, and they're going to have pain with lifting the arm, or they were are going to be unable to lift the shoulder on physical exam. And then on physical exam, they're going to have an obvious bump deformity. And usually we do an x-ray for these patients. It classifies the AC dislocation and usually the treatment for these patients is usually non-surgical, so we put them on a sling for comfort. We can do ice, NSAIDs. It's going to help reduce the soreness and swelling. Now, the AC, the chromocubicular separation, the treatment um, can also depend on what grade they have, right? So grade one through three, usually these tend to get better by themselves, but injuries that are grade four through six, usually these patients need surgery. So... Another thing that's really important to keep in mind is that before resuming any type of athletic activity, the patient has to have full painless range of motion and no tenderness on palpation and sufficient strength before they can go back to like, um, exer exercising and then doing their athletic activities. So we're done with shoulder pain. Just real quick though, I wanted to go into each one because I know it's a lot. So just how are they going to present? So rotator cuff impingement, usually it's going to be pain with abduction, right? External rotation. Usually they're going to have tenderness in the subacromial area. Usually they're going to have the positive impingement tests, like your NEAR and Hawkins tests that are going to be positive. And then we have rotator cuff tear. 
So with these patients, you're going to have weakness with abduction and external rotation. We're usually going to think about those patients that have a history of like repeated overuse, right? Uh, usually found in your patients that are going to be older than 40. And these patients are going to also present with like very similar symptoms of rotator cuff impingement, but it's going to be worse, right? It's going to be your full rotator cuff tear. We're thinking about those sits muscles, your supraspinatus, your um, infraspinatus, your teraspinus, and your subscapularis. In regards to adhesive capsulitis, it's usually going to be decreased passive and active range of motion. Usually these patients are going to have stiffness with pain. For your, for example, biceps tendinopathy, usually these patients have anterior shoulder pain. They have pain with lifting, carrying, or overhead reaching, and usually weakness is not very common in these patients. All right, guys, let's go into now the arm. So we have lateral epicondylitis, labor, lateral epicondylosis. Sorry, it's also known as your tennis elbow. This involves your wrist extensors, especially your extensor carpi radialis brevis. It's usually due to lifting with the wrist and elbow extended. So we think about, right, our um, tennis players that are just repeatedly like extending that elbow. And these patients are usually going to have a pain at the lateral epicondyle with arm and wrist extended. They're going to have pain while shaking hands, lifting objects, using computer mouse, hitting backhand in tennis also. On physical exam, you're going to see tenderness over the lateral epicondyle, especially over the posterior side where the tendon inserts. And usually with these patients, you can confirm the pain by reproducing pain over the epicondyle with raised wrist extension and third digit extension. You can also reproduce pain with passive stretching of the affected muscles while the arm is in extension. Diagnosis for these patients is usually confirmed by pain with restrictive strength testing and passive stretching of the affected tendon and uh, muscle unit. So usually with these patients, we don't need to do any further treatment. It's usually a clinical diagnosis. Uh, we can do an MRI only if the patient doesn't get better after three months. And treatment for this is going to be physical therapy and activity modification, right? To just make sure that they're modifying their activity. We can also do NSAIDs, ice with these patients. We can also do a contraforce elbow brace. Is this going to help them with symptoms? And the next one's going to be your medial epicondylitis, also known as your Colfer's elbow. Uh, this usually involves wrist flexors, right? Most common pronator teres tendon is going to be the one that's going to be involved and this patient is going to have pain at the medial epicondyle during motions when the arm is pronated repetitively or wrist is flexed. Usually with these patients uh, we want to make sure that we reproduce pain over the epicondyle with resisted wrist pronation and wrist flexion. This is how we're going to confirm that the patient has pain due to tendinopathy and once again right um, for these patients we only get MRIs if the symptoms are more than uh, three months and they're getting worse. And treatment's going to be right physical therapy and activity modifications. You can do ice, NSAIDs, and then we can do that counterforce elbow brace also. So just to differentiate between these, right, we said lateral epicondylysis is going to be your tennis elbow. It involves a wrist extensors, especially your extensor carpi radius, radialis brevis, right? This patient's going to have pain at the lateral epicondyle whenever they extend their arm or wrist. And also, in regards to medial epicondylosis, it's going to be your golfer's elbow, right? They're going to have um, usually pain at the medial epicondyle, especially whenever their arm is pronating, um, whenever they, they pronate their arm repetitively or when their rest, wrist is flexed. And it involves the wrist flexors, and the most common tendon is going to be your pronator teres tendon. All right, next one's going to be your supracondyle fracture of the humerus. This is the most common elbow fracture that's seen in children between the ages of three to six years old. It's usually due to a fush injury, so once again, falling on that outstretched hand, right? On physical exam, you're going to see elbow deformity. The patient's going to be presented with pain, decreased mobility, also swelling. It's really important with these patients that with a supracondylar a fracture of the humerus that we do a neuro and vascular exam because we want to make sure that the median motor nerve branch is working with these patients, right? So this is where we do that okay sign, right? If they can't do the okay sign, if they go like this, then that's usually like abnormal. 
diagnosis for this is going to be an x-ray. Um, usually on x-ray, we're going to see that posterior fat pad. Um, that fat pad sign, it's also known as a cell sign. So just make sure that you know that, right? Um, fat pad sign or your, and it's going to be your posterior fat pad sign. Whenever you see that, it's usually pathognomonic for your supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Um, and the thing about these and why it's important that we treat them is that it can develop into a Volkman's contracture, so make sure that you know that. Treatment for this is going to be mandatory ortho consult, right? Um, it's important that we do not reduce these in the ER, so it's important that we consult ortho like ASAP because these patients can have um, high morbidity if it's not treated soon. And like I said, it's really important that we treat it because there's a complication of the Volkman ischemic contracture um, of the forearm due to medium nerve and brachial artery injury. All right, guys, so once again, supracondylar fracture of the humerus, right? It's going to be a foosh injury. It's going to be an elbow fracture, especially in your children between the ages of three to six years old. Um, they're going to have the OK sign that's going to be like abnormal. Instead of going like this, they're going to go like this. And usually with these patients on x-ray, we're going to see that posterior fat pad sign, and these patients go to surgery ASAP. So let's go into our Cole's fracture and our Smith's fracture, right? So how I memorize this is um, how they look, right? Call you, call you for dinner, so that's usually your Cole's fracture. It's going to be your dinner fork deformity, so that's how I memorize that one. So Cole's fracture is usually a distal radius fracture. The most common type of injury is going to be that push injury, once again, falling on an outstretched hand. On a physical exam, the patient's going to be presenting with swelling, tenderness at the distal form. They're going to be saying that they're going to have a lot of pain in that distal form. They can also have palmar paresthesia from medium uh, nerve damage. On x-ray, right, that's how we're going to diagnose these patients. But on physical exam, we're going to see that dinner fork deformity, whereas there, there is that dorsal displacement and dorsal angulation of the distal impact radius with radial shortening. And then we're going to do an x-ray. Um, it's important that um, we do a weekly x-ray with these patients because this fracture is at greatest risk of displacement, especially during the first three weeks of treatment. And usually treatment for these patients is going to be your initial immobilization, right? It's going to be your volar or sugar tongue splint, especially if they have significant swelling. And if the patient has like a minimally displaced fracture or osteopenia, then we can do a cast for these patients. And it's important that we um, think about the complications because they can have median nerve compression. Um, they can also have older nerve contusion or compression, and then they can also develop acute compartment syndrome in these patients. So once again, right, call you for dinner. It's going to be that dinner fork deformity. It's going to be that distal radius fracture for these patients. They're going to have that dorsal displacement and dorsal angulation of the distal impact radius with radial shortening. So Smith's fracture is going to be the next one. Next one. This one's usually known like your reverse Cole's fracture, right? So with Smith's fracture, it's going to be usually due to a fall or a direct blow on the dorsum of the hand and wrist. It's going to be, once again, a Fouche injury. So fall from Fouche, falling on an outstretched hand on supination that then shifts into a pronate position. And usually this patient's going to have a, a volar angulated fracture of the distal radius. So it's going to be volar angulated fracture of the distal radius and you're going to see a garden spade deformity. You're going to do an x-ray, you're going to see the lateral view that shows volar angulated and displaced fracture. And treatment with these patients, right, is usually going to be um, uh, pressure is going to be applied in the opposite direction for these patients. And then just make sure that we are placing a splint also on these patients. So once again, right, Smith's fracture is going to be that garden spain deformity. It's going to be the volar angulated fracture of the distal radius. And Cole's fracture is going to be that distal radius fracture. Um, it's going to be that dinner fork deformity, dorsal displacement, and dorsal angulation of the distal intact radius with radial shortening. Next one's going to be your nursemaid's elbow or your subluxation of the radial head. Usually it's very commonly found in your infants, right, your children that have um, some type of injury that causes a subluxation of the radial head, usually like they're lifted or they're pulled by the hand by the parent by accident. And usually this patient's going to be presenting with an elbow that's fully pronated. 
they're going to have pain and usually the child, the child is not going to be able to bend their elbow. On physical exam, you're going to see point tenderness over the radial head. And what ligament is usually involved in this? They really like to test this. It's going to be the annual, annular ligament. So once again, um, your nursemaid's elbow is going to be your annular ligament that's going to be involved. Uh, you can do an x-ray, but usually you don't need to. Um, an x-ray usually, if you do do, it's going to be normal. We're going to reduce the elbow. So how are we going to reduce it? So the clit can be palpated at when the elbow is supinated and you move it from full extension to flexion. Usually the patient's going to have relief of pain and the child stops crying immediately. And then we can immobilize the, the elbow in a sling for comfort for one day. All right, guys, let's go into our hand disorders now. It's going to be carpal tunnel syndrome. Usually this patient's going to be presenting with pain, burning, tingling along the medium nerve, right? Usually it's going to involve the palmar surfaces of the thumb, index, and long fingers and radial half of the ring finger. It's usually going to say that involves fingers one, two, and three usually on your question stem. Usually these patients are going to have an aching pain that radiates proximally into the forearm and occasionally proximally to the shoulder and over the neck and chest. Um, <clears throat> usually the pain is exacerbated by fuller flexion or dorsiflexion of the wrist and it's the most bothersome at night. Usually the patient's going to wake up to shake their hands to, to just like decrease that discomfort that they have. Uh, some of the symptoms that can present in like late carpal tunnel syndrome can be weakness and atrophy of the femur eminence. So make sure that you know that. I think I had a pants question on this. Is that later they have that atrophy of the femur eminence or weakness of that femur eminence. So what is carpal tunnel syndrome due to? It's usually because there's a compression of the median nerve between the carpal ligament and other structures within the carpal tunnel. It's usually due to someone that's doing repeated wrist activities. It's commonly seen in your patients that are pregnant and patients that have diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis. So once again, right, carpal tunnel syndrome, it's going to be what nerve is going to be involved. It's going to be that median nerve, right? And usually it's going to be that paining, burning, tingling. It's usually going to be in the palmar surface of the first three fingers, which is going to be the thumb, index, and then the long finger, and sometimes the radial half of the ring finger. So what if physical exam findings or tests can we do for these patients? This is something that's highly tested, so make sure you know this. So you're gonna have a positive tenel test. This is usually tingling or shock-like pain on roller wrist percussion. So you're gonna percuss on the roller wrist near the uh, medial nerve, and they're gonna have like you're gonna reproduce those symptoms of like tingling and numbness. Um, I actually think I have carpal tunnel syndrome because this is always positive, and whenever I do it, I do have that, that tingling numbness in my little three fingers. The positive failings test, right, also, this is where you kind of tell the patient to go like this. I think it's for like 30 seconds to a minute, and then they're going to be able to reproduce that tingling and numbness. You can also do a positive carpal compression or the Durkin's test. This is actually very specific. It's more specific and sensitive than the other two. And this is where you apply direct pressure over the carpal tunnel, um, which causes numbness and tingling. So you're going to just um, apply like that direct pressure over the carpal carpal tunnel and it's going to cause that tingling and numbness. So we can do an ultrasound for these patients, um, but usually it's a clinical diagnosis. You can also do an electromyography and nerve conduction test if needed. If you do though, you'll see like um, decreased, your, it's going to show sensory conduction delay with these patients. Treatment for this is just make sure that we're relieving the pressure on the median nerve that is causing all these symptoms, right? So you know, instructing the patient to just make sure that they uh, modify their hand activities. Um, you can also splint the wrist for three months at bedtime only. You can also give them oral cort corticosteroids and NSAIDs, although we don't really do this because, of course, like corticosteroids, right, they're immunosuppressive. We can do NSAIDs, methylprednisolone injections, but once again, we don't do this also for long term because it can actually atrophy those like muscles in that area that we're injecting the corticosteroids. And then final treatment, if the patient has done the injections, right, everything else, and they're not getting better, then we're going to do surgery for these patients. So once again, carpal tunnel syndrome, it's going to involve the median nerve, right? We said first one, two, three digits usually. It's going to be that tingling and numbness. It's going to be a typewriter or someone that just uses their wrists a lot. They're going to have a positive tenel test, positive failings, but the best and more specific and sensitive test is going to be your positive carpal compression where you're compressing that carpal tunnel. 
and treatment for this is usually going to be right um, conservative. You can also do uh, a splint at night. So next one's going to be your decutrin contracture. What are some of the causes? Usually it's idiopathic. Usually these patients have a genetic predisposition, very commonly found in your 50-year-old uh, uh, Caucasian men. Has a higher incidence among alcoholics and patients with chronic systemic disorders, especially your cirrhotic patients. This patient's going to be presenting usually with a nodule or cord-like thickening of one or both hands with that involves usually the fourth and fifth fingers. These are going to be the ones that are going to be most commonly affected. They're going to have tightness in the fingers. They're going to be unable to extend that finger with occasional tenderness. And with these patients, right, um, we usually, treatment for this is usually, we can do a steroid injection like triamcinolone or collagenase injection into the nodule. And then surgery is usually going to be like the last line for these patients, right? And it's important to just educate that, that the patients that these are very likely to recur, so to come back. All right, so next one's going to be your decurvans tenosynovitis. This is going to be an inflammation of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendon. They really like to test this, so I'm going to repeat it once again. Decurvans tenosynovitis is going to be an inflammation of the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis tendons. Usually these patients are going to have pain at the radial styloid area. It's usually going to be provoked by lifting activity when the thumb is flexed while the hand is ulnar deviated. And usually on physical exam, they're going to have tenderness over the first extensor compartment. They're going to have positive Finkelstein's test, right, which is pain that's reproduced at the radial border of the wrist. So once again, right, positive Finkelstein test is associated with the Quirvin's tenosynovitis. The initial treatment is going to be splinting or steroid injections um, with these patients because it's going to usually decrease the swelling and pain. We can also do a thumb spica splint so we can immobilize it by doing a forearm based thumb spica splint. If the patient is not responding to any of these, then we can do an elective surgery release. So once again, right, the Kerwin tenosynovitis is going to be the inflammation of abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis tendons. And usually these patients are going to have a positive Finkelstein test. So scaphoid fracture is going to be the next one. This is going to be due to a foosh injury, so falling on that outstretched hand, right? And with these patients, they're going to be falling on an outstretched hand with dorsiflexed and radially deviated. Um, they're going to have forceful hyperextension of the wrist. They're going to be presenting with a painful wrist with swelling and prestigious ecchymosis and limited range of motion. So whenever you have a patient that presents with like a history that they fell right on their hand and they have that their wrist is very, very painful, tenderness, swelling, we're thinking about scaphoid fracture. And it's really important that we don't miss these because these patients are at high risk for what, right? Um, a vascular necrosis. So on exam, these patients are going to have maximal tenderness in the anatomic snuff box. Once again, maximal tenderness in the anatomic snuff box. They're going to have pain with radial deviation of the wrist, pain with axial compression of the thumb. And on x-ray, that's how we're going to diagnose them, right? Sometimes we are able to see the fracture, right? But sometimes we're not. So it's really important that if we don't see the fracture, we repeat the x-rays one or two weeks later, or we do an MRI with CT because it's important that we do not miss this because once again, the patient can have avascular necrosis. So what's going to be the treatment? It's going to be immediate immobilization. If we suspect, right, a fracture, we can do it with a thumb spica splint or a cast until the x-ray can be repeated. If the scaphoid fracture is non-displaced, then we can treat it with a short-arm thumb spica cast, right? And usually these patients are going to need surgery. They're going to have open reduction and internal fixation for displaced fractures. And what carpal bone in general is the most common fractured carpal bone. It's going to be the scaphoid, right? Scaphoid, scaphoid, scaphoid. It's going to be scaphoid. And once again, why do we need to treat these? Because these patients are prone to non-union or avascular necrosis. So scaphoid fracture, right? Falling on an outstretched hand, that tenderness around the wrist. Um, you'll see some ecchymosis. You'll have limited range of motion. You're going to do an x-ray for these patients. They're going to have tenderness in the anatomic snuff box. 
and it's important that we treat these patients because if not, they can develop avascular necrosis. So the next one is going to be your metacarpal neck fracture or their boxer's fracture. This tend to occur after a person hits an object with their closed fist, right? Very commonly found in men. Um, or whenever they do a direct blow, this patient is going to be presenting with local knuckle tenderness, swelling, decreased grip strength, decreased range of motion, bruising. They can also have an abrasion. On physical exam, um, <clears throat> you're going to tell the patient to flex their fingers individually and together, and you're going to assess the nail rotation, the finger rotation, and overlapping of fingers, right? Usually if there's overlapping of fingers and there's some type of deformity and you were possibly thinking of uh, metacarpal neck fractures, right? We're going to diagnose this with an x-ray. And how are we going to treat these patients? So usually with these patients, the majority of fractures are non-displaced and stable. And usually it's going to be with an ice, NSAIDs, and elevation. You can also do buddy tape or a brace, right? And now the treatment's going to depend on how much angulation there is, right? If there's less than 15 degrees angulation for index and middle metacarpal fingers, and if there's less than 30 degrees of angulation for ring and little finger uh, metacarpal fractures, then in these patients, um, if you reduce them and they, the angulation is still not maintained, then these patients need to go to surgery, right? All right. Now let's go on to mallet finger fractures, also known as your extensor tendon avulsion. So your mallet finger fractures. What's going to be the mechanism of injury? It's usually going to be a forced hyperflexion of the distal phalanx. So it's going to be a patient that was playing volleyball or basketball. And what happens is that they have like a disruption of the extensor tendon mechanism to the DIP joint, right? So the distal intraphalangeal joint. And this results in a flexion of the DIP joint for these patients. They're going to have a lot of pain. They won't be able to straighten their distal finger on physical exam. And usually treatment for these patients is that we splint them in extension for four to six weeks. And then um, <clears throat> that's going to be the conservative treatment for these patients. And then surgery is usually going to be required if the fracture involves more than 30% of joint spacing or if there's poor, poor healing with loss of function. All right, guys, so let's go into our next one, which is going to be our Salter-Harris fractures, right? Salter-Harris fractures. So just in general, for our Salter-Harris fractures, um, these are usually used to describe fractures, right? And the thing we need to know is, like, how many types there are. So there's five types. We have our type 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and then it's going to depend on which on where it's located, right? So type one Salter Harris fracture, it's gonna be a fracture is gonna be through the growth plate. Type two Salter Harris fracture is gonna be through the growth plate and metaphysis. Um, type three is gonna be through the growth plate and epiphysis. Type four is gonna be through all three elements. And type five is gonna be a crush injury of the growth plate. So how I memorize it is from the mnemonic Salter, right? So type one is gonna be straight across. So S, A is gonna be above which is going to be type 2. L, which is going to be your um, type 3, is going to be lower or below, right? Because it's going to be through the growth plate and the epiphysis. And then you have um, type 4, which is going to be um, through the entire three elements. And then you have type 5, which is going to be your ER, right? Erasure of the growth plates or crush. So once again, Salter, that's usually the mnemonic, right? Straight across, type 1, type 2 is above, type 3 is lower or below. Um, type 3 is when it goes through the growth epiphysis and plate. And then you can also use the uh, other T for that one. Type 4 is going to be through all three elements. And then type 5, it's going to be just where you have those crush injuries, right? Erasure of the, erasure, eraser of the growth plate or crush. Another one I wanted to go into real quick is going to be your Montague, Montiglia and your Galizzi fracture. So Montiglia is going to be an ulnar fracture with dislocation of the radial head, right? How I memorize it is Montiglia has an A, so A is proximal, so the bones are going to be affected proximally. And then you have your 
Elysia, which is going to be your radius fracture with dislocation of the joint distal to the radial ulnar joint. And since the Z is in Galicia, the Z is distal, so bones are going to be affected distally. So mugger, right? Mugger, M-U, we said Montigia, ulnar, um, Galicia, G-E-R. So Galicia is going to be affecting usually your, um, <clears throat> it's going to be your radius fracture. So that's how I memorize it. All right, so now that we're, gonna, we're done with that, why don't we go into our rheumatoid arthritis and just arthritis in general, um, and then our, we'll go into that. So inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. This is the most common type of inflammatory arthritis. The cause is unknowns, but we believe it's due to be triggered by cell, in, cell mediated immune response. This patient's gonna be presenting with an insidious onset of morning stiffness, right? Fatigue, low-grade fever, polyarthritis. It starts in the hands and feet. And usually the MTP joint is usually gonna be involved. You're gonna see swelling. Um, they're gonna have ulnar deviation and long-stand rheumatoid arthritis. They're gonna be nodules at the elbows. And they're gonna have those swan neck deformities, right? And your boutonniere deformities. And usually, how to differentiate um, your rheumatoid arthritis from osteoarthritis is that rheumatoid arthritis is going to be symmetrical, right? Versus osteoarthritis is going to be asymmetrical. How are we going to diagnose these patients? We're going to do labs. We're going to check for the ESR and CRP, your, which are going to be increased. We're going to do the rheumatoid factor, which is going to be positive. And then we're going to do the anti-cyclic uh, citrullinate peptide your, or your anti-CCP. This one's going to be positive also. This one's actually very specific for rheumatoid arthritis. So if you have a question, asking you which one of these are specific, it's gonna be your anti-CCP. We can also do a CBC, we're gonna see anemia of chronic disease, so it's gonna be a normal cystic anemia, right, with thrombocytosis. We can do an X-ray also, we're gonna see soft tissue swelling or joint effusion, we'll see just juxta articular osteopenia, loss of cartilage and bony erosions also, and MRI is gonna be the best test to see erosions, especially if the patient's coming in with an early um, onset of rheumatoid arthritis. Treatment for this is usually going to be with your DMARTs or things like sulfazalazine, hydroxychloroquine, leflunomide, methotrexate with folic acid one milligrams daily. You can also do your biologics like Humira and Embro, especially in those patients that have positive anti-CCP because these are usually more aggressive. And once again, right, whenever we're thinking about rheumatoid arthritis, we're thinking about our swan neck deformity, um, what is going to be the swanic deformity? They're going to have a hyperextended PIP joint, and then they're going to have a flex DIP joint. We're also thinking about a boutonniere deformity, which is where there is a flexed PIP joint and extended DIP joint. So rheumatoid arthritis, right? It's going to be symmetrical. Um, NCP joint swelling, we said, insidious onset of morning stiffness. So the stiffness is going to be worse whenever they wake up in the morning. The most specific Diagnostic test for labs is going to be your anti-CCP or your anti-cyclic citrullinate peptide. And then treatment, we said it's going to be your DMARTs, sulfazalazine, right, leflunomide, methotrexate. And we're thinking about abutinir and swan neck deformity whenever we think about rheumatoid arthritis. Next one's going to be your ocranon bursitis. Um, this is usually due to trauma or a lot of pressure on the elbow against the surface. This patient's going to be presenting with pain, swelling, redness, warmth, and pus if it's infected. We're going to do an x-ray for these patients, also CBC just to rule out infection, and then fluid analysis or culture if we suspect infection. Treatment for this is usually NSAIDs, uh, tell the patient to modify activities, and then protect the elbow. So next one's going to be gout, right? So whenever we think about gout, gout is very commonly found in patients that are older than 50 and also postmenopausal women. There's certain triggers for gout, like trauma, foods that are high in purine, alcohol, certain drugs. The big one that they really like to test is going to be your diuretics, right? Especially your loop diuretics. Salicylates also, niacin, urate-lowering drugs like probenicid. Um, and then also, <clears throat> the thing about gout is that we, make sure, we want to make sure that we treat it because it can lead to complications like nephrolithiasis. So what is the etiology of gout? Basically, there's uric acid crystal deposition, arthritis. This patient's going to be presenting with acute monoarticular arthritis. Usually, the first MTP joint or the big toe is going to be involved. So that's going to be your pedagra, right? They're going to have tophi, 
which is going to be the deposition of the crystalline uric acid. You're going to have a rapid onset of exquisite pain. Pain is going to be usually worse at the 8 to 12 hour period. They're going to have warm, swelling, erythema of the affected joint, fever, chills, malaise, cutaneous erythema. Usually also um, diagnosis, usually we're going to see hyperuricemia in these patients. So you, their serum urate is usually going to be greater than 6.8 milligrams per deciliter. On CBC, we're going to see leukocytosis with increased PMNs. You're going to have increased ESR and CRP. But the definitive diagnosis is usually going to be your arthrocentesis. So a treatment for these patients, um, usually for an acute gout attack, we can give them NSAIDs like endomethacin, colchicine, and glucocorticosteroids. Uh, the treat we can also tell the patient to make sure that they're decreasing their purine, right? So having a low purine diet, avoiding organ meats, sweet breads and sweet and high fructose drinks, and also making sure that they're drinking a lot of water. Also, if the patient is on a diuretic, then we can, we can make sure that we possibly change them to another medication, right? Because we said diuretics are a huge cause of gout. All right, guys. So once again, right, gout is going to be due to uric acid crystal deposition. It tends to involve the first MTP joint or the big toe, which is known as your pedagra. You're going to be presenting with swelling, erythema, warmth in that big toe. The definitive diagnosis is going to be arthrocentesis. This is where you're going to see those monosodium uric crystals, right? They're going to be needle-shaped. Um, usually, they're going to be biofringent negative. And we can also do an x-ray. Usually, on x-ray, you're going to see bony erosions that are round, oval-shaped, and punched-out lesions. And we said that for acute treat for acute gout treatment, we do endomethacin, colchicine, and glucocorticosteroids. Now, prophylactic treatment, which I apologize, I forgot to discuss, is that we can also do things like allopurinol. So that's usually going to be the drug of choice for um, prophylactic treatment. And then, of course, telling the patient to avoid any type of hyperuricemic medications like thiazide, loop diuretics, niacin, and aspirin. So what about pseudogout? So pseudogout is going to be calcium pyrophosphate deposition. It looks like gout, but it's not, and it's usually found in the knee or wrist. This patient is going to be presenting with minor arthritis, pain of the knees, redness, swelling. Um, it's usually going to be provoked by trauma, surgery, or severe medical illness. Diagnosis is going to be arthrocentesis. We're going to see those crystals, right? Uh, they're going to be rhomboid-shaped and positively biofringent versus gout is going to be negatively biofringent. Um, X-ray, you're going to see chondrocalcinosis in the articular cartilage, right? And treatment for these patients for acute attacks, it's going to be the same as gout. So it's going to be your NSAIDs, colchicine, um, corticosteroids. Um, usually, you can also do prophylactic treatment, but it's not very effective. You can also do regular colchicine, which is going to decrease the frequency of painful attacks in these patients. And we also want to think about pseudogout and other conditions that can cause pseudogout. So conditions that are like metabolic and endocrine, like we think about hyperparathyroidism, right? Hemochromatosis, hypothyroidism, and amyloidosis. So these are the things that we think about that can cause pseudogout. So once again, right, pseudogout, it's going to be due to what? It's going to be your calcium pyrophosphate deposition. It's usually going to be found in the knees. You're going to be present presenting with painful knees. On arthrocentesis, you're going to see these rhomboid-shaped and positive biofringent. And on x-ray, you're going to see this chondrocalcinosis. So the next one we're going to go over is going to be your Raynaud's phenomenon. So Raynaud's phenomenon. So with Raynaud's phenomenon, right, um, it's usually with these patients, what happens is that they're having some type of like vasoconstriction of their vessels, right? Some of the symptoms are usually suggestive of an autoimmune disorder. Um, and usually, Raynaud phenomenon attacks tend to start in a single finger and then they spread to other digits of the same in both hands. Usually, the most common fingers involved are going to be the index, middle, and ring fingers. It can also affect the toes and areas of the face, also. And this patient is going to be presenting with a sudden onset of cold digits plus skin pallor um, or cyanosis. So with these patients, how are we going to diagnose them? So we usually we'll ask these three questions like, are your fingers unusually sensitive to cold? Do your fingers change color when exposed to cold? Do they turn white, blue, or both? Right? And 
usually with these patients, it is a clinical diagnosis, but like we said, it's usually associated with an autoimmune disorder. So we want to make sure that we check for specific autoantibodies, like we want to make sure that we do a CBC, CMP, thyroid studies, do an ANA test, right? Serum and reurine protein electrophoresis. We can do an ESR and CRP. We can do um, tests for anti-toposomerase antibodies, um, SLE. We want to look for SLE, right? So we can do our anti or lupus, anti-double standard DNA. We can do the anti-Rho and SSA, anti-LA and SSB, um, anti-Smith and anti-RNP antibodies. So we're looking for like autoimmune disorder with these patients. So treatment is just patient education, right? Just making sure that we educate them on our warm clothing, stress control, and also tell them to avoid any type of vasoconstrictive medications like decongestants, right? Uh, sumatriptan, bleomycin, cisplatin, so some of our chemotherapeutic agents, opioids. If we do need to give them treatment, we can give them something like calcium channel blockers. That's usually going to be the first line. So nifedipine, amlodipine, and philodipine. So once again, right, right now it's phenomenon. It's just going to be that sudden onset of cold digits plus skin pallor or cyanosis. Um, treatment for this is usually going to be conservative. And then, of course, pharmacologic treatment is going to be your calcium channel blockers making sure that we look for any other autoimmune disorders that can be associated with these patients. So the next one's going to be scleroderma, also known as your systemic sclerosis. This is usually a diffuse fibrosis of the skin and internal organs. Um, it's a chronic multi-system autoimmune disease. It's usually, this one, this one also has Raynaud phenomenon, right? And it's very commonly found in women. It's actually four times more commonly found in women than men. And the thing you need to know about scleroderma is that there's a limited disease and a diffuse disease, right? So limited disease is going to be the most common one out of the two. It's about 80% of the patients and that we see. And usually it's going to involve thickening of the skin that's going to be confined only to the face, neck, neck and distal extremities like the hands and feet. These patients are also going to present with your crest syndrome, right? So that's a pneumonic crest, which is going to be your calcinosis, cutis that looks like tophus. Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility, S is going to be for sclerodactyl, and T is going to be for telangiectasias. Usually these patients have a better outcome than the patients with diffused scleroderma. So with diffused scleroderma, we said not as common, about 20% of patients have this. Um, usually it's going to be a widespread thickening of the skin, increased trunkal involvement with areas of increased uh, pigmentation and depigmentation. And the thing about this one is that it starts involving organs, right? So it involves the kidney, um, they can have interstitial and cardiac diseases also. So just in general for scleroderma, right, the etiology is unknown, so we don't know the cause of it. This patient's going to be presenting with Raynaud's phenomenon like we discussed. These patients can also present with dysphagia, right, especially if they're having that esophageal dysmotility. They can present with cutaneous symptoms like uh, skin becomes thickened, telangiectasias, ulcerations, and like we said, Raynaud's phenomenon. This is usually the first manifestation. They can also present with polyuria arthralgias, weight loss, malaise. Um, usually this is going to tell you that there's diffuse scleroderma. They can have diffuse pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary cardiovascular disease. Once again, diffuse scleroderma. And then if the patient has like scleroderma renal crisis, usually these patients have poor outcome already. So Diagnosis criteria for these patients, they either have to have thickened skin changes proximal to the MCP joints or at least two of the following, sclerodectal, uh, digital pitting, and then bi-basal pulmonary fibrosis. The diagnosis also has to be made if the patient has uh, three positive um, crest features, um, for example, lab CBC, you're going to see mild anemia, hemolytic anemia, proteinuria, especially if it starts involving the kidneys, right? They're going to have a positive ANA. Anti-SCL70 is going to be positive also. We can do an anti-central mute antibody also. This is one is not always positive. It's positive in about 50% of patients with crust. We can do imaging like chest x-ray. This is usually insensitive. Um, and then an esophagram also just to look at the esophagus, right? And treatment for these is that usually there's not an effective treatment that's going to cure the patient. So usually we just target the organs. So we'll do calcium channel blockers or Lorsartan for esophageal disease. We'll do proton pump inhibitors, instruct the patient to just make sure that they are taking their medications in crushed or liquid form, right? Remain upright for at least two hours after eating. And for 
We can also do cyclophosphamide is gonna help dyspnea, especially in patients that it starts involving the lung, right? We can do ACE inhibitors for hypertension. Um, that's due to scleroderma renal crisis. And usually these patients are referred, right, to rheumatology. So next one's gonna be lupus. So SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. This is a chronic autoimmune disorder. It's usually an inflammation of multi-organ system. It more commonly affects women than men, has a higher prevalence in African-Americans, Hispanics, Asians, and Native Americans. It's mainly found in your young patients between the ages of 20 to 40 years old. And another thing to keep in mind is that systemic lupus or SLE can also be drug-induced. So some of the common medications that are culprits of SLE are going to be procainamide, hydralazine, um, isoniazide, and quinidine. So make sure that you know that. They really like to test that. So it can be autoimmune or drug-induced, right? Drug-induced, we're thinking about procainamide, which is going to be um, the medications for our heart, right? We're thinking about hydralazine, which is going to be a hypertension medication, isoniazide, which is going to be your medications for tuberculosis, and quinidine, which is another medication, a cardiac medication. Uh, usually with drug-induced, the uh, symptoms tend to get better once we discontinue the medication. And usually with drug-induced lupus, it's not associated with like multi-organ damage, like uh, kidney damage, CNS damage, or alopecia. How is this patient going to present? They're going to be presenting with fever, anorexia, severe fatigue, weight loss, skin lesions, eye pain, arthritic pain. They're going to have this malar butterfly rash. They'll have this discoid rash. That's so usually pathognomonic for that with these patients. They're going to have pleuritis, pericarditis, nephritis, psychosis, seizures. And how are we going to diagnose these patients? They're usually going to have a positive ANA test, right? This is actually very sensitive for SLE. We can also do an anti-DNA test, an anti-Smith test, um, and anti-phospholipid antibodies. Also, we can also do complement studies, look for C3, C4, right? And then a direct Coombs test is another thing that we can do if we want to look for hemolytic anemia. Treatment for these patients is, of course, make sure that we're educating them on sun protection due to photosensitivity and rash. For their skin lesions, we can give them something like hydroxychloroquine. For their arthritis, we can do NSAIDs or acetaminophen. And then we can also do steroids, cytotoxic drugs, and DMARDs, like methotrexate and cyclophosphamide. So once again, systemic lupus, right? We're thinking about uh, the autoimmune, which is going to be the worst one. It involves multiple organs. We're thinking about our drug-induced, right? We talked about the medications, which were which ones. It was procainamide, hydralazine, isoniazide, and quinidine. Usually the symptoms will get better once you start to stop the drugs. And also another thing is that with drug-induced, it doesn't involve all the other organs, right? The key sign that usually you'll see on question stems is going to be that malar rash, right? That butterfly rash and that discoid rash on exam. For diagnosis, we're going to do a bunch of antibody tests, right? Positive ANA is going to be the one that's going to be sensitive for SLE. And treatment for these patients, right, is just going to be with steroids, um, cytotoxic, cytotoxic drugs, DMARDs. So the next one's going to be your Shorgan syndrome. So Shorgan syndrome, the cause is unknown, but we believe it's associated with Epstein-Barr virus and HLA gene. And usually the onset's going to be middle-aged and it's usually going to be predominantly found in your females and women. They're going to be presenting with sicka symptoms, so it's going to be that xerophthalmia, dry eyes, or xtomia, which is going to be that dry mouth. These patients tend to have a lot of like cavities, dental issues because of that dry mouth, right? Usually they'll have vision impairment because of their dry eyes, and these patients can also have systemic manifestations like arthritis, Raynaud's fever, and fatigue. On diagnosis, you're going to see a positive ANA, positive rheumatoid factors also, you're going to do the SSA antibodies. These are usually not specific, but we still do them. But usually SSB antibodies are going to be the best ones because these, your anti-SSB antibodies, because you're, these are have a greater association with Shorgans. Um, you can also do an ESR and CRP, which are going to be increased. You can do a Schirmer test also. And biopsy of the glandular tissue in the lip, this is going to help you see like the lymphocytic infiltration because this is an autoimmune disorder, right? We can also see parotid gland enlargement in these patients. And treatment is just going to be dependent on symptoms, right? So symptomatic treatments so for dry mouth, we can do something like pilocarpine or civelamine. Uh, for dry eyes, we can tell the patient to make sure that they're avoiding wind, right? Protecting their eyes from the sun. 
Um, but we can also give them like eye drops or um, tears. We can also do hydroxychloroquine and then we can also do DMARDs, right? So once again, right, um, Sjogren's syndrome, it's gonna be that patient's gonna be presenting with dry eyes, dry mouth, um, they're gonna have arthritis. Usually we'll do the um, anti-SSA and anti-SSB antibodies. Anti-SSB antibodies are gonna be the best ones. We also do the Rho and the Law antibodies also. So the next one's gonna be giant cell arteritis or your temporal arteritis and polymyalgia rheumatica. So for both of these, it's very commonly found in your older patients. You're gonna be, um, let me phrase that. It's gonna be found in your patients that are gonna be older than the age of 50. Um, usually they're gonna have an increased ESR. Now before we get into differentiate each one, it's really important that we know the differences, right? So just real quick, polymyalgia rheumatica does not cause blindness, right? And this one will usually respond to low dose prednisone therapy versus giant cell arteritis. This one can cause blindness and large artery complications, and usually this requires high-dose prednisone. So make sure you know that, right? Once again, polymyalgia rheumatica does not cause blindness. Low-dose um, prednisone therapy or corticosteroid therapy, giant cell arteritis does cause blindness. These patients need high-dose prednisone. So giant cell arteritis, right? The cause is unknown, but we think that it's due to herpes zoster. This patient is going to be presenting with that headache, scalp tenderness, visual symptoms, jaw claudication, throat pain, fever of a known origin, um, usually associated with rigors and rigors and sweat. Blindness also is one of the big ones, especially in one of the reasons why we treat these patients like ASAP. Um, physical exam, you're gonna see the temporal artery that's usually gonna be normal, but it can also be nodular, tender, or pulseless. And with these patients, how are we gonna diagnose them? So we're gonna do lab work, right? We're gonna do an ESR, which is gonna be increased. CRP also is gonna be increased. It's actually like, it's more sensitive than your ESR. On CBC, you're gonna see a mild normal chromic normocytic anemia and thrombocytosis. But the best test and the gold standard is gonna be your temporal artery biopsy. Treatment for these patients, it's important that we treat them as soon as we can, right? Because this patient can have blindness. We wanna prevent blindness. So with these patients, we want to give them prednisone, right? And usually it's going to be high-dose prednisone. We can also give them aspirin. This is going to actually decrease the risk of vision loss or stroke. So once again, right, giant cell arteritis, it's going to be that jaw claudication, that headache, scalp tenderness, blindness also um, these patients can have. And usually it's going to be that temporal headache. They're going to have headache like over here in the temporal area. Um, Usually with these patients, the best test is going to be your temporal artery biopsy. That's going to be the gold standard, and we're going to treat them with high-dose prednisone. Next one's going to be polymyalgia rheumatica. With these patients, they're going to be presenting with stiffness, pain in shoulders, hips, and lower back. Once again, this is usually going to be a patient that's going to be older than 50. Uh, they're going to be saying that the patient has trouble combing their hair, putting on a coat, rising from a chair, but they are not going to have any muscle weakness. They can also have a fever. It's usually going to be a low-grade fever, malaise, weight loss. So they look like they're super sick, right? Like a fee like they're having maybe some type of viral syndrome. Uh, physical exam, you might see some joint swelling, especially of the knees and wrists, but sometimes you may not see it. This is usually a clinical diagnosis, so we really don't need to do any testing. If we do, we can do a CBC, and most of these patients have anemia, and they have an increased ESR. And treatment for these patients, right, it's going to be with what? Like a low dose, like 10 to 20 milligrams per day of prednisone. All right, so now that we're done with that, let's go into our final topic for MSK. I know it's a lot. It's gonna be your back and spine disorders. So let's talk about ankylosing spondylitis. This is usually gonna be progressive stiffness plus chronic inflammation. Um, usually these patients have an arthropathy of the axial skeleton and sacroiliac joints. It's very commonly found in your young males between the ages of 15 to 30 years of age. This patient is going to be presenting with chronic low back pain, right? Morning stiffness, and usually the back stiffness improves with increased activity. And that's how you're going to differentiate this one between spinal stenosis and ankylosis spondylitis, because I know I get these confused a lot. Ankylosis spondylitis is going to be a patient that presents with lower back pain, and pain is actually going to improve with activity and exercise, versus lumbar spinal stenosis, the pain is gonna be worsened with activity. 
with ankylosis spondylitis, it's going to be better with activity. It's going to be your younger patients, that lower back pain, right? Um, with ankylosis spondylitis, I have decreased range of motion. Usually the pain can radiate to the thighs. And usually the patient is unable to place their head down while supine. And labs for these patients, uh, we're going to do an ESR, which is going to be increased. But the one that you need to know is that they're going to have a positive HLA B27. This is very, very highly tested, positive HLA B27. Um, on x-ray, you're going to do, for these patients, you're going to see a bamboo spine or a squaring of the vertebral bodies. I've also seen fusion of the vertebral bodies on question stems. And also, you'll see loss of normal curvature. Treatment for this is going to be first line is going to be NSAIDs, right? Rest and physical therapy. Second line is going to be your TNF alpha inhibitors, so you're like your MOBs, like infliximab, Remicade also. This is going to help with the back pain and stiffness. And then third line is going to be steroids. So once again, ankylosis spondylitis, very commonly found in your younger patients between the ages of 50 to 30. It's going to be a progressive stiffness plus chronic inflammation. They're going to be saying that they have this chronic low back pain morning stiffness that improves with increased activity, decreased range of motion. And we said that they're going to have HLA B27 positive. They're going to have a blue spine on x-ray. So make sure that you know that. Lumbar spinal stenosis, right? This is usually going to be an insidious back pain that um, increases with time. So it's usually due to narrowing of the spinal canal or neural foramina due to osteoarthritis of the lumbar spine or nerve root. Uh, compression. Also, disc herniation can cause stenosis, right? Um, and usually with these patients, it's going to be more commonly found in your patients between the ages of 50 to 60, so they're going to be a little bit older in comparison to your younger patients for ankylosis spondylitis. This patient's going to be presenting with pain in the buttocks, thighs, calves, during walking, running, and standing. They'll have back pain with paresthesias in one or both legs and leg weakness. Usually, we think about these patients about the shopping cart sign, right? So they're going to lean forward while walking to relieve the symptoms that they have. And usually, pain is going to be worse with back extension, especially with prolonged standing and walking. And the pain is going to get better with flexion, usually whenever they're sitting or they're walking uphill. So with these patients, they're going to have on physical exam limited extension of the lumbar spine. Because if they do extend their lumbar spine, they're going to have these symptoms that are going to radiate down their legs. So they're going to have a positive straight leg test for these patients. We're going to do an MRI and CT scan. And usually treatment is usually going to be conservative with um, physical therapy, right? You can also do facet joint corticosteroid injection. We only do surgery if the patient has no improvement or worsening symptoms for more than four weeks, or if they have significant spinal stenosis on an MRI or CT scan, right? So usually we'll do like a spinal decompression for surgery or nerve root decompression. So once again, right, lumbar spinal stenosis is going to be your older patients. Um, they're going to have pain worse it's with back extension. So whenever they're walking and standing for a long time, it's going to worsen. But the pain's going to be better with flexion. So if they're sitting or if they're walking uphill, it's going to get better, right? And usually the pain is worse with movement. And with these patients, they're going to have a positive straight leg test. So, let's go into the next one, spondylolosis, also known as your spinal arthritis. This is going to be a degenerative change of the spine, um, usually due to bones, bone spurs and degenerative intervertebral um, disease with vertebrae. It affects the joints and discs in the neck and back, and it occurs with aging. Versus your spondylolisthesis, this is usually a forward displacement of one of the lower lumbar vertebrae over vertebra below it. It's very commonly found in your adolescents and young adult athletes. It's most commonly seen in these patients. You can also see them in older patients, like older than 60 years old, that have osteoarthritis or had some type of minimal trauma. And this one can predispose to spinal stenosis later in life. So make sure that you know the difference between one of them, right? Spondylosis, more commonly found in your older patients. It's due to aging. Spondylosthesis, it's going to be in your adolescents and young adult athletes, so like your football players, etc. Next one's going to be your lumbar disc herniation or your herniated nucleus pulposus. With these patients, it's usually due to radicular pain into the leg because there's some type of compression of the neural structures, right? Especially the sciatic nerve. Usually L5 and S1 are going to be the most commonly ones that are going to be effective, right? So the nerves there, L5 to S1. It's usually due to bending or heavy lifting. 
um, with back inflection, so they herniate the nucleus of pul pulposis into the spinal cord area. It's also found in 30 to 50 year old patients, especially as a degenerative disc, disc disease. These patients are gonna have pain with back flexion or prolonged sitting. They're gonna have increased pain with prolonged sitting, bending, straining, or coughing, and they're gonna have lower extremity numbness and weakness with these patients. They can also have discogenic pain, um, which is gonna be localized in the low back. That's gonna worsen with pain. They can also have sciatica, right, which is going to be an electric shock-like pain that's going to radiate down the posterior leg, often below the knee. And how are we going to diagnose these patients? We can do an x-ray just to rule out any malignancy, but MRI is going to be the best test to assess the level and morphology of the herniation, right? If a patient has like very significant disc herniation, you can see numbness and weakness, right? Especially with weakness of the plantar flexion of the foot, if it involves L5 and S1 or dorsiflexion of the toes if it involves L4 and L5. What's going to be the treatment for these patients? First line is going to be modified activities, NSAIDs, um, also physical therapy. Um, usually we do surgery like last line, and that's going to be the best treatment for these patients. All right, guys, so next one's going to be cauda equina syndrome. This is severe compression of the spinal cord by a massive herniation into L4 and L5 by either a tumor or an abscess or just herniation in general. This is an emergency, right? This patient's going to be presenting with new onset of urinary bowel incontinence um, or retention, right? They'll have that saddle anesthesia, radiating pain to the legs, either unilateral or bilateral. They're going to have decreased deep tendon reflexes, leg weakness and numbness, and also decreased anal sphincter tone on a DRE. They will have no anal reflex. This is a surgical emergency, right? We're going to diagnose them with an MRI. So these patients need to go to surgery ASAP, right? So once again, cauda syndrome, right? It's going to be that compression of the spinal cord. And usually these patients are going to have that urinary bowel retention or incontinence, saddle anesthesia, decreased deep tendon reflexes, decreased anal sphincter tone on DRE, and these patients need surgery. So next one's going to be your scoliosis. This is going to be a lateral curvature of the spine. It's the most common spinal deformity found in your adolescence, right? Usually this patient's going to be presenting with a backache, or they can also have asymmetry on your physical exam. You're going to see curvature of the thoracic or lumbar spine. And on physical exam, you're going to see asymmetry in the shoulder and iliac height asymmetric scapular prominence, and then a flank crease with forward bending. So how are we going to diagnose these patients? We're going to tell them to bend forward, right? We're going to do the Adams forward bending test, which is actually going to be the most sensitive. And then we're going to do an x-ray and measure the Cobb angle. So the Cobb angle is going to tell you what's going to be the best treatment, depending on how many degrees of angulation there is for the scoliosis. So I know books tend to differ. I've read some books that have different degrees. But in general, like anything that's less than 20 degrees, um, usually you follow up with these patients, right? Six to 12 months follow up with clinical evaluation and possible x-rays. If it's greater than 20, then we want to make sure we do serial x-rays. And then usually I know if it's like 40 or even 30, they, uh, they do like bracing. And then if it's greater than 40, it's going to be like um, surgery. But I know textbooks tend to vary because I know I've read some textbooks that say like if it's 10 to 15, they do x-rays and then... Um, greater than 20 than surgery or bracing. But in general, right, just know that less than 20 is just going to be follow-up. You can do x-rays. And then if it's greater than 20, like 20 to 30, you can do something like bracing. If it's like greater than 40 or 30, that's severe. So these patients need surgery usually. So the next one's going to be kyphosis, right? Um, the etiology, we think about juvenile kyphosis of the thoracic spine. This is usually due to Schumann disease, and it, it can also be due to poor posture, very commonly found in your girls. It can also be congenital. Um, it can also be due to tuberculosis, like Potts disease, osteoporosis, and usually this is a rounded back. They're known as your hunchback, right? Um, these patients can present with mild back pain, spine stiffness, tight hamstrings, fatigue, um, and usually we diagnose this like We'll do a clinical exam, but we can also do an x-ray for these patients. And treatment is usually um, surgery only if it's severe kyphosis, right? Um, but it's, if it's due to things like Schurman's disease, then we can do body brace while bones grow. If it's due to osteoporosis, right? 
um, increased calcium and vitamin D intake, tell the patient to avoid alcohol, tobacco, given bone strengthening medications like our biphosphates, right? But in general, it's going to be pain relievers and exercise and only surgery if it's severe. Now let's go into the difference between a lumbar sprain and then a strain. So a lumbar sprain is ligaments torn from their attachments versus a lumbar strain is usually due to an injury like a twist, pull, or tear to the tendon or muscle. This patient is going to be presenting with back muscle spasms, pains that worsen whenever the patient moves, loss of lordotic curve, decreased range of motion, but they will not have any neurological changes or pain below the knees, right? Usually for these patients, it's a clinical diagnosis. We don't need to do x-ray. Um, usually the treatment is going to just make sure that they're having bed rest, right? NSAIDs and analgesics, and we can also do muscle relaxes if needed. So the next one's going to be neck pain, right? Neck pain. So neck pain, we have torticollis, rhinic. Um, this is usually, we have two flavors. We have the spasmodic torticollis. This usually begins in adulthood and involves the trapezius muscle, right? And it's usually sustained turning, tilting, flexing, or extending of the neck. Um, shoulder usually is elevated and displaced anteriorly on the side to which the chin turns. You also have congenital torticollis. Um, this is actually the most common type. And <clears throat> it's usually found in like, you know, difficult births, for example, where the muscle is injured, the SEM muscle is injured when the infant's head is pulled too much during birth, right? And just treatment um, for these patients, there's no cure for torticollis. Um, unfortunately, we just try to relieve the symptoms with either botulinum toxin, heat packs, massages to relax the muscles, and exercise. Next one's going to be thoracic outlet syndrome. This is going to be a compression of the brachial plexus and subclavian vessels. This patient's going to be presenting with pain, paresthesias in the neck or shoulder that extends to the medial aspect of arm and hand, and sometimes to the anterior chest wall. They can also have mild to moderate sensory impairment in C8 through T1 distribution. They can also have changes of the hand, vascular autonomic changes like cyanosis, swelling, and weakness. We usually do an Allen maneuver to, as a physical exam to diagnosis. It's because it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, we tell the patient to flex their elbow to 90 degrees. We abduct and externally rotate the shoulder. We palpate radial pulse while the patient rotates, rotates their head away from the involved extremity. And if the pulse disappears when the head is rotated, then that means that the patient does have thoracic outlet syndrome. It's positive for that. So diagnosis, we said it's usually a clinical diagnosis. We can do an MRI, especially if we want to look for uh, brachial plexus or cervical spine involvement. Treatment for this is just physical therapy, low-dose um, tricyclic antidepressants, analgesics, and then surgery is going to be like last line, right, if the patient is not responding to medical treatment. So... That is it, guys. So we are done with musculoskeletal finally. So let's go into our next topic now. All right, so neurology is gonna be our next topic. And why don't we start with Alzheimer's disease? So Alzheimer's disease is about 60% of all cases of dementia, usually very commonly found in your elderly patients, right? Between the ages of 60 to 70, the majority of them are older than the age of 85 with the patho for Alzheimer is that there's decreased acetylcholine synthesis. So there's imp impaired cortical cholinergic function. Usually these patients will develop these sensile plaques, which are focal collections of dilated tortuous neuritic processes that are surrounding a central amyloid core. So known as your amyloid beta protein for these patients. Also, these patients have neurofibrillary tangles. If you were to do a biopsy, which is a bundle or bundles of neurofilaments and cytoplasms of neurons that lead to neuronal degeneration. So how is this patient going to present with Alzheimer's disease? So it tends to begin insidiously, right? And then it progresses at a steady rate. Usually these patients will start having progressive memory loss. They'll have cognitive deficits like disorientation, trouble with their language, They'll have problems performing complex motor functions, inattention, visual misperception, poor problem solving, inappropriate social behavior, and sometimes also hallucinations with these patients. 
And then also when you perform a mini mental status exam, you're going to see that they have an intellectual decline in two or more areas of cognition. And there's different stages. So you have your early stage, you have your intermediate stage, you have your late stage, and then you have your advanced stage. In regards to how does the early stage start, these patients with early stages will have very mild forgetfulness. Then they'll have impaired ability to learn new material. They'll have poor performance at work, poor concentration, personality changes also, and impaired judgment. Sometimes they'll have like inappropriate humor. And then you have the intermediate phase, which is where the memory is progressively impaired. And usually the patient is aware that if something is going on and they're aware of their condition, but still they are in denial. Usually they'll also have visual spatial disturbances that are very common. So they get lost in places that were familiar to them and they have difficulty following directions. And these patients tend to repeat questions over and over again. Now, the late clinical manifestation, usually these patients will need assistance. They'll have difficulty remembering names of their friends, family members. They'll have trouble remembering major aspects of their life. They'll be paranoid. They'll have delusions. And also hallucinations are very common in these patients with late Alzheimer's. In advance, this is where the patient is completely debilitated by the disease and they depend on others. They have incontinence and they even forget their own name. And then, of course, this is a very sad disease because this can lead to death, which is going to be the final stage. And it's usually due to infection or other complications just because the patient is just so debilitated. So this is usually a clinical diagnosis for these patients. With these patients, um, you can get a CT or MRI scan. If you do get these, and that's when you're going to see that diffuse cortical atrophy with enlargement of ventricles which is something that I would know, hint, hint, right? So on CT or MRI, you're gonna see that diffuse cortical atrophy with enlargement of ventricles. Another thing that you can see is gonna be those neurofibrillary tangles, right? And extracellular neuritic plaques. You can also do CBC, CMP, right? Look for any metal ingestion that might be causing the problems with their cognition. Look at their calcium, glucose, TSH, B12, LFTs, drug and alcohol levels, because you want to make sure that you're ruling everything out with these patients. The treatment is that usually there's not any treatment that has been found to have a significant effect or completely treat the patient to this day. But there are medications that you can give, which is going to be your cholinesterase inhibitors like donepezil, rivastagmine, galantamine. You can also do Mimantine, which is going to be your NMDA receptor antagonist, vitamin E, and it's really important that you avoid anticholinergics in these patients, which makes sense, right? Because when we were discussing the pathophysiology, it's usually because these patients have decreased acetylcholine synthesis and they have impaired cortical cholinergic function. So you want to make sure that you avoid anticholinergics. And usually these patients do progress to death between five to 10 years, usually once they're diagnosed. So once again, what do you need to know about Alzheimer's, right? They're different phases. And how are they going to present on your CT or MRI, your diffuse cortical atrophy with enlargement of ventricles? You can also do the mini mental status exam. And that's going to also see how far the patient is or what phase they're in. The next one's going to be Bell's palsy. This is the hemofacial weakness and paralysis of muscles that are innervated by what cranial nerve? So it's going to be cranial nerve 7, and that's because you have swelling of that cranial nerve. It's really important that you know this cranial nerve because this is something that's very highly tested. So once again, cranial nerve 7 is going to be the nerve that's going to be involved in Bell's palsy. It's usually an inflammation or swelling of this cranial nerve. Now, we don't know what the cause is, but we do suspect that it might be due to herpes simplex virus. So how is this patient going to present? Usually they'll have in the history in the question stem, make sure that you're looking for this, is that they have a history of upper respiratory infection that preceded the Bell's palsy. They'll have an acute onset of unilateral facial weakness and paralysis. Both upper and lower parts of the face are going to be affected. And that's how you can differentiate this between a stroke. And this is something that they really like to test because they really like to trick you between Bell's palsy and a stroke. Once again, Bell's palsy, cranial nerve 7, it's going to involve both the forehead and the face. And usually with these patients, right, 
um, they will not be able to raise their eyebrows on the affected side. So you are telling them to raise their eyebrows and they won't. Versus a patient that has a stroke, they will be able to raise their eyebrows. They will be able to wrinkle their forehead, but their lower portion of the face is going to be paralyzed. And that's how you can differentiate, once again, Bell's palsy from your stroke. So Bell's palsy also, they'll have mastoid pain, decreased tearing, right? Um, usually these patients will be unable to close their eye on their affected eye, on the affected side. And they'll also have dysgeusia, which is going to be impaired taste or even loss of taste. So on your physical exam, you want to make sure that you also look at the external ear canal because you're going to look for that rash or vesicles to ensure that you're ruling out ramsey Hunt syndrome. This is usually associated with herpes zoster um, oticus. And usually these patients will also present with hyperacusis also. So diagnosis, this is a clinical diagnosis. You can do EMG testing. Usually you do this if the paresis is still there and it doesn't get better in like 10 days, but usually it's a clinical diagnosis. Another thing is that if it's bilateral, then you're thinking about Lyme disease, right? So once again, if it's bilateral, the entire face, Lyme disease, okay? So treatment for these patients, usually there is no treatment. You can give them prednisone and acyclovir because we said that we suspect that herpes simplex virus is a culprit of Bell's palsy. And then you're going to give them an eye patch to prevent corneal abrasion also. If it's severe and the patient is getting this recurrent or hasn't gone away and it's been months, then you can do something like surgical compression of the cranial nerve 7 if needed, but once again, treatment is not really needed, you can give them prednisone or acyclovir. So Bell's palsy, cranial nerve seven. Now let's go into our TIAs and cerebrovascular accidents for these patients, right? So let's go into ischemic stroke. So there's different causes and risk factors. If it's a patient that's coming in with an ischemic stroke and they're younger, these are some of the causes that we're thinking that can cause an ischemic stroke. So your oral contraceptives, does the patient have a hypercoagulable state, something like a malignancy, right? Do they have von Willebrand fracture? Um, also pregnancy, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Do they have, or are they taking vasoconstrictive drugs like cocaine, amphetamines? Do they have polycythemia vera, sickle cell? These are some of the causes that can cause an ischemic stroke in your patients that are younger. What are some risk factors? Age and hypertension, right? Older patient gets smoking, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, AFib, family history of a, of a previous CVA, or if the patient has in their history a previous CVA or a TIA, carotid bruise, and then once again, drugs like your oral contraceptives, cocaine, and some pathomimetics. So these patients, how are they going to present with your um, ischemic strokes. Remember we just said in stroke in general, ischemic stroke, it's really gonna depend on what artery is going to be involved. And this is something that they like to test. So let's just, just get into it. So the anterior cerebral artery is going to involve the contralateral paralysis of the lower limb and contralateral loss of sensation in the lower limb, okay? So that's gonna be the anterior cerebral artery. Now in regards to your middle cerebral artery, this patient's gonna have contralateral paralysis of the upper limb and face. They're gonna have contralateral loss of the sensation of the upper limb and face like we discussed. Um, and then usually with your middle cerebral artery, it will affect the Wernicke's area and the Broca's area. So they might have problems with their speech, right? So they'll have usually aphasia, especially if the lesion is going to be in the dominant, like the left hemisphere. And usually they'll have hemineglect if the lesion is going to be in the non-dominant hemisphere. So for example, the right. So make sure that you know these. They really like to test you on these. Now, in regards to diagnosis for these patients, we usually start with the CT head without contrast. Why? Because this is gonna tell us whether this is an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, and this is gonna be the first line. Because of course, before we start any type of uh, TPA or medications like that, we wanna make sure that it's not a hemorrhagic stroke and we make it even worse. So that's why we do our CT scan without contrast, okay? 
that's going to be the first line. We can also do an MRI. This is actually more sensitive than the CT scan, but of course it's not preferred in the emergency, right? The CT scan is going to be preferred. We can also do an EKG. This is also going to help us see whether the patient is having an acute heart attack or is AFib the cause of their stroke. We can also do a carotid duplex scan. This is going to tell us the degree of the stenosis of the carotid arteries, right? And then we can also do an MRA. This is actually going to be the definitive test for stenosis of vessels of the head, neck, and for any aneurysms. So what's going to be the treatment for an ischemic stroke for these patients? So usually uh, for an ischemic stroke, it depends. So if it's acute, you want to make sure that we do supportive treatment, right? Do our ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. So protect the airway, oxygen, um, give them IV fluids, of course. And then we also want to make sure that we are gradually controlling the blood pressure. So once again, this is going to be for our ischemic stroke. Usually we prefer to do this with a medication like IV labetalol, 20 milligrams for these patients. And of course, the stable treatment is going to be our TPA. We want to make sure that for prevention that we're controlling any risk factor that is leading for the patient to have a stroke. So control their hypertension, control their diabetes, tell them to stop smoking, control their cholesterol if they're obese, uh, tell the patient to lose weight, aspirin, right? If needed, we can also do a carotid endarterectomy depending on how stenosed those carotid arteries are. So that's going to be for our ischemic strokes, okay? So just in general for CVA and TIAs, right, we just want to make sure that we know, right, that hypertension is the most common and most important stroke a risk factor for strokes in general. And then whenever we're thinking about a younger patient, besides the causes that we discuss, we also want to make sure that we think about cocaine. Cocaine use is actually one of the most common causes of stroke in your younger patient. So just make sure that you know that. Also, what is a TIA, TIA right, in, co in comparison to a full-blown stroke? So a TIA is going to be a neurological deficit that lasts a few minutes, usually less than 24 hours, normally around 30 minutes. And usually these symptoms are transient because what happens is that there's reperfusion, right, to the collateral circulation or there's breakup of that embolus where you have blood flow going back to the brain. But still, these patients need to be treated because these patients are more likely to develop a full-blown stroke in the future. So, next one's going to be embolic stroke. So, we had just discussed ischemic strokes. So we have different types of flavors or strokes, right? We have our hemorrhagic strokes, we have our ischemic strokes, and then we also have um, embolic strokes. So, whenever you think about hemorrhagic stroke, this is basically your bleeding in the head, right? It's usually due to a ruptured vessel and you start bleeding to the head. And then we think about our um, ischemic stroke. This is where we talk about the embolic stroke that we discussed and then our thrombotic strokes also. So usually when you think about an embolic stroke, stroke, usually what happens is that there is a blood clot, right? Which is called an embolus and it forms in the circulatory system. And what happens is that blockage occurs when the clot reaches vessels in the brain too small to let it pass. So there's somewhere in the body where you create this embolus and it travels and it gets lodged in your small arteries, which is not allowing blood to go and circulate to the body, right? To your head. Versus cerebral thrombosis, usually with this, it's a blood clot or a thrombus that forms within an artery that is supplying blood to that brain. So it's forming in that artery and it's decreasing blood. And sometimes it'll completely obstruct that artery where you're not getting blood flow to the brain. And usually the most common type of stroke, the thrombosis, it usually happens due to damage to the arteries, which are caused by fatty deposit buildups, which is going to be your atherosclerosis. So once again, your embolic stroke is coming from anywhere in the body, right? We can think about AFib, which is creating those blood clots, shoots up a blood clot, it goes up, and it gets stuck in your smaller arteries, which is decreasing that blood flow, which is versus thrombosis, right? Your thrombotic, it's usually when you're decreasing the lumen, of those vessels that are going to the brain due to, for example, coronary artery disease, that plaque, that fatty buildup. And with time, it can include the entire vessel. We're not getting blood up to the body. So make sure that you know that. So we had just discussed our um, ischemic stroke. So let's go into our embolic strokes. This is actually going to be the most common type, right? 
And like we discussed, the most common source is going to be due to an embolization of a mural thrombus in a patient with AFib, like we discussed also. So usually a patient with an embolic stroke, the symptoms are very rapid, right? And the deficits are maximal initially. And usually the, the features are going to depend once again on what artery is affected, like we discussed. Out of the, all the arteries, the middle cerebral artery by far is going to be the one that's going to be most commonly affected. And since repetition is a key, and I say that through all my videos, let's say it one more time. So the MTA is going to be presenting with contralateral hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, hyperreflexia, aphasia, and apraxia. And then remember, aphasia usually involves the left. So diagnosis is going to be the similar to ischemic stroke like we discussed. So with these patients, we want to do a CT head scan without contrast, right, to differentiate between a hemorrhagic and an ischemic stroke. Treatment for these patients is that they have a very high risk of re-stroke, especially in the subsequent um, months for these patients. So our next one's going to be thrombotic stroke. So once again, these are forms or flavors of your ischemic strokes. So Thrombotic, right? This is going to be atherosclerotic lesions in large arteries of the neck or medium-sized arteries of the brain, like the middle cerebral artery, like we just discussed. And once again, usually these patients have an onset that may be rapid. And usually these patients awaken from sleep with neurological deficits. Treatment is going to be like we discussed the treatment for ischemic stroke, right? So let's go into our TIA, our transient ischemic attack, which we had discussed briefly. So it's a brief episode of neurological dysfunction caused by focal brain or retinal ischemia. Basically, there's blockage and flow, but it does not last long to cause permanent infarction, right? So once again, you're getting some blockage of flow to the brain, but usually the blockage will go away in a few minutes or hours, and these patients get better. But these patients are prone to getting a future um, full-blown stroke. So usually the sudden onset of neurological deficits that lasts minutes to less one hour, usually, usually normally lasts between 15 to 30 minutes, and these symptoms tend to get better and go away within 24 hours. How do we diagnose these patients? We're going to do a carotid Doppler ultrasound, and then we're going to do that MRA of the neck, the MRA. Treatment for these patients is usually we want to admit these patients if it's a new right? TIA. And then of course, if they have recurrent TIAs, because like I said, these patients are very prone to getting full-blown strokes. Also, we're going to give them antiplatelet therapy, things like aspirin or Plavix, with or without Plavix. And if the patient is high risk, then we're going to give them warfarin. So next one is going to be your amaurosis fugax. This one is very commonly tested. I've had a lot of question backs, so just make sure that you're familiar with this one. What happens is that you have atherosclerosis and emboli of the ophthalmic artery. So the arteries that go to the eye, you're going to have atherosclerosis there. Um, you can also have carotid stenosis, which are some of the causes of amaurosis fugas. And what happens is that the patient has a fleeting blindness or a curtain coming down vertically into the field of the vision. Usually it's painless, it's transient, and it's unilateral, so the patient's going to have monocular vision loss. Um, usually they'll have seconds of grain out of vision in one eye. In diagnosis, we're going to do a retinoscopy. We're going to see refractile arterial lesions, and then we'll also see cholesterol crystals with these patients. It's really, and the thing about this is once we see this is that usually these patients have an annual risk of stroke of one to two percent. And treatment for this, just make sure that we're checking up regularly with these patients, um, checking their carotid arteries, right? Just giving them telling them to change their diet. Uh, we can also give them aspirin, warfarin to just remove that blockage. So the next one's going to be carotid stenosis. This is where the extracranial internal carotid artery is stenosed more than 80%. So this patient may or may not present with symptoms of ischemia. Usually this patient can present either asymptomatic or with symptoms. So if the patient is asymptomatic, Usually, it's due to presence of narrowing of the internal carotid artery in patients without a history of recent ipsilateral ischemic stroke, or TIA. Versus a patient that's symptomatic, it refers to neurological symptoms that are caused by TIA or ischemic stroke in the carotid artery, um, territory, and ipsilateral to significant carotid atherosclerotic pathology. 
how is this patient going to present? So if they have symptoms of ischemia, usually they have partial and complete blindness in one eye and absent pupillary light response also. They'll have contralateral homonymous hemonopsia and hemiparesis, hemisensory loss. And if the left hemisphere is involved, then they're going to have aphasia. If the right hemisphere is involved, they're going to have left visual spatial neglect, construction, apraxia, dys dysprosody, and they can also present in general also with unilateral limb shaking, transient loss of monocular vision, especially when they are exposed to bright light. But the thing about this one is that it does not cause vertigo, it does not cause syncope, and it does not cause lightheadedness. Usually on your physical exam, you're going to see a carotid brui, or here a carotid brui. Um, when you do a fundoscope exam, you're going to see arterial occlusion or ischemic damage to the retina with a patient with carotid stenosis. So what's going to be the diagnosis for these patients? The gold standard is going to be a cerebral angiography. So once again, gold standard is going to be a cerebral angiography. This is going to help us identify those people or patients that would benefit for, from a endarterectomy. We can also do a carotid duplex ultrasound. This one's very non-invasive, but sometimes uh, you can miss um, certain things. So that's why we tend to prefer the cerebral angiography. You can also do an MRI of the neck or CTA also. So what's going to be the treatment for this patient? So it depends. Are they symptomatic or are they asymptomatic? So if they're asymptomatic, usually these patients, we put them on an antiplatelet therapy, statin, we manage their risk factors like their diabetes or hypertension. Um, if it's a patient that has more than 80% stenosis on a CEA, then usually these patients do need to ensure that we put them on medical therapy because they are very likely that they might get a TIA or a full-blown stroke. We ensure that we want to get a duplex ultrasound annually just to make sure that we are looking at the progression or, of course, the regression of the disease. And usually we can also do a carotid artery stenting only for patients that are higher risk, right? Um, if they have a lot of comorbidities also, or of course your family history. Now it's going to be for asymptomatic. Symptomatic usually with these patients, we want to anticoagulate them with warfarin and usually we'll do a CEA, so we'll do a carotid endarterectomy for patients that have severe stenosis. So if the stenosis is between 70 to 99 percent, we definitely want to do a CEA. If it's moderate stenosis between 50 to 69 percent, then a CEA is recommended. If it's less than 50% stenosis, we really don't need to do CEA for these patients. So that is going to be carotid stenosis. So let's go into the lesions one more time because this is very highly tested. So we said that the most common lesion in regards to the arteries is the MCA, right? But let's start with the ACA, so the anterior cerebral artery. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have contralateral lower extremity hemiparesis and hemisensory loss, more commonly in the legs and the arm. And usually they'll have abulia, which is going to be inability to make decisions. That's going to be for your anterior cerebral artery. Your middle cerebral artery, usually these patients are going to present with aphasia, especially if the dominant hemisphere is involved, right? They're going to have agnosia also, which is where the patient cannot process sensory information. And usually that's going to be only if the non-dominant hemisphere is involved. They're going to present with apraxia, contralateral body neglect, and confusion, especially if the non-dominant hemisphere is involved. They're going to have contralateral hemiparesis and hemisensory loss and homonymous hemonopsia also. So that's going to be for the MCA, which we said is going to be the most common artery involved. Now, what about your your ICA, right? Your inferior cerebral artery. So, so what about your internal carotid artery? This patient is going to present with ipsilateral blindness, and usually they'll have uh, the middle cerebral artery syndrome also. What about if it's a vertebral or posterior infer inferior cerebral artery? These patients are going to present with um, hema hemataxia, nystagmus, facial sensory loss, and a Horner syndrome that's going to be ipsilateral, so it's going to be on the same side, versus um, contralateral loss of temperature or painful sensation. They can also present with dysphagia. So what does ipsilateral, right? If it's the left one, it's going to be the same side symptoms. If it's on the left side, 
um, and they have loss of temperature, then it's going to be in the control side. So they're going to have symptoms on the right side of temperature, loss of temperature or painful sensation. If it's a basal artery, usually, right, when we think about the basal artery, the basal artery supplies blood to a lot of arteries. So if this one is blocked, this patient can present with quadriparesis, dysarthria, dysphagia, diplopia, somnolence, and amnesia. Now, what about the posterior cerebral artery? This patient's going to present with contralateral homonymous hemonoxia, amnesia, and sensory loss. If it's a lacunar artery, right, we're thinking about the internal capsule, the pons and the thalamus. Usually, if it's an internal capsule, usually this patient's going to have pure motor hemiparesis. If it's a pons, they're going to have dysarthria, clumsy hands. If it's a thalamus, they're going to have pure sensory deficit. So, we are done with TIAs and strokes. Definitely need to know these for your pants. So let's go into our delirium one. So a delirium is going to be an acute period of cognitive dysfunction due to a medical disturbance or condition. Usually elderly patients are very prone to getting delirium and there's so many causes that can cause delirium. So we're thinking about post-operative state, right? Pain medications. Uh, is the patient dehydrated? Do they have an infection, like a urinary tract infection, especially in your older patients? Do they have encephalitis? Medications, are they on TCA, steroids, anticholinergics, hallucinogens, cocaine? Is there any type of metal exposure? Are they withdrawing from alcohol or benzos? Do they have a fever, trauma, burns, right? Do they have a stroke, meningitis, mental illness, alcohol? Um, drugs like opiates, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and usually with delirium is that what happens and how you differentiate it from dementia is that delirium will wax and wane and it has a rapid onset, right? And usually these patients will sundown, so it's going to be worse at night. So clinical manifestations for these patients, uh, they're going to have a rapid deterioration in their mental status, usually from hours to days. They're going to have a fluctuating level of awareness, disorientation, abnormal vitals, and this usually is accompanied by acute abnormalities of the perception, such as visual hallucinations. So usually with these patients, they also can present with tremors sometimes. And how do we diagnose this? So we can do a mini mental status exam. Uh, we also do labs. So we want to make sure that you look at their vitamin B12, their folate, right, to rule out things like alcohol, um, CMP. Uh, we can also do a lumbar lumbar puncture, especially in your patients that are febrile, if they're delirious, just to rule out things like cerebral abscesses, right, or cerebral edema. And treatment is usually most of these are always reversible. We want to look for the underlying cause. If it's a medication, of course, we want to stop that medication. If the patient is acutely psychotic and agitated, then we can give them something like haloperidol. And it's important that we really never restrain these patients, right? We don't want to restrain them because that can make it worse. Unless, of course, they're severely psychotic. But most of these patients, we want to avoid restraining them. So dementia is going to be the next one. This is going to be a progressive deterioration of intellectual function, typically characterized by preservation of consciousness. So they preserve their consciousness. And like we said, this is going to be progressive versus delirium. It's like within hours to days. So the thing about this one is that the most important risk factor is age. So as a patient gets older, they're very prone to getting delirium. And there's so many causes that are reversible for dementia, like hydrocephalus, depression, right? Um, hypothyroidism, certain medications. And like we said, dementia is going to be insidious. It's going to be a progressive onset. Usually this patient is going to preserve their consciousness. And usually these patients rarely have hallucinations, and they don't have any tremors unless they have an underlying disorder like Parkinson's disease. So how are we gonna treat these patients or diagnose them? Usually we'll go do labs and imaging, so CBC, CMP, TSH, vitamin B12, folate, um, HIV. We wanna do a CT scan or MRI of the head. In treatment with these patients, we wanna avoid and monitor doses of medications, especially if they have uh, severe adverse effects that can affect their cognition. So, for example, steroids, opioids, sedative hypnotics, ansiolytics, anticholinergics, and lithium. We want to make sure that we're treating also their underlying comorbidities like diabetes, hypertension, depression. Uh, and then, of course, we can give things 
like vitamin E, donepezole also, but usually this is going to be irreversible. So the key for this is differentiated between delirium and dementia, right? So like we said, delirium, usually the onset is going to be abrupt versus dementia. It's going to be insidious for delirium. The course tends to fluctuate versus dementia. It's a slow decline. The duration for delirium is hours to weeks versus dementia. It's months to years, right? So let's go with our next one, which is going to be our different types of dementia. So we have vascular, frontotemporal, and Lewitt body dementia. So vascular de dementia, and how it sounds, right, it has to do something with the vascular portion with your vessels. Um, usually it's due to multiple infarcts. So usually a patient has had several infarcts in the brain where the brain is just not getting enough blood flow to that area, right? So the patient is going to have a stepwise decline. And it's more commonly found in your men than women. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have forgetfulness, right? But they won't be depressed. They might have problems with their speech, um, trouble performing routine tasks, sensory interpretation difficulty, confusion, amnesia, executive dysfunction. They can also have problems with their gait, urinary difficulties, motor deficits, and personality changes. So treatment for these patients, we want to make sure that we control the hypertension and any other metabolic disorder like we discussed. Are they diabetic? Control that. And treatment's going to be very similar to the treatment of Alzheimer's like we discussed earlier. So the next one's going to be your frontotemporal dementia, right? Frontotemporal dementia. Usually with these patients, they're going to have uh, personality and social behavior changes. They will have a non-fluent speech also. And... So usually they'll have like compulsive disorders also. Diagnosis for this is going to be an MRI. We'll see frontal or anterior temporal lobe atrophy, which makes sense. That's why it's called frontotemporal dementia. And we can also do a PET scan also. Supportive treatment is the treatment for these patients and SSRIs for depression since a lot of these patients are depressed. The next one's going to be your Lewy body dementia. This patients usually have features of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, but the thing about this one is that progression is more rapid in comparison to Alzheimer's disease. So this one progresses very quickly in the patient just going downhill. So the thing about Lewy body dementia is that they'll have cognitive fluctuations and the thing that really predominates is going to be visual hallucinations. And that's how you can kind of differentiate this one from the other ones, is that this one has your visual hallucinations. They can also have extrapyramidal features and fluctuated mental status. Um, they'll have Parkinsonism symptoms also. And with these patients... Treatment is going to be neuroleptics, especially for those hallucinations, since we said this is something that's very commonly and predominant in these patients. We can give them cholinesterase inhibitors like donepezole, rivastagmine, uh, galantamine, and we can also do selenjaline. Usually these medications will slow the progression because, like we said, this one has a very rapid progression. So now that we're done with that, why don't we go into our tremors, right? So we have different types of tremors. And the one by far you're definitely going to be tested on. It's going to be your essential tremors, right? So essential tremors are usually familial, right? It's going to be someone in the history that the patient has a family history or someone in the family that has a tremor. It's autosomal dominant. And the thing about this one is that it's known as a postural tremor. Why? Because it's worse with certain postures. For example, if you're armed or outstretched, or if you're doing certain tasks like your handwriting, drinking from a cup, or use of the utensils, that tremor is going to be worse. These patients have, can have head tremors, also vocal tremulousness. And the thing about this one is that it improves with alcohol, which is really interesting in comparison to all the other ones. So this one will improve with alcohol. Treatment for this one's going to be propanolol. That's going to be the first line. You can also do something like primidone, but by far propanolol is going to be the treatment for this one. So you also have a resting tremor. This is going to be a tremor at rest, right? Whenever we think about this, we think about Parkinson's disease, right? Or Parkinsonism tremors, or medications like your antipsychotics that can lead to these resting tremors. And then you have that intention tremor also, which is going to be a tremor during movement that increases as a target is approached. So these patients have no tremor at rest, but 
Usually when we think about an intention trauma, we're thinking about patients that have cerebral disease, multiple sclerosis, or chronic alcohol use. But by far, make sure that you are familiar with your essential tremor. That one is very highly tested. So let's go into our headaches. Why don't we start with migraines, right? Migraines. So migraines in general are more commonly found in women than men. There's a lot of factors that precipitate migraine. For example, emotional stress, hormones in women, like their menses, right? Is the patient not eating, weather, sleeping, disturbance? odors, neck pain, certain lights, alcohol, smoking, heat, food, exercise, and usually some of the comorbidities for this is going to be sleep disturbance, so insomnia. So usually, how is this patient going to present? They tend to have recurrent attacks of these migraines or these headaches over hours to days, and there's four phases. So they have that prodrome, which is going to be 24 to 48 hours before they get that, that headache, so they'll have euphoria, depression, irritability, food cravings, constipation, neck stiffness, increased yawning, and then they can't present with an aura or without an aura. That's why you have two different flavors of migraine, aura or without aura. So in general, for a migraine, they're going to have that unilateral throbbing, pulsatile, increasing gradual intensity over four to 72 hours. They can also present with nausea and vomiting, photophobia, phonophobia, it's better whenever they lie down, especially in a very dark, quiet room, because lights in general are going to make it worse. And the post room with these patients is usually they'll have pain with sudden head movement in a certain location of the headache. And usually these patients feel very drained and exhausted after the headache has occurred. So this is usually a clinical diagnosis. We don't need to do any type of imaging, of course, unless the patient has any red signs on your physical exam, like do they have fever, do they have a stiff neck, papilledema, are they older than like 50, do they have any comorbidities, then we can do imaging, but usually it's a clinical diagnosis. Treatment for these patients, if it's an acute exacerbation, we're going to do something like our tryptans, like sumatriptan, right? We can also do NSAIDs and dihydroergonomines. Antiemetics, because a lot of these patients present with nausea and vomiting. Prophylaxis with these patients, it's going to be beta blockers like uh, propanolol. You can also do calcium channel blockers for these patients. And why don't we go real quick into our migraines with aura and without aura. So the classic migraine is going to be your migraine with aura, right? Um, there is a thought that maybe it's due and caused by serotonin depletion, but we don't know. And what is an aura? Aura, usually what happens with these patients is that they have signs like uh, they'll see bright lines, shapes, objects. They might have, so these are visual signs or symptoms. They also have auditory symptoms, which are going to be your ringing in the ear, noises, music, somatosensory like burning, pain, paresthesia. So paresthesias can affect like the buccal mucosa. They'll have motor symptoms like jerking, repetitive rhythmic moment, uh, movements. So any of these are going to be an aura. It tells the patient that a migraine is coming on. So usually these symptoms happen before the migraine starts with these patients. And like we said, the treatment is going to be similar like we discussed. Um, now migraines without aura, these are going to be the most common type of migraine it's a common migraine and with these patients right they're not going to have that aura that we discussed they're going to have those classic symptoms that we discussed of a migraine that unilateral pain right um with these patients and also we think about our chronic migraine so chronic migraine is characterized as a headache occurring 15 days or more out of the month for more than three months and usually they'll have features of migraine on at least eight days out of the month. So it's going to be a chronic migraine. So those are migraines. Make sure that you know how to treat these, right? So these are usually focally. And they're photosensitive, so they can't even go to light. They're going to be presented with nausea and vomiting. And they can present with aura or without aura. The next one's going to be your tension headaches, your tension headaches. So your tension headaches, it's caused by multiple things like stress. It can be psychogenic also. We really don't need to know the cause, but we think that what happens is there's just stress or tension that causes that muscle contraction. It's very commonly found in women. 
And the thing about this one is that it usually presents bilateral. So it presents throughout the entire head versus migraine, right? It's usually unilateral. This one's going to be bilateral. And the patient's going to say that they have that band-like pain. So it's going to be that band-like, like they're wearing a very tight band. And it can last hours to days. And usually this one's not associated with full chronological symptoms. And this one's going to be the most common headache by far. So what's going to be the treatment for this one? If it's a mild to moderate headache, usually NSAIDs, Tylenol, Aspirin for these patients, right? And if it's severe, you can give them something like tryptans. Usually in the emergent setting, you can give something like metoclopramide uh, plus Benadryl. You can also give IV chlorpromazine if needed for these patients. Um, but yes, just in general treatment for this, it's just with simple energies, analgesics, right? And like we said, tension headaches are going to be by far the most common headaches. The next one's going to be your, your cluster headaches. This one's not very common. It's rare. It is very commonly found in men, specifically your middle-aged men, and specifically your chronic cigarette smokers. So that, was, that would be something I wouldn't know. So very commonly found in your chronic cigarette smokers with these patients. And these tend to last episodic. So they last two to three months, and then they'll have remissions of months to years for these patients. The thing about this headache is that it's also unilateral, right? But it's, it's excruciatingly, excruciatingly severe unilateral headaches with pain that usually peaks in 10 minutes and lasts up to three hours with these patients. And these patients tend to have symptoms of, for example, they'll have ipsilateral autonomic signs like rhinorrhea, right? That runny nose. They'll have lacrimation, my meiosis, and ptosis, and that's kind of how you can differentiate this headache in comparison to your migraine. Since usually the sites of pain is going to be the orbital area, that supraorbital area, and the temporal regions. And these headaches tend to occur several times uh, during the day, and that's why they're called clusters. And like we said, they're usually followed by remission. And the first line treatment for this is Usually with these patients, we want to give them 100% oxygen inhalation via a non-rebreather facial mask. That's going to be the best treatment. We can also give them subcutaneous tryptans also because oral tryptans are not effective. So that's why we give uh, subcutaneous tryptans. I've seen also questions asked in regards to the prophylaxis for a cluster headache. So make sure that you know that. The first line prophylaxis is going to be your calcium channel blockers like verapamil. So once again, cluster headaches, men, uh, your cigarette smokers, especially those chronic cigarette smokers, it's going to be unilateral. These patients are going to have the symptoms of ipsilateral lacrimation, facial flushing, like we said, uh, nasal stuffiness and discharge. And treatment for this is going to be oxygen. Prophylaxis is going to be verapamil, calcium channel blockers. So the next one's going to be your Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is due to a loss of dopamine-containing neurons in the substantia nigra and loss of corporeus. So the age of onset is usually after the age of 50. And there's also medications that can cause Parkinson-like symptoms like we discussed, right? Our antipsychotics, especially like our first generation antipsychotics because they're very good at basically what they do. So these, these patients can present with Parkinsonism uh, symptoms also. So medications like chlorpromazine, um, also, you have medications like metoclopramide, and patients with Parkinson's are going to have that pill tremor at rest. Remember, we were discussing the tremors earlier. So that pill tremor at rest that's worse with emotional stress and resolves whenever the patient is performing a routine test. So usually they'll have that pill rolling um, tremor. Also, they have bradykinesia, which is slowness of voluntary movements. So they're going to be very, very slow. They'll have that cobble rigidity. What does that mean? That's racket-like jerking. Um, usually we examine this by testing tone in one limb while the patient clenches their opposite fist. They can also have poor posture reflexes, difficulty initiating first step and walking. So they walk with these small shuffling steps. So that's why they're called shuffling gait that they have. They're gonna have this masked faces. Like it looks like they're wearing a mask because really they can't make any facial emotions whatsoever. They'll have dysarthria and dysphagia, so trouble swallowing, trouble with their speech. Decreased blinking is another one. Um, 
Also, they can have impairment of cognitive function like dementia with these patients. And this is usually a progressive course, right? Um, usually they tend to get very significant disability by five to 10 years with these patients. And there's like a sign called, it's called the Meyerson sign. With the sign, you do repetitive tapping over the bridge of the patient's nose. And usually these patients will have a sustained involuntary bullying response whenever you do that. Diagnosis is usually gonna be a clinical diagnosis, right? Um, you can do like your physical exam findings, like we said, the Meyerson sign, you can do the glomerular reflex. This is usually elicited by repetitive tapping on the forehead. So you're repetitive tapping on her forehead. And if the patient blinks in response to the first several taps, then you can say the patient has a positive glomerular reflex. Um, you can also do things like a mini mental status exam, which I did a lot during my psychiatry rotation for patients with Parkinson, just to rule out things like dementia. And the thing about this one, there's really no cure, unfortunately. The treatment for these patients is just ensuring that we relieve the symptoms that they have and that we delay the progression of the disease. So the drug of choice is going to be your carbidopa lobodopa. This is actually the most effective one. Another drug that you can give is going to be your dopamine receptor agonist, right? So things like bromocryptine, uh, pramipexil, because remember we said that with these patients, they lose their dopamine containing neurons. So we're going to give them dopamine back. And that's what these medications do, like bromocryptine. You can also do selegiline. You can give them anticholinergics. These are going to be very good for tremors, so things like benzotropine. And last line is going to be surgery. So surgery is going to be last line. This is going to be for refractory cases or patients that just have very severe diseases. Um, even severe disease before the age of 40, we can do something like surgery. It's going to be your deep brain stimulation. During my anatomy um, class, fortunately, my program was one of those programs that had a cadaver lab. One of the patients that we, or cadavers patients, that we looked at actually had a deep brain stimulation in their brain. So that was really interesting. So let's go into our next topic. It's going to be seizure disorders or just seizures in general. So the thing that they really like to test is to differentiate between a seizure and syncope, right? Because, I mean, if you think about it, it may be confusing, like they both pass out, but you really need to know the difference between each one. So let's go into seizure. So seizure is going to be a sudden, abnormally high synchronous discharge of electrical activity or a chronic disorder of recurrent idiopathic seizures that are not reproduced by a secondary cause. Usually with seizures, duration of the unconsciousness tends to be longer than a syncope, okay? So when a patient has a seizure, they're unconscious usually a lot longer than when a patient passes out syncope. So there are different causes of seizures, and these are kind of the causes that we want to keep in the back of our mind whenever we have a patient that has seizures. There's usually the four M's and the four I's. So when we think about the four M's, the first one's going to be your metabolic and electrolyte disturbances. Um, is a patient hyperglycemic? Are they hyperthermic? Do they have uremia? Do they have a thyroid storm? Are they hypocalcemic, especially if they have a calcium level less than seven? Are they intoxicated with water? Hypernatremia, is it greater than 155? Or hyponatremic, less than 120? So I definitely would know this. Hyponatremia is very highly associated with your seizures. The next M is going to be mass lesion. So do they have brain metastasis, any type of brain tumor? hemorrhage in the brain. The next M is going to be missing drugs. And that's actually one of the most common causes of seizures is that the patient is just not compliant with their medications, with their anticonvulsants. Are they withdrawing from alcohol, benzos, barbiturates? The next M is going to be miscellaneous, pseudo seizures, right? Usually these patients have a psychiatric illness that is causing these seizures, eclampsia, uh, hypertensive encephalopathy, childhood febrile seizures, right? Now, those were the four M's, now the four I's. First one's going to be intoxication, cocaine, lithium. The next I is going to be infection, right? Does a patient have an abscess in the brain? Do they have bacterial or viral meningitis? Do they have septic shock? The next I is going to be ischemia, involved stroke, TIA, especially in your elderly patients, syncope, and the last line is going to be increased intracranial pressure due to trauma. So those were the four M's and four I's. Keep those in the back of your mind. By far the most common cause of seizures in general is just going to be the patient is not adhering to the medications. So 
let's go into infantile spasms. This is going to be the first one. So this is a very severe type of epilepsy syndrome with a peak incidence between 4 and 12 months of age. So whenever you're looking for this one, it's going to be a very young baby, 4 to 12 months of age. And usually these patients, these babies, are going to have these brief jerking spells of flexion, extension, and usually a combination of both that's going to involve the head, neck, arms, trunks, and legs, and usually it lasts a few seconds or even less. Usually the spasm occur in clusters during the sleep-wake transitions. And of course, the diagnostic test is going to be an EEG. On your EEG, you're going to see hips arrhythmia. And that's usually what's pathognomonic for your infantile spasms is going to be that hips arrhythmia EEG. The thing about this one is that it's associated with tuberous sclerosis. So also make sure that you keep that in mind for these patients. And treatment for this one is going to be your adrenocorticotropic hormone. So it's going to be ACTH. So make sure you know that one, infantile spasms. So just in general for seizures, the patho, right? Seizures occur because there's increased depolarization for patients. And they're classified as either focal, partial focal seizures, and then you have your generalized seizures. Partial focal, is partial or focal seizures because it's combined to a small area of the brain. So um, usually it involves like a focal part of one hemisphere. These can become generalized, right? Now, what is generalized? Just when it involves the um, diffuse brain involvement. It then involves both hemispheres with these patients. And usually, how can you differentiate in general a seizure from a pseudo seizure? It's going to be your prolactin levels, and then of course your EEG. Prolactin levels are usually going to be elevated in seizures, and that's going to tell you that it's actually a real seizure in comparison to a pseudo seizure. You can also do an EEG, right? Hmm, but. Let's go into the classification of seizures. So we said our partial focal seizures, simple uh, partial. How is this patient going to present? These patients are going to have fully maintained consciousness, okay? They can have focal sensory or autonomic motor symptoms. Usually it's followed by transient neurological deficit, also known as your pause paralysis, that lasts up to 24 hours with these patients. The next one's going to be your partial focal seizures your complex partial, right, which falls under that umbrella. This one with complex partial, the consciousness is going to be impaired. It starts focally with these patients. And on your EEG, you're going to see interictal spikes with slow waves in the temporal area. These patients also present with aura, right, auras. And these tend to last a very low amount of time, but usually less than three minutes. And it's followed by a phase of preserved awareness that the patient can later describe. So what's going to be an aura? Usually it's going to be some type of sensory, autonomic, or motor system, which the patient is aware of. Sometimes it can precede the seizure or it can accompany the seizure. And these patients are also going to present with automatisms like lip smacking, manual picking, padding, coordinated motor movement, like walking also. So these were our partial focal seizures, we had our simple partial and then our complex, right? Simple, the consciousness is fully maintained versus complex, the consciousness is impaired. Now let's go with our generalized seizures. So we have different types. So why don't we go into our absence or petite mal seizure. With these, these are very commonly found in your children, right? It's gonna be that child that is just not paying attention in class, um, they, for example, stare off into the, to, the teacher will tell you that they stare off and they're just not paying atten attention to class. So why are they having these seizures going on? And so with these patients, they have a brief lapse of consciousness and usually the patient is unaware that they're having the seizure. They'll have these brief staring episodes, the eyelids will be twitching, twitching and usually they tend to last between five to 10 seconds. They occur in clusters and usually a patient can have up to dozens or even hundreds in a single egg. Day. The thing about this one, though, is that there's going to be no post ictal phase. So this one can be clonic, so that jerking, right, tonic stiffness, or atonic loss of postural tone. Like we said, it's the most common in childhood, and they tend to go away by the age of 20. And the thing about this one that kind of differentiates all the other ones is that on your EEG, you're going to see a bilateral symmetric 3 hertz spike and wave action. Okay? Once again... If I see an EEG and I see that bilateral symmetric three hertz spike, 
I'm thinking about uh, absence or petite mal seizure. First line for these patients is going to be edosuximide. And this one only works for absence seizures. Next one's going to be your tonic clonic or your grand mal seizures, right? These patients have that tonic phase and that clonic phase and the post ecto phase. So the tonic phase is where the patient loses consciousness, they have rigidity and sudden arrest of respiration. It tends to last about less than 60 seconds and then they go into that clonic phase. The clonic phase is gonna be that repetitive rhythmic jerking that lasts about less than two to three minutes and then it leads to that post ecto phase. Post ecto phase is usually a flaccid comma or sleep. It, the duration tends to vary, variate and usually it's defined by depressed neurological function. Okay, so usually these patients, and they were moving so much, right, they were physically tired, and that's what usually the post ictal phase is, is, that the patient is just tired from their brain shooting everywhere, like all those neurons, right, all that electrical activity, all that movement of the body, the patient is just tired. So usually with these patients, they wake up, um, and then they're usually going to be confused or agitated. So usually with these Seizures, they can be accompanied by incontinence, tongue binding. They can also aspirate. So it's really important that we turn these patients right on their side when they're having their seizures. Um, and then an EEG for this one is going to show generalized high amplitude rapid spiking. Treatment for this is going to be your anti-epileptics like valproic acid, right, phenytoin, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, topiramide. But usually valproic acid is going to be the first line for your um, tonic clonic seizures. The next one's going to be your myoclonus. This is going to be a sudden brief sporadic involuntary twitching. This patient is going to have no loss of consciousness. And the thing about this one is that usually a patient will have a simple motor seizure in like their left arm followed by post ictal weakness in their left upper extremity. It tends to involve either one muscle or group of muscles. There's like a really good episode on house. There's a patient that just has a myoclonus and it was just like the leg, just the twerking of the leg. So it can just involve one muscle or group of muscles. Treatment for this is going to be valproic acid and clonazepam and or clonazepam. And then you have your atonic seizures, your drop attacks. The patient just drops and they lose their postural tone. And then you have your status epilepticus. This is going to be where the patient has repeated generalized seizures without recovery for more than 30 minutes. So they're repeatedly having seizures for... Uh, more than 30 minutes and they're not getting better from the seizure with these patients. There's so many triggers that can cause it, right? Um, for example, sleep deprivation, emotional stressors, certain medications, infections, alcohol. And with these patients, diagnosis requires at least two separate seizures that are unprovoked and an EEG is actually going to be the best one. But of course, we want to make sure that we do a CT head scan and MRI just to make sure that we're ruling out things like maybe a tumor, stroke, right? And with these patients, treatment is going to be with lorazepam or diazepam. We can also give them phenytoin and also phenobarbital if, if um, needed. So if the patient has a first seizure, it's really important that in general, we get a CBC, CMP, LFTs, get their glucose, renal function test, serum calcium, UA, just to make sure they're ruling out everything else. But if the patient is a known epileptic, right, and they're coming in, it's really important that we check their anticonvulsant levels. Because sometimes, once again, these patients are just not complying with their medications, which is going to be the most common cause by far for these patients. So that is going to be it for these patients. And like we said, status epilepticus, um, make sure that you know that one, like we said, the treatment for these patients is usually going to be with your benzodiazepines. If the benzos are not working, then you can add phenytoin after that. So the next one is going to be syncope. So remember we were discussing syncope and seizures. It's really important that you know the difference between these. So syncope is loss of consciousness or loss of postural tone secondary to acute disease in cerebral blood flow. Usually the patient's going to have rapid recovery of consciousness without resuscitation. Um, there's different types of syncopes, right? We're thinking about, for example, vasovagal. This is usually due to neurocardiogenic. Um, usually the patient's going to faint. 
And this is going to be the most common cause of syncope. It's going to be vasovagal. So vasovagal is going to be that patient in the question stem, right? That they were stressed out or someone in their family passed away and they um, passed out. Or they were so scared that they passed out. There was so much pain that they passed out. Um, other causes can be extreme fatigue, claustrophobic situations, right, with these patients. And also, um, that's vasovagal. So orthostatic, right, usually we're thinking about medications that block the ganglions, diabetes, if the patient's older. And usually what happens with the orthostatic is that there's a defect in the vasomotor reflexes. And usually posture is going to be one of the main causes. So is a patient suddenly standing? Like they get up out of the bed really briefly, or are they standing for a very long time? We're thinking about uh, orthostatic. I know during my surgery rotation, they always told us to bend our knees or just change position because if you're standing for a really long time, sometimes it will be like people passing out behind you. So that would be an example of that. So how is the patient going to present? So if it's vasovagal, usually they'll have pallor, right? They'll have sweating, lightheadedness, nausea, dimming of vision, or ring them ears. And these are symptoms they're going to get before they pass out. Versus orthostatic, you usually get light, lightheadedness and nausea also. Uh, diagnosis for these patients, we can do that tilt table test, right, just to rule out things like um, orthostatic or even cardiogenic. We want to make sure that we rule out life-threatening causes also, so ensure that we're getting an EKG. Does a patient have like an underlying heart problem? Hokum, right? Um, so EKG for everyone, a CBC and CMP. If needed, we can do a 24-hour Holter monitor. Also, if we suspect it's a seizure, we can do an EEG. An echo, if, for example, there's an abnormal EKG. Um, prolactin we can also do, just in case, once again, if we think it's a seizure, right? So treatment, if it's vasovagal, just make sure that we educate the patient on elevating their legs, right? Um, supine posture, if it's orthostatic, ensure that the patient is increasing the amount of fluids that they're drinking, their sodium, and um, we can give them fluid or cortisone also if needed. So the next one's going to be vertigo. Vertigo is basically when you feel that everything's like spinning around, right? The world's spinning around you. And there's several causes of vertigo. Um, for example, is a patient using certain medications that are like autotoxic, right? For example, your aminoglycosides, do they drink? Do they take a lot of caffeine, nicotine? And usually this patient is going to be presenting with dizziness. They'll have lightheadedness, imbalance, nausea. Usually the symptoms are brought on by changing the position of their head, like tipping their head back. And usually these episodes tend to last less than one minute. Usually the dizziness is also triggered by lying down or rolling over. So it's really important that you know how to differentiate dizziness or vertigo between a central cause and just like a vertical cause, right? So, um, I'm sorry, a central or peripheral cause. So central, is there something in the brain that's going on that is causing that dizziness? Or is it peripheral? Is there just something in the auditory system, right? In our ears, because that's usually what is associated with our dizziness. So it's really important that you know the differentiate between both of these. So why don't we go into each one? So whenever we're thinking about peripheral, right, usually the onset of dizziness or vertigo is going to be sudden. It's going to be quick, like it's going to hit you. Boom. Versus our central causes of vertigo, it's usually going to be gradual. So it'll be a patient that's just like it's getting worse or it's been going on for a while. It can be sudden also, but more commonly to be gradual. Now, for duration, for our dizziness, a patient's usually going to have, for peripheral, the dizziness is going to last seconds to minutes, and it's going to be intermittent. Versus central, it's usually variable, right? It can be brief, it can intermittent, it's just variable. The intensity, though, for that dizziness, for that vertigo, for a peripheral cause, is going to be severe. Versus the intensity for a central cause, it's going to be mild. Now, in regards to the head position, in peripheral causes, if the patient um, moves their head, it's going to be worsened versus a patient that has central vertigo, there's not going to be much change with head position. Now, in regards to the nystagmus, this is a big one. In peripheral vertigo, it's usually unidirectional, right? And it's never vertical. So it's always unidirectional. It goes one direction versus nystagmus and central causes. It's usually going to be horizontal, vertical, rotary, and bidirectional, okay? 
Now, neurological findings, usually what you will not find any in peripheral causes, but you will find them in your central causes. And then causes of peripheral vertigo we're thinking about are uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, otitis media can cause it, especially acute otitis media, labyrinthitis, Meniere's disease, vestibular neuritis, um, versus our central causes, we're thinking about meningitis, right, encephalitis, is there a stroke, tumors. So how do we diagnose these patients? We're going to do a horizontal head impulse nystagmus test of SKU, SKU, also known as your HINTS test. You can also do a dix hall maneuver to see, once again, is it a peripheral cause or is it a vertical cause? So, um, like we said, make sure that you know the difference between both of them. So, what's going to be the treatment or what's going to be basically the next thing we're going to do? So, if it's a central cause, we want to make sure that we do an audiogram and an electronystagmography and a head MRI because we want to make sure that we rule out anything that can be central. Um, now, if it's peripheral, we can do like the Epley maneuver if we're thinking about the benign paroxysmal positional vertical, right, which is one of the most common ones. And usually, how do you do an Epley maneuver? You, it's also called particle repositioning, right, because there's in benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, um, you're having uh, the particles in your ear just now positioned. So you're repositioning those particles. And so what happens is that you move the head into four positions and you stay at each for about 30 seconds. And usually uh, with this, um, this is gonna cause weakness, numbness, and visual changes with these patients. So in general, for the nausea and vomiting, for a patient that just has peripheral vertigo, right, your benign vertigo, we can give them something like antihistamines, that's gonna be first line. So things like meclizine, right? Meclizine, you can also give them things like uh, antichlorinergic medications like scopol so scopolamine and then benzodiazepines if you need it. So speaking of benign paroxysmal positional positioning vertigo, BPVV, um, this one, what is it? So this is gonna be a peripheral cause of vertigo like we discussed. This one lasts about a few minutes per spell. So per spell of dizziness, it's associated whenever the patient changes their position of their head. For example, rolling over in bed. And with these patients, they're gonna have positional vertigo and once again, it's gonna be provoked by changes in the head position. And the thing about this one is that they're gonna have that episodic peripheral vertigo that's provoked with changes of head positioning and it lasts 10 to 60, 60 seconds. And usually it's gonna last for several days with these patients. Um, the thing about this one is like we discussed the pathophysiology, is, there we go, that's the word. It's caused by displaced otoliths. So these are calcium carbonate part particles that are in the ear and there's some type of displacement. Sometimes I've heard patients that they're riding their bike, they fell off their bike, or they just got up really quickly from a certain position and that caused that displacement of the otoliths. So what happens is that normally these otoliths are attached to the hair cells inside the saccule and utricle. And if there's any type of displacement of this, it's gonna cause you a vertigo signs. And this is actually the most common cause of vertigo with these patients. So diagnosis, we're gonna do that dix hall pike Maneuvering like we discussed, um, usually if it's if they have a burst of nystagmus, it's going to be positive. If the but if the nystagmus is persistent and it's not fatigable, like it doesn't go away, it keeps going, then we want to make sure that we rule out any central causes of vertigo like we discussed. Treatment for this uh, epily maneuver we can do also, um, but like we said, antihistamines, right? First line, we can also do antichlorinergics for these patients. So that was neuro. Let's go into our next one, which is gonna be derm. So derm is a lot. I'm gonna to try to cover it as, as quick as I can, and of course, um, as brief as I can. So let's go into our first one. It's going to bacterial infectious diseases. So the first topic is gonna to be folliculitis. Folliculitis is gonna be superficial bacterial infection of the hair follicle. If it's multiple hair follicles, and we're thinking about a carbuncle, right? The most common bacteria associated with folliculitis is going to be your staph aureus, which makes sense, right? Because staph is found all over the skin, so that's going to be the most common cause. Now, if we're thinking about a patient that went in a hot tub, they went in a swimming pool, then what are the bacteria that love that environment, that thrive in that environment? It's going to be your pseudomonas, right? Um, 
So patients that are very prone to getting these are going to be, of course, your patients who are diabetics, immunosuppressed, but of course, everyone else can get these. So how is this patient going to present with folliculitis? You're going to see these small raised erythematous pruritic pustules that are going to be less than five centimeters. They can or can present. They can or cannot present with erosion. There's going to be crust, pus, tenderness. You're going to be itchy red bumps in like um, where your hair is located. And like I said, this one can progress to an abscess or a furuncle. Treatment for this is just cleaning them with antibacterial soap. Um, usually the superficial pustules will rupture and they'll drain spontaneously. If you do give them medications, you can give them localized medications like your topical uh, bacterials like mupiracin, right? Um, you can also give them something like penicillin, dicloxacillin, amoxicillin, cephalosporin, clindamycin for about 7 to 10 days if needed. Of course, if it's like recurrent or bad, then that's when you can give things like oral antibiotics. The next one's going to be your abscesses. So this is going to be a collection of pus within the dermis and the deeper skin tissues. Once again, what is a bacteria most commonly found on the skin? Staph aureus is going to be the most common culprit. Symptoms, it's going to be painful, tender, fluctuant is a key word for this one. Anywhere in the question stem, if you read anything that's fluctuant, that's going to be an abscess. So this one's going to be fluctuant. Um, it's going to be, the patient's going to have erythematous nodules. With these patients, it's going to be warm. You're going to see edema. It may or may not be draining, right? Treatment for this one, we want to make sure that we do an IND, especially if it's fluctuant, right? We can or cannot give it antibiotics if needed. Only Usually, we give antibiotics if, for example, the patient has comorbidities. Are they diabetic? Are they immunosuppressed? Are they like older? Is the abscess and just in a very weird and difficult area? Then in these patients, we can give them antibiotics, but usually just an IND, we really don't need to do anything. Now, what about if a patient has an abscess in the hospital? During my burn rotation, we had a lot of patients that would get these abscesses, and of course, we're thinking about MRSA in these cases, so we were going to give medications like vancomycin, which is going to cover MRSA, or uh, lin linozolid. linozolid, also for your MRSA. If there's like a lot of pus, we want to make sure that we wound culture it to ensure that we're giving the proper antibiotic for the appropriate um, bacteria that's causing it. So the next one's going to be cellulitis. This is a common infection of the dermis due to bacterial entry via breaches in the skin barrier. It involves a deeper dermis and the subcutaneous fat. And usually with cellulitis, there's going to be some type of portal of entry that made the bacteria get in there quicker, right? So usually it's going to be any type of wound, ulcers. Um, during my burn rotation, it was burns, maceration between the toes, right? Usually we're thinking about streptococcus in this case, any type of fungal infection. But by far the most common bacteria involved in cellulitis that you need to know, and it's very common to test it, it's going to be your group A strep. So group A strep is going to be the most common bacteria in cellulitis. Now, if it's an open wound, we're thinking about Staph aureus, right? If it's an animal bite, we're thinking about Passerella multicidar. I apologize if I mis said that. But Passerella, right? If it's a human bite, we're thinking about Iconella. And if it's purulent drainage, drainage or if the patient is an illicit drug user, then we're thinking about MRSA. Make sure that you know this and you make the connections with the bacteria with the type of bite that is causing the cellulitis. But by far... Group A strep is going to be the most common one. Pastorella, antibiotic bite, echinella is going to be your human bites. What are some of the risk factors for cellulitis? Local trauma, preceding or concurrent skin infection, pre-existing skin infection because there's some type of compromise to the skin barrier, like we said. Burns, for example. Inflammation. Is a patient diabetic? Are they immunosuppressed? How is this patient going to present with cellulitis? They're going to have spreading erythematous, non-fluctuant tender plaque, right? Because when we think about fluctuant, we think about an abscess. Most common location is usually in the lower leg. Uh, usually it's going to be the arm if the patient is an IV drug user. And you'll also see streaks of lymphangitis, skin erythema, edema, warmth, fever, chills. And the thing about this one and how you can differentiate it from erysipelas is that this one's going to be poorly differentiated. So if you were to grab a marker and draw a line around it, it's not going to have, uh, you can't tell the difference between normal skin and, I mean, you can, but it's not, 
it's not a circle. It's not going to have a specific shape. So that's what it means. And that's how you compare it to erysipelas. Erysipelas is differentiated versus sigillitis. It's poorly differentiated on your physical exam. Treatment for this patient, it's really important that we treat these patients early, okay? Because these have gone very deep into the skin, like we said, right? It involves the deeper dermis and subcutaneous fat. I mean, that is deep in there. So it's important that we treat these patients because the majority of them are immunocompromised, like the burn victims that I took care of during my burn rotation. So these can lead to sepsis and death. So it's really important that we treat them. Now, if you're treating this patient as an outpatient, right? and it's not purulent, you remember that we were thinking about the bacteria, the most common one, group A strep. So give medications that are gonna cover group A strep, cephalexin. Usually you'll have a question from a patient that comes in, they just got bitten by a bug, and now they're having like full-blown um, cellulitis. And in this case, you can give something like cephalexin. Now, IV drug user, give something like clindamycin, right? You're covering from MRSA. If it's a purulent, pus or abscess, then we think about MRSA and or strep. So we're going to give also clindamycin because this one's number one for MRSA and also for strep. And then we also want to make sure that we're culturing this one, right? Now, if it's fluctuant, it can be, then we're going to IND it. We also want to make sure that we're monitoring it, right? That's what we, usually we do that Sharpie and that's what we do in the burn. We, the next thing we're going to see, is it receding in size? Is it getting smaller or is it getting larger? and also ensure that we're elevating the area. So that's gonna be cellulitis. Now the next one's gonna be erysipelas. This one's more superficial, right? So superficial cellulitis with marked dermal lymphatic involvement. So this one's gonna involve that upper dermis and the lymphatic versus cellulitis, right? It involves the deeper, even the subcutaneous portions of the skin. The most common bacteria for erysipelas is gonna be your group A strep and your staph aureus. Usually this patient's gonna have pain bright erythema, it's gonna be more raised and plaque you're gonna see with these patients, they can or cannot have bulla, and it usually involves the lower extremities and face with these patients. They also present with chills, fever, headaches, um, they'll have positive elevated white blood cell counts. Treatment for this, we wanna make sure that we monitor it, right? And we cover for strep, since once again, group A strep is gonna be the most common one. So things like penicillin, amoxicillin, clindamycin, and macrolide we're going to give for patients with erysipelas. The next one's going to be empatigo. This one's a very common contagious. It's going to be a superficial bacterial skin infection. So when we're thinking about this, think about what portions of the skin are they affecting, right? So we're thinking about epidermis, which is going to be the top layer. Dermis is going to be your middle, your subcutaneous tissue, and then you have your muscle. So this one we said is going to be a superficial bacterial skin infection. And this one's very commonly found in your children, and that's how usually you'll get it in your question stem. So usually it's gonna be a child between the ages of two to five years. It's usually, once again, due to trauma, right? So some type of injury to that epidermis. And the most common bacteria is gonna be Staph aureus. So this patient's gonna be presenting with papules that are surrounded by erythema that progress to form pustules. And that's how it'll be described on the question stem. It's gonna be pustules that enlarge and break down to form thick adhering crusts with characteristic honey crusted appearances. And that's how it's described in the question stem, those pustules and that honey crusted appearance in a child. The most common site is usually gonna be the nares and the mouth. And usually this patient tends to like auto inoculate themselves because they're constantly scratching themselves. Now you can also have the bullous type, right, of, um, your impetigo, usually with the bolus type, you're gonna see that flaccid bulla with clear yellow fluid. It's gonna be purulent and rupturing it leaves thick brown crust um, with these patients. And these can be in the face extremities and even the diaper area for the bolus. Now treatment in general for impetigo is gonna be mupyrosin, okay? So if it's localized only, mupyrosin. Wow, if it's extensive, right? For example, I had a question the other day, it was not only in the face, but it was also in the diaper area. So that's extensive. So in these cases, you would give medications like dicloxacillin, cephalexin, erythromycin, clindamycin, but by far dicloxacillin was the one I also kept seeing on question stems. The next one's gonna be acute paronychia. This is gonna be an infection of the lateral slash proximal nail fold. It's associated because once again, you have a break or a trauma in that epidermis. The most common bacteria is gonna be staph aureus and group A strep. Some of the risk factors is going to be a patient that has manicures, 
nail biting right thumb sucking and that's because you're getting that oral flora into that injury um, if they're picking at a hangnail ingrown nails if the patient's diabetic also what is the occupation of the patient how is this patient going to present they're going to have that throbbing pain erythema swelling um, they may have an abscess formation and the thing about this one is that if it extends deeper it can actually form a felon right so treatment with this is that if the patient has an abscess, we want to make sure that we culture it. And then, of course, we IMP it. If the patient is, for example, severe or immunocompromised and they have an abscess, remember, we're not only going to IMP it, we're also going to give them antibiotics. If the patient has no abscess and they just have that acute paronychia, right, we can treat it with topical antibiotics like um, mupirocin. Also ensure that the patient's get, having those warm water soaks. And if it's severe, then we're going to give them empiric antibiotics. If it's a nail biter, right, we want to treat for iconella like augmentin. The next one's going to be your chronic paronychia. So this is going to be a paronychia that's been going on for a while. So it's going to be a chronic inflammatory dermatosis that's going to involve, once again, the nail folds and the matrix. And it's associated because it's associated with damage to the cuticle. What is the etiology? Usually it's going to be due to repeated exposures to irritants, allergens, colonization by fungi and bacteria. Risk factors is going to be either your adult woman, fishermen, right? Housewives, bartenders, food handlers, house cleaners. And with these patients, how are they going to present? Usually the first, second, first, second, and third finger of the dominant hand are going to be involved. It's going to involve, once again, that proximal or lateral fold, which is going to be erythematous, so it's going to be swollen and red. And usually the cuticle is going to be absent for these patients. The nail plate can be discolored, and you're going to see nail dystrophy and no cuticle. And that's how you can differentiate a chronic from an acute paronychial for these patients. And you'll see that separation of that nail plate from the proximal nail fold on your physical exam. Treatment is just going to be protection. Keep it dry, right? Put some gloves on. You can give them something like topical glucocorticoids and then, of course, treat the secondary infection. So the next one's going to be your Hydra adenitis superita, superitava. This is going to be a chronic superitive psychiatrical disease of the apocrine gland bearing skin. Very commonly found in your females. And usually with these patients, it's going to be genetics. So it's going to be a patient that had a family history, like their mom also suffered from this. Um, so it's going to be genetic. And what happens is that uh, you get an occlusion, right? So an occlusion of the follicle with these patients. And there's predisposing factors like obesity, smoking. Um, also, if they have a genetic predisposition to acne, they're prone to getting this one. And also uh, secondary bacterial infection. So the sites especially in females. The axilla is going to be a very common site. Uh, the other area can be the breast, the groin area, the anal general region also, especially in males, the back, the butt, and it's usually often bilateral. The patient's going to be presenting with pain and marked point tenderness related to the abscess. You'll see open comedones, paired comedones. They're going to be tender, red, inflammatory nodule and abscesses. They're going to be very exquisitely tender sinus tracts. You're going to see fibrosis, bridge scars, hypertrophic scars, contractures, and lymphedema. Treatment for this is usually going to be with intralesional glucocorticoids followed by IND. You can also give them oral antibiotics like erythromycin, tetracycline, minocycline, clindamycin, and rifampin for these patients. Now, um, you can also give them prednisone, especially if there's a lot of pain and inflammation going on. And surgery is usually going to be, um, for these patients, like last line, it's very, very painful. You want to make sure that you excise those chronic fibrotic nodules and sinus tracts, but this is usually like the last line. The next one is going to be pilonidal disease. This is going to be an infection of that skin and subcutaneous tissue at or near upper, the upper portion of the natal cleft or buttock. So it's going to be in the buttock area. It can be acute or chronic, and it's usually acquired, more commonly found in males and females. And some of the risk factors is going to be obesity, local trauma or irritation, sedentary lifestyle or prolonged sitting, um, deep natal cleft. And then once again, these patients are going to have a family history. So someone in their family suffered from this. So another thing with pilonidal disease is that the patient can be asymptomatic, right? Um, sometimes they don't even know that they have it. 
Uh, if they do have symptoms, they're gonna fever and malaise, specifically if there's like an abscess there and it's not drained. Um, usually you'll see primarily pores, midline of the natal cleft. Um, usually it's painless, like I said, and you'll see a painless sinus opening lateral to the cleft. Um, if it is painful, you might see like a tender mass, drainage, hair protruding from the sinus. That's usually like a buzzword for this one is going to see, you're going to see that hair protruding from the sinus with these patients. So if it's acute infection, it's usually a sudden onset of pain to the intragluteal region while the patient is sitting or performing activities that usually are going to stretch that skin, right? That's overlying that natal cleft. cleft. Um, intermittent swelling, also mucid, uh, purulent, blood drainage. And if it's chronic, then usually these patients will have a recurrent or persistent drainage, which is very painful. Diagnosis is usually a clinical diagnosis. No specific imaging is usually needed for these patients. You can do labs, and if it's like an undrained abscess, you're going to see that they do have uh, leukocytosis. And treatment for these patients um, are usually like antibiotics, Especially, specifically if the patient is immunosuppressed, right, or if they have, um, if you suspect MRSA. Um, if it's acute pilonidal disease, usually IND it and debride all the visible hair. If it's chronic, usually these patients need to get a surgery. They get surgical excision of all the sinus tracts with these patients. And the thing about it is that usually with a simple excision, um, usually these patients will heal faster, right? So the next topic we're going to go over is going to be our erythema infectiosum. So we're going to go into our viral infectious diseases. So erythema infectiosum, this is going to be a rash that appears abruptly and it affects several areas of the skin. Usually it's an eruption on the mucous membrane. Most commonly found in your children between the ages of 4 to 10, right? Um, adults can also get it. Usually it involves drug eruptions though. And the pathogen that is most commonly associated with erythema infectiosa and something that's very highly tested and you need to know, it's going to be parvovirus B19, parvovirus B19. Um, there is like a video, a really good video on family medicine in regards to the exam for medical students, um, for the shelf exam and the educator on there. So it's something that was amazing. It just stays on, stays with me. She said got slapped by parvovirus, right? Because these patients with erythema infectiosum usually present with those slapped cheeks, like they got slapped. And parvovirus B19 is the most common pathogen that is involved. So if that helps you out, use it. It definitely helped me out on exam. So got slapped by parvo. So parvovirus B19, most common pathogen, right? Um, usually found in your respiratory tract uh, secretions. It can be actually transmitted from mommy to baby. Uh, exposure to blood, you can also get parvovirus B19. And usually with erythema infectiosum, it tends to occur in epidemics. So usually there'll be school outbreaks, usually during uh, late winter and early spring. How is this patient going to present? So they're going to have those prodrome symptoms, symptoms of low fever, malaise, headache, itchiness, pruritus, like coryza, right? Myalgias, joint pain, especially like in your adult patients. Um, and then you have that exanthem. So what does exanthem mean? It means that it's outside the body, right? So this patient's going to present with the first one. It's going to be those bright red cheeks that we talked about. So if they give you a picture and this baby has like these bright red cheeks, think about parvovirus B19, right? Slap cheeks got slapped by parvovirus B19. And usually the rash is going to go away over one to four days. This one's usually symmetric, okay? And then um, the second symptom the patient's going to present with is going to be that reticular lace-like eruption that appears on the trunk and extremities. This is also known as your fifth disease. So diagnosis, of course, it's a clinical diagnosis. You can do uh, IgM antibody. This is actually the preferred test, and it'll usually be positive for um, patients with erythema infectiosum. Treatment is going to be supportive, right, because this is going to be a viral disease. It's going to get better after five to ten days with these patients. The thing about parvovirus B19 that we think about is going to be uh, patients that have uh, your hemolytic anemias, right? We want to make sure that we monitor these patients more closely because they can get really sick with parvovirus B19 and it can cause your hemolytic anemias. Um, so how's going to be the prevention for erythema infectiosin? Hand hygiene, right? 
proper disposal of facial tissues, and then avoid sharing any type of utensils for eating. So erythema pertussum, that uh, slap cheeked, right, very commonly found in your children, specifically between the ages of 4 to 10. And parvovirus B19 is the most common culprit. Treatment is going to be supportive. Hand foot mouth disease is going to be the next one. This one is very commonly found during late summer and early fall. The incubation is about four to six days. And the most common virus associated that you need to know for hand foot mouth disease is going to be your Coxsackie virus. Coxsackie virus also causes herp angina. And also Coxsackie virus, like we discussed, very commonly associated with what? Myocarditis. So just make sure that you have that in the back of your mind. So once again, Coxsackie virus herpangina. So signs and symptoms, um, usually how does hand felt mouth disease occur happen? It starts with the mouth and then it goes to the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet with occasional involvement of the butt, dapper area, or elbows. Usually these patients are going to present with a prodrome, right? Fever, sore throat, malaise, joint pain, and then they'll have that exanthem, which is going to be that bright pink uh, macules and or papules. So they're going to be painful vesicles with erythematous halos. And that's usually like what you see on the questions and what's pathognomonic is going to be those erythematous halos. Um, you can also present with an enanthem, which is going to be inside the body, right? So exanthem, outside the body, your skin, enanthem is going to be inside the body. So usually with these patients with an enanthem, they're going to have these erythematous erosions that resemble canker sores, okay? Diagnosis is going to be clinical. Treatment, once again, it, since it's due to a viral cause, usually it's going to be uh, benign, so it's self-limited. It tends to go away within 10 days, but the thing about this one is it's very infectious. So just make sure that you know that. Supportive treatment, right? Fever and pain relief. So once again, hand, foot, mouth disease, commonly caused by Coxsackie virus. Next one's going to be your measles, also known as your ru rubiola, right? Your measles rubiola. So for measles... Etiology. So the incubation is about 8 to 12 days. It's transmitted through respiratory droplets. Uh, very common, of course, in your unvaccinated children. And it's very contagious. So it's contagious from 1 to 2 days before onset of symptoms and 3 to 5 days before the rash starts occurring. So these patients will start with a prodrome, which is going to be your fever, your malaise, your conjunctivitis, your cough and coryza. So that's three C's. That's how I think about your measles. So your three C's, cough. Coryza and conjunctivitis. They have to present with these three C's on your question sent for it to be your um, measles. And then you have your exanthem. So usually this patient is going to present with an erythematous macular or papules that start on the face, right? And then they start spreading down. And this is how you can differentiate these from all the other exanthems depending on where they start. So measles, right, is going to start on the face and then it starts spreading down versus all the other, some other ones will start in the uh, chest or trunk and then they'll spread out. This one starts in the face and then it starts spreading down or in the forehead. So uh, with these patients, usually the lesions are going to blanch with pressure and usually by the third day the whole body is involved, right? These patients can also present with an enanthin, which is going to be those complex spots, right? That's usually what's pathognomonic for measles. You'll see these multiple blue gray spots in the mouth. These usually occur in the prodrome period. So once again, those complex spots, those multiple blue-gray spots in the mouth. Diagnosis is usually a clinical diagnosis. We can confirm it with serology, right? And it's really important that we report these cases to the local and state department um, without waiting on the test results for these patients. So treatment is going to be self-limited, right? Since it's a viral disease, 10 to 12 days. It's supportive, antipyretics, fluids. Vitamin A actually has been shown to help with measles, which is really important. Interesting. And how do we prevent it? Immunization, right? MMR, measles, mumps, rubellus. Um, complications for measles, though, if a patient does not get it treated, is that they can get otitis media, pneumonia, croup, and diarrhea. It can even go to uh, neurological symptoms. So they can get meningitis, vision loss, uh, parencephalitis, especially children that are like under the age of five, they're very high risk for death. So the next one's going to be our molluscan contagiosum. So this is going to be a benign, usually asymptomatic viral infection of the skin with no systemic manifestations. The virus that is associated with molluscan contagiosum that is commonly tested is going to be your pox virus. So make sure that you know that pox virus. So 
This virus colonizes the epidermis and the hair follicle. It's very commonly found in your children and also in your sexually active adults. And how is it transmitted? So skin to skin contact, fomites, um, usually auto inoculation, scratching, touching, and it's also associated with public water exposure also, very commonly found in your wrestlers also. And it's the most common cause of inflammation and it tends to exacerbate atopic dermatitis also. So how is this patient going to present? Usually they'll have about two to 20 discrete five millimeter diameter, flesh colored, pearly dome shaped papules. So that's usually gonna be your pathognomonic word for this one is your flesh colored, pearly dome shaped papules that have central umbilication. So central umbilication, flesh colored, pearly dome shaped papules. They're usually located on the trunk face extremities. And the thing about this one, uh, we think about the boat sign, right? Beginning of the end, B-O-T-E. Basically what happens is that these, these macules, um, sorry, these papules, I apologize. These papules are gonna start becoming tender. They'll start crusting. There's gonna be erythema. There's gonna be an inflammatory halo. And this is resolution, right? And that's why it's called beginning of the end because that means that the patient's getting better. So sometimes you might get a question stem with a patient with that comes in and they're having all this crusting erythema halo around those papules and they think it's getting worse. No, that's, they're getting better. So that's why it's called beginning of the end, that boat sign. So uh, with these patients, the diagnosis, like we said, it's gonna be clinical and treatment since it's due to a virus, it's usually self-limited. So it's gonna go away by itself. So just make sure that we're educating the patients on ensuring that they limit transmission, washing their hands and not touching anywhere else in their body with their hands that are dirty. Now you can do treatment like curatage and cryotherapy or electric desiccation, but of course we're not gonna do this in children because it's very painful. It's more, more like cosmetic, but these are gonna go away. It's just gonna take a while for them to go away. So the next one's gonna be your verruque or warts, right? Um, commonly found in both males and females, it's equal. And the peak prevalence is usually during adolescence between the ages of 13 to 16. Now this one's due to your human papilloma virus, right? And it's usually gonna be your benign virus type. So just make sure that you know that. So it's gonna be very commonly found with like your HPV 2, 4, HPV 3, 10, and usually one. So it's not found with your like really bad HPV um, types. So this one's gonna be usually benign. It's transmitted through skin to skin. If you have any trauma to the corneum, right? Um, most commonly found in the fingers. Also, it can be found on the dorsal of the hands, knees, elbows, and usually on your physical exam, you're gonna see a hyperkeratotic exophytic. So that means that it's growing outward, dome-shaped papular or nodule that's firm, it's clefted with vegetations. And then the keyword for this one that you'll see on your question stems, it's gonna be that punctate black, red or brown dots that present thrombose capillaries. And sometimes if you pick at it, it'll bleed also. And then you have different types of warts, right? You have your flat warts. These are usually skin colored, light brown, pink, smooth. They're slightly elevated. They're flat top papules that are round, sharply defined. And these are found on the dorsal of the hands, right? The arms, face, and chins. You also have your palmal plantar verruca. These are gonna be a little bit more thicker. They're gonna be endophytic uh, papules. Um, and usually they accumulate thick callus over warts. And usually these can be painful when walking. So these are gonna be on the plantar, usually portions of their feet. So diagnosis is gonna be clinical for these patients, right? Treatments, usually observation. Sometimes they go away by themselves, but um, if you do need to give them treatment, you're gonna be giving them salicylic acid, right? Cryotherapy and curatage. So just make sure that you know that. So our next one's gonna be our fungal parasitic bites and infectious diseases for dermatology. So let's go into um, oncomycosis. So this is gonna be a chronic fungal infection of the nail bed. It usually starts with tinea pettis and it can actually look like psoriasis. So just make sure that you know how to pick this one out from psoriasis or not. Because when we think about psoriasis, right, it also affects the nail beds because you have different types of psoriasis. So oncomycosis, it's transmitted from person to person through fomites, most commonly found in men. And the most common location is usually distal sub, uh, subangual. And the, the fungal infection that is most commonly associated is going to be your 
T. rubrum. So just make sure that you know that they really like to test that. So T. rubrum is going to be your more, or your tinea rubrum is going to be the most common one that's going to be associated with oncomycosis. So risk factors for oncomycosis, patients that are immunocompromised, right? Diabetics by far is one of the big ones. If the patient has uh, atopic dermatitis, and what are you going to see on your physical exam? You're going to see that thick and brittle now, subungual de debris, and you're going to see separation of the nail bed from the bed. And you'll also see color change of the nail. Sometimes it'll look like really green. And with these patients, we want to make sure that we, for diagnosis, we culture it before we start therapy, right? Usually we'll do a KOH for these patients. Um, and treatment for this is that usually we can't give topical antifungals for this one. And when we think about our tinea infections, right, our fungal infections, usually we give a lot of topicals except for this one. These patients need um, oral antibiotics, um, antibiotics, I'm sorry, oral antifungals, oral antifungals. And the thing about these oral antifungals, it's really important that before we started and when the patient is on them, we measure their liver function. So if a patient has like, severe liver problems, we can't prescribe these because these can affect the liver. So it's really important that we monitor the liver function test and we also make sure that we get their LFTs uh, before we start these medications. So the first line for oncomycosis is gonna be terbenafine. Like we said, this one's hepatotoxic. So we have to monitor LFTs every six weeks with these patients, right? And we have to make sure that we confirm that the patient has oncomycosis and they have a fungal infection that's due to T. rubrum before we put them on terbenafine. The second line is itraconazole or fluconazole, right? But once again, first line is going to be your terbenafine. But this one's hepatotoxic, so we have to make sure that we give these patients um, the medication for uh, terbenafine. We monitor their LFTs. So the next one's gonna be tinea pettis. So this is also known as your athlete's foot, right? Um, this is once again a fungal infection, but it's a fungal infection of the feet. And the most common cause and the most common infection is gonna be your trichophyton rubrum, right? Your T rubrum. This fungus really likes to thrive in warm, moist environments, especially like shoes, right? Public areas, uh, public showers, gyms. So that's why patients that um, for example, shower in public showers, are very prone to getting these. Sometimes this patient is asymptomatic, right? They don't even know they have it. Um, but if they do have symptoms, they're going to be complaining of pruritus, so that itchiness, pain. Sometimes also if they get a secondary bacterial infection, because once again, you have, you're have having a break in your tissue, right? In your um, skin. So infections like staph, which is all over your skin, and group A strep can go in there. So usually when you get a second bacterial infection, this patient can present with pain. In addition to that, you'll see scaling, erythema, macerations is actually one of the key words for tinea pettis, so look out for that one. Bulla, and there are different patterns of tinea pettis. So you have your interdigital, and this one is actually gonna be the most common one you're gonna see. So you'll see scaling, redness, maceration, fissuring. It's most commonly found between the fourth and fifth toes. And this one is the one that's going to be in between toes, right? And then we also have the mucosin one. So this one's also known as a belay slipper. Uh, this is a chronic hyperkeratotic type. And usually what you'll see is that you'll see sharply marginated scale uh, to lateral borders of the feet, heels, soles, with erythema and papules on margin. And usually this patient will present with one hand and sometimes two feet with this. Um, you also have your ulcerative, which is going to be an extension of intradigital tinea pettis onto the plantar and lateral foot. You have your vesicular bullus also. And then diagnosis in general for tinea pettis is going to be with the KOH um, culture and then, of course, microscopy. And you're going to see that hyphae. Treatment is going to be hygiene, so ensure that you educate the patients on changing their socks, keeping their socks dry, changing their shoes, wearing open-toed shoes, foot powders, right? So first line for these are going to be your imidazole, so things like clotrimazole and myconazole, because these are good both for candida and dermatophytes. Okay. The next one's going to be your tinea corporis. This is also known as your ringworm, right? This is a fungal infection of the skin. It usually involves the trunk and limbs. And once again, this is going to be due to your T. rubrum, so your trichophyton rubra, rubrum. Um, and with this one, patients are going to be presenting with sharply defined annular papules with central clearing. 
It's going to be very itchy, scaly, sharply marginated plaques. Usually the margin of lesion is going to be the most active area. You have a central area that tends to heal. And then you can also get a variant of this one. It involves, for example, the groin. This one's also known as your tinea cruis. It's also known as jock itch, right? So how do we diagnose tinea, tinea corporis? So we're going to diagnose it with microscopy and culture, uh, KOH, right? And first line treatment for this is going to be your imidazoles, once again, clotrimazole and myconazole for these patients. Um, and then, of course, with these patients, if they're not responding to any topical infections, then you're going to do oral like trebenafine. So second one's going to be our tinea cruris. So I know we had mentioned this one briefly. This one's going to be a dramatophyte infection of the groin. So it's usually the inguinal, the upper thigh, or the pubic regions. And once again, this is due to what, uh, in what infection? What's the name? This is very commonly tested. So it's going to be your trichophyton rubrum, your T rubrum. So usually with these patients, you're going to see a centrist clearing, large, scaling, well-demarcated, dull, red, tan, brown, plaques. You may or may not see papules, pus pustules at margins. And usually with these patients, um, we diagnose them with a fungal culture, right? And first line is going to be your imidazoles, once again, clotrimazole and myconazole. How do the patients prevent this? Shower shoes and antifungal powders. Tinea versicolor is going to be your next one, also known as pityriasis versicolor. This is going to be a superficial overgrowth of yeast, malassezia furfur, and um, yes. So etiology with this one is that this one tends to have a very high recurrence, very commonly found in your young adults. It tends to decrease during the fifth and sixth decade of life, and it's not contagious. So usually patients that have like sweaty or oil skin um, during the summertime, right? It's very commonly found with these patients. So once again, this one is associated with what? Malassezia furfur, right? Malassezia furfur versus the other ones we were talking about T. rubrum. This one's Malassezia furfur. So make sure you know that. Um, how is this patient going to present on physical exam? You're going to see sharply demarcated macule and patches, round and oval with fine scales. It's most commonly found in the trunk and arms. Usually patients are going to be asymptomatic. And usually the the keyword for this one is going to be those tan salmon hypo slash hyperpigmented patches. They're going to be asymmetric in distribution, and sometimes they can enlarge and merge to form like uh, very large geographic areas. So usually with these patients, we're going to do a KOH, right? And on the KOH, this is the one is the one that's going to look like spaghetti and meatballs. So you're going to see that round yeast and hyphae. So once again, KOH, spaghetti and meatballs. Uh, your woods lamp also is another way to diagnose this. You're going to see that blue and green scales for tinea versa color. So treatment is going to be with selenium sulfide. So it's going to be that shampoo. All right. So the next one's going to be seborrheic dermatitis. This is going to be an inflammatory reaction due to what? Malassezia yeast. So malassezia yeast really likes to live on this seborrheic oil producing skin. It's like the perfect environment for it. So... This is what seborrheic dermatitis is. Etiology. So the thing about seborrheic dermatitis is that if you see this in a patient, like an adult patient, uh, we're thinking about maybe HIV and very commonly found in your patients that are HIV because once again, they're immunocompromised. So they're very prone to getting this. So also keep that in the back of your mind. Any patient that's immunocompromised, an adult, then we're thinking about uh, seborrheic dermatitis because whenever... I see seborrheic dermatitis, we think about your infants, right? That cradle cap. But in adults, we're thinking about maybe something more sinister, like immunocompromised, HIV, Parkinsonism. So just have that in the back of your mind. So like I said, etiology, HIV patients, immunosuppressed, uh, patients with Parkinson's, most commonly found in mouths. And like we said, our infants, right? That cradle cap. And how is this patient going to present or what are you going to see on physical exam? You're going to see your erythematous macules, papules with waxy, greasy, yellow scales. And that's usually what's the buzzword. So greasy, yellow scales, um, they're usually located on the scalp. They can be located on the hairline, the eyebrows, the eyelids, the nasal labial folds, and also in the external auditory canals also. The patient can say that it's itchy, um, and they can also be hypopigmented. Diagnosis is clinical. We can do a KOH just to make sure that we rule out a dermatophyte, right? 
or a yeast infection. And treatment's gonna be your anti-dandruff shampoo. Um, you can also give them something like keto, uh, ketoconazole, selenium sulfide also. So the next one's gonna be lice. So there's three different types of lice. There's head louse, right? The common one that you find on heads, very commonly found in your children. There's a body louse, and there's also your pubic or crab louse. It's spread by close physical contact and by fomites, so head to head, theater seats, and very commonly found in your school age children. Not very commonly found in your adults, but most commonly found in your school age children. And with the, these, uh, what you need to know is that they, the eggs tend to hatch in one week and they mature in one week. Um, lice tend to feed every four to six hours, especially on the scalp and the neck. They live for 30 days and they lay about five to 10 eggs per day at the base of the hair, which is disgusting. So what are you gonna see on physical exam? You're gonna see the presence of live adult lice. You might see some immature nymphs, which are um, the baby ones, right? You might see uh, viable eggs. And usually these are like the size of sesame seeds. Um, usually the patient's gonna be presenting a scalp pruritus, so their scalp is really, really itchy. They may or may not present also, also with posterior cervical lymphadenopathy. And diagnosis is gonna be clinical, right? You're gonna see the lice on your physical exam. You wanna make sure that with these patients, you examine everyone that lives in the home and then you treat everyone in the house, even if they did not have active lice. So that's really important. So treatment with these patients, you wanna make sure that you educate them, right? Um, you tell the patient to ensure that they wash all their clothing, all their bedding, their brushes or combs in hot water. So wash everything in hot water to ensure that you kill everything. And with these patients, right, we usually treat them with topical therapies. Um, you want to make sure that we retreat them with topical therapy seven to nine days after initial therapy, just to make sure that we are killing any newly hatched uh, lice. And then for pubic lice, of course, we're going to treat the sexual partners. The next one's going to be scabies, scabies, right? It's due to sarcoptis scabii. Um, with these, usually what happens is that females lay three eggs per day in burrows, and then they hatch in four days. Usually they can survive up to more than two days on clothing and bedding. Most commonly found in women and children, especially patients that are immunocompromised, if there's anywhere that is congregated, so a lot of people, um, it's transmitted through direct contact and fomites. And usually what you're going to see on your physical exam and what's pathognomonic is going to be those burrows, right? Those ridges, those bur burrows, linear markings, and usually they're going to be found between the finger webs. They are also commonly found in the wrists, the elbows. Um, they're going to be very itchy. You're going to see excoriations. You can also find them in the axilla, the breast, umbilicus, penis, scrotum, wrists, finger webs, like we said. And usually the itching is going to be very severe at night. So diagnosis is going to be microscopy. We're going to put mineral oil over the burrow um, in the scrape. And that's where we're going to see those mites, those eggs. We can also do dermoscopy. Treatment is going to be permethrin 5%. So lice is going to be permethrin 1%. That's going to be the treatment. Permethrin 5% is going to be for scabies. So once again, don't get those confused. I've seen questions where they put both of them on there, and I'm like, I don't remember if it was 1 or 5. So 1% is going to be for lice. 5% permethrin is going to be for scabies. So you tell the patient, and this is something that they really like to test, to apply permethrin from your neck down. So it's going to be for neck down and they're going to keep it on for 8 to 14 hours once again neck down permethrin 5 percent 8 to 14 hours and they're going to repeat it in one week so the next one's going to be your brown recluse spider i'm from texas we had a lot of these in texas and i think i saw one of these cases in texas so uh with these very commonly found in your midwest and southeast portions of the US, right? Usually what happens is that the patient is gonna be in an area where the spider lives, right? Um, the patients that we would get, a lot of construction workers would come in. So with these patients, what you need to know is how does a spider look? Because you'll describe to them, or you'll ask the patient, how is a spider? So the spider is going to look, it has a violent shaped dark brown marking on its cephalothorax. So violent shaped dark brown marking on its cephalothorax. Thorax. 
And this patient's going to present with a maculopapular exanthem, fever, headache, malaise, and arthralgia, nausea and vomiting. But what's pathognomonic about this one is going to be that red, white, and blue sign. Red, white, and blue sign, how I think about it is, since I'm from Texas, right, think about the Texas flag, red, white, and blue, even though the U.S. flag is also red, white, and blue. But I think about the Texas flag, right, south, red, white, and blue mark sign is what you're going to see on your physical exam. So you're going to see that peripheral edema, blanching, and then that central wallacious area. The thing about this one is that the wound can progress to necrosis and deep ulcer uh, formation. So that's why it's um, important to treat these patients. So treatment for this is going to be rest, ice, and elevation, tetanus if the patient has not had one in the past 10 years, right? Usually treatment is going to be supportive, so we want to make sure that we're cleaning the wound, we're using cold compressions and pain control. And then you have your black widow, right? Black widow, that's going to be the one that is black, and then of course it has that red um, hourglass figure on its back. So with these patients, uh, how are they going to present? So these patients tend to have more neurological symptoms. Why? Because of the neurotoxin that's released by that spider. So they're going to have that severe pain, um, muscle cramping, nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, dizziness, chest pain, respiratory difficulties, especially in your children and elderly patients, it can actually cause very serious symptoms. So with these patients, um, once again, treatment's just supportive since it only causes really bad symptoms in your older patients. So the next one's going to be your eruptions and dosquamation. So let's start with api vulgaris. This one's very commonly tested, and I even had a lot of questions on this one for the pan, so it's really important that you know how to treat it. So api vulgaris is going to be a disorder of the sebaceous follicles. Um, basically, you have an increase in sebum production, keratin and sebum, which causes, which causes hyperkeratosis due to P. acnes, right? That's um, usually the bacteria that is involved with your acne vulgaris. So P. acnes, uh, make sure that you know that. What is the name for this one? It's uh, also known as your cuta bacterium acnes, right? It's a gram-positive um, bacteria. So that's something that they really, really like to test, also known as your propionibacterium bacterium acnes. So with these patients, it's commonly found in your adolescence. Usually they have a family history, right, genetics, and it tends to present between the ages of 8 to 12. So usually when puberty starts um, occurring. And it peaks at ages between 15 to 18, and they tend to go away by the age of 25. The thing is that the, it can also come back, and it can occur later in life, like in the patient's 40s. So what's going to be the patho? Basically, there's a distended follicle wall break. Um, and sebum, keratin, bacteria, and all that yuckiness on the outside of your face start entering the dermis, and the body just reacts to it, right? You get all this inflammation um, response to it. And some of the things that can trigger it can be certain drugs, like oral contraceptives, right? Androgens, um, emotional stress, occlusion and pressure. It tends to get worse during the fall and winter, during the onset of mesentesis. And the thing about acne in general is that it's related to hormones, so what are you going to see on your physical exam? You're going to see open comedones, also known as your blackheads. You can also see closed comedones, which are also known as your whiteheads. You'll see papillopustules, nodules, cysts, pitted, uh, depressed, hypertrophic scars if it's progressed later. And it tends to involve the face, neck, upper trunk, upper arms, uh, sometimes even the buttocks, but not very commonly found. And the diagnosis, right, it's going to depend on whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. And it's really important that you know how to know whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, because the pain on whether it's mild, moderate, or severe is going to guide your treatment. So let's go into each one. If it's mild, it's usually a comedone with few inflammatory lesions. If it's moderate, it's going to be comedones with marked number of inflammatory lesions. If it's severe, you have extensive inflammatory lesions with diffused scarring with these patients. So treatment, of course, you want to make sure that you're removing the plugging, you're decreasing that sebum production, you're decreasing that bacterial colonization, and you're preventing scarring, right? So usually with these medications, it's going to depend once again, what is the patient acne? Is it mild, moderate, severe? So if it's mild, usually we tend to do topical things. So topical retinoids, topical benzoyl peroxide, topical antibiotics, Versus if it's mild on top of the topical 
that you're doing, you're gonna add also oral antibiotics. If it's moderate to severe, especially severe, that's when you're gonna add oral isotretinoin, Accutane, right? The thing about Accutane is that you have to make sure that the patient is not pregnant. So you're gonna do a pregnancy test before, especially for your females. You start this medication, and then while they're on the medication, um, they have to be on oral contraceptives. One of my classmates that works in dermatology, she says that they have to have them sign a form saying that they're not going to get pregnant or anything like that during while they're on this medication. So it's really important that you educate these patients, right? That once they start taking, for example, these antibiotics, it's going to take a while for them to start seeing results. So it's not something that's going to occur quickly. So you have to make sure that you tell them to adhere to it, right? Um, use any type of oil-free cosmetics, cosmetics, diet, sunblock, and some of the complications for this one can be scarring. So once again, let's go through the treatment, right? If it's mild, the first line treatment is going to be anything that's topical, so benzoyl peroxide or topo, topical retinoid. Um, moderate, it's going to be the topical combination therapy like we've discussed, like benzoyl peroxide plus an antibiotic or retinate with these patients. Versus severe, it's going to be oral antibiotic plus a topical combination therapy plus an antibiotic or retinoid with these patients. Or of course, you can put them on oral isotretinoin, but isotretinoin, it's important that you tell the patient you do a pregnancy test before and ensure the patient's on oral contraceptives, usually two of them when they're on it because it can really affect, it can really kill a fetus. So it's really important that you know that also about this one. So next one's going to be acne rosacea. How I think about this one is just acne of older patients. So this one's usually patients going to present with flushing and blushing. That's usually what is pathognomonic. And it's due to sebaceous hyperplasia, edema, and fibrosis. And this one is not related to hormones. Versus your acne vulgaris, it is related to hormones. So this one's going to be very commonly found in your patients that are older, like I said, 30 to 50 year olds. And there's certain things that trigger it. And you need to know this because this is something that I kept seeing question stems. So alcohol, sunlight, hot beverages, spicy food, and emotional stress will trigger your acne rosacea. So usually with these patients on physical exam, you're going to see absence of comedones, right? It's usually episodic and they're going to have flushing, erythema, telangic pages, papules, postules, phimetis changes also usually roast cheeks, right, forehead, chin, that tends where it tends to involve. The patient can also present with that rhinophyma, which is involvement at the nose, like a really large nose. They can also involve the, uh, the, the eye, so ocular involvement. They might present with like conjunctivitis, chronic blepharitis, and treatment for this is just ensuring that you educate them about prevention, right? So use sunscreen, avoid anything that's triggering, stop drinking hot beverages, spicy foods, and of course, the patient can also get surgery and laser surgery, but usually the treatment for this is going to be metronidazole. But once again, remember about the pants and just in general for NCCP8, they really like to say prevention. We really like to talk about prevention. So prevention is going to be the key for this one. So the next one's going to be erythema multiforme. Um, erythema multiforme, right? This is a cutaneous reaction pattern of blood vessels in the dermis with secondary epidermal changes. Usually this one's benign, but it tends to reoccur. So usually these are commonly found in males. It's due to uh, infection or medications. If it's due to infections, we're thinking about herpes simplex virus and also mycoplasma. When we're thinking about medications, we're thinking about orsulfonamides, right? Phenotoin, barbiturates, penicillin, allopurinol. Usually those drugs that are like in the mnemonic of Satan, right? Um, so just make sure you have them back in mind. Usually with these patients on your physical exam, it's usually gonna be bilateral, it's gonna be symmetric, and you're gonna see these erythematous iris-shaped papular and vesicular bolus lesions. They're gonna be pruritic, painful, dull red. You'll see these macule, papule, vesicles, and bulla in the center of the papule. Usually the keyword that you're gonna see is gonna be your target lesions. You'll see redness with ring of white and another ring of red. It tends to involve the extremities, the palms and the soles, the mucous membranes like the lips, the nasal area, the conjunctival area, the vulva, the, an the anus, the face, the penis, the eyes. And diagnosis is going to be a clinical diagnosis. Uh, like we said, usually 
we have a connection between herpes simplex virus that has not been verified, but we think it's associated with that. And you have two different flavors of erythema multiform. So you have your minor and you have your major. So make sure that you know the difference between each one. Erythema multiform minor, usually these patients have little to no mucus membrane involvement. And that's usually how it's going to be in the uh, question stem. They have no mucus involvement. And usually with these patients, you'll see vesicles, but there will be no bulla. So no bulla, no mucus involvement, even though you can have mucus involvement for everything um, minor. So everything in multiform minor, you also see these classic target lesions, which are the classic signs for everything in multiform. Um, everything in major though, multiform major, always, always, always involves mucous membranes, like the mouth, right? And with these patients, there is going to be confluent, and you're going to see bolus. And these patients have, are going to have a positive Nikolsky sign. That's a key positive Nikolsky sign. You touch it, and it literally like sloughs off. Positive Nikolsky sign. And it's going to be uh, systemic symptoms also. They can also have colitis and stomatitis, right? Because once again, it involves the mucosis membranes. So these patients are going to be complaining of pain whenever they eat. Um, it can also involve, once again, the vulva. So these patients might have trouble going to the restroom. And treatment for general for erythema multiform is going to be prevention, right? So we can give them something like oral valcyclovir or femcyclovir, especially if we suspect herpes simplex virus, since we said it's um, associated with that. If the patient is like severely ill, we're thinking about erythema multiform um, major, then we can give them uh, glucocorticoids for these patients. All right, so the next one's gonna be your exanthematous drug reaction. So this is usually a reaction to a drug and it's a very delayed reaction. It's one of the most common cutaneous drug eruptions. And some of the causes of these are gonna be penicillin, carbamazepine, alpurinol, sulfonamides, NSAIDs, isoniazide, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and even uh, tetracycline. So this patient, in regards to your physical exam, usually the area that is involved is going to be limited, but it can also involve the buccal mucosa. Usually it's, it'll start in the trunk and then it'll start going centrifugally to the extremities. Um, it's usually symmetric. Sometimes it may mimic measles because it might be described on your question stem like morbilliform. So just make sure you keep that in the back of your mind when you're reading these questions. Uh, usually you'll see erythematous macules and inflated papules, pruritus, mild fever, and this one's going to be diffuse, right? So it's going to be everywhere. Treatment, of course, first thing you need to do is discontinue the offending medication. What medication is causing this reaction? Stop it. You can also do topical steroids and then oral antihistamines because these patients are going to be very, very itchy, right? And usually just reassurance because this is usually going to go away once you stop the medication. So the next one's going to be fix drug reaction. Once again, this is also a delayed reaction. This is a formation of a solitary erythematous patch or plaque that recurs at the same time every time the patient is re-exposed to whatever is causing this um, eruption, so this drug. So once again, the key about this one, and that's why it's called fixed drug eruption, is that it's going to recur at the same site whenever the patient is re-exposed to whatever caused the eruption of the drug. Some of the causes of these are going to be laxatives, uh, tetracyclines, metronidazole, sulfonamides, barbiturates, NSAIDs, salicylates, food coloring, also oral contraceptives, quinine. And once again, these reoccur at the same site. So if it appears in the thigh once, it's going to come back and it's going to appear in the thigh again. So it can occur anywhere in the body. Usually it's going to be in an area of antecedent trauma. And like we said, it's going to be fixed. It can also be found in the mouth, the genitalia, the face, the acral areas, and it's going to be usually localized. So usually on your early lesions, you're going to see these sharply demarcated erythematous macules that are going to be itchy, painful, and burning, and they're usually solitary, and then they tend to become large. Usually the lesions will become edematous, form a plaque, which evolve to Ebola, then erosion, and usually these lesions tend to heal, but they heal with dark brown with violet hue. That's going to be the color. And usually most of these, um, so this rash will usually go away in days to weeks after the patient discontinues the medication. And if they do have pain, usually it's going to be because they have like any type of mucosal areas because remember we said that it tends to involve also the mouth. 
If it's generalized or widespread, we can refer them and we can also give them something like prednisone, right? If the lesions are like non-eroded, then we can give them a to potent topical corticosteroid. If it's eroded, then of course, we wanna make sure that we ensure that we cover for possibly antibiotics, right? So antimicrobial ointment usually, and then also dressing. So the next one's gonna be your drug-induced hypersensitivity reaction, also known as your um, DIHS or your drug-related eosinophil with systemic symptoms, also known as your DRESS, right? So what are some of the causes of this? Usually it's an eruption with systemic symptoms and internal organ involvement. So if it does involve the organs, the common organs are gonna be the liver, the kidney, the heart, the, and the bone marrow. So some of the causes can be certain antibiotics like penicillin, metronidazole, TB, TB drugs, so tuberculosis drugs like acinizide, NSAIDs also like naloxicum, diclofenac, and also anti-HIV medications. Also, calcium channel blockers, allopurinol, the big one, right? Phenobarbital, so any of your anti-epileptics are also associated with DRESS. So this patient's going to be presenting with an exanthem. Um, they'll have erythematous central facial swelling, fever, malaise, lymphadenopathy, involvement of other organs, also like the liver and kidney. More than 70% have eosinophilia. They also have abnormal LFTs, hepatosplenomegaly, a nonspecific rash, and it tends to begin in the third week of a patient starting a new medication. The mucous membrane may or may not be involved. If it is involved, you'll see colitis, right, which is usually on the edges of the mouth, erosions. Um, you'll see the pharynx. It's going to be very red, so erythematous pharynx, enlarged tonsils also. Diagnosis is usually, usually a clinical diagnosis. Make sure we take a good history, right, ask the patient if they start any new medications. Are they on what medications? Ensure that we're doing a good skin exam. We can also do CBC, LFT, BUN, and creatinine. And usually there's a three diagnosis criteria, right? For dress, it's going to be drug eruption, hematological abnormalities, and systemic involvement. Treatment, once again, first thing, stop any medication that is causing it, okay? Or substitute it for another medication. If it's a certain anti-epileptic, substitute it for another one. If it's a certain antibiotic, then you can go to another one. And then discontinue any medication, of course, that is not essential. Um, if it's not severe, we can give something like topical steroids and antihistamines. If it's severe, usually these patients are going to get systemic steroids, right? Like prednisone for these patients. The next one's going to be the really, really, really bad one. So Steven Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal nephrolysis. So these are usually delayed reactions. I saw a lot of these during my rotation at the burn center, and they are very, very scary. So these are very acute, life-threatening mucocutaneous reactions, right? Uh, the etiology, the majority of the cases that we saw in the hospital were due to drugs. By far, I have to say the most common drug I saw was allopurinol and then also your sulfa drugs. But by far, allopurinol was one of the most common ones that I saw when I was rotating um, at the burn center. Also, uh, etiology can also be idiopathic. Sometimes it just happens. So what's the path, though, of this? Usually there's apoptosis of keratinocytes, and there's a cytotoxic immune reaction that just starts attacking the own cells of the skin. And some of the medications that cause this, like we said, uh, sulfa antibiotics, sulfazalazine, allopurinol, by far common, tetracycline, certain anticonvulsants, NSAIDs, nivirapine, uh, thiazidazone also, and how are you gonna, what are you gonna see on physical exams? So you're gonna see extensive necrosis and detachment of epidermis and mucosal surfaces. Uh, usually these patients tend to present one to three weeks after onset of medication exposure. And then when I worked in the burn center, we would also get patients that would get transferred to us that had dress, but they were just worried that it was gonna go into TENS or SJS, so we would just um, monitor these patients just to make sure that it was not SJS or 10. So we got a lot of um, dress patients also. And sometimes we would get patients that we were like, mm, they would tell that the patient has SJS and we'll look at him, we're like, doesn't have any mucosal involvement. And then the next day, like, boom, like all this mucosal involvement, the sloughing of the, the mouth, it was just, and they, most of these patients, sometimes it will involve also, of course, like, um, esophagus and your throat and stuff like that. And so these patients cannot swallow. So a lot of these patients needed uh, um, enteral tube feedings. So 
it's really, really sad, very scary. Um, usually these patients also present with fever, headache, rhinitis, arthralgias, and myalgias. Usually the it'll start on the face, so they'll have these initial symmetric eruptions on the face, and then we'll go to the upper trunks, proximal extremities. Um, it's more painful than anything. It can be itchy, but it's more painful than itchy, and the rash will extend very quickly throughout the body. It's going to be erythematous, irregular shaped, dusky red to pyritic macules that progressively coalesce. And like I said, this these involve both SJS and 10 are going to involve mucosal membranes. So anywhere, the eyes, the lips. Um, also, the I had a female that came in. She actually got it after taking alpurinol. She was diabetic, and it, she also had vaginal involvement. Um, and so she was just in a lot of pain. And when she would talk, she couldn't even open her eyes just because it was just really bad. And her lips were just really inflamed. She was just inflamed everywhere. Um, so with these patients, like we said, they'll have conjunctival burning or itching, skin pain, burning, tenderness, paresthesias, um, photophobia, painful micturation, which was another one also I saw. So a lot of these patients had foleys because they hurt a lot whenever they go to the restroom. Um, anxiety. Lesions will sometimes evolve, and the majority of the time they will evolve, to flaccid blisters. They'll spread with pressure and they'll break easily, and this is what a positive Nikolsky sign is. And literally, like, you would just go like this and they would slough off. Um, usually with these patients, like we said, mucosal membrane involvement, um, and it can involve anywhere, buccal, ocular, genital, like I discussed earlier. And the thing about ocular is that can it can these patients can actually become blind. So a lot of these cases we need to call opto. So opto will come and see these patients. Like I said, like this patient that had really bad like vaginal involvement. Um, she had two feedings because she just couldn't swallow. Her mouth was just really swollen. Her eyes. And with these patients, uh, it's a dermatological emergency, right? Usually these patients you'll stabilize them in the ER and then you'll transfer them to burn centers specific burn centers that take care of these patients. So in our case, we got a lot of patients. Um, we were located in San Antonio, so that's where I'm from. And we got a lot of patients from everywhere, like all over Texas, like the southern part of Texas, northern part, um, El Paso, everywhere. And so um, <clears throat> with these patients, of course, they have a very high mortality rate. And usually the treatment for these patients is just ensuring that it's supported treatment and we just kind of help the patient go through what's going on with them. So giving them fluids, right? A lot of these patients just cannot swallow. So we would put them on internal feedings. They can't go to the restroom. Um, and so another thing with these patients, whenever they came in, every patient that came in that we suspected it was SJS 10 or pemphigus vulgaris or the really bad skin disorders, we always got a biopsy. So dermatology would get a biopsy just to confirm that it was SJS or 10. So a lot of these patients, you do have to consult dermatology as soon as possible, right? And then in regards to the body surface area, that's another thing that they really like to test. So make sure that you know this. Um, Steven Johnson syndrome involves less than 10% of the body, right? Versus Steven Johnson syndrome slash toxic epidermal necrolysis is 10 to 20%. And that's the majority of the cases that we saw in the burn center were both SJS and 10. And the majority of them were between the 10 and 20. Um, toxic epidermal necrolysis is like when it involves more than 30% of the body surface area. So once again, SJS less than 10, um, 10 to 20 is gonna be SJS slash 10. Anything greater than 30 is gonna be your toxic epidermal necrolysis. The thing about Steven Johnson syndrome and 10 is that we have to make sure that we recognize it early, right? You have to make sure that you take care of these patients quickly. You discontinue the offending agent because these patients can lose limbs. I mean, I've seen patients that will lose limbs um, because of this. Uh, so, of course, like we said, supportive care. Um, make sure that you're stopping the medication that is causing it. To transfer these patients to an ICU or burn unit, like where, is, where we took care of these patients. Multidisciplinary approach, like I said, ocular involvement, get off though. Um, we can give them some medications like high dose IVIG, but usually it's just a part of right? IV fluids, electrolytes, glucocorticoids, ensuring that we suction that oral pharyngeal because it, this will help prevent aspiration. If they have eye lesions, erythromycin ointment. Um, and then a lot of these patients go septic quick. 
and they get very hypertensive quickly. We actually had one patient that passed away from um, Stephen Johnson syndrome slash 10. So it's really important that we get these patients under control. Um, so yes, make sure that the, you know this one, you really need to know how to point it out and how to recognize it in general wherever you practice because this is an emergency and it's very fatal. So next one's gonna be keratotic disorders and neoplasmins. So it's gonna be seborrheic keratosis, very commonly found in males more than females, especially if the patient's older than 30, right? It can arise in any part of the body except for the palms and soles, but it can go anywhere in the body. Commonly see them on the face, right in the back. Um, whenever I think about this, I think about the actor, and I apologize, I don't remember the name, but um, majority of these, Morgan Freeman, they're Morgan Freeman, he has a lot of them on his face. Um, so how is this patient gonna present what you're gonna see on physical exam? You're gonna see these sharply marginated pigment and lesions. Uh, they're gonna usually be black, tan, flesh-colored, pink, blue, gray. They can be multiple and they can be extensive. Usually they're papular, they can appear macular. Usually they'll have a superficial epidermal growth and they can become a plaque. Usually on your exam, you're gonna see the description of a velvety texture or verrucous wart-like waxy, greasy, stuck on appearance. That's usually what's pathognomonic for these on exams. Um, usually there's no really specific treatment for them, especially if, because they're benign, right? But a lot of patients do get them cosmetically removed because they're just cosmetically bothersome, right? And like we said, these can also be found in the back. If they are, usually they are found in that Christmas tree distribution. Um, and of course, we can biopsy them just to make sure that it's nothing that's bad. Uh, we can also do a dermoscope, and then you're going to see these keratin pseudocysts. And you want to make sure that you're always comparing these lesions to other lesions, right? Looking for that gray or that ugly duckling. And treatment, like we said, Usually you don't need treatment. You can do something like curatage or cryotherapy, shave removal, especially since this is more cosmetic, if anything. The next one's gonna be actinic keratosis. These are actually pre-malignant lesions versus seborrheic keratosis, right, are not. These actinic keratosis are pre-malignant lesions. So just make sure that you know how to differentiate between both of them and which ones are pre-malignant and which ones are not. So this one is has a potential of transforming into full-blown squamous cell carcinoma. And usually the cell that is involved is gonna be the keratinocyte. And it's very commonly found in your mouths, any patient or individual that works outside, so your outdoor workers, um, if they have any type of prolonged UV exposure, if they're older, also if they have fair skin, right? We're usually thinking about FITS one, two, and three skins immunosuppressed, genetic syndrome also, like are they, do they have albinism, um, xeroderma pigmentosum that makes their skin more prone to getting um, attracted by the sun. Risk factors is going to be persistence of actinic keratosis, cumulative UV exposure, history of skin cancer, genetic susceptibility, and immunosuppression. Usually what you're going to see is that you're going to see these tender, excoriated, sun-exposed areas like the head, neck, forearms, face, and hands, Erythematous papules, a thin plaque with rough, gritty scale. And that's usually how they like to say it, right? Sun exposed area, rough, gritty scale. You'll see these adherent, hyperkeratotic, skin colored, yellow brown, dirty, reddish, coarse like sandpaper, strawberry pattern that might have one or might have several of these on your physical exam. So, diagnosis is going to be clinical diagnosis. Um, Usually we do want to biopsy these, especially if they're like very highly hyperkeratotic. And the thing about this one is that it does not bleed weeks with excoriation, right? Treatment, we want to consult with dermatology. We want to look at the number of lesions, like where are they located? How thick are they? And then of course, that's going to guide us on whether we want treatment or not. Um, usually we can do liquid nitrogen cryotherapy if it's like an individual lesion or if it's local. If it's multiple, right, then you can do something like field therapies, like topical I5-FU and Miquimod cream. And then just make sure that we're educating these patients, right, that ensuring that they protect themselves from uh, the sun, um, ensuring that they wear uh, UV protectants, right, ensure that they wear hats when they need to be outside, uh, ensure that these patients follow up with their skin exams at least every six or 12 months or sooner, of course, if 
they see a new one that pops up. So the next one's going to be our basal cell carcinoma. So this is actually the most common skin cancer, and it arises from the basal layer of the epidermis. It's usually due to proliferating atypical basal cells. And more commonly found in your males, especially males that are older than 40. Um, majority of them, more than 90% of them, are found on the face. Yeah, also patients that have a lot of UV ra radiation, right? If they have certain tumor suppressor genes, mutations like PTCH, and then once again, your fair skin types, like types one and two. Um, and then, of course, how is this patient going to present on physical exam? Usually they're asymptomatic, but you will see some erosion or bleeding with just minimal trauma. Uh, sometimes they, you'll see an open sore, reddish patch, shiny bump and nodule. Usually what you'll see on your question stem is going to be your shiny bump and nodule. And... Um, usually we want to think about the danger sites, right? Like the medial and lateral canthi, the nasal labial fold behind the ears, ear canal and scalp. Um, these, we want to think about these danger sites with these patients. So diagnosis is going to be a dermoscopy, right? Biopsy is going to be the best one. And we want to make sure that with these patients, of course, you've seen them in the ER, you're going to refer them to dermatology, right? Um, but say if you're Dermatology, of course, we can do curate and electrocautery, cryosurgery, and then excision with standard three to four millimeter margins. And then, of course, remember we said those danger sites, if it's located on the face, the ears, um, the canthi, or if it's chlorosine, then we're going to do the most micrographic surgery for these patients. And then, of course, educating these patients, once again, sun protection. Make sure that you, self, you do self-exams. Um, follow up every 6 to 12 months at least for two years with your dermatologist. So the next one's going to be your squamous cell carcinoma. This, this one usually commonly arises from a dysplastic lesions, right? We had just discussed actinic keratosis. And once again, the origin of cells is going to be your keratinocytes. And this is very commonly found in your white, fair skin males that are older than 55 or patients that are in their 20s or 30s. Very commonly found in your areas that are sun exposed, like your head, neck, forearms, hands. Uh, patients that use tanning beds are very prone to getting these. UV exposure, chemical carcinogen, tar, chronic radiation, HPV infections, like uh, the genitals and the thumb. And with these, with squamous cell carcinoma, it has a lot of morphologies, but usually what you'll see is a sharply demarcated macule, papule, plaque, or nodule that can be pink, red, or skin colored. Um, it'll be hyperkeratotic. It's going to be exophytic, so that means it's going to grow outward, right? It's going to be indurated. Um, usually the lesion feels thick and firm. Cutaneous horn is another way I've seen it described on your exams. It's going to be crusted, friable, and it bleeds with minimal trauma. It's itchy, it can be tender, and it can also be painful, and it's usually firm. Any keratotic or eroded papier or plaque for more than one month is usually cancer until proven otherwise. If, it's, if it has not involved the dermis, then we usually think about squamous cell carcinoma in situ, right? Because it has not involved that dermis portion of the skin. Versus if it does involve the dermis and it goes all the way into the lymph nodes also, we're thinking about your invasive squamous cell carcinoma because we have squamous cells so squamous cell carcinoma cells that are located in the dermis. And with these patients, you want to make sure that we refer them, right? The standard of care is going to be your surgical excision, usually your Y-local excision or your Mohs micrographic excision. Um, we can also do cryosurgery, but usually the best one is going to be your Mohs micrographic, right? In regards to med medications, we can do something like 5-FU with Miquimod, Diclofenac for these patients. And the thing about squamous cell carcinoma is that it has an increased mortality compared to basal cell carcinoma. So if we're thinking about our cancers, right, in like a step ladder, you have your basal cell carcinoma in regards to mortality, and the next one, squamous cell carcinoma, which is a higher mortality than basal cell carcinoma, and then you start going to uh, the other ones, like, for example, melanoma. So... We said this one has a very high mortality, so we want to make sure that we refer these patients quickly because this one has a high mortality in comparison to basal cell carcinoma, and it has a higher rate of metastasis with these patients. So all these patients have to make sure that they are following up 
with their dermatologist um, every three to six months for two years and then every six to 12 months for three years and then after that annually for life. So melanoma is the next one, right? So melanoma. Melanoma is the most malignant form of skin cancer. So remember we were talking about that ladder. You have basal cell carcinoma, squamous, and then full-blown melanoma. Most malignant form of skin cancer, 80% of skin cancer deaths are due to melanoma. And what is the origin of cell? What's the cell that's mutating? It's going to be your melanocytes. Very commonly found in women between the ages of 25 to 29. Usually, it's going to be a patient that has some history of UVA or UVB exposure, tanning beds, genetic predisposition. Usually, some of the risk factors are going to be, of course, age, fair skin, blue eyes, red slash blonde hair, freckling, patient older than 50. Do you see a melanocyte nevi that is greater than 5 millimeters? Is the nevi atypical? Do they have congenital nevi? Is the patient immunosuppressed? Do they have a personal or family history of melanoma? And then, of course, UV exposure, um, also some of the risk factors. Usually, these patients are asymptomatic. Sometimes they just develop, um, and they arise also with the pre-existing nevus. Very commonly found in your areas that are sun-exposed or even also in your non-sun-exposed areas. And what you're going to see on physical exam is going to be your pigmented papule, plaque, and or nodule. So we, we think about our A, B, C, D, E's for these patients, right? Um, asymmetry, um, what, how big is it, right? Um, what's the diameter? Is it elevated in comparison to all the other ones, that ugly duckling, like they said? This one can bleed, and then also, sorry, B, it's going to be the border. So it's a border, so asymmetry, borders um, for these patients. What's the color of it, right? D is going to be diameter, E is going to be elevation. So you're always looking for all these, and then that ugly duckling, like I said. This one can bleed, erode, crust, and usually the patient's going to have, say that it has a history of changing, so it's growing quickly or etc. So um, with these patients, right, diagnosis is going to be total excisional biopsy. It's usually not done on the face, of course, or any area that's cosmetically sensitive. But if it's okay anywhere else, we will do an excisional biopsy. Um, and like we said, we don't play with melanoma. Melanoma kills people. So a red flag, usually it's going to be if the color is blue, that means it's more deeper, right? A deeper lesion. So treatment, uh, we usually refer these patients. We want to make sure that these patients do follow up six months for two years once they have been treated for the melanoma. And then after that annual follow-up, it's usually a multidisciplinary approach. Once again, educating our patients on protecting themselves from the sun, examining, doing self-exams in regards to their skin, right? So, the next one's going to be Kaposi sarcoma. So, Kaposi sarcoma is multifocal systemic tumor of endothelial origin. Usually, it has systemic involvement also, commonly involving the GI and the lungs. So, what's the etiology? So, it's going to be human herpes virus 8 infection, HIV is one of the big ones, right? Uh, when we think about the 1980s, when the HIVs and AIDS um, epidemic occurred, uh, this is one of the signs that a lot of doctors were seeing was Kaposi sarcoma, right? Um, another one associated with Kaposi sarcoma is B-cell lymphoma, immunocompromised transplant patients. So usually this patient's gonna present with a mucocutaneous, um, ulcerating or bleeding easily, pain, urethral, anal obstruction, they'll have GI obstruction or bleeding, bronchospasm, so symptoms of shortness of breath, intractable coughing, and usually the lesion is going to start as an oval ecumotic macule. It'll occur at a site of trauma, and it usually is going to be parallel to the skin tension lines, and then it's going to evolve into patches, papules, plaques, nodules, tumors. You can see also green halo. The patient's going to be presenting with lymph edema, ulceration, and the color is usually purple or red, and that's usually what's pathognomonic about this one is that it's purple or red. So the first manifestation, sometimes they'll have an oral lesion. It's very commonly found on the hard palate. And then it'll start at the feet, legs, and hands, and then it'll start slowly spreading centripetally. The diagnosis is going to be a skin biopsy and then imaging just to rule out that no internal organ has been involved because, like we said, it tends to really involve the GI and the lungs. Treatment is going to be your cryosurgery, laser surgery, photodynamic therapy, electrocautery, excisional radiation, systemic chemo, 
Um, and then of course, our goal is just to control the symptoms of the disease. So our next topic is going to be over papular squamous, alopecia, pigmentations, and other disorders, right? So let's go into irritant contact dermatitis. This is usually due to a chemical irritant. It occurs after a single exposure to an offending agent, which is toxic to the skin. It's the most common type of occupational skin disease. It's commonly associated with abrasives, right? Cleaning agents, oxidizing agents, reducing agents, plants, animal enzyme secretions, desiccant powders, dust, soil, excessive exposure to water also. There's also predisposing factors, right? Does the patient have atopy, right? Fair skin, do they have, um, do they live in an area that has low humidity? Um, certain also the occupations, uh, people like us, medicine, right? We're constantly using these chemicals to wash our hands. Dentists, vets, housekeeping, hairdressing, floral, agriculture, forestry, food prep, printing, painting, metalwork, engineering, car maintenance, construction, fishing. So acute symptoms, it's usually localized to confined areas that are exposed, most commonly found on the hands. And I've actually seen this most commonly found on the hands during my family medicine rotation. And in addition to that, it can also present as a burning, stinging. Um, it can either be immediate or delay. Usually if it is delayed, it occurs more than 24 hours. You'll have erythema, vesiculation, caustic burn with necrosis. Usually the lesions are going to be sharply demarcated. They can have superficial edema. But the thing about this one is that lesions only stay localized, right? So they do not spread beyond the site of contact. There's also severe cases of irritant contact dermatitis. Usually with these patients, you'll see vesicles, um, blisters, erosions, frank necrosis, bizarre and linear configuration also. And then of course, so these are the acute symptoms. You also have chronic symptoms. The most common um, symptoms are usually gonna be your chronic symptoms. So usually this tends to develop slowly after a patient is having repeated exposure to whatever is irritating their skin. And usually, once again, it's gonna be found in the hands. It's gonna be, once again, that smarting, stinging, burning, itching pain. Usually they'll have fissures also. The hands are gonna be super dry, chapping, erythema, hyperkeratosis and scaling, fissures, crusting, sharp margination, ill-defined uh, borders, lichenification. It'll start in the finger web spaces and then it'll go to the sides and dorsal surfaces of the hands and then it'll start involving the palms. Usually for housewives, it's gonna start on the fingertips. So diagnosis, we tend to do these patch tests. Usually they're gonna be negative and irritant contact dermatitis, right? Treatment is usually gonna be uh, systemic. So we can give something like, um, well, treatment, right, sorry. We can do something systemic like allotretinoin, right? Um, we can also do, if it's located on the hands, topical therapy. If it's acute, of course, so in general, treatment for these, stop the offending agent, right? That's always with the pants, like I said, it's the most conservative. So stop the, the discontinue, stop the offending agent. If it's the patient's job, then maybe um, counsel them on maybe switching to a different job. You know, sometimes patients don't have the luxury of doing that. Maybe wearing gloves to better protect their hands but usually ensuring that they stop whatever is causing that allergic reaction. So if it's an acute irritant contact dermatitis, right? Wet dressings, um, topical corticosteroids, right? If it's severe, then we're gonna give them oral steroids and emollients. If it's chronic, we can do potent topical corticosteroids, lubrication also, and then prevention. Once again, avoid the irritants. So the next one's gonna be allergic contact dermatitis. This is usually due to an antigen or allergen that elicits a type four delayed cell mediated hypersensitivity reaction. So allergic contact dermatitis is gonna be a type four hypersensitivity reaction. It's dependent on the sensitization and it only occurs in sensitized individuals. So it's very common in all ages, right, everyone? Um, signs and symptoms, usually they're going to be presenting with an eczematous dermatitis, intense pruritus, which makes sense, right? Anything itchy, it's going to be an allergic reaction. Um, they're going to be presenting with pain, stinging, though it can present with like an acute illness syndrome, like with fever. And sometimes it'll, usually majority of the time, it's confined to the area or to a specific area. Then it's going to spread linear with atypical patterns. It can be isolated or generalized. 
And usually a patient that has allergic contact dermatitis has to come in contact with something that caused that dermatitis. So if it's acute, you're going to see a well-demarcated erythema and edema that superimpose closely spaced papules or non-umbilicated vesicles, right? If it's subacute, you're going to see plaques of mild erythema, small dry scales, small red pointed firm, erythematous firm papules and scales. If it's chronic, that's when you start seeing your lichenification, thick scaling with satellites, small firm rounded flat topped papules, excoriations, and pigmentation. Diagnosis is going to be a patch test for these patients, right? Um, you're going to apply an allergen to the normal skin, and then usually you'll see that erythema, papules, and vesicles. Treatment, you want to avoid exposure, right? You can do something like wet dressing and then topical corticosteroids. If the patient has acute flare-ups, then you can consider something like systemic corticosteroids. So the next one's going to be atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis is an acute, subacute, chronic relapsing skin disorder. It's usually chronic, and it's a pruritus inflammatory skin disease. It's very commonly found in infancy, so in babies during the first two months to one years. Usually the patient's going to have a family history of atopic dermatitis, so someone in their family also suffered from this. Um, they also have a history of allergic rhinitis, asthma. So when you think about atopic dermatitis, we think about a tribe, right? It's going to be asthma, your atopic um, dermatitis, and then your allergies. Um, also with these patients, they have like IgE re reactivity, more commonly found in males and females. And what are some of the factors that cause this? So inhalants like dust mites, pollens, microbial agents like staph aureus, group A strep, um, candida, IgE antibodies, certain foods like eggs, milk, peanuts, soy fish, and wheat. Seasons like winter flare, clothing, um, after taking off something like wool, right? Emotional stress, usually. I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were saying that milk actually now has currently one of the highest allergies that people are allergic to, which I thought was really interesting. So lactose intolerance. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have this dry skin, pruritus, rubbing, um, increased inflammation and lichenification. It's usually that itch and scratch cycle. It's very itchy and they keep scratching themselves. Um, usually they'll have also, like I said, a history of some type of allergic rhinitis, asthma. They can also have conjunctival pharyngeal itching, um, lacrimation, and usually it's seasonal, right? Especially like with pollen. Now the key to this one is where is it located? Because when we think about this one in comparison to like psoriasis, they're located in certain areas. So this one is located on the flexure surfaces, right? So it's going to be flexure surfaces. And where I see it usually is going to be like on the back of the knees or like in your antecubital fossa area. And that's where I've seen on the question stems. Versus psoriasis, right? It's going to be found in your extensors like your elbows. So once again, atopic dermatitis is going to be your flexors, antecubital fossa, or in the back of the knees versus psoriasis is going to be on your extensors like the elbows. So that's how I kind of got these straight in my head because I always used to mix these up together because they're both like and something wrong with like your immune system. So once again, flexor surfaces, front side, front or the side of the neck, they can be located, eyelids, forehead, face, wrists, dorsum of the feet and hands. If it's severe, it can be everywhere, so it can be generalized. And like we said, if it's acute, you'll see poorly defined erythematous patches, papules, plaque, with or without scale edema, puffy skin, erosions due to scratching, um, Usually these patients get secondary infections because they're like auto inoculating themselves, especially if they're children, right? So with these patients, if they do have secondary infections, you might see pus, right? Cracked, very scaly skin. Um, they can also have chronic atopic dermatitis. This is where you have that lichenification. So whenever I think about lichenification, it's just like your, your skin like um, repairing, right? And that's usually chronic as we discussed almost everything that we had dis pri discussed priorly that was chronic involved lichenification. So lichenification, uh, painful fissures, usually they'll have the lateral one third of the eyebrow, alopecia also. Um, and usually in general with atopic dermatitis, it's usually exacerbated with stress and sweating. 
So diagnosis is clinical. We can do an allergic workup for these patients, right? Because it's possibly very common that these patients are going to have allergies to something else. And make sure that we're always keeping in mind that this is very commonly associated with secondary infections like staph aureus, right? Because you have staph all over your skin and that constant itching and scratching like you're auto inoculating yourself. Um, treatment is avoid that rubbing and scratching, right? Um, so we can do something with wet dressings, emollients, hydroxyzine, like your histamine antagonists for the pruritus, which is going to help with the itchiness. You can give oral antibiotics, especially if you do suspect that maybe there's a second bacterial infection. But like I said, first line, topical corticosteroids. Second line, you can do something like calcineurin inhibitors. And this is usually for subacute. So the next one's going to be your lichen simplex chronicus. This is going to be due to repetitive rubbing and scratching of the same location. Usually, like, these patients have it on the back of the neck and, like, they're constantly scratching that area and it just becomes so hyperkeratotic. So the patient just scratches it and feels better and that's why they keep doing this over and over again. Most commonly found in women, especially if they're older than 20 years old, and usually it's stress-induced, right? And like I said, sites, com the common area is going to be that nuchal area, like the back of the neck, we're just constantly just scratching it. Um, scalp, ankles, lower legs, upper thighs, forearms, even the vulva, uh, anal area, scrotum, and groin area. This patient's going to be presenting with paroxysms of pruritus, so paroxysms of itchiness. You're going to see that thickened skin. Um, and skin markings are usually accentuated. You're going to see excoriations and treatments. Just discontinue that rubbing and scratching, right? Occlusive bandages, topical corticosteroids, intralesional trimcinolone, oral hydroxyzine for that pruritus. The next one's going to be your dyshydrotic eczematous dermatitis. This is going to be like a special type of hand and foot dermatitis. This one can be acute, subacute, or recurrent, right? And this patient's usually presenting with that pruritus. Um, it's going to be painful whenever there's erosive. And the key word about this one is going to be that clear tapioca-like vesicles. Or sometimes it'll just say clear vesicles. So if you see that on the question stem, think about your dyshydrotic eczematous dermatitis. Or sometimes it'll just show you a picture. If you see your like this tapioca-like on the hands, that is dyshydrotic eczematous dermatitis, right? Those tapioca-like vesicles. Large bulla, scaling fissures, and once again, lichenification. Most common area is going to be the fingers, the palms, the soles. These patients can get secondary infection once again because these are itchy. Treatment is going to be your topical corticosteroids. Usually we do high potency topical corticosteroids for these. If it's a severe case, we can do something with prednisone and Pruva. Um, so once again, PO antibiotics for secondary infections because these patients are prone to getting, once again, uh, infections because of that itching cycle. The next one's going to be your osteotic dermatitis. This is very commonly found in elderly patients, very commonly found during the winter, and that's one of the key words for this one is winter. Uh, usually also commonly found in patients that bathe frequently, especially in those hot, soapy baths. And this patient is going to be presenting with pruritus. The pruritus can lead to lichenification. Um, they're going to have this dry, cracked, superficially fissured skin with light scaling. And it's usually found on the legs, arms, hands, and trunk. And the thing about this one is just tell the patient to avoid overbathing, right? Um, I've heard podcasts where there's, you know, we have like really good oily oil that our skin produces, right? And if you're constantly removing that, then your skin is not going to be exfoliated. And I was listening to a podcast about dermatologists that were just discussing that. So that makes sense, right? avoid overbathing. Um, use humidifiers, emollients. You can also do topical corticosteroids if it's inflamed, so like meat and potency topical corticosteroids. The next one's going to be psoriasis. So this is going to be a common chronic inflammatory multi-system um, disorder that mostly involves the skin, but it can also involve the joints. And it waxes and wanes during the patient's life. Interestingly, someone who has this is Kim Kardashian, which I thought was very interesting. So etiology, usually the onset has two peaks. So it'll usually start between the ages of 20 to 30 and also between the ages of 50 to 60. Usually these patients have some type of strong genetic component. And the cause is because there's cytokines that are released by immune cells, right? And they start attacking the own um, uh, skin. 
So triggers of this, of course, are going to be bacterial infections like strep, trauma, that rubbing and scratching, right? Drugs, uh, systemic steroids, stress, alcohol are some of the triggers that can cause psoriasis. And how is this patient going to present? So usually you'll have that plaque. So it's going to be located usually on the knees, elbows, low back, ears, scalp, umbilicus, gluteal, cleft nails. And like we said, this is usually going to be where on the extensors, right? Extensors. And um, with these patients, another thing that we need to know is that it's usually slowly changing and these patients are going to have that positive Auschwitz sign, right? That Auschwitz sign, um, they're also going to have the Kubner phenomenon. And usually you'll see red plaques that are surrounded by white silvery scales. And that's usually what you'll see on the question stems, those red plaques that are surrounded by white silvery scales. They're usually sore. They're symmetric and they're bilateral and they're very, very itchy. So with these patients, right, um, treatment is usually going to be with PUVA or systemic treatment. Also, you can give it either monotherapy combined or rotational therapy. You can also do something like retinoids for keratosis. So there's different types of psoriasis. We also have butate that involves usually the trunk, extremities, and face, right? Um, and then you have also postular, uh, you have the scalp, and just in general for psoriasis, the diagnosis is going to be a clinical diagnosis, right? The therapy is just very, very um, complicated, and it really depends on which type they have, right? But usually with these patients, topical steroids is usually the best one for all types of psoriasis. Um, and then we can do coltar, especially for the plaque type psoriasis. You can do calcineurin inhibitors for like the facial type and psoriasis and the intratrigonous types of psoriasis. Um, but usually topical steroids are going to be the best one for all types of psoriasis. And like I said, you can also give systemic treatment if needed for these patients. And the thing about this one is that we don't give prednisone, right? Because prednisone sometimes will make it worse. So just make sure that you know that. There's also psoriatic arthritis, right? This one will usually involve the joints. And it's important that we recognize these early because they can actually destroy the bone. And treatment for this is usually something like methotrexate for these patients. So like I said, treatment, first line is usually topical corticosteroids. That's usually if it's localized and if it's involves like less than 5% TBSA. If it's extensive, right, then we tend to do something like systemic methotrexate. We can also do, um, like we said, UV therapy for these patients. And it also involves the nails. So remember we had discussed that earlier, so it can also involve the nails. Sometimes they're like pitted. And like we said, so psoriasis is usually going to be, once again, those extensors versus atopic dermatitis is going to be those flexors. And usually for psoriasis, I see it a lot on the elbows on the question stems that we get. So the next one is going to be your lichen planus. This can be actually acute or chronic, and this is a skin disorder. Um, it involves the skin and or mucous membranes, and it can persist for months or years. Um, usually when it does become hypertrophic, it's because the patient has had it for decades. Very commonly found between the ages of 30 to 60 and more commonly found in females. On exam, you're going to see this flat topped pink to wallacious shiny pruritic polygonal papule. This is where we think about the four P's, right? Papule, purple, polygonal, pruritic, and plateau. Another thing you might see is a Wickham striae. This is going to be like white or gray lines. Um, and usually for these lesions that we discussed, they're going to be grouped, annular, and disseminated. And they're usually found on the flexor portions of the arms and legs, the wrist, the lumbar region, the shin, the scalp, um, and also on the lips. These patients are also going to have a positive Kibner's phenomenon. And they're also found on the mouth. Usually on the mouth, you're going to see your milky white reticulated papules that are going to become erosive and painful. And diagnosis is clinical. Treatment is going to be usually with topical corticosteroids with occlusion. You can also do something like intralesional trimcinolone. And um, you can also do something like systemic, right? Like cyclosporin, oral glucocorticoids, and even PUVA photochemotherapy. The next one's going to be your pityriasis rosea. This is going to be an exanthematous eruption that usually occurs in young people. 
It's usually found between the ages of 10 to 35 and commonly found during spring and fall. Usually these patients are asymptomatic and if they do have symptoms, they're usually flu-like symptoms. They can also present with malaise, nausea, loss of upper appetite, um, GI upset, upper respiratory symptoms, fever, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes. And the key about this one and what's like pathognomonic what you see is that usually they're going to start with a single lesion. So it's usually known as that herald patch, right? It's going to be that single annular erythematous patch with peripheral scaling and central sclering. So sometimes in the question stem, it's going to say, um, I noticed this lesion like a few days ago and now it's like I have so many of them. So they present usually with a single lesion. And like I said, sometimes also they'll have a history of having like an upper respiratory tract infection or they just got over like a GI bug. And your, another keyword for this one's gonna be your Christmas tree eruption. So after that first hair lesion, it's gonna like erupt like a Christmas tree on the back. So, sorry, down, Christmas tree on the back. And with these patients, treatment's gonna be self-limited. Um, usually in five weeks, they get better. I've actually had a question on this where it asked me what was the best advice or what would you teach the patient about this one is that you really don't need to do anything for these patients that's supportive and just expect it to disappear in five weeks. And usually recurrence is not common. If you do give them medications, you can give them something like over-the-counter anti-itch creams, um, topical steroids, and oral antihistamines also if needed. The next one is going to be your melasma, okay? Melasma slash cloasma. So this is a well-demarcated macular light to dark brown hyperpigmentation of the face, very commonly found in females, and it tends to run in families. It's most commonly found in darker skin types, and it's usually due to hormonal changes, right? Usually it's known as your mask of pregnancy, very commonly found in your pregnant patients. If the patient also has a history of being on oral contraceptives or hormonal replacement therapy, um, they're very prone to getting this. It's associated with diphenyl dantone acyl, and then the cause is usually idiopathic. This patient is usually going to have that malar, um, and it's usually going to call, cause be found in that malar frontal areas. It's going to be uniform or um, blotchy, and it's usually worse with exposure to that UV light. So once again, that demarcated macular light to dark hyperpigmentation of the face for these patients, and um, with these patients, right. We think about uh, usually associated with pregnancy, right? So usually melasma is usually found to be due to hormonal changes during pregnancy or from um, sun exposure. It's also known as cloasma. And treatment, right? Just educating your patient to avoid the sun. Um, use daily sunscreen. And they can get it removed. And usually it's a cosmetic, if anything. If they do, you can use something like triple topical therapy, lasers, and chemical peels. The next one's gonna be vitiligo. So vitiligo is going to be a well-circumscribed depigmented macules and patches that can enlarge gradually. It's usually autoimmune. And what happens is that your own body is attacking your melanocytes, right? And usually it's a genetic component, most commonly found in the ages between 10 to 30. And with these patients, it tends to favor areas of trauma. So it's very commonly found in your knees, elbows, finger, mouth, eyes, genitalia. And usually these patients can have white hair. Diagnosis is going to be with, with a was light exam. Sorry, I just had a phone call. So diagnosis is going to be with that wood light exam. It, this is where you can differentiate between hypopigmentation and depigmented lesions. Treatment is going to be with potent topical corticosteroids, topical tacrolimus, and also calcinerin inhibitors, right? Which is the one that we just discussed. The next one's gonna be your pemphigus vulgaris. So this is gonna be autoantibodies to the decimal glenes that are resulting in superficial bulla and erosion. This one's usually acute or chronic, and this one's fatal. So this one's up there with your toxic epidermal necrolysis and your Steven Johnson syndrome. Usually commonly found in your adults between the ages of 40 to 60, and Usually what you're going to see on exam is going to be those flaccid blisters on the skin that are easily erupted. And this one's going to be a positive Nikolsky sign. Usually on exam, you rarely see any intact bulla. They're usually erupted. 
You'll also see erosions on the mucous frame membrane. These are very painful. They're burning. They bleed easily. You'll see vesicles, serous content, um, very commonly found in the scalp, face, chest, axilla, groin, umbilicus, also back if the patient is bedridden. And diagnosis, these patients need to be consulted with dermato or dermatology, right? Um, treatment's going to be fluid, electrolyte imbalance. You can give them oral steroids and immunosuppressants, but usually it's just going to be for these patients, just um, ensuring that they get through with it, right? So in comparison to pemphigus vulgaris and bolus pemphigoid, pemphigus vulgaris is a really, really bad one. How I memorize it is it has V for villain. might help you, so that's how I memorize that pemphigus vulgaris was worse than bolus pemphigoid. Another difference between this one is pemphigus vulgaris we said it has these flaccid blisters that are ruptured versus your bullus pemphigoid. These usually are firm bulla, firm blisters that have not ruptured. And the, another thing with pemphigus vulgaris is that usually they're found in younger patients versus bullus pemphigoid. Usually in the question stem, it's going to be a lot older patient. So that's another way you can differentiate these. Pemphigus vulgaris, remember we said it's between adults, the ages of 40 to 60. Usually for your bullus pemphigoid, the question stems I've seen is going to be usually in your late 60s, early 70s, even 80s for patients with these. So that's another way you can differentiate between each one because I know for sure this topic was something that I kept messing up when I was studying for my parents. So bullus pemphigoid is going to be the next one. This is going to be autoantibodies of parts of hemidesmosome that are resulting in deep, tense bulla. So once again, this is going to be a tense, firm bulla that's going to be intact. Etiology is going to be a linear um, AGA in kids. Once again, this one's commonly found in older adults. It's going to be found in areas of the axilla, medial thigh, groin, abdominal area, flexure surfaces, lower extremities, and mouth. Usually, they're going to have this pruritic papular or urticarial lesions with bulla. They'll have a prodrome of pruritus and then urticaria. And then you're going to see the papula, papula and then it's going to form into tender bulla. Usually the bulla is going to be oozing and bleeding. Diagnosis is going to be with direct immunofluorescence, uh, which is going to be the same with pemphigus vulgaris, right? That direct immunofluorescence. Uh, Treatment, we want to refer these patients to dermatology, give them something like prednisone. If the patient's stable or if they have a mild case of bullous pemphigoid, we can give them something like topical corticosteroids or tacrolimus. So out of both of these, right, pemphigus vulgaris and um, bullous pemphigoid, like we discussed, pemphigus vulgaris is going to be the one that's going to be more severe. It's going to be found in, like, your younger patients between the ages of 40 to 60, like we discussed. This one has flaccid bulla, and it has that positive Nikolsky sign. Um, and like we said, with these patients, it's usually very fatal, okay? And... With bullous pemphigoid, usually these patients have a tense from bulla, and on the question stem, it's going to be usually an older patient. So the next one's going to be alopecia. This is going to be an autoimmune attack on the hair follicles by lymphocytes. So the hair is going to fall out literally in patches, and it can occur in any hairy part of the body. Usually these patients are going to have like some type of autoimmune disorder also, so they might have Down syndrome. Uh, thyroiditis. They're usually young adults, less than the age of 25, that present with alopecia. The cause is idiopathic, but recurrences are very frequent with alopecia. On physical exam, you're going to see these localized round oval, no inflammation, hair follicle intact, not scarring, sol solitary patch with follicular openings that are present. The keyword for this one is going to be those exclamation mark hairs, and that's what I kept seeing on my exam. So I think I even had a question on the pants in regards to this one. Exclamation mark hairs, and that's what kind of gave it away that it was alopecia and it wasn't any of your fungal causes, right? So alopecia. Um, usually these patients for diagnosis, you want to make sure that you rule out things like a tinea capitis, like we discussed, because that was another answer choice that I had. So you want to do like a KOH, um, RPR, just to rule out things like syphilis, um, you can do A and A just to rule out things like lupus because, like I said, this is autoimmune, so you just want to rule out any other autoimmune disorders. This usually tends to resolve without treatment in about six months, but if it's a huge area that's involved, you usually want to refer them to dermatology because they have a very poor prognosis. But usually it's reassurance. We can give them something like a top potent topical corticosteroid if needed, even topical minoxidil. 
And like I said, if it's extensive, you just want to make sure that you refer these patients, you might have to put them on topical immunotherapy. So the next one's going to be tinea capitis. Um, this is where the scalp hair traps fungi. And what happens is that trauma is going to assist that inoculation, right? So there's going to be dermatophytes that invade the scalp and they start spreading to the other hair follicles. It's most commonly found in your toddlers and school-aged children. And infections can sometimes become endemic in schools. It's usually transmitted from person to person, fomites, animal to person also. And how is this patient going to present? They're going to have this non-inflammatory scaling, scaling and broken off hair, severe painful inflammation, and boggy nodules. Usually that's what I see on the question stems. It's going to be that boggy nodule that drains pus and it's scarring. I've also seen the patient having a black dot also. And there's like different variants for this one. The variant that you definitely do need to know is going to be your curion. This is a variant of endothrix. So what is endothrix? Endothrix is when it occurs within a hair shaft without cuticle destruction. So this is going to be a variation of that with boggy inflammatory plaques. Usually you'll see an inflammatory mass, boggy purulent nodule or plaques are painful. They drain pus and the hair falls out and it's pulled out. Uh, without pain. Sometimes they also have sinus formation, um, thick crusting, matting hairs, lymphadenopathy, and these will heal with scarring alopecia. So it's really important that we refer these patients because this is a very severe form of tinea capitis is going to be your curion. Um, usually we treat them with oral prednisolone with an antifungal. But in general for tinea capitis, it's usually a um, diagnosis that's done. Uh, you can do a clinical diagnosis uh, we can also use a Woods lamp, direct microscopy. That's when you're going to see scales with hyphae and, and, and arthrospores. We're going to do a fungal culture also. And treatment, of course, is going to be based off the fungal culture, right? So we want to make sure that we culture it first. And usually medication that we give for this is going to be something like Rizofulvin, right, for children. We can also give something like terbenafin and itraconazole. And then just ensuring that we educate patients to prevent spread, right? Don't show towels, brushes, hair, accessories, anything like that. Because um, with these, like we said, there's a bad one, bad variant, which would be your curion. So the next one's gonna be your stasis, dermatitis, and venous insufficiency. So this is gonna be an eczematous eruption that occurs in venous insufficiency, stasis, and leg edema. It can be either acute or chronic, and some of the etiologies for this one is going to be smoking and obesity. And these risk factors increase your risk for ulcer development, right? Um, and usually what you'll see on exam is going to be that itchy red scaly plaque. It's going to be weepy. You'll see these inflammatory papules, scaly crusted erosions, brown pigmentation, petechiae, Venous ulcers, and like the venous ulcers are going to be where? Usually on the medial malleolus. Um, remember when we were discussing the ulcers in general, when you think about venous, since it has that E, right? Venous, it's located on the medial malleolus, since that medial has that E. That's how I memorize it, right? Venous medial uh, malleolus versus anything that's arterial, it's usually on the lateral malleolus. Uh, Stasis dermatitis and venous insufficiency is going to be found on the lower one-third of the legs and ankles. You'll see varicose veins. Usually some early signs of this. You'll see tenderness, edema that's usually better in the morning, telangiectasias, hyperpigmentation. Late signs are going to be things like limited ankle movement, venous ulcers, porcelain white scars. Uh, chronic stasis dermatitis and venous insufficiency, usually there's fat necrosis, permanent sclerosis, and then usually on your chronic, we think about that inverted bottle leg, right? That inverted champagne bottle leg, where there's edema above and then below is like sclerotic region. Diagnosis is going to be a uh, Doppler ultrasound. You're going to see this incompetent veins and venous occlusions. Treatment is going to be elevation and compression stockings. Um, you want to do wet compressions for the erosions and ulcers. And you can also do high potency topical corticosteroids. So the next one's going to be your pressure ulcers. These are, these are usually caused, um, they're usually on bony prominences due to external compression of skin, shear force, friction, and ischemic tissue necrosis. Usually it's commonly found in your patients that are chronically bedridden, right? They have decreased sensation or patients that are uptunded mentally. 
And the thing about pressure ulcers is that the complication is going to be osteomyelitis, which makes sense, right? Because you are compressing on that skin and it's going through all the skin tissues, the skin um, layers, and it can actually involve in going to the bone, which can cause osteomyelitis. Diagnosis is going to be clinical. We can do a wound culture, a blood culture, a skin biopsy, and a bone biopsy, especially if a patient has like a non-healing pressure ulcer and we just want to rule out things like osteomyelitis. Treatment's going to be repositioned. We want to inspect for breakdown, minimize friction, interface air mattresses, avoid moisture and nutritional status. So that's why it's really important for a patient that's bedridden, especially like for example, if they're in the ICU, just to make sure that we're, the nurses are turning them constantly. During my uh, burn rotation, I had a patient that had Guillain-Barre syndrome, so she was paralyzed from the neck down, and she had a lot of these. So we would always ensure that we turned her constantly, or she was at least moving around to prevent these pressure ulcers. So treatment's going to depend on the stage. So we have stage one, two, or three, and four. So stage one or two, we can give topical antibiotics. We can do moist sterile gauze, hydrogels, and hydrocolloid dressings. Stage three or four is usually surgical management, debridement, and bony prominence removal. Sometimes they might even need a skin graft, depending on how bad the skin, the skin, um, the ulcer is. So the next one's going to be urticaria or hives. This is going to be a vascular reaction of skin that's characterized by wheels that are surrounded by red halo or flare. So it's usually a transient edematous papular or plaque. And usually the cause is sometimes idiopathic. It can be just a reaction to a drug, right? To the food the patient ate, an infection. Um, in children, though, usually the most common cause is going to be a viral infection. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have pruritus, so that itchiness due to swelling of the upper dermis, right? And then that histamine release. They'll have wheels, and that's usually the, the key word for this one. is going to be wheels that appear within minutes, they enlarge and they blanch with pressure and they're usually white whenever you blanch them. Diagnosis is gonna be clinical. Usually if they have an acute case of pruritus, it usually resolves within six weeks. If, if it's been going on more than six weeks, then we think about chronic urticaria. And we wanna make sure with these patients, we're also looking for anaphylaxis, right? And treatment's gonna be antihistamines. Um, usually we, first generation or second generation, but remember first generations are really sedating versus second generation, which are the new ones are not as sedated. So also take them into consideration the pain on the patient you're treating. Is it a truck driver? Of course, these patients, we don't want to give them a first gen, maybe do something like a second gen. Um, doxepin is another thing that you can give them. If the patient has urticaria and then on top of that, they have angioedema, then you can give something like prednisone. And then of course, anaphylaxis, um, ABCs first, right? First line. So ABCs, airway, breathing, uh, circulation. So first line is always going to be epi, 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 epi. So the next one's going to be angioedema. Uh, this is going to be a pathology in the deep dermis, deep dermis and subcutaneous tissue, very commonly found in the face or in the extremity. And sometimes it can last for several days. Usually you'll see a deep, ill-defined swelling, painful burning, uh, but it's not itchy. And it can involve, you know, like the, the lips. Um, it can even involve the palms and the soles. It can involve the larynx. When we think about the larynx, we're thinking about maybe asphyxia. It can involve the bowels also and the tongue and the pharynx also with these patients. Um, and then also just make sure we take a good history on the patients, right? Are they taking certain medications? Um, when we think about angioedema, right, we think about like our ACE inhibitors, the next one's going to be ecchinthosis nigricrans. This is going to be a velvety hyperpigmented plaque that's usually found on the intertrigonous areas. And whenever I think about ecchinthosis nigricrans, you think about some type of insulin resistance, right? Like diabetes. But of course, there's a lot of other causes. It can be hereditary, obesity, um, certain medications like uh, nicotinic acid can cause it. Another one that I actually thought was really interested that's associated with acanthosis nigricans is going to be a malignancy, especially like your GI cancers, um, also lung cancers, GU cancers, lymphoma, but cancers in a patient with acanthosis nigricans that does not have diabetes or acanthosis nigricans, no diabetes or type of um, insulin resistance, also look for a malignancy. I'll look, look for those lymph nodes, which can tell you a lot whether the patient has a malignancy like gastric cancer. So usually what you'll see on physical exam, it's going to appear dirty. 
you'll see these lines that are accentuated, hyperkeratotic skin tags, rugose surface area, and it's usually insidious, right? Um, if it's malignant, like usually we think about the palms, the oral mucosa, the vermilion border, the, they'll usually have these tripans, and usually that's a sign that the patient has some type of malignancy is those tripans, because just as how it sounds, they look like intestines. Um, and then of course, treatment for this is treating whatever is the underlying disorder. If it's cancer, make sure that we treat that. If it's diabetes, get the diabetes under control. Usually we can do for cosmetic, right? Topical keratolytic or topical and systemic retinoids. The next one's gonna be lipoma. This is a collection of fat under the skin. Um, you also have angiolipomas. This is usually has a vascular component and usually these do require excision. Some of the causes for lipoma, usually it's familial, uh, tends to begin in early adulthood. They're slow growing and they can occur sometimes in, one in the 100s. And what you'll see on physical exam is this soft, round, lobulated, movable, just like mass, right? And it's very commonly found in the trunk. I've seen it in patients in the neck, um, proximal extremities, and they can be tender also. And then just surgery for these. Um, they're super quick surgeries. My surgeon would probably done like 10 minutes uh, when he removed these, but they can just become so large. I had a patient that it was just in her neck and she was young. She was like 17 or 18. And so for her, it was more like she was becoming, uh, um, her posture was being affected. The next one's going to be your epidermal inclusion cyst. This is going to be a mobile dermal nodule, often with an overlying punctum. Um, and that's usually what you'll see on your question sum is that it's going to have that overlying punctum most common cutaneous cysts, and they tend to arise from hair follicles. And if you open them, they have like this really rancid smell. And punctum, like I said, is gonna be your keyword. And with these patients, treatment just surgical excision, and it's actually gonna be curative. So we can do IND, we can also do intralesional trimcillinolone. But if it's inflamed, we wanna make sure that we just do not excise them because they can actually um, worsen the infection. All right, guys, so we are actually done with Germ. So why don't we go into our next topic? Hey guys, let's go into our next topic, which is going to be endocrine. So let's start with diseases of the thyroid gland and let's start with hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism is usually due to excess thyroid hormones in the tissue, right? Usually there's more T3 and T4. And when that, what that's going to cause, it's going to cause increased metabolics and sympathetic activity and growth um, and development also. More commonly found in regards to hyperthyroidism in females and males, and the most common cause of hyperthyroidism is grave disease. So make sure that you know this. Grave disease is an autoimmune disorder, and by far it's the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. If not, 60 to 80 percent of hyperthyroidism is going to be grave disease. And like we said, it's autoimmune. Antibodies usually stimulate the TSH receptor that leads to an overproduction of thyroid hormones. The second most common cause of hyperthyroidism is going to be your toxic multinodular goiter. And this is usually due to an expansion of cells that are due to mutations of the TSH receptor. Other causes can be a pituitary adenoma and then also iodide. So how is the patient with hyperthyroidism going to present? They're usually going to be presenting with a goiter, heat intolerance, fatigue and weakness, thirst, dyspnea, palpitations, weight loss, amenorrhea, low libido, hair loss, and then hyperreflexia also with these patients. Um, in regards to Graves' disease, since this is one of the common ones, right, this is autoimmune like we discussed, very commonly found in your females, specifically in your younger females between the ages of 20 to 40. This can also be brought on by stress, smoking. Certain medications are also associated with Graves' disease like amiodarone. And usually your patient's going to have a family history of graves. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have or orbitopathy, so that lid leg, right? Pretibial mixed edema, which is going to be that non pain edema plaque nodules on the shin. And usually they'll also have thyroid acropachy. So in general, for hyperthyroidism, the best initial test is going to be your serum TSH, right? You want to see, does this patient hyper? hypothyroidism, is it low, is it high? And then we also want to get a T3 and T4. Although I listened to, uh, to podcasts that says that it's not necessary to get these. But once again, in regards to textbook and the medicine, you want to start with your serum TSH, T3 and T4. 
Also make sure that you look at any recent CT scans also just to rule out anything like a pituitary um, problem, adenoma. So usually in a patient, um, if a patient has a secreting pituitary adenoma, everything's gonna be high. So they're gonna have a high TSH, high T3, and high T4, okay? If it's primary hyperthyroidism, which is the most common one you're gonna see, usually it's gonna be a low TSH, right? A high T4, and that's when it's gonna tell you as primary hyperthyroidism. Because if we think about just kind of like the anatomy, right? You have the thyroid, it releases, um, you have the thyroid, and then in regards to just, um, so just in general, you have the hypothalamus, right? It releases a hormone, it goes to the anterior pituitary gland, which releases a hormone, and then it'll go to the gland, right? Um, for example, in this case, it's gonna be the thyroid. And then that thyroid is gonna release that hormone and it's gonna cause a physiological effect, right? And if the thyroid is not working, for example, or if the thyroid is working too much, this is where your thyroid stimulating hormone comes in. So your thyroid stimulating hormone is going to be released, right? So your TSH is being released. If the thyroid is overacting, then you're gonna have really, really decreased amount of TSH, right? If the thyroid is just not acting or it's not acting like it should be, then you're gonna have increased TSH. So they're gonna try to stimulate more. They're calling, they're calling, but no one's picking up on the other hand. So that's how you should think about it. So in regards to hyperthyroidism, um, like we were discussing, since the thyroid is just like overactive, it's producing a lot of thyroid hormones, right? The brain's gonna be telling that thyroid gland, like it's gonna be, the patient's gonna have a low TSH, right? low thyroid stimulating hormone because the thyroid's already overacting. So low TSH for primary hyperthyroidism, but they're gonna have a high T3 and T4 because it's just crazy and it's creating all of these hormones. And that's usually gonna be your primary hyperthyroidism. Now, if we're thinking about a patient um, that has radioactive iodine uptake, usually these patients are gonna have a low TSH with either a high and or normal T4 and a high T3, right? And if we think about in regards to your thyroid, your uh, scans, right, your radioactive iodine um, uptake scans, which is a way we also diagnose these patients, is and something that they really like to test is that if you see that there is a low uptake of that iodine uptake, you're going to see this is commonly associated with thyroiditis or ectopic thyroid hormones, right? So it's going to be a patient that. I've read questions and I've also heard cases that it's a woman or a man that's trying to lose weight and they found out that if you take thyroid hormones, you lose weight like this. So that would be like an example of exogenous thyroid hormones. So they're just taking um, things like uh, levothyroxine, right, that is increasing, just giving them exogenous thyroids. Uh, now, if a patient has a high uptake with diffuse or homogenous radioactive iodine distribution, then that's going to be Graves'. So on your picture, you might see just your thyroid, right? And the uptake of that radio iodine is going to be distributed equally. So it's going to be distributed and it's going to be a high uptake. That's going to be Graves, right? Versus a high uptake with nodular uh, radioactive iodine distribution and there's multiple patches of accumulation, then this is when we're thinking about a toxic multinodular goiter, right? Versus a high uptake with nodular radioactive distribution, and there's only a single area of accumulation, then these patients were thinking about a toxic adenoma. So the treatment in general, we want to make sure that we give them antithyroid medications. So things like methamazole, right, is going to be first line. Um, PTU is usually first line in first trimester of pregnancy. And then, of course, in thyroid storm, PTU is usually going to be your first line. And if the patient has severe graves or, like, for some reason they cannot tolerate like medications or radioactive iodine, then we can do a thyroidectomy for these patients. But once again, we try to avoid these because you also have your, um, so many things on there, right? So on your thyroid. So once again, most common cause of hyperthyroidism is gonna be Graves' disease, which is gonna be an autoimmune disorder. And best initial test is gonna be your serum TSH and then T3 and T4. Treatment for these patients is going to be methamazole first line, unless the patient's pregnant first trimester, then you would give PTU. So next one's going to be your hypothyroidism, right? So hypothyroidism. So you have different forms of 
hypothyroidism. You have your congenital hypothyroidism. This is actually going to be the most common cause of thyroid dysgenesis. And this is the most common preventable cause of intellectual disability. So usually for these patients, we screen them all. Um, for the newborns, we screen them for um, congenital hypothyroidism. Usually a patient with a congenital hypothyroidism is going to be presenting with an enlarged posterior fontanelle and delayed closure. And usually we think about those six Ps, right? And I've seen pictures of babies for these uh, pot belly, pale, puffy face, protruding umbilicus, protuberant tongue, uh, poor brain development. And these are usually the six Ps of congenital hypothyroidism. Diagnosis is going to be your TSH and T4. This is where you're going to see increased TSH and the low serum or free T4. And treatment is going to be sodium thyroxine. And then you have also acquired hypothyroidism. This is where the, there's a failure of the thyroid gland to produce sufficient thyroid hormone to meet the metabolic demands. So when we think about hypothyroidism, especially for like family medicine, right, this, this is the one that we think about. This is most commonly found in female. It's commonly found in elderly also. Uh, commonly found in patients that are postpartum. Um, Hashimoto's, right, is by far one of the common causes of, of hypothyroidism. Also in areas that have iodine deficiency, very common to have hypothyroidism. Does the patient have a history of autoimmune disease, family history of thyroid disease? So usually with these patients, they're going to be presenting with weight gain, fatigue, weakness, cold intolerance, constipation, delayed deep tendon reflexes, brittle hair and nails, dry skin, usually the lateral eyebrow loss, right, which is also known as your queen Anne's eyebrows, memory impairment, difficulty concentrating, menorrhagia, depression, myalgias, coarse facies, bradycardia, edema, you can also see a goiter, hypothermia, bradycardia, and decreased output. So once again, hypothyroidism, right? Remember we were talking about hyperthyroidism, everything's like up, so this patient's like tachycardic, they're losing weight, um, they have like, they're sweating all the time. Now hypothyroidism is the opposite, everything's down, so weight gain, cold intolerance, fatigue, delayed deep tendon reflexes, um, menorrhagia, and so bradycardia, goiter. So diagnosis, we want to make sure that we evaluate for thyroid dysfunction in every single patient. We're going to do a TSH for these patients. Um, and there's different types, once again, of hypothyroidism. It's, it's euthyroid. Usually these patients are going to have a TSH that's going to be within normal limits. Um, a low TSH, we think about hyperthyroidism state, right? If the patient has a high TSH, though, and a low T4, T4 this is where we think about primary, primary hypothyroidism. And that's how it's going to be in general for primary hypothyroidism, right? We think about Hashimoto's, it's going to be a high TSH and it's going to be a low T4. Because once again, the thyroid is not acting, you're getting signals from the brain like, you know, thyroid, work, 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 but it's not answering. They're calling, no one's picking up here. So... For these patients, you also have subclinical hypothyroidism, which is going to be your high TSH and normal T4, and then you have your secondary hypothyroidism. Usually, this is something to do with the pituitary gland, right? And usually, in secondary hypothyroidism, you're going to see high TSH and a high T4. So, treatment for this is going to be lifelong therapy with levothyroxine. Usually, a low-dose medication should be started on these patients that have ischemic heart disease or elderly patients. It's really important that in pregnant patients that are hypothyroidism, they, we increase the levothyroxine to at least nine doses a week because once again, we're trying to prevent your congenital hypothyroidism because remember we discussed these babies have a lot of um, probabilities that are really sick. So we're trying to prevent this. So in general, like we said, levothyroxine is going to be the treatment for hypothyroidism. Another one I wanted to go over was mexedema crisis or coma, which is the extreme form of hypothyroidism. This one has a very high mortality rate. Um, it's not very common, but if it is found, it's usually going to be found in your older patients. I've seen questions some where it's an elderly woman, they have long-standing hypothyroidism, and they were outside in the cold, right? And that just exacerbated it. The classic signs and symptoms you're going to see is going to be decreased mentation and hypothermia hypoventilation, hypoglycemia, hypotension, bradycardia, so everything's down. Diagnosis is clinical. Uh, we can do a T, TSH also and a T4. So usually the TSH is going to be really, really high because once again, it's trying to call, but no one's picking up. That T4 is going to be low. You can also measure the cortisol. 
So with these patients, right, we want to make sure that we always start medications before we get lab confirmation, especially if we have a high suspicion for mixed edema, uh, crisis, and coma. So usually we want to also do our ABCs in the, air, in the ICU, right, airway, breathing, circulation, um, intubate them, if, especially if the patient's very, like, uh, they can't breathe if they're unresponsive, and treat whatever is the underlying cause. Usually supportive care is the care for these patients, and we give them IV levothyroxine and hydrocortisone, usually in stress doses. So why don't we compare that to, for example, your thyroid storm, um, which is going to be like this extreme cause of your hyperthyroidism, right? So thyroid storm is just, this one's an emergency. This one has a very high mortality rate, and it's also fatal, um, with these patients. And usually what happens is that most of these patients don't even know they have hyperthyroidism, so they're undiagnosed, or sometimes they're just not complying with their medications. There's certain things that can also push a patient into hyperthyroidism. So surgery, trauma, infections, iodine overload, amiodarone, once again, can cause patients to go into um, thyroid storm. And usually with these patients, they're going to have the same symptoms of hyperthyroidism, but everything's going to be exaggerated, right? It's going to be super bad. They're going to have nausea and vomiting, di uh, diarrhea. Um, usually the classic presentation is going to be your hyperthyroidism with fever, tachycardia, and then altered mental status is another one. So this is usually a clinical diagnosis. We can measure the TSH. Um, usually we'll see like a very high T4 with these patients. And treatment, once again, like mixed edema is going to be your ABCs first, so airway, breathing, circulation. We usually are going to give them super physiological doses of glucocorticoids, and these are usually going to be very, very high doses. And usually it's supportive care in the ICU, right? Volume status, temperature, heart rate. Um, we're going to give them beta blockers because that's usually the first thing in these patients because we want to make sure that we control their heart rate because these patients come in with like very high heart rates. We also want to give them PTU, right? Um, and then... Of course, uh, corticosteroids also. So how I think about it is going to be your P's, propanolol, PTU, and then um, prednisone uh, for your patients. And that's going to be for thyroid storm. So the next one I wanted to go over is going to be adrenal insufficiency, also known as your Addison's disease, right? This is going to be a deficiency of aldosterone, cortisol, and androgens. So it tends to evolve the sona fasciculata usually. And this one can present both acutely or chronically. Basically, what happens is that the adrenal cortex gets progressively damaged over time. Uh, primarily, the most common cause is going to be autoimmune adrenalitis. So this is where we think about Addison's disease, which is going to be an autoimmune disorder. The secondary common cause of adrenal insufficiency is going to be a patient that's just on Google corticoids, right? So we have to make sure that we distinguish whether it's a primary or secondary cause. So how is this patient going to present? So... Usually these patients um, are usually going to have symptoms of hyperkalemia and hyponatremia, and those are usually the labs that we're going to see and what you always see on your question sums. It's going to be that hyponatremia, that hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis. These patients are going to be craving salty food. I was listening to a podcast the other day, which I thought was really interesting, and there was a doctor. He said that he went out with his friend, and his friend, who was a doctor also, had no idea that he had Addison's, but he had, like, noticed that, you know, he was just very, very tan. He's like, hmm, you know, just very, very tan. And also, they went out to eat, and when they went out to eat, he was just, like, pouring so much salt on his plate, like, almost the entire thing. And he was like, hmm, maybe, do you have Addison's? So I thought that was hilarious. And that's how these patients will present they crave salty food. Um, they'll have nausea and vomiting, fatigue, dizziness. They'll have low blood glucose also. And why? Because the patient does not have cortisol, right? Um, they'll have also overactive pituitary, which is going to cause like your hyperpigmentation that we see in these patients. It looks like they're super tan. And usually in women's, you'll have a loss of pubic and armpit hair. They'll have decreased libido. And with these patients, if they do have chronic Addison's, usually it's an insidious presentation. They'll have fatigue, weakness, hyperpigmentation, anorexia, weight loss. And then you also have Addisonian's crisis, which is like acute adrenal insufficiency. This is usually caused by some type of like stress that is put on the body. 
where the body's just not able to keep up with that stress. So we think about, for example, surgeries, infections, injuries, um, even like uh, vomiting and diarrhea. Usually these patients are gonna be presenting with low blood pressure. They'll have cardiovascular collapse, syncope. You can also have Waterhouse Friedrich syndrome, which is a sudden increase in blood pressure where the vessels rupture that cause ischemia and adeno adrenal failure. This is usually due to like some type of infection. Um, and diagnosis for just Addison's disease in general is gonna be a BMP and AM serum cortisol level. This usually peaks in the morning. And then we can also do a cosentropin stimulation test. So we're gonna give synthetic ACTH and see how does the body react to that. And then we can also do a CT scan of the adrenals and then a pituitary MRI. Treatment's gonna be usually with steroid replacement, right? Um, cortisol, aldosterone, androgens, prednisone, and fludrocortisone also. So once again, Addison's disease by far most common cause of adrenal insufficiency. You have primary and secondary. Secondary, we're thinking about glucocorticoid use, right? Um, where patients on steroids and all of a sudden you stop them and then they go into like Addisonian crisis. So that's why we do, for diagnosis, we do the cortisol level tests and we do the cosentropin stimulation test to see whether it is a primary or secondary cause. And treatment, like we said, is steroid replacement, prednisone, fludrocortisone. The next one's gonna be your Cushing syndrome. Usually um, the zone that's involved in regards to adrenal cortex is gonna be the zona fasciculata. Uh, usually these patients are gonna have elevated cortisol levels in the blood. And the thing about Cushing syndrome is that you have Cushing syndrome and then Cushing's disease, right? Cushing syndrome is a syndrome because it has multiple origins versus Cushing's disease, it's usually due to the pituitary. So just keep that in mind. Etiology. So the most common cause of Cushing syndrome is going to be exogenous corticosteroids. So medications are being given to the patient that are increasing the cortisol levels. Other causes can be adenoid pituitary, right? But most common cause by far is going to be your exogenous corticosteroids. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have hypertension, weight gain, moon facies, right? It's one of the big ones. Abdominal striety, trunk obesity, high insulin levels, buffalo hump, hyperglycemia, and insulin resistance. And diagnosis is going to be with a one milligram overnight dexamethasone suppression test. What happens is that this is supposed to suppress the ATCH production, and then it normally decreases cortisol levels. But if this does not work, then we're thinking about Cushing syndrome, right? We also want to check ACTH for the source because like we had said, there's multiple causes, but by far the most common cause is going to be your glucocorticoid use. Treatment is always removing the cause, right? Since once again, primary cause is going to be use of glucocorticoids, so telling the patients to stop corticosteroids, right? But of course, we can't cut them cold turkey. No, we have to make sure that they are being tapered and they're gradually decreased because this patient can go into what? Adrenal crisis like we discussed, Addison um, adrenal crisis. So if it's a pituitary tumor, right, we're gonna remove it. Sometimes even Cushing syndrome can be due to certain cancers, like small cell lung cancer. Um, so of course, treating the lung cancer with these patients. So the next one we're gonna go over is gonna be diabetes. So diabetes, uh, just real quick in regards to the background of diabetes is that diabetes in general, is when there's a difficulty of moving glucose from the blood into the body cells and the tissues. So remember the cells, when we think of our biochemistry, right? The cells need glucose for energy. And sometimes in diabetes, especially the glucose levels are just too high. So too much glucose in the blood makes cells starve for energy. And then the two things that we think about, we think about insulin, right? Insulin, what does it do? It reduces blood glucose and it's secreted by beta cells. Glucagon, this one increases blood glucose levels and it's secreted by alpha cells. So we have so many different types of diabetes. Let's go into diabetes mellitus type 1. So diabetes mellitus type 1 in regards to diabetes 1 and 2, 1 is going to be the least common, type 2 is the most common. So type 1, about 10% of diabetes is type 1. Um, and this is where the body just does not make insulin, right? This is due to a type four hypersensitivity. And what happens is that there's T cells of your own body that are attacking the pancreas and they destroy that beta cell. So remember that we said that insulin is secreted by beta cells. Well, if you have a destruction of your own T cells that are destroying that, those uh, beta cells, 
you won't be able to release insulin. And this is what is occurring with these patients. They're not making enough insulin. They're not releasing insulin. So this is autoimmune, like we said. There's a pancreatic islet, islet beta cell destruction, and insulin is just absent in the blood. This is most commonly found in your children. So usually in your question stem, it's going to be a child. It's also found in your young adults, but of course it can be occur at any age, and there's adults now being also diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Also, usually there's like genetic markers that are associated with diabetes type 1, things like HLA-DQ, HLA-DR3, and then HLA-DR4. These patients in general that have diabetes, they are at risk for other autoimmune disorders like thyroid problems, adrenal insufficiency, pernicious anemia, celiac disease, and vitiligo. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have poly polyphagia, so they're going to be very hungry. Glycosuria, polyuria, they're going to the restroom a lot. Polydipsia, they're very, very thirsty. And why? Because they're urinating so much and they're dehydrated. That's why they're just super thirsty. Weight loss. Um, and like I said, if you see any of these in the question system, it's a young child. They're eating, but they're not gaining weight. They're drinking so much water. They're going to the restroom every like five minutes. You're thinking about diabetes type 1. So how are we diagnosis? Usually it's going to be a hemoglobin A1C that's going to be greater than 6.5%. What is a hemoglobin A1C? If my doctor explained it the most perfect way to a patient. I thought it was just amazing. So hemoglobin A1C, you think about how many of your blood cells are covered with sugar. And he kind of just said, like, if you have a bowl of cornflakes, how many of those cornflakes are covered with sugar? And that's what hemoglobin A1C is. So hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5% is diagnostic of diabetes. Um, also, and or a fasting plasma glucose greater than 126 is diagnostic of diabetes. Uh, random glucose greater than 200 is also diagnostic of diabetes. And usually you also see is the antibodies that are present um, in diabetes type 1. So treatment for these patients, they're going to need lifelong insulin therapy, um, a combination of both rapid and long acting, and then of course, just educating the patient on diet and exercise. Uh, one thing that they really like to test is in regards to the DOM phenomenon and the Samoji effect, so we'll just go into these real quick. So the DOM phenomenon is where the patient has reduced tissue sensitivity to insulin between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. Samoji effect is when the patient has nocturnal hypoglycemia that leads to surge of counter-regulatory hormones to produce high blood glucose levels by 7 a.m. Sometimes it can also occur due to waning of circulating insulin by the morning. And then in general, when we think about diabetes mellitus, we think about DKA, right? So diabetes mellitus type 1 is associated with DKA versus diabetes mellitus type 2 is associated with your HHS. So just make sure that you have those connections, even though, of course, that's not always set in stone, but just in regards to your textbook, um, just think about that. So what is diabetes, diabetes ketoacidosis? What happens is that the cells need energy, right? So they start using ketone bodies to get their energy, and this increases the acidity of the blood. This is an emergency, right? And some of the triggers of DKA are infection, infarction, ischemia, um, idiopathic, also certain like Ill illegal like stuff. And this patient is going to be presenting with polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia, fatigue, nausea and vomiting. Also, they have that fruity breath, right? Why? Because they're releasing that ketone, those ketone body acetone, um, abdominal pain, loss of consciousness, dry skin. They're going to have that Kuzmal respiration. So those deep labor breathing, reduced cardiac output, reduced acidity. Diagnosis, uh, we'll do a urine sample. You'll see ketones that are going to be present in the urine, and they're going to be really high, about 200 to 600. And that's how you can differentiate DKA from HHS, is that DKA has ketones that are present versus HHS has no ketones that are present in the urine. These patients are going to be metabolic acidosis, They're going to have low serum bicarb and serum sodium. The serum is going to be positive for ketones. The serum potassium is going to be increased. The total body potassium is going to be decreased. And like we discussed, this one's associated more with type 1 than type 2 diabetes. Treatment's always going to be your ABCs, right? So IV fluids, insulin, electrolyte replacement, potassium, supportive measures, and then make sure that we're admitting these patients, right? So the next one's going to be diabetes 2, and like we said, this one by far is the most common type of diabetes for diabetes 1 and 2. 
This one is about 90%. And what happens with these patients is that the body makes insulin, but the tissues just are not responding to it, right? So these patients have insulin resistance. They have impaired beta cell function and they have increased insulin resistance. Very commonly found in your adults. Um, I was reading a book the other day that said that the onset usually is greater than the age of 40, but that was like in the early 2000s. Now the onset is in the 20s. Um, I did my schooling in the Valley of Texas where diabetes is everywhere. And during my pediatric rotation, we would even diagnose children like in 10, 11, 12 years old with diabetes too. So that's not the case. Although textbook medicine, you know, it says that the majority of diabetes 2 is found in adults in comparison to diabetes 1. Not necessarily true because we tend to find this everywhere. Um, but the thing about this one is that the etiology, one of the most common ones is going to be obesity, right? Um, centripetal fat distribution, if the patient's older than 40, like I discussed, textbook. Lack of exercise, hypertension, also genetics. Someone in their family member have diabetes. What happens is that the beta cells become hypoplastic and then they have they become hypotrophic. So this patient is going to be presenting with hyperglycemia, polyphagia, glycosuria, polyuria, polydipsia due to increased urine and dehydration. They'll have ankylosis nigricans, remember, that dark, like, dirty skin in the back of the neck. Um, and these patients are very prone to getting fungal infections. So if you have a woman that comes in and she, it's like her fourth or fifth candidal infection or even like third candidal infection throughout the entire year, you want to make sure that you check her for diabetes because these patients are very prone to getting candidal infections, especially women. And it's associated with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, atherosclerosis. Diagnosis, once again, fasting plasma glucose of 126 on more than one occasion or a two-hour post-glucose of more than 200 or hemoglobin A1C of greater than 6.5%. It's really important that you memorize these numbers because I can guarantee you're going to have so many questions on this, whether it's on this exam or on your pants. Treatment's going to be diet and lifestyle. That's always first line, right? Lose weight. Uh, make sure that you start eating more greens and veggies. Get your hypertension under control, your hyperlipidemia under control. But of course, Usually the treatment that we do give for these patients, it's going to be your metformin. That's usually the first one that we start with because it's a very safe medication. Um, there's so many other medications that you can give, right? You can give metformin. You can also give something like your sulfonamides. You have your first generation and your second generation. So we think about our second generation sulfonamides like our glyburide, right? Um, glipicide, but these medications aren't used as commonly because they have a very high risk of lactic acidosis. And then, of course, you have your newer medications like your DPP-4 inhibitors, right? Your SGL-2 inhibitors, like the newer ones, and these medications are just amazing. Um, uh, you have so many other medications, and like I said, these newer medications, they don't only control the sugar levels in diabetics, but they're also cardioprotective and they protect the kidneys. I mean, so many things with these newer medications. And then of course you have insulin. But in regards to like when I was rotating through my family medicine, my doctor would stay away from insulin and I actually were with him as much as he could. Like if we had all of these new drugs, right? Metformin's not working because metformin's very cheap. Um, the thing, the bad thing is that these newer medications like your SGL2 inhibitors, your DPP4 inhibitors, is that they are expensive because they're newer drugs and sometimes insurance does not cover that. So also keep that in mind. Um, but they are amazing. Like for example, Genuvia, right? Um, this one's like a DPP-4 inhibitor. So that one's like a new drug. So always metformin, right? And then try SGL2 inhibitors, your DPP-4, all these medications before you get to insulin. Insulin should be really last line, of course, unless a patient cannot afford these medications. And it's really important that we get patients um, diabetes under control because there's so many complications, right? It affects everywhere. And it's like you're running gasoline through your entire body. So these patients start getting neuropathies, right? You think about your um, polyneuropathy, your peripheral neuropathy, that uh, neuropathy in your fingers, the feet. It's, that, that, it's called like that glove right? Because it literally feels like they have a glove and it's that neuropathy here because it's destroying all those nerves. These patients are more prone to dying from an atypical um, uh, chest pain, right? They have atypical chest pain from 
heart attacks that they just didn't feel the heart attack like a normal person would because they're just destroyed all those nerves. It destroys the eyes. I mean, there's so many things with these patients that why it's really important that we get their control, their blood sugar. And then, of course, we also think about HHS, right? Um, this, once again, is associated with diabetes type 2, dehydration, hyperglycemia state, state increased plasma molarity. Why? Due to extreme dehydration. This patient is going to be presenting with polydipsia, polyuria, ultramental sided, neurological abnormalities. But once again, this patient will have no ketosis. In comparison to DKA, which is associated with type 1 diabetes, this patient will have ketosis. And another way to differentiate between type 2 and type 1 is that type 2 for blood sugar levels, this one's going to be high. So levels between 600 to 2400. I mean, can you imagine a patient walking around with 600 or even 2400 blood glucose? So blood glucose levels are going to be high in these patients versus your DKA, it's usually like less than 600. So it's not as high. Um, they'll have a high BUN. Why? Because they're very dehydrated. They're going to have a hyponatremia. Usually pre-renal azotemia is very commonly associated with these patients. Treatment's going to be fluids, right? Insulin, potassium, supportive measures, and these patients get admitted. So it's really important that you know the difference, once again, between type 1 and type 2. What's a patho? Um, who are they found in more commonly? We said that insulin resistance is type 2, right? No insulin production whatsoever is going to be your type 1 because you have total beta cell destruction in type 1 versus type 2 is just resistance, right? Um, type 2 is usually with metformin. Type 1 treatments usually you go straight to insulin because these patients are not created insulin whatsoever. All right, guys. So <clears throat> we are done with endocrine. So our next topic is going to be psychiatry so psych so when are we going to anorexia nervosa so anorexia nervosa usually these patients are preoccupied with their weight their body image and being thin right i've seen pictures of this where it's a patient or a woman seeing themselves in the mirror they're extremely skinny they're gorgeous they're beautiful but in the mirror they see a woman that's obese so they have a distorted image of themselves it's usually associated with OCPD traits and depression, so it's also make sure to keep that in your mind. And according to the DSM-5 in regards to diagnosis, uh, usually the BMI is going to be very low. It's usually less than 17.5 kilograms, or the body weight is going to be less than 85% of their ideal weight. And these patients have an intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat, and they have behaviors that prevent weight gain, right? Um, and there's different subtypes. So you have your restricting type and you have your binge eating or purging type. So just make sure that you keep that in mind because I've had questions where I confuse anorexia nervosa, uh, your um, binge eating type and purging type with like bulimia nervosa. So the way to differentiate this is anorexia nervosa is always going to have a very low BMI, less than 17.5 versus your bulimia nervosa. They're usually going to have a normal BMI. Okay, so restricting type, usually the patient is engaged and is not engaged in binge eating or purging behavior. And what they do is that they fast, they diet, or they do excessive exercise. Versus a binge eating and purging type, usually these patients will eat, binge eat, they'll go and vomit, or they'll use laxatives, enemas, or diuretics with these patients. And in regards to your physical exams, right? Um, you'll see amenorrhea. Why? Because there's decrease in gonadotropins. Usually these patients are going to have cold intolerance. Why? Because the majority of them are hypothyroidism. They'll have hypotension. They'll have decreased bone density. And what happens, unfortunately, is that this bone loss that happens is irreversible. They're going to have lanugo, which is like that baby hair, like that thin, uh, light hair. They can also present with arrhythmias, salivary gland hypertrophy, why? Because they're constantly throwing up and they're constantly um, stimulating those salivary glands. They'll have bradycardia. Um, also, you'll, you'll see in regards to their labs, which is something you need to know and they really like to test, is you'll see hyponatremia, hypochloremia, and hypokalemia. Um, arrhythmias, like we said, especially your QTC prolongation, and if they're vomiting, they're going to be metabolic alkalotic, right? If they're using laxatives, they're going to be metabolic acidotic. 
They'll have leukocytosis, leukopenia, and an increased BUN also. And treatment for these patients, it's really important that we ensure that these patients see a psychiatrist. Also, food's going to be the best one for these patients, right? We want to make sure that we hospitalize any patient that has more than 75% expected body weights or patients that have uh, medi medication complications like electrolyte imbalances, right? Because it, this can cause cardiac complications, right? Since a lot of these patients are hypokalemic, they can develop cardiac problems. And like we said, treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy, family therapy, um, and just ensuring that these patients start gaining weight. But of course, we want to be careful and look out for refeeding syndrome, right? Because refeeding syndrome, what happens is that you have an increased insulin output because you're suddenly introducing a lot of calories in the patient's diet. So these patients um, basically <clears throat> can die from this. So this is very commonly seen in your patients that are malnourished. We saw this a lot like in during the concentration camps. Um, a lot of our the patients that were there that were just fed all of a sudden, we saw a lot of refeeding syndrome. So just make sure that you know that. So the next one's gonna be a generalized anxiety disorder, right? This is defined as a persistent excessive anxiety, hyperarousal with or without somatic symptoms. And we usually think about the DSM-5 criteria, right? Where they have to have excessive anxiety and worry about various daily events and activities for more than six months. And it's associated with more than three of the following symptoms. And then the mnemonic I have is going to be Macbeth frets constantly regarding illicit sins. So M is going to be for muscle tension. F is going to be fatigability. C is going to be problems with your concentration. Uh, R is going to be restlessness. I is going to be irritability. And then your S is going to be problems with sleeping. So they have to have more than three of these symptoms for more than six months to be diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, according to the DSM-5. This is more commonly found in females, and it also has a genetic component of it. It tends to begin in childhood, but it usually has a mean age of onset um, in 30-year-olds. And treatment for this is psychotherapy, right? Pharmacotherapy. And it's always best that you give both psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy is always going to be the best treatment. But first-line medications for this is going to be an SSRI, right? Um, anything like your fluoxetine. Um, and you can also give SNRIs, but usually first line is going to be SSRIs. If the patient is having like an acute anxiety attack, you can give something like benzodiazepines also. And then we have panic attacks. Uh, these are recurrent, unpredictable episodes of intense fear. These are these usually peak within 10 minutes and usually last less than 60 minutes. And with these, like Usually in the question stem, it's going to say that the patient has a sense of impending doom. And that's how I've seen it. And it's really important that we rule out heart attacks because these patients feel like their heart's going to like fall out of their chest. Um, I've had these and it really does feel like the world's going to end. They're terrible. So the mnemonic I have for this, and according to the DSM-5, you have to have more than four of the following to be diagnosed with a panic attack. So the mnemonic I have is D panic, so D-A panics. D is going to be for dizziness, disconnectedness, right? Um, um, P is going to be for palpitations. A is going to be for abdominal distress. N is going to be for numbness and nausea. Uh, I is going to be for intense fear of dying, losing control, going crazy. C is going to be for chills and chest pain. And S is going to be for sweating, shaking, and shortness of breath. So they have to have more than four of these with these patients. Usually treatment for this is going to be benzodiazepines for an acute attack. It's usually first line for these patients. The next one's going to be a panic disorder. So a panic attack is going to be one single event. A panic disorder is when a patient has had multiple of these or they have a fear of getting a new panic attack. So according to the DSM-5, right, it's usually one or more panic attacks that are followed by more than one month of continuous worry about experiencing another attack, right? Or experiencing the consequences of another attack. And then on top of that, they have maladaptive changes in behavior. So they try to avoid whatever triggered it. For example, for me, what triggered it was my OSCE. Um, and not only that, it was during the COVID-19 era, which we still, we still are. And we were required to wear all this like PPE 
Um, and so that just, because I am a little claustrophobic, and then on top of that, me being nervous, it just, it was just terrible. And so I try to stay away from, it just scares me. Anyways, you try to avoid whatever triggered it with these patients. And these patients have to have at least four of the 13 typical symptoms that we discuss above for panic attacks uh, to be diagnosed with panic disorder. This one also has a genetic factor, more commonly found in females, and cognitive behavioral therapy is the most effective treatment. We can also give benzodiazepines um, for an acute attack, and then we can also give SSRIs. These are usually first line for these patients. The next one's gonna be your specific phobias. This is defined as an irrational fear that causes anxiety and or avoidance of something specific, right? So according to the DSM-5, they're gonna have persistent excessive fear that's elicited by a specific situation or object, which is out of proportion to any actual danger and or threat. They'll have exposure to situation that triggers an immediate fear response. Situation or object is avoided when possible or tolerated with intense anxiety. Symptoms cause significant social or occupational dysfunction. And all this has to be going on for more than six months. So this is actually the most common psychiatric disorder in female and then second most common in males. The most common psychiatric in males is going to be substance abuse. So cognitive behavioral therapy is going to be the treatment of choice for this one. You have things like exposure and uh, desensitization, which are the therapy treatment of choice. You can also give them short benzos and beta blockers if needed. The next one's going to be agoraphobia. This is going to be an intense fear of being in public places or places where it's difficult to escape. And this usually, according to the DSM-5, is going to be intense fear and anxiety about more than two situations due to concern of difficulty escaping or obtaining help in case of panic or of other accumulating symptoms. So they're scared of being outside of home alone, open spaces like bridges, enclosed spaces like stores, public transport like trains, crowds, and lines. And usually... These symptoms will cause significant social or occupational dysfunctions, and the symptoms last more than six months for these patients. Usually some of the causes of these or etiologies is going to be a traumatic event. They also have a genetic factor for these patients. And treatment is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy and SSRIs. The next one's going to be social anxiety disorder. This is going to be a fear of scrutiny or fear of acting in a humiliated or embarrassing way. Uh, according to the DSM-5, diagnostic criteria for this is going to be persistent excessive fear elicited by a specific situation of object, which is out of proportion to any actual danger and or threat. Exposure to a situation causes immediate fear response. Situation or object is avoided when possible or tolerated with intense anxiety. Symptoms cause significant social or occupational uh, dysfunction and duration is more than six months. Um, treatment of choice is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy. First line medications are going to be your SSRIs, SNRIs like venlafaxine for these patients. You can also give them beta blockers, especially for performance anxiety. So I've had questions where it's a patient that's about to give a speech. You can give them something like a beta blocker. It's going to help them relax. And then, of course, you have your specific phobias like animals, right? Spiders, insects, dogs, snakes, mice, natural environment, like people that are afraid of heights. Um, people that are afraid of situational causes like elevators, airplanes, and closed spaces like me. Blood injection injury like people that are afraid of needles, blood, invasive medical procedures, and injuries. So the next one's going to be um, your bipolar disorder. So you have bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. And it's really important that you know the difference between both of these. So bipolar 1, according to the DSM-5, is the only requirement, um, the only requirement for this diagnosis is occurrence of a manic episode. So a patient to be diagnosed with bipolar 1 has to have a full-blown manic episode, right? Usually between these manic episodes, uh, they can be euthymic, they may have depression, or they might have a hypomanic episode with these patients. And what is mania? It's an abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood for at least one week with marked impairment of social occupation function, right? Usually, these patients will have um, usually the following symptoms. Um, clinical manifestations of this is going to be, the mnemonic I have is DIGFAST. D is going to be distractibility. 
I is going to be indiscretion. G is going to be grandiosity. F is going to be flight of ideas. A is going to be activity and or agitation. S is going to be sleep deficit. And T is going to be uh, thought, thoughtlessness and talkativeness. So these patients have to have these symptoms for more than one week. That is going to cause significant impairment, social and occupational function. So these patients are non-functional. In comparison to bipolar 2, these patients are functional. And these patients have to be having these symptoms for more than one week, right? And with these patients also, um, women and men are both equally affected. So, and also family history is a huge thing for this one. Um, bipolar 1 has this huge family history. So family history and first degree relative is the strongest factor for developing bipolar 1. Treatment for this is going to be lithium, right? It actually decreases suicide risk, and this is going to be the first line. Then we have bipolar 2. It's also called recurrent major depressive episodes with hypomania. Usually, this patient's going to have a history of one major depressive episode and at least one hypomanic episode. If the patient has ever had a manic episode, remember, it's going to be bipolar 1, not bipolar 2. These patients are going to have those dig fast symptoms that we discussed, but usually they're going to last more than four days. And these patients are not impaired, so they're going to have no impairment. So uh, treatment for these patients, uh, acute mania, right? We can give them lithium once again. If they're depressed, we can give them something like Seroquel, Lamotrigine, um, Latuda with these patients. Okay, so bulimia nervosa. So with bulimia nervosa, these patients tend to have normal body weight or even overweight, right? Uh, usually in regards to symptoms or what you're going to see on your physical exam, they're going to have those enamel erosions, right? Because they're constantly vomiting and that gastric acid is destroying the teeth. They can also present with a sore throat. Once again, that frequent vomiting, they're going to have that teeth uh, pitting of the teeth, parotid plant hypertrophy. And also they'll have that Russell sign, which is going to be calluses on the dorsal of the hand because they're inducing that vomiting. And usually these patients also have compensatory behaviors, like usually in your purging type, the patient will engage in self-induced vomiting, diuretics, laxatives, enema, and abuse after they eat. And then also you have your non-purging types. Uh, usually the patient will decrease calorie intake, fasting, dieting, excessive exercise, and diet pills. But the key about this one, like we said, these patients have a normal body weight or they're even overweight. According to the DSM-5 criteria for bulimia nervosa, these patients will have recurrent episodes of binge eating that are characterized by eating within a second, within a two hour period, more than people would eat in a similar period with lack of control during an eating episode. So these patients will have recurrent and appropriate attempts to compensate for overeating and to prevent weight gain by using laxatives, vomiting, diuretics, fasting, or excessive exercise. And these patients will have binge eating and compensatory behaviors that occur at least once a week for three months. Usually the perception of self-worth is excessively influenced by their body weight and shape. Treatment for this. So this is where the treatment differs. So remember we were talking about anorexia nervosa. There's really no medication treatment for these patients. It's just refeeding that cognitive behavioral therapy. For bulimia nervosa, there is actually medications you can give that are effective in these patients. So you can give them something like antidepressants. And then of course, if you couple that with behavioral therapy, it, these patients have a lot better um, treatment. So SSRIs are usually first line, and the best SRI for bulimia nervosa is going to be fluoxetine. And we also want to make sure that we avoid certain antidepressant medications like bupropion in patients that have either anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. Um, why? Because it can lower their seizure threshold, and these patients are prone to getting seizures. So that's one thing to keep in mind that they really like the test. The next one's gonna be your major depressive disorder. With these patients, like the patho, um, usually there's alterations in serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, acetylcholine, and histamine. Usually these patients have a genetic um, factor associated with it. And usually with these patients, it can occur at any age, but it's most commonly occurring during the patient's 20s, most common in women. And usually with these patients, of they tend to have increased REM sleep and about 15% of these patients tend to commit suicide. 
usually the rates are going to be higher in patients that have a plan, right, of committing suicide in males that are greater than 45, and also in patients that have concurrent substance use. What are signs of the signs and symptoms? So this patient needs to have more than five of the following signs that I'm going to discuss at least for two weeks, okay? On top of that, they also have to have at least one of the symptoms, which is either depressed mood or anhedonia, which is loss of interest slash pleasure in order to be diagnosed with um, major depressive disorder. So once again, more than five of the following symptoms for at least two weeks, and one of those symptoms has to be either depressed mood or anhedonia. So the symptoms that I'm gonna discuss, right? More than five of these. City caps is gonna be the mnemonic. So S, S is gonna be for sleep disturbance. I is gonna be for loss of interest, right? Lack of interest. G is gonna be for guilt. E is gonna be for lack of energy. C is for lack of concentration. A is gonna be for lack, lack of appetite. P is gonna be for your psychomotor retardation or agitation. And then S is gonna be for suicidal ideation. So once again, more than five of these with one of them being either depressed mood or anhedonia for at least two weeks, this is gonna be required for the diagnosis. And then of course, you have your atypical features for your major depressive disorder. So for example, increased weight, appetite, and sleep. So patients are gonna be sleeping more, they're gonna be eating more um, instead of the opposite. And if a patient has psychotic features, usually these patients have a worst prognosis. So treatment for these patients um, and just diagnosis, usually we'll do a PHQ-2 form for the initial screen. If it's positive, then we're gonna use a PHQ-9 for these patients. If we think that the patient is a threat to themselves, we're gonna hospitalize them. But treatment for these patients is usually gonna be your SSRIs. These are usually gonna be first line. You can also do bupropion and mirtazapine, that's second line, and third line are gonna be your TCAs and MILIs. So it's important just for SSRIs in general to know that it's gonna take a while for these medications to get into effect. So a patient is not gonna feel happy or feel not depressed anymore in one week. It's gonna take at least three to six weeks for the medications to become um, or kick into effect. So it's really important that you know that if a patient presents and they are not feeling better with the medication, before you switch to another medication or you, you increase the dose, you have to give the medication, the SSRI, at least three to six weeks. Other therapies can be ECT, right? Um, electroconvulsive therapy. This is usually for patients that have really bad medication side effects or just medications are not working for them. Also for uh, patients that are pregnant and elderly, and this is actually very safe in these patients. So the next one's gonna be PTSD. These patients usually, according to the DSM-5 criteria, um, they usually have an exposure to an actual or threatened death, right? Or serious injury or sexual violence by directly experiencing it or witnessing the trauma. So in a woman, usually uh, abuse, sexual abuse is gonna be one of the common causes for PTSD or also from learning the event happened to someone they're close to or experiencing extreme or repeated exposure to aversive details of the traumatic event, for example, first responders during 9-11. So this is according to the DSM-5 what PTSD is, and the patient's gonna have recurrent intrusions of re-experiencing the event via memories, nightmares, or dissociative reactions like flashbacks. They'll have intense distress at exposure to cues relating to the trauma, or physiological reactions to cues relating to the trauma. So this patient's gonna actively avoid anything that triggers their memories. Um, so they'll actively be avoiding people, places, or objects that are associated with the trauma. And these patients have at least two of the following symptoms with increased arousal and reactivity. So they'll have hypervigilance, exaggerated startle risk response, Irritability, such angry outbursts, impaired concentration, insomnia. And usually these symptoms result in impairment of social and occupational uh, functioning. Usually it's more commonly found in females and males, but it can occur at any age. Usually it occurs within three months. So this patient has to have the, these, this has occurred within three months. And treatment for this is going to be uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, SSRIs or SNRIs, but SSRIs are gonna be first line. If these patients have trouble sleeping because of the nightmares, you can give them something like trazodone for their sleep. And like we said, 
just to differentiate between PTSD and acute stress disorder, since this one is very commonly tested. For PTSD, trauma has had to occur at any time in the past, right? And symptoms usually last more than one month. Versus acute stress disorder, trauma occurred less than one month ago and symptoms get like they go away after months. So symptoms last less than one month. So the next one's going to be substance use disorder, right? Um, in elderly, the most common abuse substance is going to be alcohol, but common substances that are addictive and abuse are going to be alcohol, cocaine, amphetamines, PCP, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, right? Opioids, marijuana, caffeine, nicotine. Also, you have addictive behavior, which is seen in non-substance related disorders like uh, gambling disorders, right? So according to the DSM-5 for substance use disorder, cognitive behavioral and physiological symptoms indicating continuous use of a sub substance despite significant substance related problems. It's usually characterized by a problematic pattern of substance use that, impair that causes impairment or distress that is manifested by two of the following within a 12 month period. So these patients have to have two or more of the following, which I'm gonna discuss in one year. So the patients have to have been using the substance more than originally intended, persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down on use, significant time spent obtaining, using, or recovering from the substance, cravings, failure to fulfill obligations at work, school, or home, continued use despite social or interpersonal problems due to the substance use, decreased social, occupational, or recreational activities because of substance use, use in dangerous situations, continued use despite subsequent physical or psychological problems like drinking alcohol despite worsening liver problems, tolerance or the need for increased amounts of the substance to achieve the desired effect or diminished effect if using the same amount of substance, and development of substance-specific syndrome due to cessation or reduction of, sub of substance, right, like withdrawal. So... This is more commonly found in males. The predominant age is between 16 to 25, and the most common abused uh, substances are gonna be alcohol and nicotine, usually in these patients. Um, usually depression, personality disorders, and bipolar disorders are associated with substance use disorder. And um, it's really important that with these patients, right, we do a physical exam. Uh, we look for abnormally dilated or constricted pupils that can tell us whether this patient is using opioids or barbiturates, right, or any other, other drugs, needle marks on the skin, nasal septum per perforation, especially for your cocaine use, cardiac dysrhythmias, malnutrition with these patients. And um, usually with these patients, right, um, it's important that we just help them out with the substance abuse, right? And then, of course, depending on the drug that the patient is taking is how they're going to uh, present. So let's go into them real quick. Um, we have our depressants, right? Usually when the patient's intoxicated, they might have mood elevation, um, sedation, behavioral disinhibition, respiratory depression, and withdrawal from, these, from depressants. They're going to have anxiety, tremor, seizures, insomnia. Um, versus alcohol, if they're intoxicated, Usually with these patients, they're going to have that slurred speech, right? Ataxia, blackouts, coma, emotional ability. Um, usually GGT serum is a sensitive indicator for alcohol use. GABA levels are going to be high. Withdrawal, it depends when was the last time the patient was drinking. So if it was between 3 to 36 hours, the patient's going to be presenting with tremors, insomnia, GI upset, diaphoresis, and agitation. If it was 6 to 48 hours, this is when the seizures start. So usually it's going to be your generalized tonic-clonic type, and usually these occur as a single episode. 12 to 48 hours, you'll have your hallucinations. Usually they're visual, right, versus when we think about our hallucinations that are auditory, we think about schizophrenia, but in alcohol withdrawal, they're going to be visual. 48 to 96 hours, you are going to have your full-blown delirium tremens. So in regards to delirium tremens, how is this patient going to present? They're going to have delirium, they're going to have so altered sensorium, right? Hallucinations, agitation, abnormal vital signs like tachycardia, hypertension, and fever. Treatment for this usually requires for the patient to be hospitalized because this can be very, very fatal. Uh, treatment is going to be with benzodiazepines, IV fluids, and you want to make sure that we supplement 
the patient with thiamine and magnesium before we give them glucose because most of these patients are going to be hypoglycemic. It's really interesting. I was listening to a podcast the other day and they believe that Alan, Alan Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe died from um, alcohol withdrawal. He was possibly even in delirium tremens when they found him on the streets. So I thought that was very interesting. So in regards to opioids, how is this patient going to present? So when we think about opioids, we think about heroin, oxycodone, morphine, and peridine, codeine. So these patients are going to have euphoria, respiratory, and CNS depression. They're going to have pupillary constriction, seizures, especially if they're an overdose, right? And this is actually the most common cause of drug overdose death. And this is actually one of the unique ones where the patient has pupillary constriction versus pupillary dilation. And that's how I kind of memorize this one. So once again, pupillary constriction is how the patient going to, is going to present. And treatment is usually going to be with naloxone or Narcon. So this is going to be for overdose. Now, a patient that is withdrawing from any opioid, it's going to be the opposite. So usually these patients are going to be sweating. They'll have dilated pupils, pyloerection, fever, rhinorrhea, lacrimation, yawning, nausea, abdominal cramps, and um, like I said, uh, diarrhea for these patients. So this is going to be the opposite symptoms of intoxication. And like we said, the majority, when I think about overdoses um, you, or intoxications, these patients usually have pupillary dilation. But in this case, they're going to have pupillary constriction when they are overdose versus withdrawal. The pupils are going to be dilated with opioids. Treatment for opioid withdrawal is usually going to be methadone, uh, buprenorphine. So buprenorphine plus naloxone is usually suboxone we give for these patients. The next one's going to be your barbiturates. Uh, usually these patients have marked respiratory depression and for overdose usually just symptom management, right? Just make sure that we're helping them with the respirations and increasing their blood pressure. In regards to withdrawal uh, with these patients, they're usually going to be presenting with delirium and light, light threatening cardiovascular collapse. So for barbiturates, withdrawal is more severe than your intoxication. And then we have benzodiazepines for intoxication. They're going to be presenting with ataxia, minor respiratory depression. Usually the symptoms are not as severe as opioids for, barbit for uh, benzodiazepines. And with benzos, treatment for intoxication or overdose is going to be with flumazenil. And how is the patient going to present in withdrawal of uh, benzodiazepines, they're going to be presenting with sleep disturbances, depression, rebound anxiety, and seizures. So the next one's going to be your stimulants, right? Um, for example, amphetamines, how is the patient going to present when they're intoxicated? They're going to have pupillary dilation, that's actually the key for this one, euphoria, grandiosity, um, hypertension, prolonged wakefulness and attention, tachycardia, anorexia, paranoia, fever, Skin excoriations, especially, so make sure that you're looking for skin excoriations, especially for those patients that use meth, right? If they have severe intoxication, then they're going to present with cardiac arrest and seizures. Uh, treatment for these patients is going to be for benzodiazepine, especially for those seizures and agitation. Cocaine intoxication, this patient's going to present with pupillary dilation. Hallucinations, especially your tactile hallucinations, paranoid ideations, angina. Um, these patients can suffer from sudden cardiac death also. In chronic use of cocaine, usually you might even see like a perforated nasal septum due to vasoconstruction, and this can result in ischemic necrosis. And this is how I've seen questions. Um, I had a question, one's practice question. It was like a lawyer and he had a perforated septum. So that's another way they can ask it. Uh, treatment for this is going to be alpha blockers, benzodiazepines, right, with these patients. And then we have caffeine. So caffeine, how is this patient going to present when they are intoxicated? Restlessness, increased diuresis, muscle twitching, and withdrawal. They're going to be presenting with headache, difficulty concentrating. And nicotine, how is this patient going to present with intoxication? Restlessness and withdrawal for nicotine irritability, anxiety, restlessness, difficulty concentrating, sleep abnormalities. In addition to that, uh, nicotine craving, they can even present with depression. And treatment is usually a variety of things. You can do something like a nicotine patch, gum, lozenges, even Chantix, which is bupropion. 
and varinicline. Um, so just make sure you know about that one. So the next one's gonna be your PCP. So this one's the one where it's a patient that they have like superhero powers, right? They're super strong, they're very violent. Um, they have that rotary nystagmus is usually like the keyword for this one. Tachycardia, hypertension, analgesia, uh, psychosis, delirium, seizures, and trauma is usually the most common in complication because these patients are just very aggressive and they're very strong. Next one's gonna be LSD for intoxication. This patient is usually gonna have those perceptual distortions, both visual and auditory, depersonalization, anxiety, paranoia, psychosis, even flashbacks. And that's the key for this one is usually gonna be depersonalization and flashbacks. Marijuana intoxication, euphoria, anxiety, paranoid delusions, perception of slow time, impaired judgment, social withdrawal, Increased appetite, dry mouth, conjunctival injection is one of the big ones that I see on the question stem. So if you see conjunctival injection, think about marijuana. This patient can also present with hallucinations. And for withdrawal from marijuana, they're going to be presenting with depression, insomnia, restlessness, decreased appetite, and irritability. All right, guys, so those are it. Let's go into suicide now. So usually for suicide, we kind of think of the risk factors for suicide and what patients are more likely to complete suicide, right? So for suicide, we think about the mnemonic SAD person, so S-A-D space P-E-R-S-O-N-S. -S. So any of the patients that have any of these things are more likely to complete a suicide so it's really important that whenever we ask the patients, right, when we assess them, we want to ask them for their suicidal ideation, intent, and plan. Like, do they have any thoughts about killing themselves? And if they do, um, are they serious about the is suicide, which is the intent and plan is uh, what plan do they have to commit their suicide? So if they admit yes to any of these, then it's really important that we admit these patients. So the mnemonic for sad persons, S is going to be for sex. Males, by far, also more common than females, are more likely to complete suicides. That's another thing. So females, according to textbook medicine, are more likely to attempt suicides. Usually, how do females attempt suicide? It's going to be usually with medication overdoses versus males are more likely to complete the suicide and they're more likely to complete the suicide with firearms. So that's another question we have to ask patients is, do they have firearms at home? So age, either a young adult or elderly. So it's going to be bimodal, how they say you're young, very young adults or a very elderly patient. Depression is going to be for D. P is going to be for a previous attempt. And out of all of these risk factors, if they ask you what's the highest risk factor for a patient to complete a suicide is going to be previous attempt. So if a patient has a previous attempt of wanting to commit suicide and they failed, um, this is a very high risk factor. Other risk factors, E, um, in the sad person's mnemonics, alcohol use and drug use. R is going to be rational thinking loss, right, like psychosis. S is going to be for sickness, medical illness. O is going to be for organized plan. N is going to be for no spouse or other social support. S is stated future intent for these patients. So that's going to be the mnemonic sad persons. And like we said, the highest risk factor out of all of these is going to be a previous attempt. And it's really important that with these patients, when we assess them, we assess homicidal ideation separately and we detain these patients, um, especially if we really think this patient's going to complete a suicide. We want to make sure that we take all suicide threats seriously and ensure that we do not identify with the patient, right? We do, do not identify with the patient. So the next one's going to be your insomnia disorders. Um, usually for insomnia, usually with these patients, uh, most of these patients, right, they just complain that they cannot sleep. And usually with these patients, some of the etiologies, right, and risk factors is going to be stress, caffeine, uh, physical discomfort, daytime napping. So their sleep cycle is just all over the place and going to bed early can all contribute to insomnia. What are some of the clinical signs and symptoms for these patients? Uh, usually we think about a patient that has difficulty getting to sleep or staying asleep. 
if they have intermittent wakefulness during the night, so they're constantly waking up during the night, early morning awakening, or any combination of, of any of, of the above. So diagnosis for these patients is going to be a clinical diagnosis, right, for these patients. And so um, <clears throat> usually treatment for this is going to be high level therapy, right, especially for primary insomnia. We can give them pharmacological therapy, right? Um, and then, of course, just make sure you're talking about them to them about their good sleep hygiene, right? Going to sleep only when they're tired, reserving the bed only for sleep and sex. Um, if the patient is still awake after trying to go to sleep for 20 minutes, uh, leave the room and try to pursue some type of activity that's going to be restful, like the bath. Meditate, right? Only go to sleep when the patient is sleepy. Get up at the same time every morning. Avoid alcohol, right? Because this will disrupt your sleep. Discontinue caffeine and nicotine, especially in the evening, and if they can, completely. Exercise daily, limit fluids in the evenings, learn and practice relaxation techniques. And with these patients, you can also give them pharmacological treatment. So we think about, for example, benzodiazepines like lorazepam, temazepam, and flunazepam. We can also give them non-benzodiazepine hypnotics like zolpidem, right? Um, this one's actually very good for long-term. And... We can give them antihistamines also, like Benadryl with these patients, hydroxyzine. Um, and then we can give them things like atypical antidepressants, like trazodone. The only thing about trazodone is that it causes a lot of priapism, especially in men. I saw this a lot during my psychiatry rotation. And you can also give them melatonin, right? This will usually help with sleep onset. And the good thing about this one is that there's no abuse potential. All right, so the next one's going to be your spouse or partner neglect slash violence. So usually with these patients, right, some of the etiology and risk factors is going to be any type of abusive behavior, whether it's psychological, physical, sexual, emotional, by a person in an intimate relationship with the victim. Usually females are more likely to be the victims and males are more likely to be the aggressors. Um, some of the risk factors is going to be any patient that's younger than the age of 35, if they're pregnant, if they're single, divorced, or separated, if there's alcohol or drug abuse in the victim or in the partner, smoking and lower uh, socioeconomic status are risk factors for spouse or partner neglect and violence. What are some of the clinical signs and symptoms? Usually the patient's going to be explaining their injuries that do not fit with any of the physical exam findings, frequent visits to the emergency department. They might even present with somatic complaints, right, like of headache, abdominal pain, and fatigue. They'll have minimal eye contact during the exam. The abuser in the room, if they are in the room with the patient, is going to be answering all the questions or just does not want to leave the room. Sometimes you'll see injuries to the central area of the body, forearms, bruises in various stages of healing. There's a lot of screening tools that you can do for these patients. You have your HITS, which is your Hurt, Insult, Threatened, Screamed At tool, your WAST, W-A-S-T, Woman Abused screening tool, your PBS, which is your partner violence screen, um, AAS, which is going to be your abuse assessment screen. There's so many screen uh, screening tools that you can use for these patients. So what do we do with these patients when we encounter one? We want to make sure that we speak with them alone. This is going to be the most important thing, and we're going to document all history and findings carefully. The USPSTF, which is a U.S. Preventative Service Task Force, right? They recommend screening women of childbearing age for intimate, uh, intimate partner violence, including domestic violence, and refer those who screen positive to intervention services. And usually want to screen women of what? Of all childbearing age. And that's kind of the key. I've had questions on this one. So USPSTF recommends screening women of all childbearing ages for intimate partner violence, right? And intervention, you want to make sure that you educate the patient to I'll leave the abusive situation, ensure that the patient goes to a safe place, and counsel them to assess risk of danger, right? Create a plan for safety. But unfortunately, with these patients, we cannot call police. For example, in comparison, when we have a child that's possibly suffering from domestic violence, right? We can call CPS, so Child Protective Services, or an elderly patient, we can call EPS, Elderly Protective Services. Uh, for these patients, we cannot. Okay, so we are done with psychiatry now. Uh, why don't we go into our next one, which is going to be our urology and renal, okay? 
So let's start with Balanitis xerotica obliterans, also known as your penile lichen sclerosis. This one occurs in males of all age. Usually the average age is between 42 uh, years old, and it's usually precancerous. It's a precancer lesion to squamous cell carcinoma. How is this patient going to present? So usually they're going to be saying that they have problems going to the restroom, so urinary retention. You'll see phimosis, and the patient's going to be complaining of painful erections or even obstructed voiding, itching, pain, and bleeding. On your physical exam, you're going to see hypopigmented lesion with skin that's similar to crinkled paper or cellophane. Faint. And that's usually what you'll see on your question stem is going to be paper, hypopigmented lesions uh, with skin that's similar to your crinkled paper. This tends to affect the glans penis and the purpose. You'll also see bulla erosions and atrophy. Usually with these patients, it's a clinical diagnosis. If we suspect squamous cell carcinoma, since this one is associated with squamous cell carcinoma, we're going to biopsy. Treatment for these patients, it's usually if it's a moderate to ultra-potent fluorinated topical corticosteroids. You can also do surgery. Um, so you can do circumcision of glands in the penis, especially if the patient has a persistent disease or history of squamous cell carcinoma for these patients. So the next one's going to be your BPH, your benign prosthetic hyperplasia. This is defined as a benign growth of the prostate gland, usually at the periurethral and transition zone. What happens is that there's encroachment, right, of that tissue on the urethra, which obstructs urination so that uh, prostate starts growing so much in size that it starts obstructing urination. The thing about this one is that it's not a malignant condition, so it's something that we really need to know, that this is not precancerous or anything like that. So usually what happens is as a patient gets older, right, um, their prostate gland changes in size, so it starts increasing in size. So for example, men aged 60 years and above have about a 50% chance of getting BPH. Men aged 80 years and above have about an 88% chance of BPH, these patients. And what happens, of course, like we said, the prostate just starts growing and increasing in size. And the age of about 20 to 55, it's about 20 grams. This is normal weight, so anything that increases after that is usually abnormal. And the thing about this one, how we kind of differentiate it between BPH and like prostate cancer, is that usually the hyperplasia, so that growth is going to begin centrally, right? And that's why it starts putting these patients, um, that's why it starts compressing the urethra. And with these patients, males, they're very prone to getting urinary tract infections for the same reason. So any patient that we have, especially when we think about urinary tract infections, right, they're very commonly found in females. But if we have an older patient presenting with a UTI and they're a male, then we want to think about things like BPH, right, because this is not very commonly associated with these patients. So how is the patient going to present? So with these patients, right, they're going to have usually symptoms of, that are related to the compression on the urethra. So they're going to have frequency of going to the restroom, right? Nocturia, which is going to the restroom at night. Usually that's going to be the most problematic symptom for these patients. Urgency, like they have to keep going to the restroom. They'll have obstructive symptoms like a weak urinary stream, hesitancy, uh, valsalva micturation, which is using the abdominal muscle pressure to go to the restroom to get rid of that urine, incomplete void with post-void dribbling, overflowing continence, and because of the obstruction, there's a risk factor of a urinary tract infection, like we said. Diagnosis, usually we'll just do patient history, right? Uh, we're going to do a digital rectal exam, and what you're going to see is going to be a uniformly enlarged, so everything's going to be uniformly enlarged, firm, rubbery prostate, and that's usually what is pathognomonic for BPH and how you could compare it against your prostatitis and cancer. So once again, a rubbery prostate that's going to be uniformly enlarged. Um, we can also do a UA, especially for patients that are presenting with symptoms that we might think that are from similar to a urinary tract infection. Uh, PCA also, which is your prostate-specific antigen. The thing about this one is that it's not specific because it can be elevated for so many reasons, but it does help us aid 
it does aid in the diagnosis. Usually for a PCA, normal is going to be anything less than 4. Anything greater than 4, we're thinking about maybe pH. Usually anything greater than 10, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is prostate cancer. So um, another thing that we can do is renal function tests, right? Because when we think about our azotemias, our acute kidney injuries, right? We think about pre-renal, intrarenal, post-renal. Usually patients with BPH, the most common cause of post-renal. Well, not the most common cause. It's one of the causes of post-renal azotemia. So post-renal acute kidney injuries is BPH. So we can do a renal function also just to make sure that the kidneys are um, working well. So usually with these patients, um, what is going to be the management, right? Usually we want to start with observation. We try to avoid surgery as much as we can, right? So observation is just educating the patient to avoid any fluids at night, right? Reduce your caffeine intake. Avoid any medications that are, are anticholinergic, like antihistamines. Um, make sure that we are following up with them annually. Medications that we can give with these patients, there's two classes. So we can give them their testosterone conversion inhibitors like finasteride, which is like one of the big ones, also known as ProScar. What they do, these medications, is that these are androgen inhibitors. So they inhibit the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which is going to help suppress that prostate growth and it's going to reduce bladder outlet obstruction. So the thing about these, right, like finasteride and dutasteride is that they have a positive effect on the clinical course of BPH. So they're going to decrease that enlarged prostate, but these medications do not give the patient immediate relief because usually it takes a few months for the patients to start having or seeing relief or seeing feeling relief from these medications versus our alpha adrenergic antagonists, which are the most commonly used, like terazosin, doxazosin, tamsulosin. Um, these provide rapid symptom relief because these patients, these are more symptomatic than treating the underlying cause, but they have no effect on the clinical course of BPH. So make sure that you know this. This is something that they really like to test. So once again, finasteride, right, your testosterone conver conversion inhibitors, these will not provide immediate health, but they have a positive effect on the clinical course of EPH because they reduce the size of the, of the prostate and usually these patients don't need surgery sometimes. Versus your alpha adrenergic antagonists like tamsulos and doxazosin, uh, these provide rapid symptom relief, but they have no effect on the clinical course of EPH. And out of all of these, the most uroselective is going to be tamsulosin. And then we have surgery that's going to be last line. So if a patient has not, like they've tried everything, the medications, and it's still not getting better and they're having very severe symptoms like recurring UTIs, for example, then we can do your surgery. So usually we think about our transurethral resection of the prostate, also known as your CHIRP. What they do is that they resect along the urethral opening and they remove any excess prostate tissue that relieves the obstruction with these patients. So what are some of the complications? Like I said, cancer is not a complication of BPH. Usually they'll have obstructive complications, if anything. So we discussed post-renal azotemia, right? Hydronephrosis, why? Because it's creating that back pressure, um, bladder problems, and sometimes even urosepsis. All right, so now that we're done with that one, let's go with chlamydia. So chlamydia is gonna be the most common by far bacterial sexually transmitted disease. It's gram negative, right? Usually with these patients um, with chlamydia is some of the risk factors for this is not using condoms, right? Um, multiple sex partners, and it's most commonly found in females between the ages of 15, 19 and between the ages of 20 and 24. Usually these patients are asymptomatic. Men will have dysuria, so that painful urination, purulent urethral discharge, itching, squirtal pain, and swelling, also fever, versus women. Women usually have the symptoms of purulent urethral discharge, intramestral or postcoital bleeding, and this area, which is going to be your painful urination. What are you going to see on physical exam? You're going to see mucopurulent, right, discharge from cer cervical os, and then a friable cervix, especially in your woman. Versus like gonorrhea, usually gonorrhea is just purulent. For chlamydia, it's going to be that mucopurulent. 
So the most sensitive test for diagnosis is going to be your NAAT, so your nucleic acid amplification test for these patients. And the treatment is going to be one gram of azithromycin orally for one, so just giving them one gram, or you can give them doxycycline in 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. And usually for these patients, right, we always try to give something that is does not require the medication to be taking a long period of time because a lot of patients are not compliant. So if we can, um, one gram of azithromycin is better than giving them one gram of doxy for, I'm sorry, not one gram, or giving them doxy uh, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days, right? And it's important that we treat all partners for these. Okay, so the next one's gonna be uh, cystitis, right? So cystitis most commonly found in females especially during the childbearing years. And like we said, UTI is not very common in males. If it is, and we're thinking about other illnesses, right? Like especially the first one that we're thinking about is going to be BPH, your benign prostatic hyperplasia, kidney stones also, or STDs. Um, and like I said, usually with these patients, if it's like a younger patient usually we don't think about STDs and like your newborns your children or anything like that but if it's a child that's getting like very recurrent urinary tract infections then in these patients we want to make sure that we check for congenital urinary tract malformations because it can cause reflux and this is usually very commonly found in your like younger females your younger babies and what happens is that the valves uh, between the ureters and the bladder are incompetent, incompetent, so urine can reflux into the ureters and it can cause an infection that way. So what are some of the risk factors for both cystitis and pyelonephritis? So cystitis, we think about our urinary tract infections, right? So in women, sexual intercourse by far very common is we think about the honeymoon cystitis, right? Uh, spermicidal use, especially with diaphragms, pregnancy because progesterone and estrogen what they do is that they cause the ureter to dilate and they inhibit bladder peristalsis. Postmenopausal, because these women are more prone uh, because they have estrogen deficiency that usually alters the flora of the, vagin the vagina and they have decreased bladder tone. Um, for males, like we had discussed, right, BPH, diabetics are very prone and also catheters, right? So what happens? So usually there's an ascension of bacteria via the urethra, and then it'll go to the bladder, and then it can go up to the ureter, and it can even go up to the kidneys and cause pyelonephritis. So that's why it's really important that patients that have UTI, that have UTI symptoms, go and see a doctor, because this can go up and start attacking the kidneys. And the reason why it's more commonly found in females and males is because females have a shorter urethra, right? so that it increases the risk of infection and the bacteria can actually go up there and infect the bladder quicker than in males. So what is the most common bacteria that is gonna be associated? So it's gonna be your gram negative, which is gonna be E. coli. E. coli by far is gonna be the most common in complicated and uncomplicated cases. There's other bacteria that can be found in cystitis. We think about Klebsiella, Proteus, right? Uh, Mirabilis, Enterobacter, Pseudomonas, um, but the most common one by far is going to be E. coli. Usually we think about Staphylococcus saprophyticus in young women, especially women that are very actively um, sexually active. We think about enterococci in indwelling catheters, right? Um, and then any patient that has kidney stones, any type of UTIs that are associated with kidney stones, usually we think about Klebsiella, pneumonia, and Proteus mirabilis, right? And how is the patient going to present? So if a patient has uncomplicated cystitis, right, they're usually going to be complaining of frequency, dysuria, burning, going to the restroom whenever they go. It's going to hurt a lot for these patients. Um, usually they'll also, also have that urgency, right, suprapubic pain, and sometimes even hematuria, although not very commonly. So it's going to be your uncomplicated cystitis. Now, if it goes into the kidneys and it's starts affecting kidneys, which is also known as your pyelonephritis, right, or your upper urinary tract infection. Usually these patients are going to be presenting with fever, tachycardia, nausea and vomiting, CVA tenderness, and flank pain, and that's a key. So if you see any CVA tenderness or flank pain, um, usually it's associated with pylo. So CVA, remember they taught us you put this in the back of the patient, and if they have any pain or if they literally like jump off, right, because it's so much pain, then we're thinking about 
pyelonephritis, uh, elevated white blood cells, and if they're toxic appearing, it's really important that we admit these patients. So how are we going to diagnose these? So urinalysis is going to be by far the most important one. We're going to see positive nitrites, positive leukocyte, leukocyte esterase, and also we're going to see white blood cells on our micro um, biology studies. So we'll see pyuria that's going to be greater than more than five white blood cell counts, especially more than 10. We can also see red blood cells. And then we'll see an elevated pH if protease is going to be the one that's involved. And then remember when we said protease mirabilis, usually we think about kidney stones for these patients. If we see a white blood cell cast, usually we think about pyelonephritis. So keep that in mind, white blood cell cast, pyelonephritis. Because the thing about cystitis or urinary tract infections is that we'll see white blood cells, right? but we will not see white blood cell cast. Whenever we think about white blood cell cast, those are already involving the kidney. So that's why we think about pyelonephritis. Urine culture is gonna be by far the definitive diagnosis. We wanna make sure that we get a clean catch specimen and usually we'll see more than 100,000 um, on, your, on your culture. Another thing that we need to know is if that there's a lot of epithelial cells, right, then that's contamination of, your, of a, a culture, and we have to make sure that we repeat it. So with these patients, what's going to be the management? Just make sure that we're educating the patient, right? Increase your amount of fluids. Make sure that uh, females, whenever they have sexual intercourse, go to the restroom and urinate. Uh, make sure the patient's not holding their urine, right? Uh, fluids, 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 fluids. And then if it's an uncomplicated urinary tract infection, we usually just give in antibiotics for three days. So usually we'll give in something like Bactrim. So we'll give in Bactrim twice a day for three days. We can also do nitroferentin um, for these patients. And then Cipro we can do for three days. But once again, we try to stay away from our fluoroquinolones, right? Because they have just a lot of, um, um, they have just a lot of side effects. So uh, we can also give them analgesics, so things like peridium, right? Um, the thing about peridium, just to make sure that we educate the patient that it's gonna turn the urine orange. So that's another thing. If anything, peridium is more symptomatic versus our antibiotic, it's gonna treat the underlying cause, right? Now, if a patient has a complicated or resistant urinary tract infection, for example, if they've been having symptoms for that more than seven days and we give them antibiotics and it's, the patient is not getting better, or we think about complicated urinary tract infections like your patients that are pregnant, right? Uh, diabetic, immunosuppressed, elderly, males. Usually these patients get an antibiotic regimen for longer. So it's going to be five to seven days or even longer. And usually we do Cipro. So ciprofloxacin is going to be the first line usually for these patients. Um, of course, unless they're pregnant. If they're pregnant, then we do another medication uh, like uh, amoxicillin, augmentin, or cephalexin. But... Any of the risk factors that I just said, diabetic, immunosuppressed, um, males, elderly, then we do Cipro for more than, uh, f for about five to seven days or even longer. And if it's pregnant, if the patient's pregnant, like I said, usually we'll do treat them for seven to 14 days with either amoxicillin, augmentin, cephalexin, macrobid. My professor said amoxicillin was first line. Um, definitely you can uh, debate. That's very debatable. So, with these patients, if they have pyelonephritis, right, usually these patients are going to be more toxic appearing than your regular uncomplicated cystitis. So for pyelonephritis, um, usually these patients, if they aren't stable, if they look very toxic appearing, we're going to admit them. We want to make sure that we culture for the specific antigen, or I'm sorry, agent. And supportive treatment usually is what we're going to do first, first thing, IV fluids. And we want to make sure we give them antibiotics. So uh, we usually give them fluoroquinolones orally for 14 days if the patient is stable. If they're unstable, we're going to admit them, and we usually give them a fluoroquinolone IV for 14 days, or you can do an amino black aside for 14 days. So the next one's going to be epididymitis. Epididymitis, right, um, with these patients is basically in infection or inflammation of the epididymis, which sits on the testes, right, for these patients. Usually the most common cause is going to be bacterial. And 
The thing that they really like to test about this one is what is the most common bacteria that's going to be causing the infection, and this depends on the patient's age. So if it's a patient that's younger than 35 years old, we think about that the patient's sexually active, right? They're more prone to getting the STDs. So gonorrhea, gonorrhea and chlamydia are going to be the ones that are most common by far out of the two since the STD is the most common. Chlamydia is going to be the most common source for any man that is less than 35 years old. Now, if the patient is older than 35 years old, then we think about our enteric organisms like E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, and Proteus. By far, E. coli is going to be the most common one. Like I said, this is something that is very, very highly tested. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have this increasing dual unilateral scrotal pain. It's going to be erythematous, painful, swollen scrotum. And usually these patients are going to have that positive front sign, which is going to be relief with testicular elevation. So you elevate that testicle and they're going to have a lot of relief with these, with these symptoms. And the thing about these is that chromosteric reflex is going to be present, right? So whenever you stroke the inner thigh, the testicle is going to rise. That's going to be present. So this one, both front sign and chromosteric reflex are both going to be positive. Uh, diagnostic tests with these patients, we'll usually do a scrotal ultrasound just to make sure that we'll rule out things like testicular torsion, right? And we're going to see increased testicular blood flow. Uh, we do a UA also. This is we're gonna see, where we're going to see the white blood cells and the bacteria. We'll do a urethrogram stain and culture just to make sure that we are looking for the cause of this STD testing, right? And management for these patients, of course, it's going to be um, antibiotics, right? So if it's GC and chlamydia, we'll gonna, we're going to give them the um, ceftriaxone, right, plus the azithromycin, and or you can give them doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for 10, day, 10 days, plus ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams um, one dose, right? If it is, if the patient's older than 35, right, we think about E. coli being the most common culprit. Usually in these patients, we'll do something like ciprofloxacin for um, 10 to 14 days, 500 milligrams twice a day. So the next one is going to be your glomerulonephritis um, with these patients. This is the most common glomerular syndrome of intrinsic acute kidney injury. So remember how we were discussing earlier the types of acute kidney injuries. We have pre-renal, intrarenal, and then we have post-renal. So before you get to the kidney, something that is causing um, the kidney to not function versus inside the kidney, intrarenal, and then post-renal outside the kidney, usually obstruction, right? So for this one, this is a, a glomerular syndrome of intrinsic acute kidney injury. So it's happening within the kidney with these patients. So we think about usually acute glomerular nephritis. This is characterized by immunological inflammation of the glomeruli. So how I think about the glomeruli is like a little basket, right? The glomeruli within the kidney, it's like a very small structure. It's a basket, and what it does is that it lets very small particles go through, but usually the large particles, like your proteins, your blood cells, it catches them in that little basket, right? That little filter. Now, when there's any type of damage to that little basket, it causes holes, right? And what happens is that usually these big items that cannot filter through are not, are not filtering through because you're having damage in those huge holes to that little basket within the kidney. So things like protein and red blood cells that could filter that cannot filter through before, now due to damage to that glomerulus, they're filtering through. So the patient's gonna be leaking into their urine protein and red blood cells, right? The hallmark for this is gonna be hypertension, hematuria, especially your, your red blood cell casts, uh, and edema. Why? Because you're losing all this protein and also azotemia. So there's different causes of uh, acute glomerular nephritis. We think about, for example, IgA nephropathy, Berger's disease. Usually this is gonna be an older patient on your question stems. And this is the most common cause of acute glomerular nephritis in adults worldwide. It often affects your young males, like I said, and that's how it's gonna present on your question stem. It's gonna be a young male um, that just got over an upper respiratory infection. So usually it'll say that they just got better from a upper respiratory infection about a day or two days ago, or even a GI infection. So they just got better from some type of um, bug, right? GI bug. And it's usually because the own body is attacking, right, that glomerular. So it's usually due to IgA immune complexes, and that's a key, IgA, right? Um, 
what does IgA IgA's do? IgA is a first line of defense in the respiratory and GI secretion. So uh, with infections, what happens is that you have an increased amount and overproduction of IgA, and sometimes it can start attacking the own body, right, the own cells, and this is where it starts attacking that glomerulus. So diagnosis, you're going to see that positive IgA mesangial de uh, deposits on immunostaining, and treatment for this is going to be usually with ACE inhibitors, um, and then you can even add corticosteroids. Versus your post-infection acute glomerulonephritis, right? We usually think about post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, post-streptococcal infection with these patients. And usually it's going to be a child in the question stem, although it doesn't always commonly occur in child, but it's going to be in your question stem, a child that just got over a group A strep infection, so a strep throat or even like a skin infection like empatigo or cellulitis, because when we think about empatigo, strep is one of the causes, same with cellulitis. So just make sure you keep that in mind. Any patient that had any type of strep infection, whether it was on the skin or the most common one, which is gonna be your, your uh, strep throat. And what happens is that it occurs because of the toxin the bug produces, um, and that's what causes the body to just go crazy, right? It occurs one to two weeks after the patient has had the infection, most common in kids, and this one's gonna present with the nephritic syndrome, right? So the patient's gonna have that smoky brown urine or that Coca-Cola colored or dark urine, hematuria and oliguria. They're gonna have elevated ASO titers for four to six weeks. And if we do a biopsy, which we don't commonly do, you'll see hypercellularity, increased monocytes and lymphocytes, and you'll see IgG, IgM, and C3. So most cases are self self-limiting, right? Usually we just do supportive treatment with these patients. Um, we can give antibiotics if they still have strep in their body, right? So um, these are some of the causes for these patients. And just treatment for all types of nephritic syndrome is going to be fluid and salt restriction, right? Because the patient is usually going to have that oligeric phase, bed rest. And then we can consider things like penicillin to get rid of organisms um, especially like in our post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So make sure you know that and make sure you know how to differentiate between nephritic syndrome and nephrotic syndrome, right? Nephritic is usually that inflammation of the glomeruli. Uh, we're going to see that oliguria, which is going to be very decreased urine output, hypertension. So we think about a child that's presenting with hypertension. I mean, that's not very common, right? Children are really hypertensive. So you want to think about things that are uh, having to do with the kidney. So think about hypertension. Um, this patient is going to be presenting with a Coca-Cola urine hematuria, right? And versus nephrotic syndrome, uh, these patients are going to have hypoalbuminemia. That's one of the key ones for this one. They're going to have hyperlipidemia, and they're going to have a lot of proteinuria, massive proteinuria. They're actually going to have more proteinuria than nephrotic syndrome. And they're also going to be presenting with edema, usually peripheral edema. And that's how you differentiate between both of them. So the next one's going to be gonorrhea. So gonorrhea, I know we had discussed chlamydia. Let's go into gonorrhea. So gonorrhea is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea. It's a gram-negative intracellular diplococci. It's transmitted sexually or neonatally, right? It's usually co-infected with chlamydia the majority of the time. Their buddies they like to travel together. Usually, how is this going to present? If it's a woman, usually they're asymptomatic. Uh, more commonly, you see symptoms in men. Males are going to be presenting with urethral discharge, dysuria, erythema, edema, increased frequency. Females are usually asymptomatic. If they do have symptoms, they're going to have cervicitis or urethritis, which is going to be that purulent discharge, dysuria, intramenstrual breeding, intramenstrual breeding if they do have symptoms. The thing about gonorrhea is that this one likes to become disseminated. So if it is disseminated, usually in females, the patient's going to be complaining of fever, arthralgias, tenosynovitis, especially in the hands and the feet, migratory polyarthritis, septic arthritis, endocarditis, meningitis, skin rash on distal extremities. The most sensitive diagnostic test is going to be your NAAT, right, which is what we had discussed. So we want to make sure that we do that. We can also do gram stains and cultures. And treatment is usually we want to make sure that we treat for both chlamydia and gonorrhea because we said these travel together. So usually for these patients, we'll give something like ceftrioxone, 250 milligrams times one, um, with azithromycin, right, uh, one dose, or you can give um, doxy, 
right, to cover the chlamydia for seven days for these patients. And the thing about gonorrhea and chlamydia, why it's really important that we treat them is that it has so many complications. Like in a woman, for example, women can get pelvic inflammatory disease. The woman can become infertile. The man can get epididymitis, um, which we discussed earlier. Earlier, women, two ovarian abscesses. Usually women, all of that also that fits acute Curtis syndrome, which is going to be your perihepatitis, bleeding, dyspareunium. All right, so now that we've gone into that one, why don't we go into our nephrolithiasis? So that's going to be our kidney stones, right? The thing about stones in general is just the terminology. So why don't we go into it? So nephrolithiasis is where kidneys form stones. Uh, uretic stone is where the kidney forms a stone and it passes into the ure ureter, which makes sense, right? Bladder stone is where the bladder forms a stone, the, the stone. So in general, for kidney stones, more commonly found in males and females, usually the peak age is between 20 to 40, 20 to 50 years old. And in regards to the kidney stones, like we said, more commonly found in males, males most commonly have the calcium oxalate stone. Um, and that's because of their diet and breakdown of bone. Versus females, they tend to more commonly have the struvite stone. And this is because it's associated with urinary tract infections. And like we said, women are prone to getting urinary tract infections. And the bacteria that causes UTI, what they do is that they split their urea. So this is what causes the struvite bone, the struvite stones. And both females and males have an equal incidence of both urate and cysteine stones. So... In regards to the risk factors, age definitely is going to be the big one. As a patient gets older, they're more prone to getting kidney stones. Males, like we said, geographic location, hot, humid, and uh, arid areas are some of the risk factors for kidney stones. So we're thinking about usually like the southeast, right, U.S., uh, Mediterranean countries. Um, another risk factor is going to be polycystic kidney disease, cystinuria, which is usually inherited, renal tubular acidosis, hyperparathyroidism, which is where the patient is getting too much PTH, which in, is going to cause hypercalcemia and calciuria, which is going to be calcium in the urine. Hypocitraturia, which is where, where these patients get the citrate stones, right? Because citrate, what does it do? It's an inhibitory factor, right? So if it's too low, it's not going to be inhibiting the citrate. So there's going to be too much uh, being produced. So these patients are going to be prone to getting the citrate stones. Also, another one that they really like to test is definitely your medication. So know what medications are associated with kidney stones. By far, the most common ones are going to be your diuretics, right? Cetozolamide, your loop diuretics. Um, also, another factor is going to be hydration. This is actually the most common one. So the patient is just not drinking enough water, right? So ensuring that the patient drinks a lot of water. Also, the dietary factors. Gout can cause a lot of uric acid stones. Um, with these patients. So types of stones, I know we had a con over them, so why don't we go over them real quick. Uh, so you have different types of stones, calcium oxalate and phosphate. Um, by far, out of all stones, the most common one is going to be calcium oxalate. With this one, it's going to be radio opaque on the x-ray. We have uric acid. Usually it's going to be a patient that just has eats a lot of foods that have a lot of protein, right? Um, and what this does is, that it does is that it increases purine levels and it causes uric acid. And these are going to be translucent on the x-ray. How I memorize this one is that it has a U, right? Translucent. So it's associated with U, uric acid. You also have struvite. These are the ones that are known as staghorn calculi. Um, it's usually due to urea splitting organisms. So we think about Proteus mirabilis, right? Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Enterobacter. And this one's going to be radio opaque. And then we have cysteine. This one's not very common. Usually this patient, like we discussed, they're going to have a genetic disorder. Um, and with these patients, uh, usually what you're going to see on x-ray is that it can either be radio opaque or translucent. But we said about out of all of these, the one that's going to be more commonly translucent is going to be which one? Translucent. It's just the U, uric acid. So how is this patient going to present? So they're going to have symptoms of renal colic, right? Um, the thing with this is that they're going to have severe unilateral pain over the uh, CVA that radiates to the groin, nausea and vomiting, lower abdominal pain. Pain that is severe and it's described as gnawing. Usually the patient's going to report that they're unable to get relief from pain in any position. So it's just uncomfortable everywhere. 
um, CVA tenderness, hematuria, frequency, urgency. And then of course, they're gonna have pain, a pain on where the kidney stone is located. So if it's located in the flank and the kidney, they're gonna have flank pain. Um, if the kidney, if the stone is in the kidney, right, and it's damaging the epithelial lining and podocytes, the patient's gonna have hematuria. If it's located in the proximal ureter, they're gonna have flank pain, abdominal, upper abdominal pain, renal colic, and CVA tenderness. If it's okay in the mid ureter, they'll have pain in the mid abdomen, distal ureter. It's gonna be that lower abdominal pain, dysuria, and frequency. Diagnosis, uh, we can do labs, right? What they like to test on is a microscopic crystal analysis. So if you see on your lab, your microscopic crystal analysis, an envelope-shaped stone, it's usually calcium oxalate. Diamond-shaped stone, uric acid. Coffin lid, struvite. Hexagon-shaped is going to be your cysteine. Uh, other diagnostic things, we can do a CBC, look for any type of infection, renal function, right? Because we said that usually kidney stones are the most common cause of what? Post-renal azotemia or post-renal acute kidney injury. So BUN, right, creatinine tells us how the kidney is working. Is there any damage to the kidney? We can do a UA also. If the patient is getting recurrent stones and we want to make sure that we look at their, um, we do a 24-hour urine and we look at the, the magnesium, right, their calcium, are they overproducing calcium? Uh, imaging is another thing that we do. Uh, we usually start with an x-ray, right? And like we said, radiopath, calcium oxalate, and struvite, um, and uric acid, right, it's going to be radiolucent for these patients. Why? Because it starts with a U. Well, the gold standard for kidney stones is going to be a CT urogram or IV pyelography. This is going to be the best test, and it's going to be the gold standard. Um, but, of course, we can't do this in pregnant patients. So if it's a pregnant patient, um, we can do other things usually for these patients. So uh, management, right, initial treatment is always fluid challenge and making sure that we flush the kidney. And then, of course, management is going to depend on how big the kidney stone is. Size of the stone. So any stone that is less than 5 millimeters, usually it's going to pass by itself. So it's about 80% chance of spontaneous passage. So we can just give them IV fluids, analgesics, and anti-emetics. We can even consider something like tamsulosin, which is an alpha blocker. And this, will gonna, this is gonna help that um, passage of the stone. Uh, stones that are greater than seven millimeters in diameter. Usually with these patients, we, are, we can do something like extracorporeal shock wave lithopsy, right? For these patients. And any stone that's greater than 10 millimeters or our struvite stones, right? Those staghorn stones. Usually we're gonna do percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Um, and this is, like I said, it's very invasive and that's why we reserve it for stones that are greater than 10 millimeters or those struvite stones. So order of management, right? Fluid challenge. Um, if it's really small, right? We will do that basket approach to see if the stone just comes out and then surgery is gonna be our last case. And prevention is just increasing fluid intake, right? And decreasing the amount of protein the patient takes. All right, so the next one's gonna be orchitis. So orchitis, most common cause by far of orchitis is gonna be a viral cause. We think about mumps. There's other causes also like Coxsackie virus, but by far the most common virus is gonna be mumps. Um, usually with these patients, some of the causes, we said mumps, there's other causes like tuberculosis, syphilis, autoimmune, but it's usually viral. This patient is going to be presenting with a sudden onset of testicular pain, fever, nausea and vomiting due to severe pain. They'll have a large, indurated, and tender testicle. Labs, we're going to do UA. Just look for protein, urine, hematuria for these patients. Um, we can look at the amylase, which is going to be elevated, right, because it's associated with mumps. Management is just bed rest since the cause is a viral cause. We can give uh, squirtle support, local ice packs, NSAIDs, and only antibiotics if like really needed, um, but like I said, bacterial causes are not common, it's usually viral, so it's usually just gonna be supportive treatment. So the next one's gonna be prostatitis, right? Um, in regards to prostatitis, we think about acute and chronic prostatitis. So for acute, most of these are usually community acquired, uh, sometimes after a catheterization and cystoscopy, usually after a trans, uh, 
trans prostate transurethral prostate biopsy. The most common organism associated with Q prostatitis, since a lot of these are going to be associated with bacteria. Most common ones are going to be E. coli by far, because E. coli is very commonly so found in the GI, right? Other bacteria are going to be Klebsiella, Proteus, Enterobacter, and Staph, but by far the most common ones can be E. coli. Usually the peak age is between the ages of 20 to 40. And how is this patient going to present? They're going to have acute onset of pelvic pain. It can be perennial or even suprapubic. They're going to have irritative urinary tract infection symptoms, so they'll have symptoms of frequency, urgency, dysuria. There will be straining, hesitancy, um, poor or interrupted stream, incomplete emptying whenever they have to urinate. They'll also have systemic febrile illnesses like f fever, chills, malaise, nausea, and vomiting. The patient's just going to be looking very toxic, right? They can even become septic. So, of course, when the patient gets hypotensive, tachycardic, tachypnic, then we think about um, septic, right? Sepsis. Diagnosis is going to be a UA in culture. We're going to see large white blood cell count, right? Uh, we're going to do a post void residual volume and then a CBC also. We're going to see those elevated white blood cell counts. Um, DRE is usually going to show a tender, boggy prostate, and that's going to be usually the keyword for this one. Remember when we were talking about BPH, it was a different one. For this one's going to be that boggy prostate versus BPH, it's that rubbery prostate. This one's going to be that boggy prostate. And that's why it's important that in these patients, we do not massage the prostate. So prostatic massage is contraindicated because we can actually make this patient septic. So treatment, outpatient, right? Fluoroquinol is like ciprofloxacin because this is going to cover those gram negatives. Um, so you can do Cipro 750 milligrams twice a day or Bactrim twice a day for four to six weeks. So this one is a very long treatment, four to six weeks, Cipro or Bactrim. If the patient is admitted white right, because they just look very systemically ill, they aren't able to urinate, right? Then we're going to give them something like IV ampicillin um, plus gentamicin. Now, chronic prostitis, this is actually going to be more common in your older patients. So it's going to be patients that are 40 to 70 years old. And some of the causes of this is going to be anything that's obstructing, right? BPH, stones foreign body in the urinary tract infection, urinary tract, uh, bladder cancer, prostatic abscess, um, intravesicular fistula, and the most common cause, once again, is going to be E. coli. Usually, these patients are going to be presenting with either a recurrent or relapsing urinary tract infection, urethritis, and epididymitis, and sometimes it will be asymptomatic between episodes. Usually, they'll have that localized dull pain in the lower back, the perennial or testicular regions, and they'll have symptoms of frequency, urgency, and dysuria. But the thing about this one is that they will not have a fever. So chronic prostatitis is no fever versus acute prostatitis, the patient does have a fever. And like I said, usually these patients are not toxic appearing or febrile. Diagnosis is going to be urine culture um, and a urine analysis, right? Uh, we can do a DRE. We'll see a prostate that's going to be enlarged and non-tender. And treatment is going to be your fluoroquinolones and Bactrim also. So the next one is going to be your testicular cancer, right? Uh, this is about 1% of cancer in males, and it's most commonly found in your younger males between the ages of 15 to 35. Risk factors, by far, one of the most common ones is going to be cryptocortism. So cryptocortism, that's why it's really important that in uh, patients, like especially with children, if the testicle has not descended, these patients need to go to surgery, right? It's a most common right-sided in these patients um, because cryptocortism usually occurs on the right, right? Uh, very commonly found in Caucasians. Um, and then any patient that has a risk factor of testicular dysgenesis, testicular atrophy, if they have a positive family history, and Klein-Felter syndrome is another big one that's associated with testicular cancer. So there's different types of cancers. Um, you have your giant, your gem cell tumors, usually these are very, very malignant, and these are actually the most common ones of all the ones, all the cancers, so giant cell tumors, usually malignant. And the most common type of cancer for giant cell tumors is going to be your seminomas, by far, uh, especially in your patients between the ages of 30 to 40. And whenever I think about seminomas, think about the four S's, right? Uh, simple, so they lack tumor markers, like your alpha-fetoprotein and your beta-HCG. These are going to be normal. 
These are sensitive, so they're sensitive to radiation. They're slower growing and they're associated with stepwise spread. So those are gonna be your four S's. So like we said, seminoma is gonna be the most common type of germ cell tumor. You also have non-seminomas. Uh, usually with these patients, there's different type. Choriocarcinoma is gonna be definitely by far the worst prognosis. And in non-seminomas, these are actually gonna have increased serum alpha fetoprotein, increased beta HCG, and these are gonna be radio resistance. And then you have your non-germ cell tumors, right? Uh, like, for example, your Leydig cell tumors. These are actually benign. You also have your Sertoli cell tumors and all these other type of tumors. But just know that out of all of these, uh, the most common type in men is going to be your seminomas. Like, and these fall under the umbrella of giant cell tumors. Uh, I'm sorry, germ cell tumors. So how is a patient going to present with cancer in general? So the patient is going to have that painless testicular mass that's unable to be separated from the testicle, Right. They'll have the dual ache in the scrotum, scrotal heaviness, and any red flags, like if they had any type of minor trauma, um, want to make sure that we're looking for that. And also, usually gynecomastia is associated with your Leydig cell tumors, right? So Leydig cell tumors are going to be those non-germ cell tumors. Um, also, look for any type of systemic clues that's going to tell us that the cancer has metastasized, like hemoptysis, right, supraclavicular lymph nodes, your uh, abdominal mass, um, and seminomas, like we said, these are the most common ones, right? These are a type of giant cell tumor. These tend to spread to the bone. And then make sure that we're staging them. So stage one is just the testicle. Stage two, it's metastasized to the retroperitoneal peritoneal nodes, and stage three, it's metastasized above the diaphragm or to the viscera. Diagnosis, we're going to do an alpha fetoprotein, like I said, beta HCG, um, LDH also, and then also a scrotal ultrasound, right? Um, scrotal ultrasounds, usually for seminomas, uh, they're going to be more dense or solid than usual, right? So we'll see that hypoechoic mass versus a non-seminoma on an ultrasound. This one is going to be cystic and homogeneous mass. So what's going to be the management for a patient with uh, testicular cancer surgery, right? Orchiectomy, um, chemo for metastasis, um, radiation for early stage seminomas. Since like I said, these are, we were thinking about our S's, right? These are sensitive to radiation for seminomas. Since once again, this is going to be the most common one. Repetition is the key, so that's why I keep repeating this over and over again. If it's a stage one, like for example, non seminoma, and it's only limited to testes, then we can do orchiectomy with retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Um, if it's a high grade seminoma, then we're going to do debulking chemo, orchiectomy, and radiation. And then just make sure that we're monitoring the beta HCG and alpha fetoprotein in these patients and just educating the patient on prevention, right? Uh, to stick your self exam. And the thing about these cancers is that they have a very good prognosis. So about um, over year, overall, five-year survival is going to be 95%. So it's very, very curable with these patients. So we are done with uh, urology and nephrology. Let's go into our hematology and oncology. So let's talk about our leukemias, yes? So we have different types of leukemias, right? Uh, let's start with our acute leukemia. So acute leukemias, um, just in general leukemias, right, are diseases that are characterized by unrestrained growth of leukocytes and leukocyte precursors in the tissues. These can either be acute or chronic. And for our acute leukemia, some of the risk factors include a positive family history. Does the patient have exposure to radiation, benzene, and alkylating, alkylating agents? And usually the incidence is going to increase with age. So in kids, ALL is definitely the most com is most common than AML, right? AL is actually going to be, which is acute lymphocytic leukemia, it's going to be the most common malignancy in kids of uh, less than the age of 15. So that's how you kind of characterize these leukemias, right? You have ALL, um, AML, CLL, and CML. ALL is going to be the cancer of more commonly found in children. So just keep that in your mind. ALL is going to be children. Most diagnoses are made in children between the ages of three to seven, right? And with these patients, usually they're going to be presenting with gingival bleeding, epistaxis, menorrhagia. Um, they can also present with infections from neutropenia, right? Because they ha they're going to have decreased neutrophils. So usually it's going to be caused by gram-negative bacteria or fungi. 
So we think about cellulitis, pneumonia, um, and then of course these patients are going to be presenting with fatigue, fever, lethargy, headaches, and bone and joint pain, especially in the sternum, the tibia, and the femur. They'll have symptoms of anemia, thrombocytopenia, gingival hyperplasia, rashes, or cranial nerve palsies. And then lymphadenopathy and ketosplenomegaly is also very commonly associated with AL. And it's actually more commonly associated with AL than AML. So usually the workout for these patients, right, what we're going to see on our labs and the hallmark for this is going to be pancytopenia with circulating blasts, right? Because when we think about acute lymphocytic um, leukemia, blasts are going to be more predominant. And that's how you should think about this. Any type of anemia that's acute, blasts are going to be more pro predominant. Um, white blood cell counts are usually going to be very, very high. And what's going to help us confirm the diagnosis? It's going to be our bone marrow biopsy, right, with these patients. Another thing that you'll see is going to be terminal deoxynucleotidal transferase, which is present in about 95% of ALL cases, right? And All right, so the next one's going to be CML, which is going to be your chronic, uh, chronic myelogenous uh, leukemia. So chronic myelogenous leukemia. So with uh, CML, this is going to be a myeloproliferative disorder, right? <clears throat> usually presents its young, in young to middle age adults. Uh, this one usually can transform into acute disease, so this one can go back into AML. It occurs in three phases, chronic, accelerated, and your acute myeloproliferative, right? Which is going to be your blast crisis, where more than 30% of blasts are found in the blood or bone marrow. With these patients, they're going to be presenting with fatigue, anorexia, weight loss, low-grade fever, and excessive sweating. Um, they'll have abdominal fullness. Why? Because they have splenomegaly. And usually for our workup and diagnosis, the hallmark for this one, right, is going to be that Philadelphia chromosome. So once again, Philadelphia chromosome is what's pathognomonic for CML. So if you see Philadelphia chromosome anywhere on there, right, your translocation of nine, the chromosomes 9 and 22, then we're thinking about our Philadelphia chromosome, right? Um, you also see leukocytosis with a median white blood cell count of 150,000 cells per milliliter. You're going to have your uh, BCR ABL gene um, by PCR that has been replaced um, for Philadelphia chromosome to establish the diagnosis. So with these patients, what's going to be the treatment? Um, usually with these patients, the uh, treatment is going to be your STI-571, like imatinib, mesylate, and Gleevec, which have replaced the former standard therapy. It's effective in the chronic phase. And then, of course, your allogenic bone marrow transplant, which is usually the initial therapy. And this is actually the only therapy that's proven to be curative in patients with CML. So once again, CML is going to be that Philadelphia chromosome, right? How I memorize it is CU in Philadelphia, CU in Philly, right? Philadelphia chromosome, CML. So the next one is going to be CLL, which is going to be your chronic lymphocytic leukemia, right? Um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. With these patients, usually it's going to be a clonal malignancy of B lymphocytes. It's most prevalent of all malignancy, and it's two times more common in men than women. Uh, usually these patients, it's often harmless, but it's resistant to cure. It's going to involve the peripheral lymphocytes and lymphocytic invasion of the bone marrow, liver, spleen, and lymph nodes. These patients are going to be presenting with recurrent infections, right, splenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. They can have also Richter syndrome, which is where there's an isolated node that transforms into aggressive large B-cell lymphomas. And like I said, Usually with these patients, you're going to see lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, um, and it's the most common type of leukemia in the West. So CLL, what we're going to see on our labs, we're going to see isolated lymphocytosis with the leukocytosis of more than 20,000 cells. On the peripheral smear, CLL is going to show increased mature small lymphocytes. And what's pathognomonic about this one is going to be smudge cells, so right? Smudge cells are pathognomonic with these patients. We'll also see anemia, thrombocytopenia, and thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. And usually the treatment for this is palliative once the disease is advanced for these patients. And like I said, well, with CLL, this one tends to affect your older patients, especially patients that are older than 65. 
So just keep that in mind, right? So we said ALL is going to be the cancer of younger children. CLL is going to be your cancer of older patients. So the next one, we're going to go into clotting factor disorders, right? So let's start with von Willebrand's disease. So just in general, what is a von Willebrand factor? This one is important in primary hemostasis, right? It binds platelets, it binds endothelial components, and it forms adhesive bridges between platelets and vascular subendothelial structures. And it contributes to the fibrin clot formation and it carries factor eight. So if you do not have your von Willebrand factor, then of course you're gonna have problems with clotting, right? So how is this patient going to present so this patient is going to be presenting with easy bruising, skin bleeding, prolonged bleeding from mucosal surfaces like the oropharyngeal uh, GI, the urethra, right? So they'll have that gingival bleeding. Um, and the thing about this one that you need to know is that it's autosomal dominant, right? So it's autosomal dominant. And this one's going to be the um, <clears throat> most common inherited bleeding disorder. So this one by far is going to be the most common tested one. So it's really important that you know this one, right? So von Willebrand factor, we said... Um, is a factor that carries usually your factor eight. And with this one, we said that it's autosomal dominant and it's the most common type of inherited bleeding disorder. So usually in the question stems that I read, it'll say the mother or the father or someone in the family member also has a disorder. So think about that whenever you're reading this question. What are you going to see on labs? Uh, you're going to see prolonged bleeding time with normal platelet count, because once again, it's not a problem with your platelet counts, but the fact, but what carries the factor. Uh, PTT can be prolonged, but usually um, you'll have a normal PTT with these patients. Um, usually, also, you'll see decreased plasma von Willebrand fracture, right, and decreased factor eight activity. So once again, this patient's going to have prolonged bleeding time with a normal platelet count, right? And like we said, PTT can be prolonged. Why? Because it's associated with factor eight. But if they have a normal PTT, it does not exclude the diagnosis for these patients. So um, that's why it's really important that you know what factors are extrinsic and what factors are intrinsic to know whether the PT or the PTT is going to be um, long or not. So whenever we think about the intrinsic system, right, we think about uh, factors 9, factors 12, factors 8, right? When we think about the extrinsic factor, we think about factor 7. So anything that's going to be affecting factor 7, we're thinking about extrinsic factor. And usually anything that, fact that affects the extrinsic system, right, we're thinking about which one. So which one is going to be um, elongated? PT or PTT. So with extrinsic, so how I memorize it for PTT and PT is that I have PT playing tennis outside and then PTT playing table tennis inside. So PTT, you're playing table tennis inside. So playing table tennis inside is going to be intrinsic factors, right? Versus playing tennis outside, it's going to be any extrinsic factor. So that's kind of how I memorize it and it helped me on my exams. If this is helpful for you, then definitely use it. So you would expect, right, playing table tennis inside anything that affects the intrinsic factors that we discussed is going to have an elongated PTT. Anything that affects playing, playing tennis outside is or PT is going to affect your extrinsic factors. So if this is helpful for you, then definitely use it. So like we said, factor eight is part of what? It's going to be part of your intrinsic factors. So of course, what do we expect to be elevated in patients um, that have any type of factor eight deficiency, then we're going to be expecting playing table tennis inside. So your PTT is going to be elevated with these patients. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? Um, it's going to be desmopressin, right? So desmopressin is going to be the best treatment for these patients. And just for repetition, right, we're going to see normal platelet counts, normal PT and INR, um, and normal APTT. And like I said, it can be prolonged, right? especially if they have a very low factor eight for PTT. All right, so that is von Willebrand's. This one's very highly tested, so make sure that you know it, right? It's, we said it's autosomal dominant. Uh, we said that it's the most common type of inherited bleeding disorders. 
these patients will not have spontaneous hemarthrosis because when we think about hemarthrosis, we think about what? Hemophilia. So get that in your mind. No spontaneous uh, hemarthrosis because that's associated usually with hemophilia. And desmopressin is going to be the treatment for these patients. So the next one is going to be your hemophilia. So we have hemophilia A and hemophilia B. The thing that you need to know about these two is that they're both X-linked recessive, right? And what factor, so what does it mean that it's X-linked recessive? So it means that it tends to affect males usually primarily. So in your question stems, look for a male with this disorder because it's X-linked recessive. And hemophilia A and B are due to a decreased synthesis of a specific factor. So it's really important that you know which factor is not being synthesized. So in hemophilia A, it's going to involve factor 8, right? 8. Versus hemophilia B, it's going to involve factor 9. Hemophilia B is also known as your Christmas uh, disease. So once again, hemophilia A is going to be factor 8. Hemophilia B is going to be factor 9. So with hemophilia A, um, usually with these patients, these are the ones that are going to be presenting with hemarthrosis like we discussed, right? So they're going to have that painful swelling around the joint. Usually the knees are going to be the most common site that's going to involve in adults and ankle is going to be the most common site involved in kids. But of course, in question sense, that's not, not, that's not the case because I've seen kids with knees um, being involved. So what happens is that the patient's going to have progressive joint destruction that occurs secondary to recurrent hemarthrosis. So usually with these patients, they can also present with intracranial bleeding. And this is actually the second most common cause of death in these patients. So that's why any head trauma that a patient has, we wanna make sure that uh, we evaluate this because this is very life-threatening and this patient can die, right? These patients can also get intramuscular hematomas, retroperitoneal hematomas, hematuria, or hemospermia. What do you expect you're gonna see? So since factor eight, right, is what? It's intrinsic. So we're playing table tennis inside. What is going to be elevated? You're going to have a prolonged PTT, but you're going to have a normal PT for these patients, right? You're also going to see low factor seven, I'm sorry, low factor eight coagulant levels. So once again, low factor eight coagulant levels and normal levels of angulogen factor. Factor. And like I said, if we suspect a cranial bleed, then we want to make sure that we do a CT scan. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients, right? If they have acute hemarthrosis, we're going to give them analgesics like codeine or with Tylenol. We want to make sure that we avoid any aspirin or NSAIDs. Why? Because these patients already have, are missing these factors and these medications are more prone to making these patients bleed. We're going to immobilize the joint, apply ice packs and non-weight bearing. Now, what is the treatment for hemophilia A in general? We're gonna give uh, the factor that they are missing, right? So we're gonna give them factor A concentrate, and that's usually the mainstay of therapy, right? We can also give them uh, desmopressin, usually in patients that have like a mild disease, right? Now, hemophilia B, we said it's due to factor nine, and it's gonna present exactly the same like hemophilia A. So we're expecting to see that hemarthrosis, right? The swelling around the knees or the ankles. And once again, the workup, what are we gonna see? Prolonged PTT, playing tables, tennis inside, right? It's intrinsic factor. We're gonna see a normal PT for these patients. And treatment for these patients, we wanna make sure that we administer factor nine. Desmopressin does not work, right? Because it does not involve factor eight. So desmopressin and hemophilia B does not work. But factor nine concentrate does work. So once again, hemophilia A, we can do factor eight concentrate or desmopressin versus hemophilia B, which involves factor nine. We're gonna give these patients um, factor nine concentrates. So the next one is gonna be DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is characterized by abnormal activation of the coagulation sequence that forms microthrombi throughout the microcirculation. Um, this causes consumption of platelets, fibrin, and coagulation factors. And so what happens is that these fibrinolytic mechanisms are activated that lead to hemorrhage, so bleeding and thrombosis can occur simultaneous. It, com it most commonly occurs in patients that are critically ill, especially in the ICU. Causes, infections is usually the most common cause, right, especially your gram-negative sepsis. We think about obstetric, obstetric complications, right, 
any type of tissue injury like trauma, burns, surgeries, fractures, any type of malignancies like cancers like lung, pancreas, prostate cancers, um, shock, right? Shag, uh, snake venom is another one, especially your rattlesnakes. How is this patient going to present? They're going to have a bleeding tendency, and this is the most common symptom you're going to see in acute cases. So they're going to have a superficial hemorrhage, ecchymosis, petechiae, purpura. They're going to be bleeding from their GI tract, their urinary tract, everywhere, gingival or oral mucosa. They're going to be oozing from any type of incision, like IV lines or any procedures that you did. And then they're going to have symptoms of thrombosis. This is usually later. It's most common in your chronic cases, right? And the thing about thrombosis, right, is that you are going to infarct your organs, especially like your kidneys, right? Um, you can also infarct your brain. This patient is going to have just generalized bleeding everywhere. They're going to have mental status changes, ischemia, or gangrene, oliguria. Why? Because once again, it's infarcting the kidneys. Um, and some of the complications of this, right, uh, thromboembolism, like we said, so they can suffer from a pulmonary embolism, um, stroke. They can infarct their bowels. They can occlude their arteries. So what are we going to see on their labs? So the PT, PTT, bleeding time, all that's going to be increased. So all that's going to be increased, right, because they are just blowing through their clotting factors. Their body's like bleeding so much that the body's trying to catch up and they're trying to clot it. But they start using up all their clotting factors. And that's why the PT, PTT, bleeding time, and um, that's gonna be elevated with these patients. Also, the D-dimer is gonna be elevated. What's gonna be decreased though, is gonna be their platelet count and their fibrinogen level. That's usually gonna be decreased. If you do any type of peripheral smear, you're gonna see schistocytes. Why? Because the red blood cells are being damaged as they're going through the circulation with all the microthrombi that's there. Treatment, of course, we want to make sure that we manage whatever is causing or what caused the DIC, right? If it was shock, manage that. Um, usually, it's going to be supportive measures for these patients also. So, given something like fresh frozen plasma to replace all the clotting factors that they lost. Give them platelet transfusions, right? You can also give them low doses of heparin. This is going to prevent um, that consumption of the clotting factors and inhibit the clotting, right? Because these patients are clotting, like we said, and they're infarcting all their organs, oxygen, um, and IV fluids. So when we go into our hypercoagulable states, right? Hypercoagulable states. So there's a lot of hypercoagulable states. We think about factor five Leiden, which is by far one of the most common ones, protein C and S deficiency, antithrombin three deficiency, and any type of liver disorder like cirrhosis. Um, Antiphospholipid syndrome, also we think about that one, especially if it's associated with lupus, right? So let's go with factor V Leiden. This is by far one of the most common type of hypercoagulable states. And what happens is that there's a point mutation. So factor V is resistant to proteolysis by protein C. So what happens is that you have an overabundant conversion of prothrombin to thrombin, and this is autosomal dominant. How is this patient going to present is that they're going to have repeated DVTs, right? So the patient that comes in, it's like the third DVT for the year, or second DVT is just, they're very prone to coagulating. Pulmonary embolism. Uh, a lot of these patients cannot have babies. So they'll have preeclampsia, placental abruption, stillbirth, intrauterine growth restriction. Uh, workup for these patients, DNA tests, right? For factor five lighting, APC resistant assay. And treatment's just going to be anticoagulation, right? preventing the patient from clotting, preventing those recurrent um, thromboembolisms. So the next one's going to be your antiphospholipid syndrome. This one's usually, like we said, associated with lupus. So lupus anticoagulant is a hypercoagulable state that's associated with a group of antibodies that are directed against the phospholipids or the cardiolipids. So usually with these patients, they're going to be presenting with spontaneous abortions, pulmonary embolism, or DVT, but usually they're healthy. They just clot a lot, right? On labs, we're going to see elevated PTT because why it involves the intrinsic pathway. We And the thing about antiphospholipid syndrome is that usually you'll see a false positive to RPR or VDRL, which is associated with syphilis, right? So that's another thing that was really important with these patients. And antiphospholipid syndrome, it's acquired hypercoagulable state. Like we said, it's associated with SLE or it can be idiopathic. Um, and with these patients, usually on physical exam, you're going to see your levito uh, reticularis. They're going to have thrombocytopenia. 
And diagnosis for this is a uh, presence of lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin antibody, or both. Prolonged PTT, right, usually with these patients. And treatment is just long-term coagulation. Make sure that we're maintaining the INR between 2.5 and 3.5. So let's go into our anemias, right? Anemia. So we have iron deficiency anemia. By far, this is the most common type of anemia worldwide. And some of the causes usually is chronic blood loss. We think about menstruation, especially in women. Um, I've had patients that come in and they're just having like um, menorrhagia, right? Um, metromenorrhagia, they're just menstruating so much. Um, and this one's the most common cause in adults, right? Also just their diet, they're not intaking enough iron, right? And this is usually seen in your infants and toddlers, adolescents, and any woman that's pregnant. How is this patient going to present? You're going to see pallor, generalized weakness and fatigue, dyspnea on exertion, orthostatic lightheadedness, hypotension, especially if they have acute iron deficiency, tachycardia, palpitations, headaches, pica is another one where they have the urge to eat, for example, dirt, glossitis, angular colitis, cholinicia, jaundice, and splenomegaly. Workup and diagnosis is a CBC. Um, we're going to see a low reticulocyte count. The thing about this one is that their, their red blood cell distribution width is going to be high, and that's kind of how you can differentiate this one. This iron deficiency anemia in comparison to the other one is that their RDW is going to be high, right? And then in regards to their MCV, right, it's usually going to be um, less than 80. So when we think about anemias in general, right, we have our microcytic anemias, we have our hemolytic anemias, and then we have our macrocytic anemias, right? So when we think about that MCV that's less than 80, usually we think about our microcytic anemias, 80 to 100, usually we think about our hemolytic anemias, right? And greater than 100, we think about our macrocytic anemias. It's really important that you know these numbers because they really like to test you on this. Um, and you'll save time, especially when you're going through the end of rotation exam. So how I think about this is that microcytic anemia is a problem with production, right? We're thinking about iron deficiency anemia, they just don't have enough iron. So they have a problem with production of blood cells. Hemolytic anemia, they are just having a problem with destruction. So they're producing the enough, the amount of red blood cells that they need, but they're just destroying them. And that's why it's called he your hemolytic anemia is between 80 to 100, your normal acidic anemias, right? Normal acidic anemias. Greater than 100, we're thinking about our macrocytic anemias. Once again, this is a problem with production of red blood cells, whether it's due to vitamin B12 deficiency Folic acid, folic acid deficiency, et cetera. So if you keep this in mind, it'll help you kind of differentiate the types of anemias that you're looking for. So once again, microcytic is usually a production. Um, 80 to 100 is gonna be your normal acidic anemia. We think about hemolytic anemias, right? Something is destroying the red blood cells, whether it's autoimmune or the patient's just taking certain things, something's destroying those red blood cells. So it's a problem with destruction. Macrocytic, which is greater than 100. Once again, this is where we think about our production anemia. So this one, right, iron deficiency is going to be microcytic. MCV is going to be less than 80 with these patients. It's a problem with production of red blood cells. So we're also going to do iron studies. We're going to see the serum ferritin, which is going to be decreased. And the total iron binding capacity and transferrin levels are going to be increased, which makes sense, right? Because you have all these... Um, basically, total iron binding capacity. What does that mean? So they're there, they're looking for iron, there's a lot of them, but there's no iron to bind to. So they're kind of just there looking for iron. And that makes sense, right? And that's why their total iron binding capacity is going to be increased. But the serum ferritin is going to be decreased because they have decreased in iron and they have an increase of these total iron binding capacities that are looking for iron to bind with. On your peripheral blood smear, you're going to see microcytic hypochromic red blood cells, poikilocytes, like pencil or cigar-shaped cells. Um, and usually the gold standard for uh, iron deficiency anemia is going to be your bone marrow biopsy. This is rarely performed, right? And the thing about iron deficiency anemia, if you see this in a patient that's older and they're having um, uh, GI bleeding, usually that's what we're going to suspect, right? And we suspect things like colon cancer. So it's impo important that with these patients, we do a colonoscopy or a white stool test just to rule it out. So treatment for this is going to be iron replacement oral, right? Ferrous sulfate three times a day. That's actually the best one. 
Um, you can also do parental iron replacement, either IM or, intra for, or IV, but once again, the best one's gonna be your oral iron replacement. And sometimes they like to trick you on this. They'll put oral and IV. Oral is gonna be the best one. So G6PD deficiency is another one. So with G6PD deficiency, there's two types, right? You have your mild form, which is gonna be your, your A variant. Usually with these patients, they're gonna have hemolytic episodes that are usually self-limited because they mainly involve only the older red blood cells and spare the younger ones. The younger ones tend to have sufficient G6PD to prevent red blood cell destruction. And whenever we think about these, right, the mild form, um, there's usually hemolytic episodes that are usually triggered by infection or drugs like primaquin, like your antimalarials, or any medications that contain sulfa, like sulfonamides or Bactrim, right, with these patients. So what does G6PD just do in, in the red blood cell? So G6PD, which is known as your glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, is responsible for the first step in the pentose phosphate pathway, a series of chemical reactions that convert glucose um, to another sugar, ribose 5-phosphate. So ribose 5-phosphate is an important component of nucle nucleotides, which are the building blocks of DNA, right, and RNA also. So this chemical reaction produces a molecule called NADPH, which plays a role in protecting the cells from harmful molecules that, can, that are called reactive oxygen species. So these molecules are byproducts of normal cellular function. Reactions that involve the NADPH produce compounds that prevent reactive oxygen species from building up to toxic levels within cells, right? So the production of NADPH by G6PD is essential in red blood cells. Um, because red blood cells are particularly susceptible to damage by reactive oxygen species. So since these blood cells lack the NADPH pr producing enzymes, they're going to be very prone to any damage, right? And this is what happens in G6PD deficiency. So G6PD deficiency is X-linked recessive, so it tends to affect primarily men. And what happens is that you have hemolysis with infection, metabolic acidosis, and medications like sulfonamides, macrobid, primaquin, dimercripal, and then your faba beans is a big one that they like to test also. So this patient is going to have episodic hemolytic anemia that is usually drug-induced. So they'll be presenting with dark urine and jaundice, which makes sense because you're having all these red blood cells being popped, right, broken, and it's releasing all this bilirubin. And an excess amount of bilirubin is going to cause what? It's going to cause the urine to become dark and the patient become jaundice, right? Because it starts going to the skin. Diagnosis for this, we can do a peripheral blood smear. This is where we're gonna see bite cells and that's usually what's pathognomonic for G6PD. So bite cells, which is red blood cells after the removal of Heinz bodies, look like they, something took a bite out of them. And what happens is that usually those macrophages are the ones that bite these cells. Um, you can also see Heinz bodies, which is going to be abnormal hemoglobin precipitants within red blood cells that are visible with special stains. And you'll see a deficiency in G6PD on assay also. So what's going to be the treatment for these patients? Just making sure that the patient avoids drugs that precipitate hemolysis, right? So if they know that sulfonamides precipitate, stop taking that drug. If it's fava beans, then you can't eat fava beans anymore. Um, we want to make sure that the patient maintains hydration and only receive red blood cells when necessary. All right, and next one's going to be sickle cell anemia. I can spend an entire video on this because there's so much to know. But just in regards to this exam, right, um, it's about the sickle cell trait. So about 1 in 12 people of African descent carry the trait and they're heterozygous, right? So it's really important that these patients, we do genetic counseling. So it's an autosomal recessive hemolytic anemia. So this is going to be a hemolytic anemia. It's going to be your normal, normal acidic anemias, right? 80 to 100. So usually what happens is that the red blood cells have one hemoglobin S, which sickles under deoxygenated conditions. So hemoglobin S can be distinguished from hemoglobin A by electrophoresis, right? Um, because of the substitution of an uncharged valine for a negative charge glutamic acid at the sixth position of the beta chain. Most commonly seen in African Americans, and these patients tend to have a life expectancy of 40 to 50 years old. So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have severe lifelong hemolytic anemia, so jaundice, gallstones, right, because these cells are constantly being chemolyzed, 
when you think about that sickle cell shape, um, you can think about um, how I think about it is how like half a moon looks, right? Um, these patients are going to be presenting with anemia, a high output heart failure. Also, why? Because they, they're always constantly anemic. So it's going to be your heart failure secondary to anemia. Um, these patients can also present with aplastic crisis. So usually this is going to be acute. They'll be in acute pain. It lasts from a few hours to two weeks. It's usually provoked by some type of viral infection. By far the most common one that you need to know that is associated with your acute crisis in sickle cell is going to be parvovirus B19. Because what happens is that it reduces the ability of the bone marrow to compensate. So parvovirus B19, a plastic crisis, and sickle cell anemia. So how is this patient going to present with a plastic crisis? Fever, uh, anxiety, they'll have abrupt changes in temperature, um, hypoxic, right? They'll have tenderness, fever, tachycardia, anxiety, and treatment for this is usually blood transfusion. Um, and the thing about this is that these patients have so many complications from the sickle cell, right? Uh, they can have painful crisis involving the bone where they just infarct their bone because once again, these red blood cells, right, they're sickle cell shaped. So when they pass through the vessels, they're more prone to get stuck. And if you have a lot of them, a lot of them getting stuck, then of course you're gonna have like almost like a thrombi formation, right? Which is just not going to allow blood flow to go to that area. So this is actually the most common clinical manifestation, your painful crisis involving the bone, and usually pain is self-limiting. It lasts for two to seven days. They can also present with dactylitis, which is gonna be your hand foot syndrome, which is gonna be a painful swelling and infarct of the hands and feet. Um, very commonly seen in your infants and early childhood between the four to six months. And usually this is the first manifestation of sickle cell disease for these patients. You can also get acute chest syndrome, which is due to sickling, right, within the lung. So this patient gets repeated pulmonary infarctions. They're gonna be presenting with chest pain, fever, cough, and tachypnea. Uh, they'll have respiratory distress. You're gonna see pulmonary infiltrates on your chest x-ray. Um, and another thing with these patients is that the majority of them by adults, they've already kind of, they have their spleen is non-functional because they auto infarct their spleen, right? Because we're talking about, once again, these red blood cells that are sickle cell shaped and they will just lodge anywhere. And if you have a lot of them, it's gonna stop blood flow to that area and usually it's a spleen. So that's why a lot of these patients will auto infarct their spleens. And on physical exam, when you do feel for the spleen, it's gonna be small calcified. It's just gonna be gone. Um, and so that's why with these patients, it's really important that we do um, that we actually vaccinate them against encapsulated bacteria, like for example, strep, right? Because these patients do not have their spleen anymore, so their spleen is not helping them out with these bacteria. These patients are also very prone to getting a priapism, right? Because of vaso occlusion, um, strokes, also ophthalmologic complications like retinal detachment. That's why we're checking for a red reflex in children. Um, chronic leg ulcers. And of course, like we said, infections, especially your encapsulated bacteria like Haemophilus influenza. We said strep, right? Streptococcus pneumonia. Um, and then of course, these patients are very prone to getting what type of osteomyelitis? It's going to be salmonella. So osteomyelitis, salmonella in your sickle cell patients. So what's going to be the workup for these patients? Hemoglobin electrophoresis. That's where we're going to see that hemoglobin S. This is going to be required for diagnosis. Um, the thing about these patients is that you also see fetal hemoglobin. Also, if you do a smear, you're going to see those sickle cells. Uh, you also see target cells. Uh, how, a jolly, how a jolly bodies. You'll see reticulocytosis, right? Which makes sense because the body's trying to create new blood cells because it's... Um, destroying all the other ones, leukocytosis, you'll see also. Um, and treatment for these patients is just really educating them, right? Uh, tell them to avoid high altitudes, which can make them prone to sickling. Uh, maintain fluid intake, so drink a lot of water for these patients. Um, vaccinate them, like we said, against strep, hemophilus influenza, and Neisseria meningitidis, because these are those encapsulated bacteria. Prophylactic penicillin sometimes for kids, especially between the ages of four to six, 
folic acid supplementation also because they're constantly chemalizing, right? Hydroxyurea is another treatment that we can give for sickle cell. Why? Because it's going to enhance the hemoglobin F levels, which interferes with sickling process. Um, blood transfusions, right? So let's go into our thalassemias. So thalassemias, we have different types. We have our alpha and beta. And just in general, thalassemias is a disorder that's characterized by inadequate production of either the alpha or beta chain of the hemoglobin. And it's a classified according to the chain that is deficient. But just in general, for both thalassemias, uh, usually they're going to be presenting with hepatosplenomegaly and jaundice. So let's go with our beta thalassemia. So in beta thalassemia, the beta chain production is deficient, but the alpha chains are going to be unaffected. So that's why it's called beta thalassemia, because what is affected? The beta chains are affected, but the alpha chains are still there. So what happens is that since you have all these alpha chains, they're going to start binding and damaging the red blood cell membrane. It's very commonly found in your Mediterranean, your Middle Eastern, and Indian ancestry. And usually the severity varies with different mutations. Um, we think about, for example, thalassemia major, usually with these patients, right? But we also have thalassemia minor. So thalassemia major is also known as your Cooley's anemia. Usually this patient's going to have homozygous beta chain thalassemia, very predominant in Mediterranean, and usually diagnosis between the ages of 6 to 12 months old. With thalassemia major, this one is really severe, right? They're going to have severe anemia, so they're going to have that microcytic hypochromic anemia, massive hepatosplenomegaly. They'll have expansion of the bone marrow space that can cause distortion of bones. They're going to have growth, retardation, and failure to thrive. And the thing about thalassemias in general is that the, micro, the blood level, like we said, this is going to be a microcytic anemia. It's going to be very, very low, like super low. And I remember my my nephrologist was sending us pictures of some blood, some blood work that he had done on a patient just for educative um, purposes. And it was a patient with thalassemias. And yeah, their red blood cell level is really low. Versus like when we think about iron deficiency anemia, like it's a microcytic anemia. It's low, but not as low as your um, thalassemias. And then you have thalassemia minor. So these are usually going to be heterozygous. And these patients are going to be asymptomatic, right? Once again, you're going to see that mild microcytic hypochromic anemia. So what's going to be the workup or diagnosis? For thalassemia major, you can do a school x-ray. You're going to see that show, you're going to see that crew cut appearance. Um, you're also going to do a hemoglobin electrophoresis for both major and minor. You're going to see hemoglobin F and hemoglobin A2 are going to be elevated. You can do peripheral blood smear. You're going to see your microcy microcytic hypochromic uh, target cells, basophic stippling is like the keyword for this one, elliptocytes, and then you can also do iron studies. So uh, treatment for these, for thalassemia major, usually these patients are going to need frequent red blood cell transfusions. These are required for them, right? Versus thalassemia minor, usually the treatment is not necessary because usually these patients are asymptomatic, like I said. Um, so usually they don't need treatment, and these are not transfusion dependent. Um, if they're asymptomatic, of course, you can just tell them to take oral iron repletion and vitamin B12, right? Um, but usually these patients do not need treatment. And like I said, thalassemia major is going to be the one that only needs your frequent red blood cell transfusions. And these are the ones that have very, very severe uh, symptoms. So now we have alpha thalassemia. So with this one, you have different types, right? And we said with alpha thalassemias, they are going to be missing that alpha chain of the hemoglobin. So you have your silent carriers. This is where a patient has a mutation or deletion of only one of the alpha locus. You have your alpha thalassemia trait or minor, which is a mutation or deletion of two alpha loci, common in African-American patients. You have your HPH disease, HPH disease. This is a mutation or deletion of three alpha loci. And then you have your hydrox vitalis. Like this is incompatible with life. Which this is where the patient has deleted all four of the Alpha loci, and this is usually fatal at birth or shortly after the patient, after the baby's born. So once again, um, in regards to beta thalassemia, we have two of them, right? Two betas. Alpha, we have four. So with um, beta thalassemias, right, you're missing, um, you're either missing one or two. So that's going to be your beta thalassemia. Versus your alpha, you're missing one, two, three, or four. Four is incompatible with life. One is going to be your silent carriers, and usually these patients are asymptomatic. Now, a patient that presents with HVH disease or your 
um, mutation of three of those alpha loci, they're going to be presenting with hemolytic anemia, splenomegaly, and significant microcytic hyperchromia anemia. So the diagnosis for these patients is usually going to be your hemoglobin electrophoresis. This is where you're going to see your HBH and your HBH disease, which is once again missing those three alpha loci. Treatment for silent carriers that are missing one alpha, uh, no treatment is necessary for alpha thalassemia minor or trait, which are missing two, right? No treatment for HBHD disease, which are missing three. Uh, usually these patients, we treat them similar with beta thalassemia major, which is gonna be with blood transfusions and splenectomy can also be helpful for these patients. All right, guys, so the next one's gonna be our vitamin B12 deficiency anemia or cobalamin deficiency. So real quick, what we need to know about vitamin B12 is that it's involved in two important reactions. It's a cofactor in the conversion of homocysteine to methionine, and it's a cofactor in the conversion of methyl, methyl malonic CoA to succinyl CoA, right? And usually the main dietary source of vitamin B12 is going to be through meat and fish. And vitamin B12 is usually bound to intrinsic factor that's produced by gastric parietal cells and it's absorbed in the terminal ileum. So with these patients, how are they going to present or more like what are some of the causes? So usually all of them are due to some type of impaired absorption. So we think about pernicious anemia, usually they have a lack of intrinsic factor, most common in the Western hemisphere, and it's autoimmune destruction of the gastric parietal cells, right? Also, if a patient has a gastrectomy, right, gastric bypass, poor diet, like strict vegetari vegetarian, Crohn's disease, do they have the ileum resected? Because usually the terminal ileum is responsible for like a lot of absorption. Um, also, do they have like infections like Diphilobothrium latum infestation, like the fish tapeworm? So how is this patient going to present? They're going to have anemia, weakness, fatigue, bruising, such gum bleeding, uh, glossitis, stomatitis neuropathies, and this is actually what's going to help you distinguish between vitamin B12 and folate deficiencies, because both of these are going to be what? Macrocytic anemias. So with these patients, right, um, what happens with neuropathy is that they're going to have the neuropathy. So the cause of this is demyelination of the posterior column in your lateral corticospinal tracts and spinal cerebral tracts. So they'll have loss of position and vibratory sensation in the lower extremities. They'll have ataxia and upper motor neuron signs, like deep, increased deep tendon reflexes, plasticity, weakness. They'll have a positive Babinski sign. There are peripheral neuropathy, so balance problems, depression. And this can also cause dementia also. Uh, workup for these patients, we're gonna do a peripheral blood smear. We're gonna see that megaloblastic anemia, like I said, so those macrocytic red blood cells. We're gonna see hypersegmented neutrophils and the vitamin B12 is going to be low, so it's going to be less than 100. You're going to see your methylmalonic acid and homocysteine levels. Um, that's another way you're going to test this, which are both are going to be elevated. And then if you see any antibodies against intrinsic factor, this can help you with the diagnosis of pernicious anemia. You can also do a Chilling's test, right, with these patients. Um, and usually treatment for this is just going to be parental therapy. So give them cyanic, cobalamin, vitamin B12, intramuscular once per month for lifelong treatment. So the next one's going to be your folic acid deficiency. What happens with folic acid deficiency anemia is that you have folic acid stores that are limited, right? So usually an adequate intake of folate over a month period can cause deficiency. And what are the main sources of folate? We're thinking about green veggies. So... Some of the causes of folic acid deficiency, it's going to be inadequate dietary intake, such as like a tea and toast diet, right, which is the most common cause. Alcoholism, certain antibiotics that are taken over long term, like our folate synthesis inhibitors, can cause folic acid deficiency anemia. Uh, pregnancy, hemolysis, uh, medications like we said, methotrexate, anticonvulsants like phenytoin, chemodialysis. How is this patient going to present? So they'll have symptoms that are very similar to or vitamin B12 deficiency, like anemia, right? Weakness, fatigue, bruising, gum bleeding, glossitis, stomatitis, but these patients are gonna have no neurosymptoms. So no neurosymptoms. Um, another thing with folic acid deficiency anemia, especially in pregnant women, right? It can cause neurotub tube defects in the baby, so spina bifida. And testing for these patients, homocysteine is gonna be increased, but methylmalonic acids are gonna be normal. And that's how you're going to differentiate between vitamin B12 and folic acid, acid deficiency anemia 
is that in vitamin B12, you're going to see your methylmalonic acid and homocysteine levels that are going to be elevated versus your folic acid deficiency, the homocysteine is going to be increased, but the methylmalonic acid levels are going to be normal. The serum folic acid is going to be low, and usually you're going to see micro ovalocytes and hyperpigmented poly uh, or PMNs, right, which is usually pathognomonic for folic acid deficiency anemia. Treatment for this is going to be daily oral folic acid replacement. The next one's going to be your sideroblastic anemia. This is caused by an abnormality in your red blood cell metabolism. It's either hereditary or acquired. Some of the acquired causes, we think about drugs like clomphenicol, right, isoniazide, alcoholism, exposure to lead, collagen vascular disease, or any type of neoplastic disease like myelodysplastic syndrome. Diagnosis and workup, we're going to see increased serum, iron, and ferritin, normal total iron binding capacity, or normal TIBC. And sometimes the TIBC saturation is normal and or elevated. This is what's going to help us differentiate this from iron deficiency, right? And the key one for this one is going to be your ring sideroblast in the bone marrow. So ring sideroblast for sideroblastic anemia. Treatment is offending, removing the offending agent and also paradoxing is something we can consider. So the next one's going to be anemia of chronic disease. So just how it sounds, right, anemia of chronic disease is that it occurs in the setting of a chronic infection. So the body is acting to the overreacting or is just acting to the chronic infection. So things like tuberculosis, lung abscess, cancers like lung breast, lung breast cancer, Hodgkin's disease, inflammation like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or trauma. So what happens is that there's a release of inflammatory cytokines that have a suppressive effect on the erythropoiesis of the body. So iron studies, what we'll see, low serum iron, low TIBC, low serum transferrin saturation. So everything's going to be low, right? Except for the serum transferrin, which is going to be increased. And that's going to help us differentiate between iron deficiency, right? Because in iron deficiency, usually the serum ferritin is going to be decreased. In anemia of chronic disease, it's going to be increased. On peripheral blood smear, uh, usually you can see microcytic and hypochromic anemia, especially when we think about rheumatoid arthritis, right? The ESR is going to be increased, and this patient is going to have low EPO or low erythropoietin. Treatment is to treat whatever is the underlying cause. If it's cancer, treat it, and then it'll treat the anemia of chronic disease. We want to make sure in these patients we do not give iron, right? Um, and usually anemia is mild and well-tolerated. So the next one's going to be your plastic anemia. Uh, this is usually due to bone marrow failure that causes pancytopenia. So you'll have anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. Idiopathic is the most common cause. Other causes can be radiation, medications like chloramphenicol, sulfonamides, gold, carbamazepine, viral infections like HPV, hepatitis C and B, Epstein-Barr virus, CMV, um, herpes zoster virus, and HIV. Certain chemicals like insecticides or benzene can cause aplastic anemia. And this patient is going to be presenting with your common symptoms of anemia, like we've discussed, fatigue, dyspnea. They'll have signs and symptoms of thrombocytopenia, so petechiae, um, easy bruising. They'll have increased incidence of infections because they have decreased neutrophils, so they'll have neutropenia. And the thing about aplastic anemia is that it can, can transform into acute leukemia. Work up with these patients, you're going to perform... Uh, bone marrow biopsy for the definitive diagnosis, and this is where you're going to see like an empty bone marrow, right? It'll have hypocellular marrow, marrow, hypocellular marrow, and the absence of progenitors of all three hematopoietic cell lines. That's why it's called um, pancytopenia because everything's low, blood cells, lymphocytes, everything's low. That's why it's called pancytopenia also, and this is a type of uh, normochromic normocytic anemia. Treatment for this one's going to be a bone marrow transplant, right? Because their bone marrow, once again, is empty, nothing, it's not producing anything. Uh, transfusion of packed red blood cells and platelets as needed for these patients. And then, of course, if it's due to a medication, just stop the medication. If it's due to um, certain chemicals, and ensure that the patient has not been exposed to those chemicals. So always treat the underlying cause. All right, guys, so now we're going to go into our hemolytic anemia. So like we said, our hemolytic anemias are usually because there's a destruction of the red blood cells, and there's numerous cause for a destruction of red blood cells. And what happens is that whenever you're destroying red blood cells, right, the bone marrow responds to the destruction of red blood cells, and it starts increasing erythropoiesis, which causes reticulocytosis, which are your baby red blood cells. 
And sometimes what happens is that sometimes erythropoiesis cannot keep up with the amount of red blood cells that are being destroyed. So there's too many red blood cells being destroyed that the body or the bone marrow just can't keep up with making all those red blood cells. And this is what causes that anemia. So usually the most common cause usually with hemolytic anemias, most of them are acquired, right? And it's due to factors that are external to the red blood cell. So we think about immune hemolysis, the immune uh, antibodies that attach on the red blood cells and then causes destruction, right? We think about infections, medications, burns, toxins, like from a snake bite. Um, when we think about intrinsic red blood cell defects, usually the most common cause of these are going to be inherited. So something within the red blood cell structure within it is causing the blood cell to become hemolysized. So we're thinking about hemoglobin abnormalities like sickle cell, right? Um, thalassemias, hereditary spherocytosis, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, if there's defects with the enzymes like G6PD deficiency that we discussed earlier. And usually hemolytic anemias can be classified based on the predominant sites of hemolysis. So is it being hemolysized within the circulation? Then we think about intravascular hemolysis. Or is it occurring within the reticular endothelial system? Like is it being destroyed by the spleen? So we're thinking about extravascular hemolysis. So in general, for hemolytic anemias, um, usually this, they're going to have signs and symptoms of an underlying disease, like, for example, bone, bone crisis and sickle cell jaundice, what you'll see, because once again, you're having an increased amount of those blood cells being destroyed, like we discussed, so you're going to have an increased bilirubin, dark urine color, why? Because you're going to have a lot of hemoglobinuria. Um, this will usually tell you that there's some type of intravascular process that is going on. Hepatosplenomegaly, cholelithiasis, which is gallstones, lymphadenopathy, um, back pain. And how do we diagnose this? We're going to measure the hemoglobin and hematocrit levels. CBC, we're going to see that reticulocytosis like we discussed. We can do a peripheral smear. Um, and this is where we're going to see those schistocytes and helmet cells. That's going to tell us that there's some type of physical injury going on to the red blood cells. Um, usually schistocytes, we think about intravascular hemolysis, right? Usually when we think about spherocytes or helmet cells, we think about extravascular hemolysis. Uh, if we see sickle red blood cells, we think about sickle cell anemia, Heinz bodies, right, G6PD deficiency. And then, like I said, this is going to be usually um, a microcytic, normocytic anemia. So haptoglobin levels are usually low in these patients. LDH is going to be high. And usually your unconjugated indirect bilirubin is going to be high. Why? Because you're it's having to... D, um, due to degradation of heme because of red blood cells are being destroyed. So the red blood cells are having to be basically the destruction of them have to be cleaned out by the body. So that's where you're going to see those elevated indirect unconjugated. Um, you can also do a direct Coombs test, right? This is going to detect antibodies that are on the surface of red blood cells. And usually it's going to be positive if it's an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And then bone marrow biopsy also. So treatment's going to be underlying cause, right? Transfusion of packed red blood cells if the patient is very, very anemic or if they're hemodynamically compromised. So another one that we have is going to be your autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Uh, this is due to production of autoantibodies towards the red blood cell membrane antigens, which leads to destruction of these red blood cells, right? And it depends on the type of antibody that's being produced. Is it IgG or IgM? And this is going to tell you the prognosis, the site of the red blood cell destruction, and the response to the treatment. So we have different types. We have warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and then we have cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So when we think about warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, this is more commonly found than your cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. With warm hemolytic anemia, usually we think about IgG, right? So IgG binds to the red blood cell membranes at 37 degrees Celsius. So this causes extravascular hemolysis, right? And some of the causes, primary causes are going to be idiopathic. Secondary causes are due to lymphomas, leukemias like CLL, um, also like lupus and certain drugs like alpha methyl dopa. When we think about cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, usually we'll think about IgM, right? IgM is going to bind optimally at the red blood cell membrane at cold temperatures between 0 degrees to 5 degrees Celsius. This produces a complement activation, and this is an intravascular hemolysis versus warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is going to be an extravascular hemolysis. 
So for cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia, usually some of the causes are going to be idiopathic. And once again, also due to infections like mycoplasma and pneumonia, right, or mononucleosis. In general, for these autoimmune hemolytic anemias, they're going to be presenting with fatigue, pallor, jaundice. Um, diagnosis, we can do a direct Coombs test, right? Usually you'll see red blood cells that are coated with IgG. And this is going to tell you it's positive Coombs test, right? If we have IgG, we're thinking about which one? Warm hemolytic anemia. So warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If the red blood cells are coated with complement only on your direct Coombs test, then it's going to be the diagnosis of cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If there's a positive cold agglutinin titer, then it's going to be cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If we see spherocytes, then we're thinking about warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Treatment for this, usually there is no treatment for these, um, since usually it's mild, but if it's severe, then of course it's going to depend on the type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. If it's warm, usually we'll do glucocorticosteroids and then splenectomy if the patients are not responding to the steroids. Cold, just tell the patient to avoid exposure to cold um, because avoiding exposure to cold is going to prevent these hemolysis and anemia. You can do transfusions only as needed. All right, so your next one is going to be your hereditary spherocytosis. This is going to be an autosomal dominant inheritance of a defect in the gene that codes for spectrum, which is a fibrous protein that helps red blood cells maintain their normal shape. So with these patients, right, um, usually you'll have autohemolytic anemia with round red blood cells instead of biconcave, and therefore patients are more prone to hemolysis because there's an abnormality in the red blood cell shape. So once again, instead of being um, biconcave, they're gonna be round. And what happens is that this, they're very prone to extravascular hemolysis, which is, means, right, that um, the spleen is gonna be destroying a lot of these. So this patient's gonna be presenting with hemolytic anemia, pallor, fatigue, hypoxia, jaundice. Once again, it can even cause carnicterus. They're gonna have splenomegaly. Um, and some of the complications of this can be aplastic crisis, hemolytic crisis, gallstones, leg ulcers, and abnormally low A1C. Diagnosis, you're gonna do a red blood cell osmotic fragility to hypotonic saline, right? So what happens is that these spherocytes are, are tolerate less swelling because they rupture, so they're considered osmotically fragile. You're gonna see reticulocytosis, spherocytes also, and the direct Coombs test is gonna be negative, which is gonna help you differentiate from an autoimmune hemolytic anemia, right? Which can also have spherocytes. Treatment is really no cure, it's just management, and it's gonna focus on the severity of the disease, right? So we can do blood transfusions, folic acid supplementation, but the treatment of choice is gonna be splenectomy because we said, like I said, uh, spleen is the one that's most commonly removing these abnormal shaped cells in red blood cells and hereditary spherocytosis. The next one's gonna be your paroxysmal nocturnal uh, hemoglobinuria or PNH. This is a acquired disorder that affects hemo hematopoietic stem cells and cells of all blood lineages. It's caused by a deficiency of anchor proteins that link complemented inactivated proteins to blood cell membranes. So what does this happen? It causes an unusual susceptibility, complete mediated lysis of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Clinical manifestations are going to have a chronic intravascular hemolysis, chronic paroxysmal hemoglobinuria, and an elevated LVH. Um, pancytopenia, thrombosis of venous systems can occur like the hepatic veins. Um, this patient is going to be presenting with abdominal pain, back pain, and musculoskeletal pain. Workup for these patients uh, is usually we'll do a flow cytometry of anchored cell surface proteins like CD5, 55 and CD59, so CD55 and CD59. This is more sensitive and specific for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Treatments usually going to be with steroids like prednisone, um, but usually patients don't respond to this, so ben marrow transplantation is going to be the best one. So our next one is going to be Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? It's a group of cancers that are characterized by enlargement of lymphoid tissue, spleen, and liver. And usually with these patients, you're gonna have a presence of the Reed-Sternberg cells, right? Reed-Sternberg cells. Another thing that's associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma is Epstein-Barr virus, right? Most commonly involved in patients between the ages of 15 to 45. And usually this patient's gonna be presenting with painless cervical supraclavicular and mediastinal lymphadenopathy, right? Um, and you have different stages. You have stage A and stage B. 
Uh, stage A lacks any constitutional symptoms. When a patient's already in stage B, it's very severe. So they have constitutional symptoms like fever, night sweats, um, loss of 10% of their body weight, pruritus, and fatigue. This one has very poor prognosis. So with these patients, uh, workup, we're going to do a basic staging, including a CT scan of the neck, chest, as well as a biopsy of the bone marrow. Also, excisional lymph node biopsy is going to be needed for the diagnosis, and that's where we're going to see those reed Sternberg cells, right? It's also known as your owl's eye because that's how they look on your lab. So once again, reed Sternberg cells are associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Also, with Hodgkin's lymphoma, like I said, usually more commonly defined as supraclavicular and painless lymphadenopathy, and it's usually going to be subsequent, right? Versus your non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it can go anywhere. So with these patients, another thing you'll see on physical exam, mediastinal mass on chest x-ray, hepatosplenomegaly, and pruritus. Treatment is usually with chemotherapy, right? And radiation is usually the initial treatment of choice, especially in your patients that are in stage A. Then we have our non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? Um, so once again, with these patients, usually they what happens is that 90% of the cases arise from B lymphocytes. This one is very commonly associated with HIV or other immune deficiency, and the peak age is between 20 to 40 years old. But most commonly, think about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in your immunocompromised, like your HIV patients. So presentation, you're going to see... Uh, your diffuse or isolated. So once again, this one's isolated or diffuse, right? Diffuse, painless, persistent lymphadenopathy. It's gonna be the most common presentation for this one. Bone marrow involvement is very common. And the thing about this one, like I said, you get diffuse and it can go anywhere. Usually you'll have extra lymphatic sites like the GI tract, the skin, the bone, the bone marrow um, with these patients. And once again, there's a worse prognosis with this one, right? with um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in comparison to Hodgkin's lymphoma, because a lot of these patients present with your systemic B symptoms already. And workup for these patients, uh, usually we're going to do an excisional lymph node biopsy, which is usually going to be pref preferred, and we're going to stage them with a chest x-ray or a CT, um, and then possibly a, even a lumbar puncture. We can do an LDH and ESR. These are going to be good prognostic markers, and then also HIV serology. So Treatment's going to base, be based on the stage of the disease. Um, if it's a single node, right, we can do radiation. Um, if it's aggressive, right, usually with these patients, they'll need a chemotherapy um, plus autologous, high, autologous, autologous stem cell transplantation. So let's go into our thrombocytopenias, right, thrombocytopenias. So we have... Um, thrombocytopenias, which is just going to be a platelet count that's less than 150,000, right? Normal is between 150 to 400,000. So for these, we have TTP, which is your thrombo, your thrombotic thrombocytopenic um, purpura. And this is going to be a rare disorder of platelet consumption. And usually the cause is unknown. Um, with these, what happens is that there's highland microthrombi that include small vessels. So any organ can be involved and they can cause mechanical damage to the red blood cells, so you'll see schistocytes usually with these on peripheral smear. The thing about TTP, thrombocytic thrombotic purpura, is that this is a life-threatening emergency, and it's really important that we treat these patients quickly and we diagnose them quickly because this patient can die. The thing about thrombocytic thrombotic, thromb, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, sorry, TTP, is that usually in your question stem, it's going to be a woman. Um, and that's how you can differentiate this one between TTP and your ITP, which is your immune thrombocytopenic purpura, is that ITP usually is bimodal. So ITP is found in your children and your older patients. So that's why it's bimodal versus your TTP. It's going to be usually found in women, um, especially your question. Some you'll have pregnancy like a patient that just delivered or they're currently pregnant. Uh, some of the other risk factors are going to be infections, inflammation, medications, HIV, and AIDS. And what happens, kind of like the pathophysiology, is that they lack um, your ADAMS TS13, which is acquired due to inhibitory antibiotics blocking um, enzyme activity. So you're lacking, once again, that ADAMS TS13. So some of the clinical manifestations is usually that pentod, when we think about your TTP, 
So it's going to be your pentad and the mnemonic I have. Once again, this is not my mnemonic, so please don't judge me. It's going to be fat RN. So F is going to be for fever. A is going to be for your uh, anemia. T is going to be for thrombocytopenia. R is going to be for renal problems, right? And then N is going to be for neurological problems. So these patients are going to present an acute renal failure, right? They'll have neurological signs and they'll have these like fluctuant changes in mental status to even like hemiplasia. Um, usually you'll see non-palpable petechia purpura. And usually with these patients, right, for diagnosis, we'll see microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. They're going to have a high lactic dehydrogenase. Their indirect bilirubin is going to be high and reticulocytes are going to be high. Also, they're going to have a low haptoglobin. Any patient that has TTP, um, like I said, we're thinking about that pentod that we discussed. Treatment for this is going to be plasmapheresis and fresh frozen plasma, and it's important that we start them as soon as the diagnosis is established, right? So once again, this has a very high mortality rate, and like I said, it's going to be due to that lack of your Adams TS13. It's going to be commonly found in your woman. Question stems look for that pregnant woman or post-pregnant woman, also any infection in a woman, woman to woman, woman, woman. Pneumonic is going to be your fat RN, fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia. R is going to be for renal failure, right? And your N is going to be for neurological abnormalities or your ultramental status. Diagnosis, we're going to see, once again, that elevated lactate dehydrogenase, indirect bilirubin, and reticulocytes, and then a low haptoglobin. And treatment is going to be with plasma phoresis and fresh frozen plasma. Versus your ITP, immune thrombocytic purpura, usually what happens with this one is that you have an autoimmune antibody formation against the host platelet. So once again, it's not like TTP where you have, you're lacking the Adams TS13 protease, right? In ITP, it's because you're forming anti auto and autoimmune antibodies against your own platelets or destroying these platelets. So what happens is that uh, your platelets get coated with these antiplatelet antibodies of IgG, and they damage the platelets, which are then removed by your spleen, right? Your splenic macrophages. So there's two forms about this one, and that's why it's called bimodal, because you have your acute form and your chronic form. So your acute form is usually commonly seen in your children less than eight years old, and usually in these patients, you're going to have a history of some type of viral infection, a bowel rep respiratory infection, and usually it goes away by itself. Versus your older patients, right, between 20 to 40, um, they're usually going to have a chronic form of this um, and usually they'll have spontaneous uh, remissions that are usually rare. They'll have cyclic remissions and exacerbations. So on physical exam, you're going to see petechia and ecchymosis on the skin, bleeding of the mucous membranes like your gum, vagina, GI, hematuria, pistaxis, no splenomegaly. In your acute form of ITP, usually it'll be an abrupt appearance of petechiae, purpura, and hemorrhagic bull on the skin and mucous membranes versus chronic. It's going to be more insidious. The patient's going to have a long history of easy bruising and menorrhagia. Um, diagnosis for these patients, bleeding time, you're going to see prolonged. PT and PTT is going to be normal. You're going to see thrombocytopenia, and then on the peripheral smear, you'll see decreased platelets and megathrombocytes um, for these patients. And Treatment, if it's mild to moderate, it's just observation, right? Educate the patient to avoid any type of contact surgeries. But first line, usually it's going to be corticosteroids for your adults. You can give IVIG for kids. But once again, if it's the acute form, observation. Really no treatment is necessary. So the next one is going to be heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So how it sounds, right? It occurs due to any amount of heparin. And usually it's most commonly associated with unfractionated heparin. That's why sometimes we trend to prefer versus heparin, low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin because unfractionated heparin is associated with uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and it has a higher risk. So with these patients, you're going to see drop in platelets after starting heparin administration, right? And usually with these patients, um, you'll see antiplatelet factor um, nine antibody or serotonin release that are usually your diagnostic tests. And the treatment is once again, stopping the heparin and just avoiding heparin in the future for these patients. So the next one's gonna be your polycythemia vera. This is a malignant clonal proliferation of hematopoietic stem cells that cause excessive erythrocyte proliferation. So you have an increased number of blood cell mass, 
that occurs independent of erythropoietin. And usually symptoms are due to that hyperviscosity of your blood, right? So headache, dizziness, weakness, itchiness, especially after a hot shower. And that's usually one of the um, buzzwords for this one is going to be your itchiness after a hot shower. Visual impairment, dyspnea. Um, you'll have DVT. These patients are prone to thrombotic phenomena like DVT, strokes, portal vein thrombosis, heart attacks, bleeding symptoms, splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, hypertension. They can also present with erythromyalgia. This is rare, but they're going to have that severe burning and red-blue discoloration. Why? Because they're having this episodic blood clots in the vessels of the extremities. And um, with these patients, right, we want to do a CBC. We're going to see elevated red blood cells, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. Um, we're going to see thrombocytosis and leukocytosis. And the key for this one is that the serum erythropoietin is going to be reduced. Usually in these patients, right, we have our major criteria, minor criteria, so they have to fit these criteria for diagnosis for polycythemia vera. So major criteria is going to be elevated red blood cell mass. Men is going to be greater than 36 uh, liters per kilogram. Women's going to be greater than 32 liters per kilogram. Arterial oxygenation saturation greater than 92% and splenomegaly. While the minor criteria is thrombocytosis, so platelet count greater than 400, leukocytosis greater than 12, leukocyte alkaline phosphatase, that's, which is going to be increased, and serum, serum vitamin B12 with these patients, which is going to be greater than 900. So treatment for these patients is just phlebotomy, right? We want to make sure that we're lowering the hematocrit because they just have so much. We can also give them hydroxyurea. Another thing with this one is your JAK stat, right? Which you're going to see for uh, polycythemia. Or... So we are done with that. And let's go into our infectious diseases. So HIV is one of the ones that you definitely need to know. So with HIV, in regards to the path pathophysiology, right? It's a type of immunosuppression that occurs. So usually the body is becoming immunosuppressed with HIV. And usually the targets of HIV are the dendritic cells in the mucosa of the genital tract. So this one's transmitted sexually, right? All through, also through blood transfusions. So the infecting cells usually express your CD4 antigen, right? Um, these patients. And like we said, it's transmitted blood to blood. And some of the risk factors for this one is going to be sexual contact with an infected person, IV exposure to infected blood by transfusion or needle sharing, and perinatal exposure. Um, usually, most patients are asymptomatic for about a mean of 10 years. Um, with HIV, the symptoms that they'll have is going to be fever, night sweats, weight loss, skin lesions, pharyngitis, swollen lymph nodes. They tend to last days to weeks. You'll see heroleukoplakia, disseminated Kaposi's sarcoma, cutaneous bacillary angiomatosis, and generalized lymphadenopathy. Workup for these patients will do an HIV ELISA, um, but the confirmatory, confirmatory test is going to be your Western blot for these patients. Um, a CVC, also anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia. And usually the amount of CD4 lymphocyte count predicts how much the HIV is progressing, right? Usually when we think about a CD4 count less than 200, that's full-blown AIDS for these patients. Um, treatment, we want to make sure that we start treatment regardless of the CD4 count and perform resistance testing prior to initiating ART, right? Because our goal for these patients is to ensure that we are suppressing the viral replication, ensuring that they have a low viral load, right? So with HIV patients, we just want to make sure that we are basically giving them prophylaxis for common opportunistic infections, right? So we think about uh, PCP, pneumocystis carinian pneumonia. So usually if a patient has a CD4 less, count less than 200, we are giving them prophylaxis. So the one that is usually given is Bactrim, and Bactrim both treats PCP and is also a good prophylaxis. If they are allergic to Bactrim, we can do something like Dapsone, right? Another one is going to be toxoplasmosis. This is usually transmitted through cats. And interestingly, patients that have HIV are very prone to getting toxoplasmosis. So this is usually going to be in a patient with a CD4 count less than 100. And usually with these patients, the prophylaxis is going to be Bactrim, right? And then we, the other one we have is Mycobacterium avian complex. Prophylaxis starts because patients are very commonly to get this with a CD4 count less than 75. Usually we give azithromycin, but we can also do clarithromycin. 
The next one's going to be cytomegalovirus if CD4 count is less than 50, and Bactrim is going to be the prophylactic treatment. The next one's going to be mycobacterium tuberculosis, right? Um, usually we'll do INH plus pyridoxine for 9 to 12 months for these patients. So that's HIV, and AIDS is going to be anything that's less than 200 in regards to the CD4, right? Um, with these patients, it can present with symptoms, usually in signs of diseases that are becoming opportunistic and have infected them. So HIV encephalopathy, histoplasmosis, Kaposi's sarcoma, right, which is the lesions that are purplish, non-blanching papules or nodules that can just appear anywhere. It's on the conjunctiva, the toe webs, everywhere. Um, we also think about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, like we discussed earlier, right, very commonly found in your patients with HIV and AIDS. And also we think about MAC, right, which we discussed earlier, salmonella, septicemia, HIV wasting syndrome, which is due to decreased caloric intake and increased metabolic rate. Treatment for this is usually just going to be your art therapy, right, fever control. Um, and diagnosis, like we said, is going to be a CD4 count less than 200 or a CD4 count less than 14%. And like we discussed, we want to make sure that we are looking out for those red flags, for those opportunistic medication, opportunistic infections, and just providing prophylaxis for these patients. So the next one's going to be influenza. This is going to be caused by an orthomyxal virus. This is transmitted through respiratory droplets, right? It tends to occur in epidemics and pandemics during the fall and winter. We have three different strains, A, B, and C. Um, by far, A is going to be the more pathogenic one because it's the one that causes more antigenic shifts, right? Um, major antigenic shifts and minor um, mutations can be due to antigenic, antigenic drifts. So how is this patient going to present? Abrupt fever, right? Chills, malaise, muscle aches, headache, nasal stuffiness, nausea, coryza, cough, but it's going to be a non-productive cough, photophobia, pain with movements of the eye, wheezing, cervical lymphadenopathy, uh, workup for these patients, we'll do a PCR. It's going to be the most sensitive and specific, and treatment's usually going to be supportive care, right? So Tylenol, your NSAIDs. We can give something like Oseltamivir, but remember with Oseltamivir, it's only effective if the patient has had symptoms within two days. So if they come in on day three with symptoms of flu, Oseltamivir is not going to be effective, right? So they have, it's only effective within 48 hours of the patient having symptoms. Other patients that are can be given, um, also time of year, can be any patient that's immunocompromised or pregnant, right? That would be the only exception. So with the next one is going to be Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne illness in the U.S. It's usually found throughout northeastern seaboard, like Maine through Maryland, Midwest, and West Coast. And what I mean where it's found is where the tick that transmit Lyme disease is found because it's usually transmitted by a tick, right? So it's vector-borne. Um, and it's usually the, the vector-borne ticks that are found like on your white-tailed deer, white-footed mice. And it's caused by a bacteria called spirochete. So it's a spirochete. It's caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. This is something that really likes to be tested. So just make sure that you know this. Once again, Borrelia burgdorferi. So... Um, the clinical manifestations are going to be dependent on how the patient is, is presenting, right? Is it stage one? Is it stage two or stage three? So stage one is usually early or localized. It tends to occur two to four weeks after the bite. And the patient's going to be presenting with your erythema chronic migraines, right? That's usually the hallmark for just in general for Lyme disease, which is going to be your large, painless, well-demarcated target shape lesion on the trunk, the thigh, the groin, and the axilla. Stage two is usually when it's been disseminated, and this is still an early stage. It tends to occur days a week. This patient's going to be presenting with headaches, stiff neck, fever, chills, fatigue, malaise, and myalgias. They'll also have meningitis, encephalitis, Bell's palsy, right? Um, within weeks some months, they'll have cardiac symptoms like AV blood, pericarditis, and carditis. For stage three, these are going to be late persistent infection, months to years, and these were when you get the really severe symptoms like arthritis, especially in the large joints like the knees. You'll have central nervous system problems, subacute or mild encephalitis, transverse myelitis, and axonal polyneuropathy. 
So this is usually clinical diagnosis. We do do serological studies to confirm. So we wanna make sure we get an ELISA in the first month and the Western blood's gonna confirm um, the patient, right? Treatment for these, if it's early, right, and it's localized, um, we can just give them oral doxycycline for 21 days. But of course, for Lyme disease, this is gonna be contraindicated in kids and pregnant women. So in these patients, we'll give amoxicillin and or cefuroxin. You can also give erythromycin, right, if the patient has a, an allergy to penicillin. But once again, doxycycline, if they're kids and pregnant, pregnant we're gonna give amoxicillin and cefuroxin. If they are allergic to penicillin, then we can do something like erythromycin, right? So the next one we're gonna go into is going to be bacterial meningitis. So bacterial meningitis, um, with this one, right, just in general for meningitis, we have viral and bacterial. Bacterial is more severe than viral. So bacterial, uh, with these patients, what happens is that you have an inflammation of the meningeal membranes that envelop the brain and spinal cord. And the most common bacteria that are going to be found is going to be streptococcus pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza, and Neisseria meningitidis. So it's going to be those infections that colonize the nasopharynx in the respiratory tract. This patient is going to be presenting with fever, nuchal rigidity, ultramental status, headache that's worse whenever the patient lies down, right? Nausea and vomiting, that stiff, painful neck, malaise, photophobia, ultramental status. Signs is going to be that nuchal rigidity, so stiff neck with resistance to flexion. They're going to have a rash, especially when we think about Neisseria meningitis, right? They're going to have that macular rash with petechiae for Neisseria meningitis. Um, they'll have increased intracranial pressure and the manifestations of increased intracranial pressure like papilledema, seizures. They're, they're gonna have a positive Koenig's and Brzezinski sign. Diagnosis, uh, usually we'll do a lumbar puncture, but of course we don't do it un if, we, if there's any evidence of increased intracranial pressure, like if there's any focal neurological problems that we avoid this, right? Usually in your lumbar puncture, you're gonna see a lot of neutrophils the cell count is going to be greater than 1,000. You're going to see, see a low glucose, especially in bacterial, so less than 35, and an elevated protein. And like we said, you can do a head CT scan. This is usually recommended before you do a lumbar puncture, especially in a patient that we suspect that they have intracranial, um, increased intracranial pressure. And then make sure that we always make sure that we get blood cultures before we start antibiotics. So treatment is going to be empiric uh, antibiotic therapy, right? Um, and then just vaccination is going to be the best way to ensure that we are preventing patients from getting bacterial meningitis. Like patients older than the age of 65, right? Vaccine them for strep pneumo. Vaccinate your patients that don't have spleens, your immunocom immunocompromised patients. And just prophylaxis for anyone who has been in contact with bacterial meningitis, rifampin or rocephin, receptrioxin for close contacts. So our next one's going to be our viral meningitis. This is usually caused by a variety of non-bacterial pathogens, but most commonly viruses like your enteroviruses, right? And your Coxsackie viruses. Um, most common in the summer and fall temperatures. Also herpes simplex viruses associated with this. Usually this patient's gonna be presenting with a subacute fever, chills, headache, photophobia, pain on eye movement, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, myalgias, rash, uh, myocarditis, herpangina. They're going to have meningitis symptoms without local neurological signs, drowsiness or irritability. Workup, lumbar puncture, we're going to see pleocytosis, so lymphocytes are going to be predominant. The cell count is going to be less than 1,000, and the glucose is going to be normal or elevated, right? Protein is usually going to be normal also because, once again, this is going to be a viral meningitis, not bacterial. Um, like I said, bacteria like to eat glucose, so that's why in bacterial meningitis, the glucose is going to be decreased, and they poop protein. That's kind of how I think about it. So in bacterial meningitis, the protein is going to be high. Treatment for this, since it is a viral meningitis, it's going to be supportive care, so analgesics and fever reduction. In comparison to bacterial and viral, viral has a better prognosis than bacterial. So the next one's going to be your infectious mononucleosis, very commonly found in adolescents, right? college students or military recruit. It's transmitted through kissing, saliva, um, sharing food or drinks, right? And usually this patient's gonna present with what symptoms? Um, it's gonna be your, your fever, malaise, exudative pharyngitis, cervical lymphadenopathy, usually posterior. When we think about cervical lymphadenopathy that's anterior, we think about strep, 
posterior is going to be mononucleosis once again, anterior is going to be streptococcus. So these patients can also present with um, uh, pharyngeal erythema and or exudate, splenomegaly, rash, hepatomegaly. You'll have pal palatal petechiae and usually periorbital edema. Diagnosis is going to be with your monospot or your herophile antibody. And treatment is going to be supportive care, right? Um, avoid any type of contact sports. So we are done with infectious diseases. Why don't we go into critical care? So I know I kind of hit some of these when we were going through um, the organ system. So I'll make sure to not repeat myself. So there was one that had acute abdomen, right? So acute abdomen just refers to sudden severe abdominal pain of unclear etiology that lasts less than 24 hours. So with these patients, what are some of the differential diagnoses of an acute abdomen? We're thinking about acute peptic ulcer, right? DKA, diverticulitis, ectopic pregnancy with tubal rupture, ovarian torsion, acute pyelonephritis, adrenal crisis, your triple A, your aortic abdominal aneurysm, uh, sickle cell anemia crisis, and kidney stones. And usually the workup is going to be with uh, KUB and or CT scan. And if the patient is unstable, we want to make sure that we give them IV fluids and do a fast exam, right? We're going to do that ultrasound to look for any free fluid that indicates that the patient needs to go to surgery. So the next one is going to be your allergies. Um, so your allergies, I think we had already discussed this for anaphylaxis, right? Um, the treatment for anaphylaxis in general is going to be epinephrine, right? It's going to be any patient that is coming in after taking a certain medication or eating a certain food where they can present with symptoms of like diarrhea, even sometimes the early onset symptoms like GI problems. Um, they're going to have that edema, especially when we think about that edema involving like the throat where it's decreasing the amount of air the patient's able to get in. So treatment for this is going to be epi. Um, the next one's going to be burns, right? So whenever we think about burns, we think about our partial thickness, our superficial, right, burns, partial thickness, deep partial thickness, full thickness burns. In regards to that, there's certain textbooks that talk about first degree, second degree, and third degree, but we're kind of getting away from those. So um, with moderate to severe extensive burns, right, we want to make sure that we always check their hematocrit, right, uh, electrolytes, BUN, creatinine, UA, and chest x-ray. And remember that a patient that is having a burn, like these patients are very immunosuppressed. So it's really important that whenever they come in, we see where the burn is, like, um, is it involving maybe like the, the inner respiratory tract, right? Or do they need to be intubated because their airway is prone to collapsing? So always make sure we do our ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. We estimate the percentage of the burn. So we're going to do our rule of nines, um, especially for our adults, right? Not very commonly associated with our children. So when we think about our rule of nines, 4.5%, 4, 4 right? 4.5%. The whole head is going to be 9%, um, 9% for the upper portion of the torso, 9% for the lower portion of the torso. The, anti the whole anterior torso is going to be 18%. The posterior torso, all of it is going to be 18%. Each arm, all of it is going to be 9%. We think about the anterior, which is going to be 4.5%. The posterior is going to be 4.5%. The perineum is going to be 1%. Um, each leg, in general, all of it is going to be 18%. But if we think about the anterior portion of a leg, we think about 9%, the posture portion is 9%, but the whole leg is going to be 18%. So make sure that you know these whenever you're calculating how much the patient is going to be burning. So in general, the treatment for these burns, right, stop the burning process, uh, make sure that we use sterile water, but first look for powders of dealing with a chemical substance, because pouring water on a chemical can actually activate it and cause even further damage with these patients. We want to make sure that we manage shock by aggressive fluid resuscitation. This is where your Parkland formula comes in, which is going to be the percentage of burn area times the body weight in kilograms times four milliliters per hour, which is going to give you the total amount of fluids that are going to be needed in the next 24 hours. And usually for burns, lactated ringers are going to be the ones that we always use. And that was true when I did my burn rotation. There was no such thing as normal saline. It was LR everywhere, right? Uh, we want to make sure that, of course, we insert a Foley catheter to monitor ureter, ureter, urine output. Look for any S-scars, right, which is going to be a tough inelastic mass of burned tissue after third-degree burn. 
And usually the best topical burn ointment for patients is going to be things like sulfadizing, right? So let's go into each one classification and then kind of treatment specifically for each one. So first degree is usually going to be a minor damage to the epidermis, right? It's going to be superficial. Usually we think about our sunburns. Treatment is usually just giving them Tylenol, NSAIDs, because usually the pain is going to go away by 48 to 72 hours. Second degree, also known as your um, e-partial thickness or your um, partial thickness burns for these patients. Um, usually you're going to see for your partial thickness, your thin walled uh, fluid filled blisters, moist blisters that blanch with pressure and are painful. For your deep partial thickness burns, you're going to see thicker walled blisters, many blisters that are ruptured and they exhibit um, a uh, mix of erythema and pallor. They blister that are painful with pressure. And for second degree, right, or your superficial partial thickness, it extends to the papillary dermis, which is the upper portion of the dermis versus deep partial thickness. This one's going to extend more deeper, so it'll extend into the particular dermis, right? Um, treatment for these patients, superficial or superficial partial thickness are usually going to heal within 7 to 14 days. Deep, though, partial thickness, these are deeper, like we said, so usually these patients need um, sometimes even surgery or like we did in the hospital, um, uh, they need surgery and they might need a graft. So what is a graft? Just getting a part of the skin, usually in the back, the areas that have a lot of skin, and just taking a little bit out of little bit skin of that and then placing all on the on the burned area. Treatment for these patients, um, like I said, deep can heal unpredictably, but both of these burns need topical antibiotics like silver, 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 silvadine. Um, they'll need debridement, dressing that promotes moisture retention and oral analgesics, right? Then we get our third degree or our full thickness burns. This involves and destroys the epidermis and the dermis, and these are caused by things like electrical currents, prolonged exposure to flame, or immersion in a scalding liquid. Um, usually on your physical exam, you're going to see skin that has a white, leathery, or charred appearance. The skin is usually characteristically dry and without the presence of sensation or pain, and they lack that capillary refill. And the thing about this one, that it's so deep that a lot of these patients, when it heals, if they don't get surgery or they don't get, um, so they don't get surgery or they don't get that tissue removed or anything, it's going to result in a contracture. So what happens is, especially in like your areas where you flex, like your flexures, if you get a burn here, it's going to contract like this. So a patient will be able to like move that. So this is where physical therapy comes in, right? They help that patient regain that motion. This is where you go in there and you do surgery and you debride that area that was burned and you do and you get a graft like we discussed, usually like the areas of the back that have a lot of skin. You take a little bit of that and then you'll put it on there. It's a very, very interesting surgery. And treatment, like I said, most do skin grafts and escarotomy. So you get rid of that escar, which is going to be that really like dirty, like non-viable skin. Um, and then, of course, any burn that's circumferential, usually these patients, especially if it's like deep partial thickness or full thickness, need surgery. Because like I said, once they start healing, they can actually decrease blood flow and they can um, basically make the limb necrotic, right? Fourth degree is going to be usually a destruction of the skin and subcutaneous tissue with further, further involvement of the fascia, muscle, bone, or other structures. Significant charring and exposure of muscle and bone and extensive damage to nerves when the patient has like no sensation of pain because they burn through everything. So remember when we think about our anatomy, right? We have the epidermis, the dermis. Um, so with these patients, the deeper you get in, the deeper is where your nerves get. And that's what I would tell my patients when I was rounding with them that if you have a burn and you're able and it's painful that's a good sign because that means you haven't burned through your nerves versus a burn that's deeper that they burn through all their nerves and you touch on it like you're rubbing your finger back and forth and it's not painful for them that's because they burned all through your nerves so that's another thing to keep in mind in regards to whenever you're classifying your burns pain is good no pain is not good so <clears throat> the next one is going to be your form body aspiration. So form body aspirations, right? Patients usually aspirate gastric contacts, um, gastric contents, inert material, toxic material, or poorly chewed material. Um, the degree of injury will depend on the substance that is aspirated. Very commonly found in children more than adults. 
And the most common bronchi is going to be the right bronchi just because of the anatomy, right? And how is this patient going to present? They're going to have an acute episode of choking and coughing or unexplained unilateral expiratory wheezing or hemoptysis. Um, usually asphyxia is another thing with these patients. And it's really important that for our workup, we do expiratory radiography. And usually we'll see regional hyperinflation that is caused by a check valve effect or tracheal deviation away from the foreign body. Um, another thing that they really like to test is in regards to when, what you're looking at in the PA view of an x-ray. So if you do a chest x-ray and you see the coin that is facing the PA view, then the coin is going to be in the esophagus. If you do a chest x-ray and the coin is facing the lateral view, then it's going to be in the trachea. So <clears throat> with these patients, uh, what's going to be both diagnostic and therapeutic, for example, with chest x-rays, we can't see anything, but we do have a very high suspicion that the patient has a foreign body. We can do a rigid bronchoscopy. This is going to help establish the diagnosis and treatment, right? And especially when we think about those batteries, right, these need to be removed ASAP because these can actually necrose through the tissue, especially like your esophagus and they can perforate. I've seen children die from this and it's very, very sad. So the next one's gonna be orbital cellulitis. This is gonna be eyelid redness or edema, warm to touch, that can start within one eyelid then both, um, usually due to previous trauma and or cutaneous injury. This patient's gonna be presenting with tearing, fever, erythema, warmth, tenderness, proptosis, right, which is the eye just coming out, bulging out, restriction of the extraocular movements, and swelling with redness of the eyelids. They'll have decreased vision, pain with ocular movement, he said proptosis. And physical exam findings will see conjunctival edema, preceptal cellulitis, signs of fever and respiratory infection or sepsis, right? Um, with these patients, um, and I, I know I mentioned preceptal cellulitis, so you have different types of orbital cellulitis, right? You have your periorbital cellulitis and orbital cellulitis. Periorbital cellulitis is usually known as your preceptal cellulitis. What does that mean? That there's an infection of the eyelids and periorecular tissues, but they're going to be anterior to the orbital septum. This one's not as severe as your full-blown orbital cellulitis. Um, usually with preceptal or periorbital cellulitis, it's associated with upper respiratory infections. We think about strep, right, uh, staph aureus um, versus orbital, which is going to be more severe, and it's called also postseptal. Why? Because this is posterior to the orbital septum, and it's infection of the orbital soft tissue. It's spread usually from the paranasal area, so you'll have staph aureus, um, usually um, also streptococcus pneumonia and anaerobes, right? It can also be caused by dental infections um, or facial infections or bacteremia, and this one, once again, is most common in children overall. So what's going to be the treatment for both preceptal periorbital cellulitis and orbital cellulitis? So we said orbital cellulitis is more severe. Orbital cellulitis is a patient that just cannot move their eye back and forth. So they have limited extraocular movements versus your preceptal or periorbital cellulitis. The patient is still able to move their eyes. So once again, periorbital cellulitis is not as severe as orbital cellulitis, but it can progress into orbital cellulitis. So with periorbital cellulitis, preceptal cellulitis, with these patients, uh, you want to make sure that you do a visual acuity, right? Check their pupillary reaction. Um, and usually these are all going to be normal. Uh, you're going to do a CT scan to make sure you diagnose these patients, a high resolution CT scan. And you're going to treat them with amoxicillin tabulinic acid, right? Or a first generation cephalosporin. And these are going to be treated outpatient. Versus orbital cellulitis, your post septal cellulitis, right? Which occurs where? Posterior to the orbital uh, septum. These patients are going to have pain, once again, with that eye movement decreased visual acuity, and poptosis. This is a deeper infection, which makes sense why you have decreased um, vision. Once again, you're going to do a CT scan. You're going to see infection of the fat and ocular muscles. Um, you, you can also do an MRI. And treatment for this, these patients get hospitalized. They get IV antibiotics, things like your second or third generation cephalosporins, ampicillin sulbobactam, carbapenems, and or clindamycin. So the next one for this one is going to be your comas. So comas, and it's actually going to be the last one. So comas, um, or commas, sorry, comas. So a comma is going to be a depressed level of consciousness to extent that a patient is completely unresponsive to any stimuli, right? There's different causes of this. 
uh, for example, any type of structural brain lesion, it can be bilateral, brain dysfunction, global brain dysfunction like metabolic or systemic disorders, psychiatric causes like conversion disorders or malignancy. And the initial steps for a coma in general is going to be making sure that you're checking the vitals and monitoring the airway. So your ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation, right? Look for any underlying trauma. Um, stabilize the cervical spine and assess for signs of an underlying trauma. Also, make sure that you're assessing the level of consciousness using the Glasgow Coma Scale. And you want to make sure that we are repeating these periodically, right? So what's going to be our approach for coma? So we want to make sure that, once again, our top priorities are going to be our ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. So we want to make sure we get a finger stick blood glucose on these patients, we get IV access, and we attach them to a cardiac monitor, measure their oxygen saturation, do the GCS exam, right? Um, make sure that we look for any type of causes like we discussed, toxic, metabolic, infectious, or structural causes. And then also make sure we do our CBCs, electrolytes, PT, PDT, INR, AST, ALT, BUN, creatinine, urinalysis, and tox screen. Um, a CT scan we're doing to just rule out stroke. We can do a lumbar puncture just to rule out things like meningitis and cephalitis. And then of course, the thyroid function tests to rule out things like myxedema, comma, or thyroid toxicosis. And then we usually give the coma cocktail, right? Which is gonna be your thiamine, uh, naloxone, and then your dextrose, because the thiamine is usually gonna be for your malnourished and alcohol abusers, if we suspect that. Naloxone for any type of opioid toxicity, and then dextrose for hypoglycemia. Uh, so that is it, we are done. As always, guys, if I have any errors or anything like that, please comment below. I know sometimes when I'm recording these videos, I tend to misread things. So please let me know, comment below, and I will definitely update that in my descriptions. And also, if you have any feedback, please comment below. And if you have any cool mnemonics or any cool ways that you remembered certain diseases or like medications, like I said, please comment below so you can help other students. As always, I hope this video was helpful for you guys. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up or comment below. It really motivates me for making new videos for you guys and better videos. In addition to that, I also have links below that are going to link you to all my other end of rotation exam reviews if you find these useful. All right, guys. Thanks for watching, and I will talk to you later. Bye.